It was a dark and rainy night last summer. I saw a number of guys standing in front of my house. They didn't ring the bell, but just kept standing there. When I looked out through the window, there were about six men playing the rock, paper, scissors game at the front door, completely soaked in the rain. All of them were wearing aprons with forks in their hands. Some of them were holding ketchup and mustard bottles as well. I lived alone and they were perfect strangers. All of a sudden they shouted, Hey, open the door. Whatever there is in the house, we will eat it all up. I kept silent, trembling with fright. Then I heard them whispering to each other, Hey bro, are we going to grill it or deep fry? Nah, let's boil it today. They whispered to each other for some more time, then left. But I had to quiver for quite a long time, paralyzed by fear. Several days later, it rained again, and I heard some people's voices in front of my house like before. When I looked outside, it was them. They were arguing with each other at the front door, getting rained on. One of them shouted, You know what? I was almost hit by lightning today, just like barbecue. <laughs> so... We are gonna barbecue you tonight. They started to giggle. I ran out of patience with them, and in the end I yelled, Hey! Wanna be really hit by lightning, or get tased by the police? You choose. Then, they just left, hurling abuses. And fortunately, these guys haven't appeared anymore since then. I was finally able to breathe again. However, I heard the shocking news before long that a woman was missing in the village. And one day, the police came to my house. They asked me about the guys who used to hover around my house and if I still remembered what they looked like. I answered I didn't remember their appearance because they used to come at dark on rainy nights. According to the police, those guys were assumed to be prime suspect in this missing woman's case. They said that the woman called the police before she was missing because some suspicious guys standing in front of her house. And the situation she described was highly similar to what I reported. I suddenly got goosebumps. The police got the CCTV footage recorded from nearby the missing woman's house. However, it was a total shock. In the footage, there were six guys standing at the front door. After a while, she opened the door and they suddenly started to pierce her with sharp forks, then rushed into the house. It was two days later that the guys finally came out of the house. However, the strange thing was that the woman was missing. But she had never stepped out of the house throughout the footage. If she was really kidnapped by the guys, they should have dragged her out of the house. But in the footage, they didn't. What they got was not her, but just a number of black plastic bags in their hands. She was not seen anywhere. That meant she was definitely inside the house. But she disappeared and nobody was home. After the police searched inside the house thoroughly, they discovered something terribly shocking. Her blood stain was found in the bathroom and the guy's fingerprints on kitchen tools like cutlery, plates, and pots. The guys ate something in the kitchen and the woman was missing. The police started to track down the suspects. Soon, they were arrested. The guys spit out the truth that they ate the woman up. Besides, it was discovered that they did this thing to several more people after her case. I was totally shocked with fear and disgust. If I had opened the door that night, I would have been their prey. The guy's voices on a rainy night. I could never, ever forget that voice. I'm from the Philippines. This happened when I was 10 years old. Our class usually ends around 4 in the afternoon, but I return home usually either 4.30 or 5 p.m. When I got home, I got a glass of water, changed my clothes, and went outside to play with my friends. We usually play hide and seek, but as soon as we get tired, we just lay on the grass and talk about what animal we hate the most. One of my friends said, I hate lizards. The other two responded, I hate cockroaches because they're dirty. Then one of my friends turned to me and asked what animal I hate the most. I replied, frogs. He said, why? <laughs> I replied, I just hate frogs. He said, okay. Then one of my friends started imitating the frogs and we just laughed at him. 
<laughs> then one of my friend's mom called to get him home to eat dinner, since it was already late at night. So the four of us said goodbye to each other. Our house is not that far from where we were playing. It probably took 200 steps to get to our house. So when I got home, I heard a croak sound near my bedroom window, and I knew there was a frog, but I just ignored it. I went in the house and went to the bathroom to take a bath. After that, I ate my dinner as well. I asked my dad, where's mom? My dad replied, she'll be late. I said, okay. Then my dad and I continued with our dinner. Then after eating, I brushed my teeth and I went to my room to sleep. Again, I heard a croak sound near my window and again, I just ignored it. Just to let you know, the windows in my room are not covered with curtains, so I can clearly see the outside of our house. I glanced at the clock and it was already 1 a.m. And I thought, oh, mom is already home. My only source of light was from the moon. I turned myself to face the window and then my heart stopped and I couldn't even move. I saw a human frog at my window staring at me, but I just pretended I didn't see it. I just watched that human frog with my single eye open, and that human frog was just standing there. After a minute, it started jumping, and I didn't know what to do. He jumped for five minutes like it was waving at me. After that, it stopped jumping and then walked away. And I fell asleep around 2 a.m. because I was bothered by that human frog that I had seen with my own eyes. In the morning, I went to the place where I saw that human frog jumping, and surprisingly, there was a very deep hole. I got accepted to a college out of the country, so I had a long flight that day. When I finally got there, the college administration gave me the keys to my apartment. I found out I had a roommate, too, and her name was Jaden. She was very nice and kind, and we talked for a while. I was tired from the flight, so I decided to get to bed early. That night, I had a dream that I was falling from a great height. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of someone crying. I didn't think much of it, since Jaden was a sensitive person, and it was her first time away from her family. But then, I realized I couldn't move. I couldn't talk, and Jaden was still crying. When I woke up the next morning, I looked over at Jaden and saw that she was terrified, as if she'd seen a ghost. I asked her, why were you crying last night? And then she said, there was a tall black figure right beside your bed, and that thing was watching you sleep, and then it crawled on you and just laid there. I didn't believe her until she showed me a picture. It was of me sleeping and that thing on top of me. She said, I was crying, but that thing didn't go away. I realized that was why I couldn't move, because that creature had been on me. I soon moved out of there, and so did Jaden. But two years later, Jaden was found dead in her house. The police found out that she had been scared to death. That thing is still haunting me to this day. This story happened to me very recently, and for me, this was the only way I could lift the weight off my shoulders. First of all, I live in an urban part of New Delhi, India. I come from a family of Hindus that are highly religious. About a year ago, a close family friend passed away in a freak bike accident and unfortunately succumbed to his wounds. This was a great loss to everyone, especially my father who was best friends with him. Now we had to perform a ritual on his one year death anniversary, which would free his soul to the astral plane. This is because spirits of people who died before they were supposed to do not want to leave this world. So a few days before this ritual was supposed to happen, I woke up at night and went to get a drink of water. Now, my floor is connected to the third floor where my parents live via a flight of stairs inside the apartment. So as I was going to the kitchen, I always had to pass by the stairs. When I was coming back with the water, I looked at the stairs and I could make out the silhouette of a man. Now, I just thought that it was my father as he would often come to check on my grandfather at night as he had just come back home after a surgery. 
So I just said, good night, dad. But as I was going back to my room, I noticed he didn't say anything back, but was just standing still at the top of the stairs. At the time, he and I were having a fight, so I just chalked it up to him ignoring me and went to sleep. When I woke up the next day to have breakfast, my father was at the table. So I asked him why he was just standing on the stairs last night, and he said he wasn't. In fact, he said he had so much work that he didn't once come down to check on my grandfather. My grandmother was at the table and overheard our conversation and immediately said that it was our friend's spirit trying to make contact with us, but that we should never acknowledge his existence as people with untimely deaths often take one of their loved ones with them. She then asked me if I had made contact with him, to which I told her the events of last night. She was relieved when she heard this because the spirit must have thought I was talking to someone else, because I thought I was talking to my father. She made me go and pray, but I could hardly focus after all that she had said. And to this day, I wonder what would have happened if I had gone upstairs to take a closer look. I don't exactly remember when it began, but I started to have nightmares. I was lying on the bed in my room. I heard someone sniffing around. When I opened my eyes, I saw a strange man sniffing my body. I tried to scream but failed. I lost my voice. The man put disposable gloves on both his hands. Then, he grasped my body and started to gnaw off my flesh. I felt unimaginable pain being eaten up alive, and it continued until I was literally stripped to the bone. Then, I woke up screaming hysterically. One day, my mom took me to the hospital, but the doctor said I was totally fine. He said too much stress could cause such nightmares. A few days later, I started to have the same nightmares again. This time, however, I stiffened up my whole body when the man was about to gnaw off my flesh like before. Then he said, hey, relax, tapping my body. I kept the body stiff and tense, and he kept failing to gnaw off my flesh. Then, he just had gone, saying like, too hard. I sighed in relief, but the nightmare had continued again and again. Every night, different men appeared in my dream one by one and stood still in my room. If I kicked one out, then another one appeared. Each of them looked bizarre, and the way they acted was very creepy. For example, one of them pulled out all my hair until I was bald, then ate it all up. I had to feel the entire pain of being plucked out helplessly. When I woke up the next morning, I couldn't believe that it's real that I still had my hair even while touching it. The next night, another man dropped a huge watermelon directly on my face from the ceiling height and I had to face the pain of my nose being broken. He repeated it over and over, and I howled in extreme pain all night long. Another one came and stuck needles into my whole body. My body was stuck with more than a thousand needles through the night. Every time he stuck it into my body, he clapped his hands with delight. After I woke up from the dream, it was like I was going completely mad. And this was really messing me up. I went to see a psychiatrist, and I said every night, Strange men appear in my dream and torture me like hell. Please help me stop this horrible nightmare. The doctor said, to them, you are the one from a different world. They're playing with you because you're interesting. And he laughed like crazy. <laughs> I woke up screaming. I barely gathered my senses and found I was in a hospital. I also saw my doctor and mother. However, my mother's face turned into a strange person's face. Then she choked me yelling out, get out, don't get into another's dream. Feeling suffocated, I slowly passed out. When I woke up after a while, I was on the bed in my room. I went to the doctors, but what I was told to do to get better was just to take rest and recharge. I couldn't distinguish between dreams and reality anymore. I got into a huge panic and suffered from insomnia every night. Several weeks had passed, and I was gradually getting used to nightmares. The way those people in my dream acted was always uncanny and creepy. For example, 
When they saw me suffering in pain, they got very happy. When they saw me screaming, they mimicked my voice and made fun of it in amusement. Like this, the way they acted was bizarre and different from normal people in the ordinary world. So I thought maybe I could fight against them by observing the way people acted. I mean, if they looked unusual, I could quickly realize that it's just a dream. And one day, while walking along the street, I saw a standing woman. I approached her to take a close look. She was as beautiful as a Barbie doll. I said hi to her, but she spat in my face. As her response seemed to be unusual, I guessed this was definitely a dream. As I was in a dream, I decided to try to attract her for fun. I'll give you whatever you want. Then I walked into a jewelry store, stole lots of jewelry, and gave it to her. She leaped for joy and our romance was about to begin. At that moment, however, I heard the police siren blaring. But I didn't care because I thought it was all just a dream. When the police came to me, I threw a punch right in their face. Then they took out their billy clubs and beat me without mercy. Completely knocked down, I blacked out. When I opened my eyes, I found I was in an intensive care unit. After that, I decided I would not act thoughtlessly, even in a dream. And fortunately, I hadn't had the nightmares anymore since then. But something was still weird. People on the street stopped and stared at me, standing perfectly still just like mannequins. And when their gaze met my eyes, they ran away at full speed. Even my family, friends, all the people around me just glared at me in perfect silence at all times. Whenever I called them, they didn't answer. No one responded to me. And every night, mysterious men kept visiting my home. They broke down the door, invaded my place, and tortured me again. One guy covered my body with cement. Another one broke my bones with a hammer. And another one tried to pop my lungs by pumping air through my mouth. Every time, I barely managed to kick them out. But the next day, they barged into my house over and over again. When it happened, I called the police, but they couldn't catch those guys. Sometimes, I went to see a psychiatrist, thinking I might have delusional disorder or delirium, but nothing got better. This way, I had three terrible years. And one day, I woke up from sleep and saw the warm, bright sunshine coming through the window at that moment, I finally realized that I had never seen the sunlight for the last three years. And with a splitting headache, all the puzzle pieces of my memory fell into place. I just realized that I had lived in my dream world for the past three years. I looked at the calendar. I thought three years had passed, but in reality, only one day had passed. <laughs> I howled and cried. In the real world, I finally received psychotherapy for quite a long time. Several months had passed and the doctors said I had gotten much better than before. Fortunately, I haven't had a nightmare since that day. I also haven't gotten into panic anymore, but I am still fearful of getting stuck in the dream world again and fearful of failing to get out of there for a long time. My name is Lisa and my family love to go on road trips. We were that family that never stayed put. We constantly traveled. But this is the most terrifying experience I've ever had. Let's just say we won't be going on road trips anymore. It started when we were driving somewhere, which I won't name for privacy reasons, and it was getting dark. The hotel we planned to go to was full, and everything else was hours away. My dad continued driving, looking for a place to stay, and we came across this old-looking inn at first, nothing seemed strange, but when we entered the driveway, we were immediately hit with a foul-smelling odor. However, we were all exhausted and hungry, so we ignored it. We knocked on the door, and out came a family. The parents looked normal, like an average white family, but the daughter was extremely pale. Her parents were blonde and brunette, and her hair was jet black. 
but they invited us in, and we planned to stay for a week, as nothing seemed wrong. The only thing that seemed odd was that a room was locked, but we shrugged it off as some owners don't want guests looking through their stuff. I was nine at the time, and so were the other girls. Another family came to the inn while we were staying there. So me, the inn's owner daughter, and the other girl decided to play hide-and-seek. The inn girl said she was the master at hide-and-seek, so me and the other girl were seekers, as we bet $20 we could find her. I also forgot to say that the girl had such a crackly and creepy voice. When she said she was ready, I got goosebumps. Anyways, we split up in hope to find her faster. Few minutes have passed, and I found her. I was behind her and was about to scream, Found you! But I looked closer, and something stopped me dead in my tracks. I froze. There was the inn girl, crouching down behind the corner of the wall holding a knife. Next to her was the other girl. She was dead. Then I realized she must have been waiting for me to do the exact same. Tears streamed down my eyes. I had to get out of there before she saw me. I quietly went up the stairs crying. Then I heard something that made my heart stop. The girl was at the bottom of the stairs, staring at me with wide eyes, smiling. I screamed and ran to the bathroom, locked it, and grabbed my phone to call the police. I was crying in the bathroom for a few minutes while the girl was pounding on the door. Then suddenly, I heard cop sirens and footsteps rushing away from the room. I noticed that immediately when the cops arrived, the owners of the inn ran away. I went downstairs and hugged my parents, told them what happened while the cops were bringing the girl's dead body away. I felt really bad for the girl's parents. I told the cops what happened and told them about the locked room. So I followed them to the room and they burst the door down. We were all hit with the same foul-smelling odor and I froze when I saw what the cause was. Dead bodies leaking with blood were piled up in the room. Some were decapitated and some missing limbs. We left the inn and we never went on a road trip again. One night, I was awakened by a strange voice. Master, where do you want me to stab? As a voice was heard right in front of my face, I opened my eyes totally frightened. What I saw was a strange man talking to the air with something sharp in his hand. Want me to take her heart out of the body? He was putting a surgical blade or something like that right to my chest, and he said, my master ordered me to take out your heart. While his face was heading to me, his eyes were looking at the ceiling, snorting violently like he's getting the adrenaline rush. He kept nodding his head, then said, Yes, sir, I'll get right on it. He told me, Let me know how it feels when the knife penetrates into your flesh. Here it goes. I pushed him off, screaming. Then he said, backing off, Master, I can't take out the heart. She keeps moving. What should I do now? Knock her out or kill her? While he was talking to the air, I called 911 right away. Then he ran out of the house super fast. Maybe as fast as you seen Bolt. About 10 minutes later, the police arrived. But the man was already gone. I didn't understand how he could come inside the house, though. I certainly locked the door. Was it an illusion? No. I could still smell him in my room. The smell from his mouth was totally strange, which I'd never smelled before. It smelled of blood, and also it was like he ate something rotten. Next night, I went to bed after triple checking if all the doors were locked tightly. But in the early morning, I heard that voice again. He wants me to serve a palatable dish made with your fresh gut, kidney, eyeballs, and brain. He put the knife only about one centimeter away from my eyes, and he shouted into the air like, I'm going to poke her eyes out for you, master. At that moment, I kicked him hard, screaming, and ran away to the bathroom. Then I locked the door and immediately called the police. He followed me to the bathroom and kept shouting, Guess how many seconds it would take until your heart stops. Would it struggle hard to beat even outside your body? What do you think? 
I shouted, trembling with extreme fear in the bathroom. Well, why don't you just count how many seconds it takes until the cops arrive? Then he shouted back with anger. Count ten, and then I'm going to poke your heart out first. And then he stabbed the bathroom door like mad. Fortunately, I heard a police siren outside in a minute, and the police rushed into the house, and he was arrested. Even getting arrested, he shouted into the air. Forgive me, master. I'll definitely serve a nice dish for you next time. According to police investigations, a number of books and pictures related to Satanism and ancient rituals to eat human organs were found in his house. Besides, there were books about anatomy and relevant materials, surgical instruments, and even an operating table. Moreover, it was discovered that he had attempted this kind of crime several times already. He bragged that he had taken out someone's heart to eat, and even explained to the police proudly what it tasted like in detail. In addition, he showed some satanic drawings on his body, which looked like symbols of Satan made with a knife, shouting like that the master had given him an eternal life. When the police asked him who the master was, he answered like this. We are not the only beings in this world. There are more than we know. Who I serve is far stronger and superior than human, and he likes to eat human heart. I'm his servant and under his command. Ha ha ha. He got imprisoned after all. But before long, he was found dead in jail after taking his and other prisoners' eyes out. First of all, this story might be disturbing to listen, so I suggest you to watch it for your own responsibility. I'm Audrey, and this story happened a few years ago when I was a kid. I'm from Hungary, and I live in a little village on the northwest side of the country. Our street isn't so crowded. We live in the middle, and the others are a bunch of old couples, except for that one boy who was around my age. Let's call him Vincent. We never talked to each other because of his family. They were very strict. They've never let him out, and his mom used to hit him a couple of times too. One day, his father got enough and the family broke apart. The dad moved out and Vincent cried a lot because he was the only one who really understood him. After a couple of months, there were still the two of them in the household. We usually heard a lot of screaming coming from the house if we went for a walk in that direction, though we thought they are going to stop soon, but we were so wrong. One day, the moms got enough of Vincent. She clearly didn't love him and wanted to get rid of him. She even blamed him for the divorce with his father. So Vincent was out of the house because he had to go to the nearby store. Meanwhile, the mom hired two crazy homeless men to get rid of him. She didn't want to do it herself because she would get in trouble, so she offered a lot of money for the two men to basically eliminate his own child, and they, of course, said yes. They didn't have anything to lose, so any money could come in handy. Like I said, Vincent was in the store, and when he came out, it was dark already. He started to walk forward, but then he saw the two homeless men. He slowly approached them because he was kind and wanted to ask if they needed anything from the store. The two men smiled creepily, looked around, and when saw that nobody was near, they grabbed him roughly and started to pull him. Vincent fought so hard, but they were much stronger, and they managed to pull him into the nearby cemetery. One of them punched Vincent in the face so hard he fell to the ground. Then they both started to beat him until he was almost unconscious. Then one of them went away for a second or two and came back with a big shovel. Vincent was crying really hard at this point, but the guys just laughed. They dig a big hole, threw Vincent in, and buried him alive. After a couple of weeks, the police found his body and started to investigate the case. They asked a bunch of questions from the mom, yet they have never found the homeless guys. They've disappeared for good. 
When we heard this story, we weren't allowed to go out after sunset. In fact, I wasn't allowed to go out at all. But the worst thing is in this story that they have never caught the mom. Rest in peace, Vincent. I had a neighbor who were an old couple who lived alone, and they lived with many dogs. People admired them for being kind and letting stray and homeless dogs stay in their house and taking care of them. One day, a child got lost in their backyard, and the clueless child was accidentally bitten by one of their dogs. The couple weren't well off. They couldn't afford to pay the med fees that the bitten child needed. The parents of the child tried to sue the old couple. In my country, you can get sued if your dog bites someone. They both went to jail temporarily. Fortunately, a lot of people were kind enough to help them. They got out. Weeks passed. The child went missing. People in the neighborhood searched and searched over and over again, but they couldn't find any trace of the missing child. Police wandered and searched the area every single day for a week, but they still couldn't find any possible evidence of the said disappearance. The parents became hopeless and started suspecting the old couple, but everyone was convinced that they're too kind to do such a thing. They searched their home and found nothing. Even the police were willing to stand in the old couple's behalf to prove their innocence. Years have passed. Everyone eventually forgot about it. The disappearance of the child case remained unsolved. The people and the authority gave up and moved on with their own lives. But the parents remained optimistic and continued looking for justice. Eventually, the old couple passed away, but the case was still unsolved. The dogs were sent to Dog Pound Authority. Later, people found out that the couple kidnapped and brutally killed the child. The reason why they couldn't find any trace, even though they searched their home, was they fed the child to the dogs. This is about a disastrophe happened in a party three years ago. I met a beautiful woman there who gave me an unforgettable <laughs> nightmare. When we met first, she shouted, Finally, I got you. And she continued touching my forearm. I've been looking for an adventurous and powerful man. So I told her I was born to be a powerful male. Super powerful. She giggled and I kept showing off my muscles to her. And I was finally invited to her house and we went there together. However, as soon as we walked in through the front door, I found a goblin costumed man standing with a club in the living room. Suddenly, she shouted at me, changing her facial expression. Your first quest? Kill the goblin. I got confused for a moment and soon burst into laughter, thinking that it's a prank. However, at that moment, the goblin man started to lunge at me with a horrible shriek. He violently swung his club at me and I finally realized that this was not a joke. When his club hit my temple, my vision turned black and my ears went ringing. Enormous pain overwhelmed me and I was almost about to be knocked down. I struggled to pull myself together. Then, with extreme anger, I started counterattack by tackling, pushing him down and punching in the face without mercy. Even while I was hearing him screaming, like, ah, you win, I surrender. I just kept punching him. His face got crushed and he fainted away after all. Gasping for breath, I shouted at her, what the hell is this shit? Then she shouted back to me. Congratulations, you've just beaten the goblin. You level up. I shouted, walking towards her. Are you insane? This is not fun at all. But she ignored what I was saying. She just came to me and said, pouring me a glass of wine. This health potion will help you restore your strength. Drink it. I grabbed her by the throat and shouted, Why are you doing this to me? Why? The blood from my mouth spattered all over her face. She said, My life was so boring. So, I've been looking for what could make me happy. And finally, I realized I was happiest when I was playing the game. But computer games? Nah, it's too boring. That's why I created my own game. To play with real people. <laughs> you are now in my game. Then she shouted, 
Let's move to the next quest. With that shout, a closed door opened, and a man popped out of it. He was holding a large hammer in armor. I tried to run away, but she was already standing guard at the door. She shouted, Just roll with it. Just think you're a game character, which exists only to satisfy my pleasure. <laughs> the man in armor ran to me, yelling like a warrior. I'm going to take your head as a trophy. As he brandished his hammer like crazy, all the furniture around us got smashed and windows were broken. She shouted again. He's a level 10 warrior. If you beat him, you'll level up much higher than before. In the blink of an eye, I got knocked out by a blow of his heavy hammer. I had blacked out for about three seconds. When I narrowly opened my eyes, I found him tramping towards me. Blood trickled down through my forehead, eyes, then fell in drops on the carpet on the floor. He yelled, anything to say before you die? <laughs> I saw my whole life flashing before my eyes. At that moment, he raised the hammer above his head. I clasped his feet and threw him down onto the ground, and I jumped on his chest and choked him as hard as I could. His eyes were about to pop, turning bloody red, and he shouted urgently, Hey, this is just a game, a game! But I continued to squeeze his throat, absolutely overwhelmed by rage, and he soon passed out. I shouted, Level up! I was short of breath and my whole body was trembling. I was literally bursting with adrenaline. Soon, I recognized her walking towards me with a large sword in her hand. Congratulations, you completed your quest, and here's your level up reward. I quickly snatched the sword and put it to her throat. She tried to run away in fright, but I immediately caught up with her and cut her back without hesitation. She collapsed, but I couldn't make a real wound because it was a fake sword. She shouted, almost on the verge of tears, how dare you? I'm the creator of this game! I yelled, kicking her back. Game is over. Then I shouted inside the house. Anybody here? And I heard many people's shouts back from a number of rooms. We want to level up. Give us a quest. That creepy scene really gave me the creeps. I got out of the house right away and called the police, and she was caught and brought to jail. After some time, the police informed that there were six men locked in the house and four dead bodies found in the cellar. I had been in the hospital for treatment for several weeks since then, and fortunately recovered my health soon, and I have practiced wrestling harder than before. If I hadn't beaten those men, I couldn't have been here. Please, guys, always be careful and trust nobody at all times. <laughs>
and she was moving it. I was frozen in fear, and I was shaking really bad. Then the lady turned around, and her face was even scarier than I thought. Her face was covered in blood. She had red glowing eyes and sharp teeth like a vampire. I was frozen like a statue. Then she started an awful scream and was running towards me. She was almost going to reach me, and then I collapsed right there. The next morning, I woke up on the sofa and everyone was looking at me. I asked, what am I doing here? My sister said that when she washed her hands and was coming out, she saw me falling down on the ground and started shouting. Everyone came and were shocked to see me in this condition. They carried me and brought me inside. After that, I told them everything about what had happened, and my aunt was shocked. She said that the woman was once a beautiful girl, and many men had a crush on her. One of the men proposed to her, but she said no. The man got angry, and one night while she was putting up the bamboo stick gates, the man attacked her and killed her. Many villagers have said that they've also seen her. After hearing that, I got scared. After that incident, I never saw that girl again, and I don't want to. Many, many years ago now, years before I was even born, my dad was driving through Arizona when he spotted a guy hitchhiking at the side of the road. He said it was a real scorcher that day, a hundred degrees in the shade kind of deal, and there's this guy with no hat and no water bottle just walking along this desert road. Being the all-around great guy that he is, my dad pulls over and offers him a ride, claiming that there was no way the dude would have made it out of the valley without getting some serious heat stroke, probably. The guy seems incredibly grateful. He jumps in the car and they take off down the road. My dad asks the guy where he's headed and the guy replies, next town over, before chugging from a bottle of water my dad offered him. They commence a little small talk as they drive and the guy tells him some common first name like Tom or Dave or something. Turns out the guy had been hitchhiking all the way across the state because he wants to cross into Mexico on account of his 90 year old abuelita who was sick and he wanted to see her before she passed on. The fact that he didn't have any money wasn't going to stop him either. He wanted to be at her bedside when she passed. My dad thought that was just about the sweetest thing he'd ever heard and the hitchhiker looked like a real hard guy too I guess you'd say. So it was extra touching seeing how you'd never really expect that from him. But everyone loves their grandma I suppose. They ended up driving together for way longer and they worked out which point my dad would be farther south using an old road map so the guy could get out as far south as possible so he wouldn't have much further to go. He gets out and my dad wishes him luck and then he goes driving on his merry way. Some way down the road, a cop car appears in my dad's rear view, puts on its lights and pulls him over. Like a model citizen, my dad pulls over, hands at 10 and 2, then asks the officer what the problem was. The cop doesn't say anything, he just asked to see his license. He took a good long look at the license, then told my dad to get out of the car. My dad then gets out of the car and the cop starts searching around it for a while before closing the driver's side door and walking back over to him. The cop asks him if he picked up a hitchhiker a few miles back and my dad says yes. The cop then asks if his name was something other than Dave or Tom, some Hispanic name, and my dad says no, that it was the plain common name that he'd been given. The cop then produces a photograph, and the guy in the picture is none other than the hitchhiker my dad had just spent the last hour or so with. When my dad says yes, that was the guy he just picked up. The cop told him he needed to follow him to the closest precinct to answer a few questions, because the guy wasn't some dedicated grandson headed to see his abuelita. He was wanted for the murder of a cop, and he was fleeing the country. The cop told my dad that the guy would have killed him for his car just as soon as look at him, and that he'd probably have taken him hostage if they performed a traffic stop on his vehicle while Mr. Abuelita was still in the car. Knowing how close he'd been to danger really shook my dad up. He was only in his 20s at the time, early 20s too, still naive and stupid brave enough to just randomly pick folks up. Says the whole thing really changed his perspective on people, and he was much more cautious afterwards glad he was too. Otherwise, I might not even be here to tell this story for him. Rest in peace, Dad. 
your kind, generous, silly self is missed infinitely. This is about what I experienced three years ago, which still makes me shudder. One night, I found a bar in an alley on my way. I had lived in the area for 10 years, but had never seen this one before. Weird music was flowing out of the bar. It actually sounded like creepy noise rather than music. I walked into the bar with curiosity. It was already packed with so many people. Interestingly, the place was full of beautiful women. I sat at the bar, thinking beautiful women from all around the world had gathered here. Bartenders also were stunningly beautiful and handsome. While slowly sipping the drink, my eyes met a woman's, and she approached me. I tried to avoid her gaze, because my heart beat about three times faster than usual in front of beautiful women. She slowly came up to me and brought her face close to mine. I just forgot to breathe because of her flawless, gorgeous face. The smell of alcohol on her breath was just like out-of-this-world perfume, and I couldn't help but get a crush on her in the blink of an eye. When she asked me to go to her place together, I couldn't even believe my ears. We finally got her home. She whispered she loved me. That night I soon fell asleep, obsessed with extreme happiness. When I woke up early next morning, it was unbelievable, but I was lying on a bed in an abandoned house and she was nowhere to be seen. The bed was stained with something dark red like old blood. Feeling startled, I looked around, but there was nothing in the empty house but cobwebs, dust bunnies, and mice. In suffocating silence, I heard only the sound of insects and howling wind through the cracked window. Completely frightened, I ran away from the place, and I finally recognized that this abandoned house was in the middle of a thick forest. How could I have spent a night in a place like this? Who was she last night? Meanwhile, I found my car parked in front of the house and I quickly drove home. When I checked my dash cam, I was shocked. In the footage, I was driving alone to that house. Besides, I just kept speaking alone, though there wasn't her voice back. Then, with whom did I spend the night? Who the hell was that? What was worse? Some changes began to happen in my body. I mean, my body began to smell weird. My eyes turned reddish and the skin turned purple day by day. I also quickly lost too much weight. Sometimes I felt like I had absolutely no energy and I collapsed from time to time while walking. In such cases, I even couldn't get up because I had no power and I had to struggle hard just to push myself up from the ground. At work, I spent time sitting in a chair, only half conscious, and my boss often criticized me fiercely. You can't be like this at work. Who did you sell your soul to? Even when I got back home, I couldn't do anything, but just lie on my bed and recall the night I spent with her. As time went by, my incredible craving for her grew more and more, and one day, I couldn't stand it anymore. I just drove to that abandoned house at 2 a.m., I was like completely out of my mind. When I arrived at the house, she was there. Besides, there were two more beautiful women. They got highly delighted looking at me. They whispered they loved me in my ears dozens and dozens of times and I fell asleep, overwhelmed with great pleasure and happiness. However, next morning, I found a strange man sleeping next to me when I woke up. He also woke up with a start and shouted, what the heck? Why am I in this shitty place with a shitty jerk like you? I was with a hot chick last night. I kicked him out, swearing loudly. However, he fell on the floor powerlessly, just like I did before, and he almost crawled away. I was confused, but soon, I thought to myself like this. No man can come here. Nobody. This must be mine. And I had visited her house, no, that abandoned house, every night since that day. The strange thing was that the women appeared only after midnight, and I had absolutely no idea where they came from and where they disappeared to. Just like sweet dreams, I almost lost all my memory next morning, and only some flashes of sweet moments remained in my head. However, I found different men lying next to me every day. 
One morning, I found two guys sleeping right next to me when I woke up, and one of them was the one who had already come here once before. I got extremely mad and yelled at him, I told you to piss off. I was about to slap his face. At that moment, he suddenly began to look so painful, grabbing his chest. I and the man next to him panicked. After a while, he just died. My brain suddenly became blank, and the other guy ran away screaming, If we sleep here, we are going to die. After pulling myself together, I called the police and they arrived soon. Carrying the body away, they said, I don't know what you guys were doing here, but you know how many people have died here? Healthy young men have died over and over again here. We are going to close this place and don't even think about hanging around here anymore. Understood? I got scared, but I couldn't get away from there because I was already deeply addicted. I locked up all the doors and openings of the house. This place must be mine. Nobody's allowed to get in. I spent every night there, and every morning, I woke up alone in this empty, dirty place, struggling with shame, fear, and regret. But I believed I had no option but to just repeat this for the rest of my life. Of course, I tried hard to push it out of my head, but I couldn't do anything but keep thinking about the women there over and over again, all day and night. Other men also sometimes came and asked me to open the door, yelling and knocking hard on the door. Then I brought a knife and threatened to kill them. They pounced on me, yelling like, she said she loved me. I fought with them and they ran away at the end. Although I got totally covered in blood, I shed tears of joy as I succeeded in defending from other guys anyway. A couple of days passed and nothing was left in my body but skin and bones like a skeleton. I don't know why, but I wasn't able to walk anymore. I had to just lie on a bed powerlessly from morning to night every day. Now, I wasn't able to go to work. Not surprisingly, I got struck with poverty. Besides living in the dirty place, I got all kinds of diseases because of unhygienic surroundings. Some weird liquid leaked from my eyes, nose, and mouth, and my vision became blurry and dark. Finally, I was taken to the hospital. The doctor said I was dying, and I would be in real danger if not treated immediately. Nevertheless, I was trying to get back to the abandoned house. So I was forcibly put in a mental hospital by my mother. But even in the hospital, I cried out loudly for the women every day. In a panic, I used to curse and swear at doctors and nurses. Then, I got shot with a tranquilizer and passed out. All this was repeated day after day. After several months, I slowly began to get better and better. And finally, everything around me got back on track, and I was waking up to reality. Yeah, the women there didn't love me. They were killing me. Curiously, however, I didn't remember their face, phone number, or whatever about them. Nothing left in my head. At the end of a very long treatment, I could get back to normal, and I've never been anywhere near the place until today. But I know that there are still many men going to that abandoned house, and that they will end up dead. But I can't save them, though. Once I put my foot in the house again, there will be really no turning back. So I warn you, if you meet these women by any chance, never follow them. They are not real. They are just an illusion, existing only in your mind. My name is Emma, and this happened to me a few years ago, back when I was in college. What happened was that two girls were missing in my town, and they were also some of my classmates. They both had blue eyes and brown hair, so one of my classmates, who I will call James, invited me to come over to his place. I didn't personally know him, but I told him sure, because I'm a nice person, and that I would be able to come over on a Saturday. To be safe, I asked my friend, who will be called Grace, to just park out James's house, and if I didn't come out in an hour, she would come in and ask where I was. This was just to give me a sense of safety. And thank God she said yes. 
Grace is a martial artist, so it gave a large sense of safety. So, Saturday came, and I went to James's house. We talked about school and whatnot, until I hear a mmph sound from the basement. I asked James what it was, and he just responded, I don't know either. So, when James went upstairs, now was my chance to check it out. The sound. I went down into the basement. It was nice, but I saw a door with an outside lock on it by the stairs, and the mm sound was definitely coming from there. I opened the door, and what I saw still somewhat haunts me to this day. What was in there were the two girls that had gone missing. I immediately recognized them, the blue eyes and brown hair. Their ankles and legs were tied up, as well as their torso being tied up from below their breast to just above their stomach. One of them had a piece of duct tape on her mouth, and another had a piece of cloth that went from below her nose to just on top of her chin. I gasped and then started trying to untie them, but then felt drowsy and fell down unconscious. When I awoke, I found out there was a piece of duct tape on my mouth and that I was tied up the same way as them. At first, I tried untying one of the girls' hands, as R had been tied in an X shape, so it would be easier to untie. However, when that failed, I remembered that Grace would come for us. So we waited for about 30 minutes until Grace would show up. When she did, we heard her asking about where I was, so we tried to scream through our gags. She heard it and asked to investigate, and we hear her coming down. She opened the door and was about to get tranquilized, but she disarmed him and knocked James unconscious. Grace untied us, and we called the cops. I have always thanked Grace for saving me. However, sometimes, nowadays, I ask myself what would have happened had I not asked Grace to come. When I was young, my father used to come home late at night. He, then, turned on classical music at full volume and cut something in the kitchen all night. On such days, when I woke up the next morning, I used to see him serving heaps of meat on the table, saying like, I can't believe it has this much meat. We could eat throughout the week. And he looked so pleased. One day, he came home with a dagger stuck in his thigh. Struck with fear, I was about to call 911, but he shouted, No, don't call 911, or my quarry will run away. Then, he did first aid and put a bandage on the wound by himself. After that, my father fell into a coma and woke up two days later. When I asked him what happened to him, he said, I was bitten by a wolf while hunting. I didn't understand what he meant then. Time passed, and I was about 12. One day, I woke up early in the morning and heard him humming in the kitchen, which was full of the smell of roasting meat. I walked closer to the kitchen and saw him cooking alone. Soon, he was going downstairs to the cellar. I also went after him to surprise on the sly. In fact, I hadn't been to the cellar because my father always kept it locked. I followed him to the cellar and watched him taking meat out of a large fridge. However, I saw the meat in the fridge. It was human meat. I shouted in panic, what the heck are you doing here? My father turned around and said, oh my boy, this is the most perfect meat on the planet. Fish, animal, none of those things can dare to compare to the taste of this. I ran upstairs screaming. He shouted from behind, you had it already. You know how tasty it is. Thoroughly confused and disgusted, I threw up. I had no idea what to do. I was just a little boy. And I turned 18. One day, my father put me in the car saying we're going camping in the mountains. After we arrived, he told me to lie and wait for a quarry. I said crying that I wanted to go home, but he gave me a hatchet and said sternly, now feed yourself on your own. I could see it was not a joke through his determined face. We pitched a tent there and had hidden ourselves for a couple of days. My food from home was already gone and I struggled hard to hunt small animals like a rabbit or something like that because I literally had nothing to eat. 
but my father didn't seem in the least interested in such things. After several more days, I finally found a climbing couple passing by in the area. When I was about to say hello, with the delight of seeing people after a long time, my father threw two sharp knives at them, and those exactly penetrated their necks. It took only about three seconds to kill the two on the spot. I screamed with terror while my father shouted with joy. Our voices echoed through the whole mountains like bizarre harmony. After that, he wiped off bloodstains around us using a special solution. Then he threw the dead bodies into the car and we came back home. My father gave me an old book, which looked decades old and worn out. Read it and master all the techniques in this book. Then you can be a great hunter like me. As he said, the book described dozens of perfect techniques to instantly kill a person. There were a variety of cruel and brutal killing techniques that we could not learn even in any army or martial art. It made me speechless with shock. I tried to persuade him to stop, saying like this was totally wrong, but he said, just try once and you will see how fun it is. I couldn't say a word. I thought to myself over and over again whether to call the police or not, but I couldn't put the only family I had in jail. And as usual, he had continued to hunt. Every day we had heaps of meat to eat on the table, and consequently, a number of their belongings had been also getting piled up in our house. But I couldn't eat the meat anymore. Since that day, I had just waited for the right time to leave. And one day, that incident happened that I could never forget for the rest of my life. When I came home from school, I saw him sitting at the table. I asked him what he's doing there, but he didn't answer nor move at all. I approached him and found his body had already gone ice cold. I was completely shocked. At that moment, I heard a man's voice behind me. Well, did he ever think about his last moments? The moment to be hunted by someone else? I looked back in fright and saw a man aiming at me with a bent bow. He was all dressed in a whole ghillie suit covered with green grass and leaves. I screamed in terror and started to run away desperately. But after a few seconds, his arrow thudded into the back of my ankle. I collapsed and started to crawl on the floor. Walking towards me with heavy steps, he said, Your dad ate up my friend. He pressed the knife close to my stomach as if he was about to stab me. And you had it too, right? Oh my god, please, please don't kill me! I put my hands together, pretending to beg for my life, and attacked his throat in the blink of an eye. He uttered a piercing shriek. He became unable to breathe and rolled around on the floor, grasping his throat. Yeah, it was one of the techniques I learned from the book that my father gave me. After, I picked up the knife right away and put it close to his neck. I called the police, and soon, the police arrived and they arrested the man. After several days, my father's funeral was held and all of our relatives gathered. However, one of my uncles whispered in my ear, consoling me. Did you learn how to hunt from your dad? If there's anything you don't know about hunting, just tell your uncles. Seriously, I am the best hunter on this planet. I stared at him in astonishment. He continued, nodding his head with a smile. Yes, it's the most perfect meat on the planet. I stormed out of the place, screaming like mad. Since that day, I had cut all connections with my relatives and moved out to a place where no one knew me. But even in my new place, I used to have nightmares almost every night. In the dream, I used to be chased desperately by those who were killed by my father. They popped up with their body parts cut off and cried out saying like, you ate me up. Then I woke up crying all in sweat. And it's been seven years since then. I still can't believe all this happened to me. Maybe because of that huge mental shock, I might have been making myself believe all this was not real. Now all my memories have become faint and even good memories with my father are almost gone. Even I'm actually not sure whether I really lived with my father or not when I was young. Nevertheless, there is one thing I still clearly remember. It is my father's happiest face while hunting. 
My name is Delilah, and this is my story. So, when I was around eight years old, I lived in a small town in Spain named Besalu Catalan. So basically, everyone in the town knew each other. All the parents knew the other parents and their kids. So I also knew all the parents and their kids. I always played outside with them from the time when I got home from school to the time our dinners were ready. I had these friends, and for the sake of this story, we're going to call them Sally and Thomas. To this day, these people are still my best friends. And when we were little, we were called the Three Musketeers due to how much time we spent together. It was a Saturday morning, and I had asked my mom to play outside. When I got out of the house, Sally and Thomas were already waiting outside for me. After a while, we decided on playing a combination of hide-and-seek and tag. I started counting, and Thomas and Sally ran away to hide. When I got done counting, I looked around for a few seconds, then ran to look for them. I searched for a few minutes and couldn't find them. There were these big trees behind our houses, so I decided to go look for them in there. After a while, I still couldn't find them and was about to give up when I heard leaves crunching. When I turned around, I saw a figure dart behind a tree. I thought I had found Thomas and ran to the tree. There was a man crouched down behind the tree. He had on dirty clothes and I heard him crunching on something. I tapped on him and yelled, found you Thomas, you're it now. The man slowly stood up. When I saw how tall he was, I realized he wasn't Thomas. He turned around and I saw blood and blue feathers around his mouth. He smiled at me and held out his hands. When I looked at them, I screamed. There was a bluish dead bird in his hands. He was eating the bird. I immediately ran back to my house and Sally and Thomas were there with my parents. Apparently, after half an hour of not seeing me, they went to my mom and father. They yelled at me for running off and sent me inside. Later after I had dinner, I went to bed. A few hours after falling asleep, I woke up to the sound of tapping on the window above my bed. It was on the side of my bed, and so I sat up and looked at it. There was the shape of a person tapping on my window with something. I opened the curtain of my window and saw the man from earlier tapping on my window with a sharp stick. When he saw that I was looking at him, he started tapping harder. I screamed and ran away. My parents came in and asked what was wrong. I told them all about today and what had happened. They called the police, and that was the last time I saw him. I just turned 18 a few weeks ago, and this is the first time I thought about this in a while. I still wonder what would have happened to me if I had stayed in those woods any longer than I did that day. This is a true story of mine, which I still get chills when I think of it. It was the winter in 1989. I was 15 back then. So winters in our state are very cold and even snowfall happens here. So my friend John had invited me over to a party at his house that night. I didn't want to go, but all of our friends would be there, so I decided to go. It was so cold that I wore a sweater and two overcoats. I set out for his house, which was around a mile from mine. So on the way, I saw a girl. She would have been around the same age as me. She was very attractive and was wearing a little old-fashioned clothes, long hair up to her waist, lavender pink dress, but they were indeed so beautiful. I went up to her and asked, hey, what are you doing alone on such a cold night? She asked me, are you going to the party? I replied, yes, and by looking at you, it seems that you're going there too. She said yes, and then we started walking together towards my friend's house. I haven't seen her before, but again, I only just came here a year ago, so it could be that I just never came across her before. I asked her, what's your name? And she told me, it's Julie. There were quite a lot of people at the party, so in the party, everyone seems not to know her. They thought she was my friend. I did not deny it. She had a very charming personality and she was with one group a moment and then the other group the next moment. Everyone liked her, but when the food and drinks were served, I noticed that she didn't eat or drink anything. As for me, 
I ate heartily and drank a couple of sips too. So it was time for me to go home as it was midnight. Julie also came with me and on the way back, it was very cold and Julie didn't have much protection against the cold so I gave her one of my two overcoats. We walked a few more steps and then I asked her, I'll drop you off, where do you live? She told me, there's a shortcut up ahead through the alleyway. I live just up there ahead in Wolfsburn. I will go there, but thanks for insisting to help. I told her, I had a great time with you. You can return the overcoat whenever you want. She came ahead and kissed me on my cheeks. And then we waved our goodbyes and went our own way. The next day, I was in awe of Julie. So I decided to meet her. I went up to that alley where she told me she lived ahead of there. When I went through, there was a house which was empty. No one lived there. It seemed like it was empty for years. Had Julie played a joke? I went up ahead and there lived the Taylor family. I went to their house and asked, does someone named Julie live anywhere near? I met her at the party yesterday and she told me she lived just ahead of the alley. When I went there, it was an old abandoned house. Mrs. Taylor told me, I don't think any Julie lives here anywhere. And about that abandoned house, it's called Wolfsburn House. The McKinnon family used to live there 40 years ago. They moved out when their only daughter had died. She stopped and gave me a queer look and continued. I think her name was Ju Julie. She had died of an accident. I think her grave is just up ahead in the cemetery. I got chills when I heard that. I thanked Mrs. Taylor and went on towards the cemetery. There were a lot of graves, but it didn't take me long to find Julie's and it was carved Julie McKinnon, 1933 to 1949. With us one moment, taken the next. Gone to her creator, gone to her rest. And there behind the grave, neatly folded, was my overcoat in the grass. To this date, I still remember her, her beauty, her charming personality. I will never forget her. It happened when I was in middle school, seven years ago. I lived in a small village and there was a man in my neighborhood. He lived in a small house next door and always walked around barefoot. So I used to call him Mr. Barefoot. Whenever I came across him on the street, he used to ask me to come over to his place. But my mother always told me to be careful of him because she had heard some screams of women from his house several times. Maybe she might have heard incorrectly, but she was still wary of him as she thought there was something fishy about him. However, I believed he was a good man. One day I met him on the street by chance. I grumbled at him that I was so tired of school. Then he said, smiling broadly, Oh yeah, you want to stop being annoyed by such crap and be free, right? I know how to set you free. Come over to my place and I'll show you. He held out his hand. However, just for a fleeting moment, I sensed something horrible about him. I mean, from his hand and his eyes, I felt like if I did hold his hand, he would just haul me into his place. I turned him down, saying my mom wouldn't allow it. His mouth was still smiling, but his eyes were not. He was actually frowning, and his hands were trembling. I hurried to school. When night fell, I wasn't able to sleep because of the irresistible lure of curiosity. So I went to his house on the quiet and peeped into his place through the window. In the house, he was eating bread with a glass of wine at a dining table covered with food. There were also women lying around on the couch and bed. It looked pretty weird, so I went home and I didn't take it too seriously. After that day, he would continue to shout at me whenever we happened to meet on the street. Set you free! One day, it was very noisy outside. I went out to see what was going on. Police officers. They were located at Mr. Barefoot's house. I heard a shocking thing, that three dead women were found inside. Each of them was lying on the couch, the bed, and the bathtub. What's weird? is that all three were iron chained by the neck and the chains were broken. On the back of their necks, carved with a knife, was largely written, free. I heard Mr. Barefoot yelling at the police. They're truly free at last, breaking away from the yoke of life. All thanks to me. 
The police handcuffed him and took him away. When the police asked him why he killed the women, he answered like this. Sir, what do you think freedom is? Only death is truly freedom, which has been desired by all humans. That's exactly what I gave them. Maybe foolish people think I am such a criminal or murderer, but I absolutely don't care about it because I know what I did was the only way to help them find true happiness. According to the investigation, he kidnapped the women, bound them with iron chains, and cut the chains off by hammering them hard. The women were killed while he was doing so. Not surprisingly, he was sent to jail. However, after some time, I received a letter from him. This is what the letter said. I feel so sorry. I am locked up here and cannot kill you. Because I can't get out of here, I will send you my messenger, who will kill you on my behalf. I know this is the only way to set you free, little boy. Believe me, and you will find true happiness. When you finally meet my messenger, put yourself in his hands. He will end your life just in the blink of an eye without pain. I can't wait to see you free, though I could only see it in a photograph. Till then, take care. After I read it all, I called the police right away, screaming. My father even hired a bodyguard for me. A few days later, a man really broke into my house. He choked the bodyguard with an iron chain until he passed out, then cruelly hammered the bodyguard's neck. While he was completely absorbed in hammering, the police finally arrived and took him away. The bodyguard was terribly wounded. The criminal was identified to be Mr. Barefoot's friend. It was so unbelievably horrible that just a couple of days later, my family and I moved out right away. Seven years have passed, and fortunately, nothing has happened to me until now. But deep down, inside me, I'm still awfully scared. Scared that he will send me a letter again. When I was in fifth grade, I had a best friend. At the time, exercising spells were popular, and all you needed to do was chant something. They said that your hands would raise without you trying to do it, and the spirits around you were the ones who were doing it. We were curious, so we watched the other kids do it, and my best friend asked me to perform the spell on her and see if it really worked. I refused at first because I was scared something bad would happen to her but she insisted, and then we went to do it. I chanted the spells in a loud voice and was laughing because nothing even happened, saying it was fake and made up. But a few seconds after, my friend's hair started to rise. But what was really weird was it rose up like something was holding her hair. To explain how it really looked, the hair was raised, but at only halfway down the length of the hair, which meant the hair was bending like someone's finger was holding it. We didn't notice it at first, but one of our classmates yelled, Your hair! And we looked at it ourselves, and I was really shocked to see it in front of my eyes. I was really scared, so then all of us ran inside our classrooms and my best friend kept crying. The next day, she said she had nightmares and she got cuts on her arms like scratches from something sharp. It was really creepy, and to this day when we talk about it, we still wonder what happened that time. When I was in the seventh grade, I had to call my dad, but because I'd left my phone at home, I couldn't call him. So I borrowed my friend's phone to call my phone and figured my dad should pick it up, because that day my dad was on a work break. Hello, dad, I said. And then someone in the phone answered, Hello, 
I hung up the phone immediately because the person in the phone call sounded exactly like me. Three days later, I was sick and did not go to school because of that. And I got a call on my phone, so I picked it up. Hello, Dad? I was surprised and turned off my phone after that. The person in the phone call sounded exactly like me again, and those were the words I'd said three days ago. I was scared, but didn't tell anyone except my friends, and when I told them, they wouldn't believe me. So, who was that on the phone with me? I still can't forget that day. Twelve years ago, I lived as a homeless person during some period in my 20s. It was a time when I used to walk the streets and survive on a single loaf of bread. One day, I was sleeping on the street and had a strange dream. In the dream, a monster with a hundred eyes was running towards me. I woke up screaming as the monster came right in front of me. It was a dark morning, and as my eyes began to adjust to the darkness, I realized that a stranger was standing right in front of me. I was so startled. Then he came right up to my nose and started groping my face with his hand. I shouted, asking what he was doing, being astonished. Then he stopped, put his palms together, and chanted strange incantations as he walked backwards. I can't remember clearly, but I think he said something like this. The visible world is fake. He was dressed like a monk and was walking with his eyes closed. I was so horrified, but was so tired and hungry that I didn't even have the energy left to do anything. So I just slept again. However, the next day I overheard other homeless people talking to each other. Is everyone okay? I think we're fine. Fortunately, everyone seems to have blocked it well. I asked them what they were talking about, and they told me something shocking. The story was that someone unknown was coming every night and secretly plucking out the eyeballs of homeless people. It was the so-called Eyeball Hunter. As soon as I heard that, I was shocked and stopped breathing for a moment because it seemed to me that he was the person I saw in the morning. Then I found out why so many homeless people here had no eyes. I was overwhelmed with too much fear, but it is rumored that he didn't kill anyone. One day, he plucked out the eyeballs of a homeless man, and the homeless man shouted that he would rather be killed. But the eyeball hunter left, saying that it was his principle not to kill humans. My whole body trembled hearing that. At that time, if I had only woken up three seconds later, I couldn't even imagine what would have happened. Only then did I find out why the homeless there were staying vigil every night. I've always thought that they were on watch not to be deprived of food, but I didn't know it was actually to protect their eyes. Since then, I decided to join a group of homeless people because I couldn't sleep on my own, and I was able to stay safe for a while, keeping a night watch in the group. Ah! Then one day, early in the morning, I heard a loud scream. Everyone woke up, but one homeless man was rolling around, putting his hands over his eyes. There was blood all over his face and on the floor, and I saw the back of the monk who was running at a tremendous speed in the distance. There is an eyeball hunter. I could hear people shouting and buzzing. We hurriedly called an ambulance and he was taken away. It turned out that the person who was on night watch fell asleep for a while, and it happened in the middle of it. We reported it to the police. I was really terrified and felt that I couldn't stay there any longer. I tried desperately to get out of there. Finally able to end my homeless life, I rented a small house and started my new life. After some time passed, I visited the homeless people I was close with. They welcomed me, and according to what they said, they heard that the eyeball hunter was caught by the police. And the eyeball hunter said to the police as follows, It is only after human beings see the world through their eyes 
that prejudices and sins arise. Only when you are not deceived by appearances do you know the true meaning of life. That is why I remove people's eyes, so that they can truly become enlightened. He believed it would save people, and he had no eyes either, it was self-removed. However, he said that he can see the world through his third eye, called Chakra, after long practice even though he has no eyes. How he sees is still a mystery, and I suddenly remembered one thing. On the day he first appeared in front of me, the black plastic bag he was holding in his hand. The bag contained several round shaped objects. I thought it was just fruit or something, but I just found out what those things were. I am still suffering from insomnia every day. He's in prison, but for some reason I keep thinking he's likely to break into my house. Now I sleep with my glasses on every day, because I feel like I can protect my eyes by doing this. I want to get out of this fear as soon as possible. If only I could erase him from my memory. I live in the UK, and I'm a 19-year-old guy, and I've been working at a bar for the past two years. I normally finish very early in the morning. This happened about a year ago, and I'll never forget it. It had started as a normal shift. I got there and started taking orders and making cocktails and all the stuff. And six hours went by and it was about midnight when two loud male customers who were in their mid-thirties at least came in the bar. They looked like they had been out all day and didn't seem to care what they had said or who they said it to. One of them stood about six feet and he had a slim build. He looked like he was an active drug user or something along those lines. And the other was about 5'9 with an unhealthy build. His face looked shabby and he had messy hair and yellow teeth. He made me feel uneasy, but I had to do my job. I approached them and asked if they would like to order a drink or anything and they both just looked blankly at me. I stood there looking at them both silently while music was blaring out of the speakers. I then broke the silence, saying I will come back over in a few minutes to ask again, and I went to another table. About two minutes had passed, and they ended up approaching a group of girls about my age, and wouldn't leave them alone. You could tell the girls felt uncomfortable. Now, I'm not saying I'm tough or anything, and I stand at about 5 foot 9 and weigh about 140 pounds, so I'm not exactly an intimidating person. But I went over and asked the girls if they were okay, and if they knew these guys who sat with them. They all looked at me, eyes widening, shaking their heads and saying, no, and they won't leave us alone. I sternly asked the men to move tables, and if I have to ask again, they'll be thrown out. They suddenly got up and glared at me with crazed eyes. I get this a lot at the bar I work at, so it didn't really bother me. They slowly walked past me and through the exits, and I thought that was the end of it. How wrong I was. The bar closed an hour after that, and we ushered out the rest of the customers so we could clean up at the end of the night. The girls who I helped thanked me and asked for my number and I politely declined saying I wasn't interested. After we had finished cleaning up the bar it was about 2am and one of my friends asked if I wanted a lift home. But I only lived a 20 minute walk from where I work so I politely declined and said I would see them tomorrow. I started walking putting one earphone in so I could listen to some music while walking home. I'd made it about 5 minutes into the walk before I heard a muffled scream coming from a small alleyway to my left. I took out my earphone and proceeded to listen again and sure enough, I heard it again. At this point, I called out asking if someone was there and if they were okay while slowly moving towards the sound. I pulled up my phone and shined my torch towards the noise. What I saw terrified me. The two guys from the bar had grabbed one of the girls from the bar and was attacking her, and for her safety, I'll leave it at that. Her eyes were crazed, pleading for me to help her, and I just stood there frozen. The two guys looked at me, and the smaller one said to me, you'd better turn around and leave boy or things are gonna get serious. It snapped me out of my fear, and I said trying to be as confident as possible, let her go or else. I said these words feeling terrified, 
And I think those guys could tell because he got up and moved towards me, raising his fists ready to fight. Instinctively, I responded by getting into a boxing stance. He swung his fist at me, and due to him being drunk, I easily moved out of the way. I clocked him on his temple, and he dropped to the floor, smashing his head against the concrete. I turned towards the girl and asked if she was okay until I realized the taller man had moved. He dived at me, tackling me to the ground. I panicked as we rolled around wrestling on the ground for a few seconds, and he pinned me to the ground. He started screaming at me and began punching me. In that instance, seeing his crazed eyes inches away from my face, I thought I was going to die. And in the corner of my eye, I saw the girl I had tried to save grab a spray and begin to spray it in the man's eyes. He let out a massive scream and fell backwards onto the ground, clenching his eyes. In that instant, I grabbed the hand of the girl and we ran all the way back to my house. We quickly got inside, locked all the doors, and we were silent for a good half hour. I broke the silence, asking her if she was okay and if she was hurt. She didn't reply, just sat there, curled up in a ball on the floor. I said to her, I think we should stay here tonight, and that I would take her to the police station early next morning. She nodded her head in agreement. I gave her my bed, I took some blankets and pillows, and tried to fall asleep on the couch, but I couldn't. In the morning, I kept my promise and took her to the police station and gave my description of the men. The officer said, thank you, and sent me on my way. He assured me he would take care of the girl now. I said my goodbyes to the girl, and she still didn't speak to me. I felt terrible about what had happened to her, but I was glad I was there to help. I had to miss work the next day due to being battered and exhausted from the night before. While I was at home, I saw in the news that two men were apprehended by the police and both locked away almost instantly. I hope they get what they fucking deserve. The scariest part of the story is what if I took the ride my friend offered? What would have happened to the girl? I dare not even think about it and I was lucky enough to save her. It all started with a knock on the door. It was around 10 p.m. The kitchen was right beside the front door so I could see the front yard. I looked out only to see a man with a mask looking right at the door. Then the lights went off. Whoever was at the front door had left and I could hear many windows being shuffled. I started fearing for my life. Shivers went down my spine. I am right now enrolled in the Durham Regional Police Academy to become a police officer in the future. So, in my parents' room, I put my gun, which was an RCMP model 3432, into a safe that my parents store money in. My mother, who also looked as frightened as I, said we should make a run for it into the backyard and sprint towards my uncle's house, which was three blocks away from us. But I looked towards the backyard glass sliding doors and I could see the silhouette of a man and realized it looked like he was holding a knife. My mother and I decided to hide in the basement as it had the most durable lock. We brought in kitchen knives and hid there in the vast darkness. My mother was crying, so I reassured her that everything was going to be okay. An hour went by, just staying there but not hearing any noises. My father should have been home by now, I thought to myself. We carefully went out of the basement and we saw that there was nothing. That's when I realized that I had a gun upstairs. I felt a little guilty as I'm learning to become a cop and cops are supposed to be investigate these kinds of situations. I didn't know the code for the safe so my mother opened it and I got out my gun. My mother was beside me with a kitchen knife as we went into every room to see if anyone had broken in. We didn't find anything, so we concluded that they were just kids who were ding-dong ditching. My mother was still paranoid as my sister's washer window was cracked open. Both my sisters were on a camping field trip as the school year ended. Due to my mother's paranoia, I slept with her in the master bedroom and I even brought my gun. She asked where my father was and I said, he's probably just busy. I went to bed, but awoke around 2 a.m. to hear my mother shouting. She was in the closet looking at something and something from the closet snatched her. I picked up my gun and pointed towards the closet, but something from behind me started strangling me. I twisted his arm and pointed the gun at him. The other man holding my mother pointed a knife towards my mother, but immediately I shot his hand. 
My shooting skills have succeeded as I successfully hit his arm and he dropped his knife. My mother picked it up as I let go of the man and pointed the gun towards both men. I told my mother to check the signal and electricity cable and she rushed to check. In a minute, the lights turned on and notifications were popping up on my phone. I picked up my phone and dialed 911 and my mother called my father. I unmasked one of the men and it was this 40 year old man with a lot of facial hair and looked frightened. I unmasked the other one and was shocked to see my father's ex-best friend, Tony. I remember meeting him a lot and my father and he were close, but this man got involved with drugs or something. My father saw his changes and decided that this will eventually turn into a toxic friendship, so left him. But he was very aggressive and my father was beaten up by him and his friends. My father ran back home and called the police on his best friend and at court testified against him and Tony was sentenced to 16 years in jail for illegal drug use. It had been 16 years, but I didn't know how he got to our location and why he would rob us. The police came and arrested them. Their car had weapons. My father didn't pick up when the police went to go see his office and he was not there. He left his work office five hours ago. My mother and I cried and they found my father's body the next day at a dumpster as it was wrapped in a garbage bag. He had 17 stab wounds. Both my sisters had to come back and we all cried. Tony and his friend, who we found out was named Tyler, were both sentenced to death. We had a funeral for my father shortly after. I still can't forget that incident. Three weeks after that incident, I rebuilt and styled the basement and put it for rent. I got a part-time job at Walmart and my mother and one of my sisters worked for my mother's friend who had a dress shop. That's how we kept the house as we didn't want to sell our house. I became a police officer at the Durham Regional Police and I've been working for 10 years. I purchased a new house, which was a two garage huge house for my sisters, mother and me. I rented my former house and I am 28 now. I'm going to get married this year. I was even told by my chief that I might be appointed as the chief of police for the Durham Regional Police. My life is going great right now, but I wish my father could see this and I could give him a big hug in person. Here in the Philippines, supernatural are very common and we have many scary urban legends and myths as well as scary monsters. I'm going to share my dad's experiences that nobody ever imagined he would experience. My parents are both teachers, and when I was seven, we transferred to the small island in the Visayas. My dad was a drunkard, but he's very good at his job as a teacher. Before, people didn't have any bathrooms, so we would just poop at this mangrove forest that was at the center of the island. We lived near the forest, so we would just take a poop there. I was 10 years old when this happened. One night, my mom asked my dad to help her with carrying stuff to the boat around 3 a.m. since she was pregnant and she had to be early at the seminar. My dad agreed, even though he was drinking that night. You might think why we need a boat. You see, it takes one hour to get to the mainland where the seminar takes place and before the lights were cut off every 12 a.m. so we would wait until dusk to get the energy power back. After my dad dropped my mom at the pier, my dad suddenly had to go to the bathroom but since we didn't have any bathrooms, he just pooped at my flower garden near the mangroves. When he was about to poop, he saw something from afar. He described it as a snake-like, but it was bigger and it was half pig. My dad continued to poop since he thought he was just hallucinating and it was just a pig, but he couldn't get the feeling out that something was wrong. He looked back and saw that there was nothing there. And when he pulled up his little flashlight, the light in the lighter. He was shocked that he hurriedly went inside the house, not even pulling his pants up, and hurriedly got the samurai he had. He gathered up the courage and he went back. The thing was not there anymore. He couldn't sleep, so he stayed up and told his friends about what he saw. He explained that he had seen something like an animal, but half was human, and this time the other half was that of a snake. When he turned the flashlight on, he saw very bloody red eyes, and that face was that of a human, but deformed, and he saw it near to him, only six meters away. His friends just laughed and told him that maybe it was just imagination, but he insisted it was not. Then suddenly, 
One of my neighbors came up to us and asked if we had a pig. A very big, black pig. And explained that he saw the pig around 1am near our backyard, where my dad had pooped. I watched my dad shocked. We realized that the thing was not just after hanging out there. It was after my mom that she was pregnant around that time. I don't know if you'll find this believable, but I saw with my own eyes. My dad was truly terrified around the time he encountered that thing. Back in high school, I was a school bully. Now, I'm a grown-up. But I still regret those days. Well, more specifically, what I regret is not about being a school bully back then. My regret originates from a terrible memory, which I'm going to tell you about now. In those days, I and my friends, Tom and Blake, used to hang out together and bully others. And there was one classmate in particular we victimized the most. I can't mention his name here, but we used to call him the Punching Machine. We often punched him and asked what our score was. Then he raided us, and we continued to punch him until each of us got a higher, more satisfactory score. He was a big guy, about six foot three inches tall, who used to be beaten by others. Even after we became adults, we often went to him and bullied him. One fall day, the sky looked exceptionally blood red, and it has bled into my memory as the day. While we were bullying him as usual, he suddenly put out his hand, saying this, It feels like I'm gonna cry. Please stop it or I'll cry and all of you guys will be dead. It froze us for a second, but soon, Tom burst into laughter and said, <laughs> If you cry, what? We are gonna be dead? <laughs> yeah, maybe. We are gonna die laughing, you dumbass. Then Blake said, Uh-oh, seriously. We have never seen him crying. Let's make it real today. <laughs> then this dude roared super loudly like a big lion and his tears started falling to the ground. It was the first time we saw him crying. His shoulders heaved like crazy, and he breathed in and out so heavily, like it was almost penetrating into the ground. When we realized he was getting enraged, he suddenly pounced on Tom and choked him. Tom struggled hard to escape from him, but he was no match for him at all. He squeezed Tom's throat with incredible power, and Tom's eyes were about to pop out of his head. Then, he threw Tom against the wall. Tom <laughs> slammed into the wall and just passed out. I thought he might be dead because Tom hit the wall so hard. He now started at me, and I looked to the side. Blake was already running away. I started shivering from top to bottom in fear. Walking slowly towards me, he said, My mom said no one can stop me once I cry, so she's never gotten on my nerves. Neither has my dad. Suddenly, pausing for a moment, he started writhing in agony and pulling out his hair. Then, he said in a low and cold voice, I'll give you... Three seconds. Run for your life. His eyes already turned into a murderer's. His pupils were red as if smeared with blood. I thought I had to run away, but I couldn't move my legs. Before I knew, he was already right in front of me. He suddenly lifted me up without any difficulty, just like picking up a basketball or something. And he hurled me down on the ground. As soon as I was thrown to the ground, I blacked out for a bit. After a while, I heard a police siren. Yes, Blake called the police. I opened my eyes and saw him. He was looking at me, standing still. He was still crying. He didn't run away, although the police siren was getting closer. And when he found me opening my eyes, he threw a punch at my face. I couldn't breathe. With his continuous punches, I was getting knocked out. He said, You want to live? Then stop my tears. There was nothing I could do but tremble in overwhelming fear. At that moment, the police finally arrived, and they told him to put his hands up. But he ignored them, 
and spoke in a low mumble, walking heavily towards the police. No one can stop me when I cry. Even police can't. The police shouted urgently. Stop, stop, or I'll shoot! But he didn't stop. Instead, he rushed the police officer just in an instant. The officer immediately shot a taser at him, but he didn't stop, even though he got tased. He picked up the officer and threw him. Then another officer ran to him to arrest, but he was also knocked down to the ground by his powerful punch, just like a piece of wood. And finally, with a bang, the sound of a gun, he stopped. After about three seconds, his knees touched the ground, and soon he fell to the ground. He was lying on the ground with his eyes wide open, not moving anymore. The officer checked his pulse on the neck, then sent the other officers a hand sign. He's dead. My vision was blurred, but I could see the police officers running to me in a hurry. I felt like this was all a dream. No, I rather wished it was just a dream, but it wasn't. Since that day, I have emotionally suffered so much from this memory. It completely changed my personality. I can't meet anyone. I'm cooped up inside the house all the time. It has been already 10 years. Although I'm getting better little by little, this trauma still affects my whole life. If I see anyone crying, I can't stand it, and I just run away. There was also a time that I fortunately had a girlfriend, but when she cried, I ran away, like an insane man. After some time, we just broke up. Many years have passed, but I still can't overcome this trauma. Remembering that day still makes me shudder, just like a helpless tree fluttering in the typhoon. Back when I lived with an ex in LA, California, I had an orange and white female pit bull named Missy. One night, when I took her out front in my yard to go to the bathroom, my next door neighbor, I recognized him but had never spoken with him before, was walking by. There was no other people around, and the street was completely empty besides him, myself, and my dog. He struck up conversation, and suddenly and abruptly, began quickly walking into my yard and right at me. He was big, gross, creepy, and probably in his 40s or 50s, while I was only 19. It was one of those moments where someone does one small thing that normally wouldn't seem threatening, but your instincts. Your feelings just immediately start telling you that something is wrong and you are in danger. My dog suddenly pulled at her leash, snarling and barking at the guy. She even had a line of fur down her back that was standing straight up. She was always the nicest dog, never acted that way. I guess her instincts were freaking out just like mine were. The man stopped dead in his tracks, stared at my dog with fear on his face then looked up at me and asked me, does your dog bite? And even though she never bit anyone, I lied and said, yeah, she bites, while looking him right in the eye and not blinking. He quickly backed out of my yard and rushed into his house and never tried to talk to me again, even though I lived next door to him for several years after that. Years and years later, after I had broken up with my ex I lived with, I moved back home to Oregon. I was bored one day, and I'd recently learned that there's a website where you can see if any sex offenders live in your neighborhood. I decided to check it out because I loved going for walks at night, but no longer owned a dog who could protect me. I looked up my area where I lived, then decided to look up the area I had lived in in California. A picture of that creepy next door neighbor popped up on my phone. He was a sex offender, and the whole time I lived there, I never knew. So that's the story of how my dog saved me from being attacked by my neighbor who was a sex offender. I loved that dog, and I miss her. This is a story about my friend Anna, who works as a flight attendant. A few years ago, she was on a returning flight from Southeast Asia. While preparing for takeoff, she got into a confrontation with a passenger. 
about the placement of luggage. The elderly man insisted that his personal belongings be stored separately from those of other passengers. But because he had not made a request for such accommodations in advance, the crew was unable to fulfill his wishes. Anna had recently started this job, and although she knew how to deal with many types of unhappy customers, this one in particular gave her a hard time. Eventually, a senior flight attendant stepped in and resolved the issue. But the old man was visibly displeased. Later, Anna was going around and taking trash from the passengers. When she passed by the old man, he held up a little wooden box and told her to dispose of it. The box was rectangular, roughly the size of an average palm, and its lid was carved with markings that looked like an ancient foreign script. Though hesitant at first, Anna did not wish to exacerbate the situation with this passenger, so she complied. The moment her fingers touched the box, Anna felt a strange sensation flow throughout her body, but it was only for a brief second. She didn't think much of it and continued down the aisle. About halfway through the flight was when Anna began noticing something wrong. She developed a slight headache and was feeling dizzy and weak. Attributing this to lack of sleep, she tried her best to power through, but it soon proved to be too difficult to do so. Her senior was aware of the situation and kindly escorted her to the crew resting area. After taking some Advil and a cup of water, Anna lied down for a nap. During her sleep, Anna initially sensed numerous tiny hairs brushing against her leg. She ignored it, thinking it was just the fuzzy blanket. At certain points, however, she did vividly recall experiencing pain. It wasn't excruciating to any degree, more like someone poking her knee with an extremely small needle. And each instant lasted for about a millisecond. Because she was so fatigued at the time, she simply shifted her position and continued to rest without opening her eyes. Upon waking some hours later, Anna felt refreshed and ready to return to work. She sat up from the bed to step into her high heels. But as soon as her right foot entered the shoe, she immediately pulled out because her toe had come into contact with an unfamiliar object inside. Unsure what it was, she was scared to reach in. Instead, she picked up the shoe, turned it upside down, and gave it a few knocks against the bedside table. To her surprise, a huge insect fell onto the ground generating a loud hiss as it landed. The insect had a red body with black dots on the back and white triangular wings that spanned the length of an adult hand. But that wasn't the most terrifying feature. The horror, which caused Anna to drop the shoe, dash out of the room and scream at the top of her lungs, was the sight of four hairy tentacles protruding from the insect's rear. It looked like a product of breeding moths with centipedes, a creature you might find in a sci-fi film, whose protagonist was a mad scientist. Needless to say, it was an embarrassing moment for Anna, running from the resting area to the cabin, where her colleagues and passengers could witness her terror. A male flight attendant quickly came to her aid and, after hearing her account of the incident, decided to investigate. Anna, still in shock, opted to stay where she was. As she stood there in her stockinged feet, hair in a mess from sleeping, she nervously glanced at the passengers. What she saw sent chills down her spine. The elderly man, whom Anna had argued with earlier, was staring straight at her with a grim expression on his face. His body was stationary, but his lips were moving nonstop as if chanting some sort of ritual, even as she paced around the cabin, anxiously anticipating what the colleague would find, the man's eyes would not leave her. Ten minutes passed, and the male flight attendant came back to report that a thorough search of the room yielded nothing. He comforted Anna by suggesting that she probably just experienced a hypnopompic hallucination, ones that occur at the end of sleep. This explanation put her fear at ease, though 
only temporarily. While buckling up for landing, Anna's skirt had slid up just enough for the senior flight attendant to catch a glimpse of something strange. Did you bump on something? The senior inquired. Anna followed her colleague's gaze to her left leg. On the inner portion of her knee, barely visible through her skin-toned pantyhose, was a linear patch of darkness, about three to four centimeters in length. She rubbed the area. It didn't hurt, and the skin was not raised. Unsure of what it was, she shrugged and answered, I guess I must have. Exhausted after a 20-hour flight, Anna returned home and headed straight for the shower. While undressing, she took a closer look at her leg, and that's when she realized the dark patch on her skin was actually a set of irregular markings which resembled the inscriptions on the wooden box that the elderly passenger handed her. She then immediately remembered the prickly pain she felt during her nap on the plane. The location of the pain was exactly where the marks were. In a state of panic, she hopped into the shower. But no matter how hard she scrubbed, the dark spot would not fade. Since then, certain types of insects seem to have an affinity for Anna, often appearing at unexpected places around the house. More than once, she found them under the blankets as she was getting ready for bed. Other times, she would awaken in the middle of the night to find them crawling on her. Consequently, she has been living in constant fear of her surroundings, not knowing when a bug might come out to attack her. To this day, Anna still has that mark on her leg. Whenever anyone questions her about it, she would recount the horrible experience on that flight. I have personally examined the mark, and though I'm more inclined to believe the squiggly patterns are just an uncommon variation of varicose veins, after all, flight attendants do spend a majority of the day on their feet. Anna insists that the old man had somehow placed a curse on her when she came into contact with the mysterious wooden box. Though I can't say I agree with this theory, there are certain points of the story I am unable to explain. For example, if the markings on her leg were indeed due to varicose veins, why had nobody noticed them before? Did they magically appear right after Anna's encounter with the old man? And why are there suddenly all these insects around her? Was all of this really just a coincidence? When I saw him for the first time, he caught my attention at first sight. Ethan. He had a handsome face and was always surrounded by women. The reason I approached him actually was that I wanted to be as popular as he was with the women. Yes, it was me, no one else who approached him. It was me who drove myself into the pit of evil. When I was a freshman in college, I went and got close with him, and we quickly became best friends. But at some point, there was something odd about him. It was the rotten smell from him I had never smelled before. I said to him half-jokingly, do you work at the fish factory at night? But he just looked at me without any change in his facial expression. There were also days when the smell was particularly strong, and each time he looked very tired. My other friends and I had more and more questions about him over time, but when we asked him, he never answered. What's even creepier was that when I shook hands with him, or even touched him, the smell lingered on my body for several days. I couldn't stand it, so I asked him what on earth was causing the smell. Then he applied an ointment-like toothpaste under my nose and replied this, Wait, you'll soon start smelling this scent on your body as well. He even laughed out loud. But one day, he stopped coming to school. He didn't even answer me, and I was worried about what had happened to him. In the meantime, I heard a rumor about him. The rumor was that he went to prison. I was shocked, but there was a more shocking fact. And at the same time, I found the cause of the smell. What was revealed by the police was that he was dealing in human corpses. 
He was making a fortune buying and selling undamaged corpses through the dark web. It was difficult for the police to find evidence because some time had passed since he had already made transactions through the dark web. Recently, one student from our school went missing, and during the process searching for him, Ethan's crimes were revealed. The missing friend was found with a cold body in the basement of Ethan's house. In the basement, there was a specifically constructed coffin to keep the body from decaying. Also, there were several drugs to use to embalm the corpses. He had made a lot of money from these deals and had plans to buy land and move very far away. When I heard this news, I was greatly shocked and I got goosebumps at myself who had tried to be friends with such a person. Eventually, time passed and everything was slowly forgotten, but there is one thing I still can't forget. It was something Ethan had said to me before. One day, he suddenly invited me to go swimming with him at his house. The swimming pool at his house was strangely large and deep. The water was so deep that you actually couldn't see the bottom. I didn't go into the water because I was scared. He teased me for being a coward and tried to push me into the water, but I stepped away and didn't go in. And now that I reckon about it, that decision likely saved my life. For some reason, the feeling of fear I felt that day, I don't think it was just because of the depth of the water in the pool. There was something in his eyes and expression that gave me goosebumps. If I had jumped into that pool at that time, I would have probably ended up lying in the coffin he made, and like the other victims, I would have been sold to someone without a trace, and I would have given him another big paycheck. It's Hansiki Chaudhry, and I am from India. This is not a horror story, but an emotional one. This all started this year when my maternal grandfather got sick one day and my mom and dad went to meet him, but unfortunately he died. After that, my father gets symptoms of COVID and headed home, so me and my brother were staying with my grandmother. After coming home, he starts to get so much fever and cough that he has to be admitted to the hospital. He stayed there for five days and died on April 30th. After getting the news, I fainted, but days after that, we started to get our normal life back. But one night, my father came into my dream, and he was in the car with me. We were driving somewhere, and then the car stopped to a dark bridge. I see him get out of the car and start going somewhere. I immediately stopped him and asked him where he was going, and he said he didn't know, and then I became aware that this was the last time we would see each other. So we both hugged each other and started crying. I said he had a dangerous type of coronavirus. Then I asked him what we'd do in our life. He answered, saying that he didn't know. Then I noticed a man standing behind him, and I asked my father who he was. My father said that the man was trying to take him somewhere. I cried some more, and then we said our final goodbyes. After that, I never saw my dad in my dreams. I really miss him. I know he will never come back. So the only message I want to give you is to try to spend time with your parents and siblings because they could vanish at any time. Now, I wet myself just by thinking about Omegle. If I could go back to that day, I would never go on Omegle. One day I turned on Omegle and got connected with a man wearing a zombie mask. I heard his voice behind the mask. Oh, hey, you're either very lucky or unlucky to meet me on Omegle. He lowered the camera slightly and behind the man, one person was rolling around on the floor, grabbing his face. He was letting out a great painful groan. I was shocked and shortly tried to leave the chat room right away, but he continued talking. Aren't you curious why this guy is doing this? I was trembling silently without saying anything. Why didn't I leave the room that time? I think it was just because I was so curious to be honest. He said, My hubby is to turn on Omegle whenever I get bored 
and pick and kill one of the people I meet. There are so many different people in this world. Do you know how thrilling it is to be able to choose the one you want? It's easy to find the IP address like this. After a while, he started talking about the names of the streets near my house. I clamped my hands over my mouth in shock. Then he said, I'm going to ask you a simple question from now on. If you answer correctly, I'll let you go. But if you answer incorrectly, you'll end up like this guy. So, let's begin. First question, why was this guy picked by me? Guess the answer. He pointed to the man groaning on the floor. I was perplexed. Then he said, Oh yes, if you disconnect intentionally, your life will end too. <laughs> I was thinking about how to get out of this situation. Thousands of thoughts popped into my head during that moment. At the time, my whole body started sweating, and he said, Don't drag it on too long. I'm a type of person who gets very upset easily. I stammered. Uh, that... Did he make you angry? He hit the desk and said, Of course. When I took off the mask, this guy looked at my face and distorted his facial expression. I asked the guy how my face was like, then he said, I'd rather die than live with a face like that, and he laughed like it was really funny. After hearing that, I made up my mind to make him as he said. Then he slowly took off his mask. Under the mask, his face was severely crushed as if all the skin had melted away. He continued talking. I went to his house and poured hydraulic acid on his face to make it look the same. Then he grabbed my leg, saying, Please save me. I said, Didn't you say that you would rather die than have a face like mine? Then he rubbed his palms together and begged for forgiveness. I said to him, I will give you three days. Do what you said with your mouth. And three days passed, but he didn't do anything. That's why I brought him here now, to kill him. <laughs> How is it? Isn't it funny? I was shivering from top to bottom in shock and couldn't say anything more. Then he said, Now, you tell me, how do you like my face? He was smiling brightly with a blood-stained face. When I hesitated, he held up a piece of paper with my home address which was written on it. Tell me right now. If you don't answer, I'll get to you now. I said, uh, I like your face. I really didn't know what to say. I thought it was the best option. Then he answered, Oh yeah? So do you want to be just like my face? I couldn't answer. Then he said, Why? Don't you want to be like this? Why? You said you liked it. He started to freak out. Then he madly slammed the desk and kicked the man lying behind him. The man's moans of pain echoed through the room. My whole body started to tremble with fear like crazy. I didn't know what to do. He calmed down after a while and spoke to me. I'll give you three days. You too, you must pour hydraulic acid on your face and make yours look like mine. I'll be at your house in three days. If you don't make your face look like this, you will die. Keep what you said. You said you like this face. And I lost connection with him. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. I reported it to the police. However, since there was no evidence, the police only told me to contact them immediately if anything happens. On the third day, on my way back from work, I saw a man wearing a zombie mask and wandering around in front of my house. That almost made my heart stop. I immediately called the police. Luckily, he was immediately caught by the police. He was holding hydraulic acid. However, he told the police that he was also a victim and that he was just doing what he was told. 
He said that a man he met on Omegle threatened him, saying I will kill you unless you do what I order. The police unmasked him, and he really wasn't the guy I met on Omegle. Since then, I live in great fear every day. But after a while, I heard that the man who came to our house had been hit in his face with hydraulic acid. The police struggled to catch the criminal. I moved out right away. A few months later, I heard shocking words along with the news that the criminal has been caught by the police. It was revealed that the criminal had so far sprayed hydraulic acid on seven people and killed one. The fact that I was also so close to the tragedy made me sit down on the spot and I couldn't get up for a long time. After that day, I never talked to a stranger on the internet again. I am a 23 year old woman. I used to live in a pretty urban area in India when I was 19. I have always loved reading horror stories, just because it's very interesting and there's always something new to read. I never believed in such stories though, because my head can't wrap around the fact that there's something other than the animals and humans we see that can affect our lives, or something that can harm us. Until this one night. I still think that someone out there can explain what happened to me that night. I was living alone in an apartment building. It was in the heart of the city. Restaurants, malls, all around. Hustle bustle all day and night. Nothing scary happened there. It was so alive that my room would still be lit at night with all my lights off. I have always slept with my curtains closed. Curtains too thick to let any light through. And a nightlight on. It was a chilly night, so I was using a very thin, bedsheet-like blanket to keep me warm. I dozed off pretty quickly, but I woke up sometime in the night. I had a king-sized bed and was sleeping near the edge facing my right. I was woken up by a pulling sensation, like someone was pulling my blanket. It wasn't the typical horror movie style pulling the blanket from the feet. It was a jolting pull. I turned to my left, but nothing was there. At least, I saw nothing. Then I noticed that every nightlight in my house was switched off. I shrugged it off as a power outage. Although I had a backup battery, I assumed it had been exhausted too. I turned around to go back to sleep, but that's when I felt it again, but this time with greater strength. With the complete sense that nobody's there with me, my body froze. The blanket started pulling up and down, basically in every direction as if it wanted to remove it from my body. And finally, it did. The blanket started scuffling and folding aggressively behind my back. That's it. No grunting, humming, mumbling, or even creaking of my bed due to such chaotic activity. Just aggressive scuffling of the blanket in the dead silence of the night. It was very close to me, as I could feel the air from the blanket movement on my neck. My heart started jumping out of my chest, and I started crying, and then fainted from all the fear. I woke up the next morning on the same side and in the same position. My blanket was thrown all the way to the other side of the bed. I looked into the mirror and saw rashes around my neck due to the blanket pulling and rubbing. I lived there for a couple more weeks before I moved out, but thinking about that night, it still keeps me awake all night. A few years ago, my mom went to do laundry. Right next to the laundry is a deli that my family likes to eat at. Me and my brother decided to go and help my mother, though we mainly went with her for the food. After about 10 to 15 minutes, me and my brother got bored, so we decided to wait outside on the bench right in front of the laundry where my mom can see us. Five minutes after that, an old, thin, wrinkly man who looked to be about in his late 50s or early 60s came out of the laundromat and sat down on the hood of a parked car. Me, being the young and shy kid I was, 
I stopped talking and started looking at the ground to avoid eye contact with him. My brother did the same while fiddling with his fingers. I remember thinking to myself, that's definitely not his car, since I remembered seeing a young man get out of the car that the old man was sitting on. For the next five minutes, the old man stared at me and my brother with an unsettling smile while muttering something that I thought sounded like complete gibberish. I started to feel bad for the guy, since I thought he was either mentally ill or completely drunk. After a while, I couldn't stand the unbearable awkwardness and I said to my brother in a voice loud enough for the old man to hear, I'm gonna go see if the food is ready, since my mom had ordered the deli food a little while before that. I then got up and started walking to the deli, which was about 30 feet from the bench I was sitting on. I was expecting my brother to catch on to what I was doing and start following me away from the man, but him being his stupid self, he didn't. When I noticed he wasn't following me, I rolled my eyes, walked back to the bench and whispered to my brother to follow me. He did and we stayed inside the deli for a little while before walking back inside the laundromat where we found our mother. About 30 minutes later, we all left the area with our food and proceeded to get into the car. Before we left, I looked out the window and saw the old man. He looked different this time though. He had a huge smile on his face. His teeth were yellow, stained, and sharper than usual. His eyes were unnaturally wide, and I could tell he was mumbling something gibberish again. While my mom was searching for her keys, the old man walked up to the window and held out a note. The handwriting was terrible, but I could make out the words. I always like them better when they're scared. See you again soon. I then looked at the bottom of the stained paper and saw a drawing of a bunch of little girls crying. Their limbs were stretched, making them look like monsters. I felt sick. I suddenly lost all my appetite for the food my mom had just received. I did do something though. Even though I was a shy girl, I still stood my ground. I made a disgusting face at him. The old man stretched his face into a frown. As my mom started the car, the man said in a loud, dark, and scary voice, Bye bye little girl, I hope to see you very soon. My mom drove off and me and my brother, who had seen all of this as well, just stared at each other in utter shock and disgust. As me and my brother were very young kids, we thought that forgetting about this would have been better than telling someone. I also believed the man would come after me if I ever told on him, so I kept quiet from everyone and decided to live in fear instead. I've never seen or heard from that man again, thankfully. I hope it always stays that way. Remember to stay safe out there and do what I wish I had done. Tell someone. Tell an adult like your parents, guardians, or if it gets to a more serious point, the police. My name is Sky, and I'm going to tell you something that happened to me when I was young. It was May of 2011, and I was only four at the time. I was at home with my Uncle Jason as my mom had gone out with friends and said she probably wouldn't be back until 5 a.m. So my uncle and I stayed up all night watching movies. I eventually got tired and told my uncle that I wanted to go to bed. At around 3 a.m., I woke up for no reason at all and I looked out the window. I saw a figure standing in the middle of the road. At first, I thought it was my mom and her friends, but then I noticed that there was only one person. Suddenly, in one swift movement, the figure ran to my window and tapped at it with a fast speed with his slender finger and kept saying, I'll be coming every night and I will get you, Sky." I froze. It it knew my name. When the tapping slowed down, it made a very loud, ear-piercing scream, and then it faded away. It took me a few minutes to gather my strength to move again. But once I did, I ran to my uncle and shook him awake. I told him what I saw. He looked at me and asked me what he looked like. I described him the best I could, and that's when he told me that what I saw was a person of some kind who was going to seriously hurt me. He meant kill me, but he didn't say that because I was so young. 
and he said he would always protect me and he would always be here for me. It's been 10 years since I saw that man, and my uncle died in September. I still haven't told my mom about this, but I plan to one day. But I still dread to think what would have happened if my uncle wasn't there, and if the man had managed to get into the house. I know how my whole family will die. I know that's not something you would typically hear out of a 13-year-old female. However, I've been having these dreams for years. Now, I'm a lucid dreamer, so some could say it's just my imagination, but I don't think so. I grew up in a big city, but would always go to the coast where some of my family lived for summer vacation. A couple of days before school let out, I had one of these dreams for the first time. My grandpa was in the hospital and he suddenly fell to the floor checking in. I kept hearing this voice in my head saying, walk to him, help him up. I listened to this and moved towards my grandpa, who was now slowly rising from his own body. I then woke up to a loud buzzing in my ear. I had this dream a few more times, not thinking much of it as I don't dream very often. In the summer of 2017, I went on my usual vacation. Everything seemed fine the first day. I was hanging out with my cousins and my grandma had her back surgery the next day. However, when I went to bed that night, I had that specific dream. Only this time the ending changed. Instead of my grandpa rising from his body, he was screaming and the doctors rushed to him, pushing me out of the way. I then woke up to a loud pounding sound. At first I thought a picture frame had fallen, but when I looked around the room, everything seemed to be in place. I went out into the hallway to look. All of a sudden there was more pounding sounds. I wandered into the kitchen to see if that was where the pounding was coming from, only to meet my two older brothers standing there, whispering amongst themselves. I was pretty startled by them as they caught me by surprise. It was seven in the morning, and they usually don't wake up until ten. I asked them if they had heard the pounding too. They hadn't. Now that I knew this pounding was only in my head, I told them about my dream. They were confused, but they said something shocking. My parents left to go to the hospital hours prior. It was my grandpa, a code blue. Come to find out, my grandpa had died due to a heart attack waiting for my grandma to get out of surgery. I also had a few more dreams where I predicted my other grandpa dying of cancer, right as he was told he was cancer free. Recently, I've been having dreams about my parents. Two dreams, specifically. The first one was just of my mom. She was kayaking on a lake that we usually go to on vacation. Her kayak flipped over, and she drowned. However, since I moved to the coast last year, my dreams have changed. My parents would always be in the car with my younger sister, and they'd get into a huge four-car crash with eight fatalities, three of them being my family. I'll save the details for next time. For now, let's hope not all dreams come true. My name is Vicente. This happened to me when a few months ago, and I am currently 25. I was born in a small town in the jungle in Colombia. My mom and dad were very proud to be 100% Colombian. I only spoke Spanish until I became a fluent English speaker when I was in college because I recently attended an exchange program in Canada. I met my wife on the trip. Her name is Akardi, and she came from Osaka, Japan. When we both finished college, we moved to my old village in Colombia. Akardi works a job at home and I work as an electrician. I was called to work on a power outage at an old office building. It was always sort of normal for power outages in our area because we live in the middle of the jungle. So I drove to the location and I got to work. 
The weird thing was that the building was 20 miles from our village. I mean, there was an office building isolated in the jungle. Usually, I only get calls within one to two minutes away. When I was trying to fix the wires, there was something very creepy, in my opinion. I noticed wires that were just ripped open in a way that it looked like someone or something bit out of it. I assumed it was some animal from the jungle since there was a massive hole in the wall. The power came back on, so I went to my truck and I started to drive back when I got a call from my wife. Hey babe, I headed to the market so I'll be gone for a few minutes when you get home, said Akardi. Okay, I'm about 12 minutes away. Love you. Adios. I said. I got startled by a random pop sound on my way home, so I pulled over to the right near a palm tree. It was about 10 p.m., so it was pretty dark out. I got out, and to my shock, instead of a pop tire, it was completely gone. Then I was scared when I found that my spare tire was completely torn to shreds. I called my wife and told her to come pick me up in her car. I suddenly heard a whistling sound come from right next to me. But when I looked to the left, nothing was there. My mom always told me to beware of El Silbon, which means the whistler in Spanish. It was a Colombian urban legend of a man who killed his father and fed the meat to his family. When his grandfather found out, he hired a witch to curse him. When El Silbon was starved to death, his spirit a tall man wearing a tank top and overalls with a large farmer's hat roamed the jungle with a bag of bones. They say when he sounds very close, he is far. And when he is close, he sounds far. I kept on hearing the whistling right in my ear, but I still was freaked out by this in the dark jungle. I was all alone in the jungle. I wish that was true, but I wasn't alone. The whistle started sounding a little bit more quiet by the minute. By the time it was almost gone, I was relieved to see headlights up ahead. I started walking towards it thinking that was a cardi, but instead I saw a man with an old farmer outfit carrying a bag just staring with his yellow glowing eyes. I froze in fear as he started charging at me. Then I heard an engine coming close, and so did the mysterious man. I was shocked to see him not run, but disappear into the thin air. A cardi pulled up and we both were scared when we heard a woman screeching. Get in, Vicente. I ran into the car and saw the man stare at us. When we got home, Akarti and I got in the bed and she kissed me and we went to sleep. Her back was facing me and she asked if I knew what the woman was screaming for. I nodded my head and then realized she couldn't see me. And I said yes and explained the story about the man that I encountered. She immediately turned over facing me with a pale face full of fear. My wife had always worried about me, and I loved that about her. But I didn't think she would have believed that this man or thing could just disappear. To my shock, she did. I saw that man first a week ago when I was taking a night walk. I saw him suffocate a man and throw him into a bag while whistling. She fell asleep hugging me. I normally wouldn't fall asleep in that position, but I felt safer that night for some reason. I still wonder what would have happened if Akardi didn't arrive at the time that she did. Would I have ended up in the bag like the other man did? <laughs> Back in 2012, when I was four, me and my mom and stepdad lived in an apartment. All was good until one night. I went to sleep on the couch and my mom was in the chair. We were watching some boring show, so I dozed off. At around 2.30 a.m., I was woken up by something touching me, but it wasn't my mom. It was something in the couch. I started screaming, and then the hand went away. My mom, who is now awake, ran to check on me. I told her what happened, and she didn't believe me. She just told me to go back to bed. I told her I was afraid, so she stayed with me until my stepdad came back. Fast forward a few weeks later, one night I laid back on the couch. At around 1 a.m., something kept touching me again. I screamed, and my mom and stepdad ran to check on me. I told them what happened again, and my mom again didn't believe me, but this time my stepdad did. Later on that night, me and my stepdad were on the two lazy boy chairs and were watching Family Guy. My stepdad dozed off, and I was about to as well, but then something caught my eye. 
There were hands sticking out of the couch. I was so shocked I couldn't scream or yell for help. My stepdad woke and saw the blank expression on my face and saw what I was looking at. He sat there in shock just like me. The hands were waving and then we heard a voice. It said in a deep voice, One to hold my hand? I screamed at the top of my lungs after it said that to me and my stepdad. We ran out of the living room and into my mom's room. We explained what happened and my mom was in shock. We stayed at a motel that night. The next day we went back to pack our stuff and we left the creepy place. To this day, I still don't know what that was that me and my stepdad saw, but whatever it was, I know it was demonic and I never want to see it again. My name is Zane. I was five years old when this happened. My father always took me to this doctor. I quote the word doctor because personally I don't think he was a real doctor. We went a lot, but mainly we went on the weekends. The place had all sorts of Spongebob items laying around, and I was only a child there, but since I was so young I never entirely questioned it. The doctor was a tall black male who always wore a suit. Every time we went it'd be the same thing. He'd take my blood, give me around 5 or 7 shots, and some shots I was even pinned down for. My dad and uncle were usually the ones who took me, my mother was never there. The room we went in for the so-called appointment would always be so weird and creepy. It always had extremely dull lighting. Now before I continue, this place looked and felt like an actual prison. It was grey everywhere, and those barbed wire fences surrounding it. One way in, and one way out. When I started kindergarten, all of the visits were stopped. We never went again. Around the time I started middle school, my dad put that place down as my doctor and my emergency contact, even when that in fact was not my doctor's office anymore. To this day, my dad, uncle, and my mother, who was aware of these things that were happening, do not remember this place at all. I explain it to them thousands of times, some more detailed than others. It drives me insane that I'm the only one who remembers and I can't remember the name since I was so young. So please be aware of your surroundings and who's with you. This is a story my grandmother told me when I was 9 years old, and it still gives me goosebumps. I love to listen to stories, even though I'd usually get scared. However, the story I'm about to explain is by far the scariest. There was once a boy, let's call his name Timothy. He had a habit of taking fruits and vegetables from the neighbor's garden along with his friends, Michael, Desmond, and John. They were always later scolded by their parents, but this habit didn't change. One day, they decided to steal from an old lady around 85 years old, which was the greatest mistake they made. The old lady had maize and fruits in the garden. Timothy jumped over the fence and the others followed along. The old lady became alarmed by a thud coming from her garden followed by the sounds of dry leaves whenever someone walks over them. The old lady remained on the spot, which was surprising as they could be murderers. <laughs> Timothy and the gang began to harvest the fruits until they saw the silhouette. To their surprise, it wasn't the silhouette of a person, but something thin and broom-like. When they saw the creature in front of them, they were paralyzed. In front of them was a living scarecrow crawling from the fence into the garden. They couldn't run away because they were already stiff. It was then that it dawned on them. The old lady was actually a witch who killed her husband and created a scarecrow from his flesh. No one knows what the old lady did to the kids. Can you help me? 
My name is Natalia, and this experience still traumatizes me to this day. Me and my parents moved into a new house, and the house was barely built, so my dad and his friends went to go paint the walls of our house, and my mom was back in our old house getting our things, and I was at the new house taking care of my little sister. At night, my parents had to go to the store to get more paint, and they told me to stay home to take care of my little sister, and then left. My little sister was in the living room sleeping, and I went to my room. I was tired and totally forgot that my sister was in the living room, so I fell asleep. But while I'm half asleep, I hear glass break, and I get up quickly and hide in my closet until I remember my baby sister was down there. I quietly went down the stairs and snuck into the living room. Thankfully, my baby sister was still sleeping, so I picked her up. But the moment I grabbed her, I heard something coming through the kitchen. I slowly went over to check. In the kitchen, there was a man going through our trash can and eating everything in it. He turned around to look at me, and I ran up the stairs and went to my closet. I was crying as I stayed in there, and I heard footsteps coming from outside my room. He said, don't be afraid of me, I just wanted to eat. But now, you're my next meal. I stayed silent and put my baby sister down. Then I got a hammer that was in my closet and went out. The man was outside the door and I hit him in his head 14 times until I heard my baby sister crying. I got her and went outside, then sat there with my bloody hands and shirt. Five minutes go by and my parents come home. They asked me what was going on and, still in shock, I told them everything. They called the cops and they took him to the hospital, but on the way to the hospital, he died. I told them it was self-defense, and a few days later we sold the house. Two years later, the news came up, and it showed our old house, the house that I killed the man in. A girl's body was found in the bathtub, with her legs cut off. And I wonder, what if I was that girl? This took place in the summer of 2020. This was the summer when COVID was happening, so I couldn't really go anywhere, but I went to the neighborhood pool and swam for a bit. It was relaxing because I was the only person there, then I got out and tanned for a little bit. Now, I've always been very self-conscious about my body, so I never wore a bikini, but this year, I decided to actually wear one. So I was laying there tanning, when this older man, probably in his 30s, walked into the pool area and started setting up in the chair right next to mine. Now usually this wouldn't be a big deal, but seeing that no one else was in the pool area and all the other seats were open, it did kind of worry me. I decided to brush it off and put in my earbuds. Another thing I should mention is that I had never seen him in this neighborhood which was weird because I knew everyone because it was a small neighborhood and no one knew had moved in. This was red flag number two. So I was just laying there as this guy gets into the pool and swims around for a bit. Then I hear him say something. I couldn't quite make it out, so I paused my music and took my earbud out. He was talking to me. I thought, oh, well, he's just being a friendly person. So I said what? and he repeated his sentence. Why don't you come swim, he said. I told him that I already swam and now I was just tanning. Then he said, Oh, your little body is tan enough. Come swim with me, it'll be fun. This made me very nervous and I didn't know what to say. I have this very bad thing where I get scared to tell people no. So me being the dumb 16 year old girl that I was, I got up and walked into the pool. On the outside, I was just kind of smiling and laughing and pretending to have a good time, but on the inside, I was terrified. Suddenly, he swam over to me and grabbed my wrist and started pulling me to the deep end. Oh, it's, it's okay. I'll stay in the shallow end. I'm too tired to swim right now. But he said nothing. We got to the six-foot end of the pool, and he said, Want to play a game? 
At this point, I was very scared and having trouble treading the water. I said, I'd rather just get out. And he responded, Oh, come on, we'll get out after we play this game. But instead, I got out. Now, you would think I would leave the pool, but again, me being the stupid person I am, I just laid back down. Then he walked over and scooted his chair even closer to mine. He then started touching my hair, so I pulled my hair away and got up. I started gathering my stuff, but all of a sudden, he jumped up and said, Where are you going? I tried to get around him, but he shoved me in the pool and grabbed me by my shoulder and said, Now it's time to play that game. And he shoved me under the water. I was there for what felt like forever, struggling, but then I finally kicked away from him and began to swim for the stairs. I sprinted up them and grabbed my bag. I know it seems stupid, but it had my phone and keys in it, so I had to grab it. I ran out of the pool into my car and sped off out of the neighborhood. Once I was a safe distance away, I called the police, but when they arrived he wasn't there. I was so grateful to have gotten away, and I had forgotten about this man until recently. Now, this incident happened around the same time last year. I haven't moved, and I have been too afraid to go to that pool ever since that incident, so I've only been going to public pools recently and only with friends and family. But the reason that this story isn't over is because recently, I've been getting the sensation that someone is watching me. Now, this sounds made up and cheesy, I know, but you can just feel it that somebody's eyes are on you. I also have been hearing noises outside my window. It could just be animals, but mixed with the sensation that I'm being watched makes it a little creepier. So one night, I peeked outside the window to see what the noise was, and saw nothing, so I decided to set up a camera outside my room. Now, I didn't really think about it anymore, until I heard noise again one night, and decided to check the camera the next day. And what I saw gave me goosebumps down my whole body. The same man from the incident last year was outside taking pictures of my house, and took pictures even of the inside of my room. I called the cops and told them everything and showed them the surveillance video. And the next night, he didn't return. And he hasn't returned since. Now they did track down who it was by seeing him in the video, and it turns out he has been stalking girls my age before. So that explains why he randomly showed up in my neighborhood, why no one knew who he was, and the sensation that I was being watched. I still have a few questions though. Was he stalking me before the swimming pool incident? How did he find my house? And what really sends chills on my spine is thinking about how he's still out there. And what if he is still stalking me? When I was a little girl, I lived with my parents and little brother in a big house, which used to be a police station. Don't get me wrong, the house was beautiful, but something was very off. It all started when I couldn't sleep in a particular bedroom in the house as a baby, so my parents decided to let me sleep in the other bedroom. So, my little brother was given the room I couldn't sleep in. When I got older, around five years old, I had terrible nightmares and sleep paralysis. There was this man that kept visiting me during the night. He was always chasing me in my dreams, and I was so scared of him that I would scream and cry and bang on my closet door while I was asleep. In this dream, I was trying to run away from him. This man was also my sleep paralysis demon. He loved it to scare the hell out of me. He would sit on my bed and stare at me with this terrible smile. Whenever I tried to speak, I went mute. Whenever I tried to move, I would freeze. The only thing I could do was cry and pray to God to save me. I kept my parents up every night because I couldn't sleep. One night, my father had enough of it while I tried to show him that he was standing right behind him. Of course, he didn't believe me. The worst thing is, I could feel his presence wherever I would go around the house. It was terrible, 
like he was right behind me. I always saw a black figure in the corner of my eye, and I could always feel him chasing me up the hallway stairs and watching me go down the stairs. I would always run up the stairs and down the stairs. When I became a teenager, I told my mom about it in detail. Her face became so white, it was almost scary. She told me that our house was an old police station, and there was one police officer that wasn't friendly at all and a real pervert. When he died, his spirit came back to our house, which was the police station. He refused to rest. She told me that his office used to be the room in which I couldn't sleep in as a baby, the room that my little brother was given. My mom had seen this man too and could feel his presence as well, but so did my brother, and this part made me freeze from head to toe. I had a conversation with him as well last year. He is 16 now. He told me that this man would yell at him to get the hell out of his office. My brother responded to him, No, this is my room now. You are dead. You have to go, sir. Later, they would get along better and even have conversations. I was so shocked. My brother had to live with this terrible man for years in his bedroom. I asked him why he didn't tell anyone about it because I assumed he was scared to death. Turned out that he didn't dare to tell my parents because he knew they weren't going to believe him. We moved out of this house when my little sister was born, and there are no spirits in the new house as far as I can tell. I am so glad that that nightmare is over, as we had lived there for eight years. The first two years in our new house, the man visited my brother to ask and see how he was doing but he isn't scaring him anymore or anything else. He said he's friendly now, but he hasn't seen him anymore. My brother said he's resting now. When I heard that, I felt like I could breathe again. This man is resting now. He is gone. My brother and I can still see spirits to this day, but this one scared me the most out of all of them. This happened like a year ago. Me and my mom were coming back from the store. Everything was pretty normal. We were just in the car and my mom was driving. Until I noticed there was a green car next to us. I didn't really care that much. But then my mom sped off as soon as I went the room. She explained why she did that. What she said next made my heart drop. There were two women in that green car. They got a gun out and were about to shoot my mom. My mom had looked at the side mirror of the car. When she saw it, she hit the gas as soon as the light turned green. I was so scared. The car went a different direction, so they didn't follow us. As soon as we got home, my mom explained everything to my grandfather, who was there waiting for us in the house. My mom didn't know who they were. We didn't look at the license plate or call the police. But now, I always remember about that incident every time I see a green car. I wonder, what would have happened if the car was going the same direction as us? Or if the light hadn't turned green in time? <laughs> This is a story that my mom told me about a true story. There was a woman in her late 40s and single who never got to experience having children. One day, she decides to fly to Russia to adopt a child, and once she arrived there, she saw a young and small Russian girl that caught her attention. The woman took her home and raised the child as her own. As the years passed by, the girl and the mother lived a happy, normal life until college rolled in and the girl started hanging out with people that were a very bad influence on her. With time, she became rebellious and vicious and started consuming drugs. One night, the mother and her daughter break out into an argument that the next part is super shocking. The daughter lost control, took a knife and stabbed the mother to death. The girl was detained by the cops, but the court was stuck whether to consider it a homicide or to declare the girl a psychopath 
as they think the girl could have relived a traumatic event from her past before she was put up for adoption. The woman's family wanted nothing to do with the girl anymore, nor did they ever find out what happened to her. When I was a kid, we lived in a three-story house, and our closest neighbors lived two miles away. It was a hot summer night when we decided to go for a swim at the beach nearby. It was just me and three of my closest friends, who were staying over for a few days while my parents were out of town. Once we were done, we reached our house, and we noticed that one of the lights on the second floor was turned on. We didn't think anything of it, until we suddenly heard a loud bang, and the light turned off. We all gasped, and I dropped my keys on the floor. I'd reached for my phone in my pocket to call the police when I noticed that my phone had died. Suddenly, one of my friends grabbed the keys and opened the door. We called out for her to stop, but before we could grab her, she was already inside the house, rushing towards the stairs to get to the second floor. I asked my other friend to call the police with her phone while I went to look for our friend. I kept the lights turned off and headed to the kitchen to grab a knife, then up to the second floor. I was halfway there when I stopped, holding the knife in front of me and called out for my friend. When I didn't receive an answer, I got anxious and started slowly heading up. I heard someone whisper my name, but before I could reach the end of the stairs, I saw the police cars through the window. I decided to let them do their job and deal with this, so I ran down the stairs, tripping along the way. I was a breath away from the door when it slammed on my face. I was completely terrified. My heart was beating a thousand miles an hour. Before I could open the door again, I heard footsteps behind me and immediately froze. I slowly turned around to see a dark figure on my right, pointing a gun at me. At that moment, the police burst into the house and the invader ran back upstairs. Then I dropped the knife and started bawling my eyes out until the policeman calmed me down. I was so worried about my friend and about the invader that still hadn't been caught. The policeman escorted me outside to my friend, and we waited silently with another policeman so he could search the house and find them both. After a half hour of searching, he finally found my friend, unconscious, but no sign of the dark figure. It seemed like he had knocked her out with something. At the sight of her, I started crying again because I knew that if the police hadn't arrived in time, it could have been me too. Once we made sure she was conscious and okay, we begged the police to please search the house one more time before we would go inside to sleep. But once again, they didn't find anyone. We were all so terrified that we decided to spend the night at a hotel nearby. Five years passed and my friends and I had lost contact since both of them had moved to different states and it was hard to keep in touch. My family and I decided to sell our house and move, so we started to go through our things in order to decide what to keep, what to throw away, or donate. My parents handled the upstairs floors while me and my sister handled the bottom floor and the basement. After a couple hours, it was time to move on to the basement when we stumbled on our father's old suitcase. We tried to pick it up in order to throw it away, but it was very heavy, so we put it down and unzipped it. What we saw inside was terribly horrifying. We saw the bones of a person and screamed. We immediately told our parents and they called the police. When the police arrived, they took the bones away as we stood there watching. It was then that I recalled the incident that happened all those years ago. And to this day, I still think about it. Have you ever seen Satan? You might think that such a thing would only exist in movies, 
yet I've seen one in reality. The story starts 12 years ago when I was in middle school. My best friend, Amy, I used to call her the world's kindest girl every day. But at some point, I had to take that back. One day her eyes became strange. It's hard to explain, but whenever I looked into her eyes, I felt an enormously empty feeling. I tried to find out what that feeling was, and I finally realized. It was despair. I felt despair. I did not have a clue why I was falling into this feeling, although I was just looking at her. So since then, I tried to not look her in the eyes anymore. One day, she held my hands and asked me, Do you have any wishes? Do you want good grades? Do you want to go to a good university? Or do you want a boyfriend? You can have whatever you want. That was so out of context, so I asked her what she meant. She replied, You can have anything you want, as long as you do what the devils want instead. For that moment, her eyes looked dark red, as if they were full of red veins. I screamed with shock, and her eyes went back to normal. Then, she held my hand and took me to the back alley. She took something out of her pocket. Inside the black bag were animal fur balls and blood. I screamed and asked what it was. Then she replied, I sacrificed the cat's soul to a Satan. Then they granted my wish. She showed me a picture of a boy in her class, and she said, Soon, he will be my boyfriend. <laughs> I was in great shock. She also told me, Make a deal with Satan, and you will have whatever you want. <laughs> I decided to cut ties with her. It turned out that she was known as a mentally ill misfit at school. I was avoiding her for a long time, until one day she spoke to me in the corridor. Mammon says he's going to punish you. Mammon? I asked. Suddenly, she went back 90 degrees and screamed in a tremendously thick and creepy voice. I will cut your body into a thousand pieces and scatter them all around the world so that no one will find your body, and the crows and worms will eat up all of your body. Your soul will also vanish. Suddenly, my eyes went black. A moment later, I opened my eyes to a screaming sound that would burst my eardrums out, and I felt strange. I was biting my wrist frantically, and around me, five girls were trying to pull my hand off. In front of me, Amy was laughing maniacally, lying prone on the floor. In shock, I loosened up my jaw that was biting on my wrist, and my friends pulled my arms away. My wrist was bleeding. If it wasn't for my friends, I might have died because of the torn blood vessel of my wrist. I could not tell the truth to my parents, as I was afraid that they would send me to a psychiatric ward. Ever since, I was so terrified that I've been avoiding Amy. I moved to a different city as I became a high school student, and luckily, I could get away from her. Nothing happened to me anymore. Time went by, and when I became a university student, I heard news about Amy by chance. When she was in high school, she went camping with her three best friends, and two of the friends bit each other's necks and died. One of them ran away and called the police. When the police arrived, Amy was talking to her friends' bodies. The survived friend testified to the police. Amy always said that her dream is to become a first-class demon. To do that, she said that she has to kill 33 people. She also said that she should take human souls and change them into demon souls. She begged us to become her sacrifice. She told us that she would make us born as demons if we let her do it. She said that we could receive eternal pleasure as a gift. Her body was trembling as she said that. Amy is now in jail. 
As time went by, I became a mature adult. But whenever I think of her, I shed tears in fear. What would happen to me if I had been friends with her all along? I might have become her sacrifice. My name is Max. I'm 16 now, and I was around 9 when my father first told me this story. We live in Wisconsin, and during the summer it gets really hot, so we would often have bonfires and grill. My father sat me down, the fire blazing before us, giving my father's face an eerie glow. He told me that tonight was the perfect night for an old story, known well by the people from our home country. Years ago, there was a couple traveling by car at night. The sky had grown foggy and cool. The couple, who I will name Carla and Dion, had been driving all day to get to Dion's mother's house, and there were still many hours of driving ahead, and with the fog setting in, the need to sleep was weighing in on Dion. He told Carla to look out for a town to spend the night in. Keeping their eyes peeled, Carla spotted a small dim light glowing off in the distance. As they approached, the light grew brighter. It was an oil street light leading into a small town. Carla and Dion drove around for a bit before pulling over by a large, old-looking wooden building. Maria's Inn was written on the old sign outside the door. This looks like a good place to spend the night, Dion stated. Carla didn't respond. A cold feeling had crawled up her spine the minute they passed the streetlight. But before she could argue, Dion had left the car and entered the inn. Hesitantly, Carla followed Dion inside. The smell of fire filled her nose, but nothing was burning. Carla found Dion speaking to an old woman. She was sitting on an old wooden rocking chair. Carla walked up to her husband. Honey, who is this? Dion looked at Carla and smiled. This is Maria. She owns the inn and offered us a room. Dion looked back at Maria. Thanks again, ma'am. Carla looked at the old woman. She looked like she had been beautiful in her youth, but age hadn't treated her well. Wrinkles and spots had riddled her face now, and her veins protruded from her shaking hands. Curly white hair fell from a scarf that had been elegantly wrapped around Maria's head. Carla and Dion settled into their room. Despite how old and unused everything looked, the room was nice. One bed, a small table, a bathroom, and a window looking out over the river behind the building. Carla and Dion had just sat down when a knock startled the both of them. They looked at each other. Dion stood up and answered the door. Oh, hi, Maria, Dion said, relief filling his voice. Carla listened to their conversation and heard Maria mention a night service at a local church that she would be attending and how she would be pleased if Carla and Dion would join. Dion looked at Carla, and with some hesitation, Carla nodded, signifying that she would join. On the way to the church, Carla was never able to shake the eerie feeling that she had following her since the streetlight. When the church came into view, Carla was stunned. It was huge, a large steeple over the entrance, a massive bell beneath a stained glass cross, huge wooden doors leading into a dome-shaped room with a stage, and on the stage, a single, beautiful woman sang with an angelic voice. The church was filled with people, everyone in town according to Maria. The bad feeling Carla had grew worse. Maria, Dion, and Carla stood near the front of the stage where the woman's singing continued to grow louder and Carla noticed that the woman was glowing and with every lyric she grew brighter, almost blinding. Carla looked away. Noticing Dion, Carla took him by his hand. He was still looking up at the woman, mesmerized, and this made Carla angry. After several moments, she forced Dion to look at her. I'm feeling ill, can we go back to the inn? Carla said, nearly crying. Dion nodded and said goodbye to Maria, who begged them to stay. 
The woman's singing grew so loud and her body became so bright that Carla felt like she may explode. When they got back to the inn, Carla lay down immediately, falling asleep. When she woke, she knew immediately that something was off. It was far too bright. Carla opened her eyes. Dion was asleep next to her. She looked around and felt her heart drop to her stomach. Unable to speak, she shook Dion awake. Dion looked at Carla, then at the scene that she was so shocked at. What they thought was the inn in which they slept was a pile of wood and rocks. They looked further out and found that there was no town, no river, no church. Only large piles of rubble where the buildings used to be. Their car was parked beside a large sign that was half buried in the ground. The wording was faded. Panicking, Carla and Dion ran to the edge of the town where the streetlight had been. Surprisingly, the streetlight stood tall, seemingly out of place in this ghost town. Suddenly, on the road beyond the streetlight, an older man on a cart being pulled by a donkey could be seen. Carla and Dion yelled to him. What can I do for ya? He asked. Carla explained the story hysterically, from the time they were driving, from when they woke up on the ground. The man listened, his face growing more and more grim. Carla looked him in the eyes. Where is the town? She asked breathlessly. The older man sighed. I'm not sure how to answer that, dear. There used to be a town here, but it's been gone for almost 50 years. A bomb hit the church directly on the night of a service, killing everyone instantly. The only thing left was this very streetlight. Carla and Dion ran, leaving the man by the streetlight. Laughter could be heard from all around them as they got into their car. Carla and Dion headed straight for Dion's mother's house. Of course, she didn't believe them. No one did. They both went mad, knowing what they went through. They even tried to find the town a couple of times, but never did. Eventually, Carla and Dion went missing, and are still missing to this day. I'm not close with my father anymore, but I still tell his stories, and this has always been my favorite. Stay safe, and stay away from the lights. A lot of people still don't believe what I say, even to this day. But I hope that someone would believe that the horror I experienced is real, so that I could finally ease my pain, even if it's just a little bit. That's why I'm posting this to this community. Seven years ago, one deep dawn, I woke up suddenly with goosebumps all over my body. My heart stopped for a second as soon as my vision came back slowly from the darkness. That was because around seven people with knives in their hands were staring at me. Their faces were painted with white paint. At that moment, I learned that in such a horrific moment, even a single voice does not come out. As if they were waiting to wake me up, they surrounded my face with knives. Seven knives around my face, leaving just about one centimeter away from my face. If I moved my head even just a little bit, my face would have been stabbed all over. Frozen in place, I moved my eyes around. They were laughing like psychos, staring at me. I screamed. One of them put their knife right under my chin so that I could not open my mouth to scream. I asked why they were doing this to me, crying. They did not say a single word. Instead, they breathed grotesquely as if they were animals that couldn't speak. After suffering from extreme horror without moving a single bit for hours, I eventually fainted. The next morning, when I opened my eyes, I vomited frantically with a terrible headache. Although the window was broken and open, the trace of them coming and going was nowhere to be found. 
I couldn't breathe properly, and my heartbeat was three times faster than usual and would not stop. I collapsed on my bed while my body was still shaking. I could not believe what had happened to me. Although I reported this incident to the police, the investigation was not easy, for there were no direct wounds left on my body and there was no evidence left behind. I stayed at my friend's house for a while, but I had terrible nightmares every night. However, this is not the end of the story. One day, I heard on the news that a woman in her 60s had died of a heart attack in her sleep. A neighbor of hers saw the window broken and reported it to the police. The police started to investigate, but they concluded that the reason of her death was a heart attack since there weren't any wounds on her body. There were no fingerprints of the culprits, no evidence at all to be found. But I thought I knew who did it. I was certain that it was them. So I said that to the police. However, when they asked me what the criminals looked like, I couldn't explain it to them properly because they were all covered in white paint. After that, I moved away and have not heard if they were caught. However, I still suffer from horrendous nightmares even to this day. Even tonight, I jumped out of the bed because I felt a blade on my face. However, that was just in my imagination. After being panicked again for a while, I could not go back to sleep. It is 4 in the morning, and I am writing this post to upload to this website because I can't sleep. I have no idea why they did such a thing, or what their motives were. Even now, although seven years have passed, this incident remains a mystery, and the terrible trauma left in me remains unsolved. This happened to me when I was 16. I'm from Cleveland, but I moved to a small village in Illinois. It was about a four hour drive from Chicago. I was sad that I left my friends behind, but I was a relatively extroverted guy, so I'd at least have a couple of friends before college. My parents told me to study and get the best marks on my exams, but I preferred to go on Omegle. Remember that thing? I spent hours talking to people. Some were nice, some were weirdos, and some were downright disturbing. There was one that had permanently burned itself into my mind and I've never been the same since. I logged on and the first person I saw was a guy, about my age, with long black hair, an Iron Maiden t-shirt and a blank stare. I tried to start conversation by asking him what his favorite Iron Maiden song was and more of those types of questions. I eventually was going to click out of the chat room, but he just put his hands up as if he was telling me to stop and with the deepest voice ever, he said, Stop. His voice startled me. How could he have known I was going to click out? I'll show you my deepest, darkest secret, he continued. A grin appeared on his face. I felt uneasy. I haven't told my parents about my girlfriend, so I'll show you. He got up, went to his closet, and took out a big sleeping bag, filled with what seemed to be a human being. I couldn't move. I was terrified. He opened the bag. There was a girl in there who had a gigantic smile carved into her face and a knife sticking out of the top of her skull. I left the chat room and threw up. I told myself to never, ever touch Omegle again. Since I was new to my town, I didn't know anyone to tell this experience to. So I'm telling it to you. I don't know where that sicko is, but I hope he hasn't hurt anyone else. In eighth grade, some kids in my class started to use an app called Omegle. Even my friend Liam started using it. Liam normally wore a blue hoodie and black slacks and had shady brown hair. I never was that person who used the internet much. I studied a lot, and Liam was always telling me how he catfishes people online with Omegle. This really frustrated me, since he did it in a not-so-legal way, by making money off of it. 
I tried to visit him sometimes, but he never answered. So I would look through the window and sometimes he would be dressed up as a short girl with a girl voice modulator. Liam is very much into computing and technology, therefore he probably made a voice modulator. A few days later, he started skipping school and it confused me since he always came to school at 7.30 in the morning. He never responded to any text messages or calls. However, one day, Liam decided to call me and tell me to go to his house like nothing had happened as he chuckled on the camera, which kind of creeped me out. So I politely declined and he started getting mad. He shouted, I'm going to kill you and your parents. Then Liam hung up the call. After that, I called the cops and told them where he lived. But when they searched his apartment, they couldn't find him. They found dead bodies of men and even some of my friends. Since that day, I moved far away from Liam. Although, I wonder what could have happened if I listened to him and visited his house. Four years ago, on a quiet summer night, early in the morning, I suddenly heard gunshots right next to my ears. I jumped up from my sleep, but everything was quiet around me. I thought for a second if I heard the noise of my dream, yet it sounded too real to just be part of the dream. Then I saw a man standing outside the window, standing still and pointing a gun at me. I fell off the bed while screaming so loud that I felt like my throat would tear out. Soon, my father rushed into my room and I pointed out the window. My father looked out the window, but no one was there. We called the police immediately. A few moments passed when the police arrived shortly afterwards and discovered that a bullet was lodged in the tree outside my window. And there was a note next to the bullet with a picture of me and the word you written on it. The police set out to find the criminal. However, a few days later, I heard a gunshot early in the morning again. I fell off the bed screaming again. My window was broken and the wind was leaking in with a creepy sound. My father rushed into my room once again and we called the police, but the criminal was already gone. After the police arrived, we found a bullet lodged in the wall of my room. There was another note by the broken window that said, Will, with a picture of a man standing beside me. From the next day onward, I did not sleep in my room and instead slept in the other room. However, a few days later, I heard the window break, so I called the police again. However, there was no evidence of a gunshot. There was just a note by the window with the word B written on it, with a picture of a man pointing a gun at me. The police tried to find every piece of evidence. However, according to them, the criminal was just pulling a prank instead of actually trying to harm me. They asked me if I would know anyone who would do this kind of prank, to which I replied, no one, as I have behaved well all my life. The police said that if I list the notes I have received in order, they say, you will be, and that last word is missing. They warned me that the criminal will definitely come again. That gave me goosebumps all over my body. The police said that they need to arrest this criminal right this instant, and this would be their last chance to do that. So, they decided to do a stakeout nearby my house at night and place a mannequin on my bed with a wig on it to pretend that I was sleeping there while I actually slept in another room. A few days later, I suddenly woke up to the sound of a gunshot early in the morning. This time, it was numerous gunshots and I could even hear someone yelling. I tumbled a lot. It took a moment until it became quiet again and the police knocked on the front door. As I went outside, I could see several police cars outside my house. I also saw a person who seemed to be a criminal lying on the floor bleeding. It turned out that the police tried to arrest him, but as he shot the gun towards the police recklessly, they had to kill him. I saw the criminal's face. I've never seen that man before, and nor did my family. In his hand, there was a note with the word SHOT written on it, 
with a picture of a man shooting a gun against me, and there was a bullet that struck the chest of the mannequin that was laying in my room. My two legs tumbled so much that I had to sit down on the floor, and for a long time, I blankly stared at the mannequin that looked just like me. The investigation results say that the man who tried to shoot me had no criminal record and was just an ordinary person, but why would he do such a thing to me? Who on earth was he? A long time has passed, but the mystery has yet to be solved. This isn't really a story of mine, but I heard it since I was a child, and ever since then I was kind of scared about hospitals. There was an inspector who inspects every room of the hospital, just to see if any visitors are still there. It was 1 a.m., and the hospital was five stories high. The man was currently on the third floor. The man walked past the mortuary room, you know, the room where dead bodies are kept until they are buried or cremated. Anyway, the man walked past the mortuary room. Then, suddenly, he heard something that sounded like a rusty metal door was being pulled on the floor. Of course, as his job was to check the rooms, he quickly turned the knob and checked the inside. He flashed his flashlight in every corner and he saw an open box where a body should be. He walked toward it to check on it, and there was no body inside, and no person inside the room with him. He thought it was his imagination, and maybe someone had left it open. He shoved it back in and headed out. He headed straight for the elevator and pressed the first floor button. When the door was closing, he heard something, Hey, wait, I need to get on too. It was a girl wearing a hospital gown. She had a cute face and long hair. The man was confused because it was past midnight, but still opened the door for her. Thanks, the little girl said. The man smiled back. Then the girl pressed for the second floor. The man asked why she was up this late. The girl said because she just wanted to grab her stuff from her friend's room since she forgot it earlier while visiting. But before the man said anything, the elevator suddenly went up instead of going down, going up to the fourth floor. The man pressed for the first floor again and thankfully it went down. But the door opened at the third floor. The man heard something in the distance. It was a man running towards the elevator at full speed. The man quickly pressed aggressively on the elevator, commanding it to close the doors. The man was only six feet away before the door closed. The man sighed and leaned his back on the wall. The girl was confused and said, Why didn't you let him in? The man answered, still covered in sweat. Because that man had a red tag on his wrist. Those things are only meant for the ones who are dead already. The little girl's eyes widened and smiled. The man was shocked when the little girl slowly pulled her sleeves up to her elbow, revealing a red tag on her wrist, and said, Like this one? That's the end of the story. And to this day, it still haunts me, just remembering that. Have you ever been so overwhelmed by fear that you were frozen and you couldn't even move your fingertips? Without blinking, without moving your mouth, without talking, and without taking your feet off the floor. Have you ever had such an awful experience that all you could do is shiver, helplessly, frozen in place? I have. And that story is what I'm going to talk about from now on. When I was 11, one day I was playing in the woods with my friends until nightfall. I told them I had to go home quickly and I left them in case my mom would scold me for being out too late. After leaving the woods and I was on the way home, something seemed strange. Suddenly, there was no sound of insects or animals crying at all. In the silence, I got goosebumps and looked around slowly. However, then a faint sound came from the forest. 
At first I thought it was an animal cry, but the sound grew instantly. No, the sound didn't get louder. The sound was coming at me, and it was getting closer at a terrific speed. But no animal could have moved so quickly. When I thought about that, I instantly got goosebumps. At that moment, in the dark, I saw something approaching like an afterimage. And at the time, I faced a scene that I would never see again in my life. A creature with multiple limbs was crawling to me at a terrific speed. At first, I thought it was a person crawling, but it was an unbelievable speed and it came before me in the blink of an eye. When I looked more closely, it looked like a spider. It was blue and about three feet tall, and it had several grape-like eyes. I froze on the spot. Fortunately, it didn't attack me immediately. It only hovered around. It was moving around in front of my nose, and the mouth seemed to be chewing something at a terrific speed. I heard the sound of chewing bones and a bizarre voice. I couldn't even breathe properly because I was so terrified. Some of you may ask why I didn't run away, but it was so fast that I couldn't dare to run. All I could do was stay still, as if I were dead. The closer the presence of it was, the colder it became, quickly. I could feel the chill from the creature, which was so cold that it couldn't be considered a living thing. As if there was a lump of ice in front of me, I felt like I was going to cough in the cold air, so I suppressed it all the way. It moved back and forth in front of me for a while, and it seemed like it was thinking whether to eat me or not. I couldn't even move a muscle, and I had to stand there and shiver with endless fear. Do you know that feeling? That the moment I move, that the living thing is about to attack me. No one will ever know the feeling of what I'm talking about. In that state, I couldn't move my hands even though my nose felt itchy. And I couldn't turn my body even though my legs hurt. I breathed very quietly because I was afraid. Even the sound of breathing would be heard by him and I felt like I was gradually running out of oxygen. That is how I stood in an immovable position for an awfully long time. And it circled around me dozens of times and it finally slowly started to move away from me, little by little. I still didn't move when it was about 100 meters away, because it seemed like the moment I moved, it would run instantly and tear me apart and chew me up. After a long time, finally, the thing disappeared into the forest and I could move again. As soon as I took a step forward, I fell to the ground, feeling great pain and cramping in my leg muscles. I pretty much crawled on my hands and feet, and I eventually managed to get home. When my mom saw my blue lips and that my whole body was wet with sweat, she asked what was going on. I talked to her about it, but she didn't believe it. Then I saw the clock, and surprisingly, I realized that when I met that thing, that I stood still like a rock for an hour. That night, I suffered from awful body aches. My fever went up to 104 degrees, and the village doctor came and treated me. Fortunately, I survived, and I told the doctor about seeing it, but he said, That is truly strange. There was one other kid who said he saw what you talked about before, but the child went missing a while later and he's still missing. His facial expression hardened. Fortunately for me, I haven't seen it since that day, but I felt like I could find out the cause of what had happened in my town in the meantime. Dogs and livestock that were raised went missing. Neighborhood people also went missing in the woods. The police determined that they were eaten by wild animals, but well, I don't think so. Sadly, I don't think there were many people who properly judged the situation like me. Everyone would have ran away the moment that they saw it, and they wouldn't have known it was a wrong judgment. They wouldn't have known it was impossible to run away from it originally. After that incident, my family moved, and I don't know what happened to the mysterious thing. And what it was, I still don't know. But I still remember it freshly. The fear of that day. The fear of death that I felt when it constantly circled around me and breathed chills. Even now when I think about it, my heart feels like it's going to stop. And if at the time I couldn't hold my cough, I probably wouldn't be here right now. My name is Arthur, and I live in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm 22 years old. One night I was returning from a party for my friend's birthday. It was a very quiet night, no sign of humans. I was driving and I saw a girl. She was standing beside the road. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, a red coat, a skirt, and a white dress wore inside the red coat. I was kind of crushing on her because she was so beautiful. The wind was really strong. That girl asked me, Sir, if you don't mind, could I have a lift? Sure, I said. She sat in the back seat of the car. So, ma'am, where do you live? 
I said it with a bit of nervousness. She did not say a word, but gave me a small piece of paper. I kept it with me. The address was on the paper. Um, okay. What is your name? I asked. Mary Talish is my name, sir, she said. Okay, so can I call you Mary? I said. Yes, was her reply. Well, you could call me Arthur. She nodded with a smile. Well, Mary, what are your hobbies? Oh, I used to play with my dolls when I was young, but I won't be able to play with them anymore. It sounded a bit weird, but girls in their teens sometimes like to play with their dolls. You could say that Mary was 19. I also like to dance, but I cannot dance anymore. This time I freaked out a bit, saying it with a little fear. But Mary, you can dance, right? I wish I could, was her answer. We were passing by an old graveyard and Mary told me to stop by the gates of that graveyard. But Mary, it's not good for you to roam alone at night. Don't worry, Arthur. Here, take this jacket and drop it at my house. Her house was far away. She told me to go as soon as possible. I went to that address and I saw a huge bungalow. I knocked on the door and I saw an elderly woman who looked like she was in her late 40s, but was looking really old for her age. Um, ma'am, does Mary Talish live here? I asked. She suddenly burst out crying. I asked if I could help her. She called me into her house. She also called her husband. The house was pretty huge and beautiful from the inside, too. I also saw photos of Mary. When I saw the woman's husband, he too was looking very old and weak. He looked like he had not eaten for many days. The man and woman told me about Mary Talish. They said that she was their daughter, their only daughter they could have. They both loved her very much. One night when she was coming back home, a group of men abducted her and took her away. The old couple were worried about her and after two days, the police had found the girl's body. Her eyes were cut, her chest looked like someone had carved out her heart, and her left hand was cut. Mary Talish was dead. I couldn't believe what I was hearing from Mary's parents. Keeping control of myself, I gave them her jacket and went outside and was on my way home. Just as I got into my car, I saw Mary Talish again. This time, she was not looking like a human, but rather a ghost or a zombie. And she gave me a creepy smile. A few days passed and I found out by researching on the internet that whoever witnesses Mary Talish should help her. If not, you will be killed the same way Mary was killed. Luckily, I was kind enough to help Mary, and I pray to God that Mary finds peace in heaven. There is an infamous road in my town. Three people died driving on this road within a few months. All of them were driving alone at night. Then, all kinds of rumors started to spread all over. Rumors like the follower of Satan summoned a devil on the road, or a killer appears on the road every rainy night, and so on. I always thought that they were just exaggerated gossip and I brushed them off. That was until I passed the road one day. One night, I happened to pass that road. Although I started to get goosebumps from the creepiness as I saw the road from a distance, I deliberately played upbeat music and danced with my shoulders. However, it even started to rain. I talked to myself. you think I'd be scared. Feeling the chills down my spine, I speeded up to pass the road as quickly as possible. Then. I saw a man standing in the middle of the road. I hit the brake hastily. The man reflected in the light, slowly walked toward me from the middle of the road. I rolled my window down and shouted, Don't you know this is a dangerous road? 
The man approached me and looked into every part of my car. Then he pointed two miles ahead and said, Would you mind driving me there? I asked, Is something there? He replied, Hurry, we will die if we stay on this road. I thought it was strange, but he had the look of an innocent man. However, his eyes looked like they were filled with blood, and his teeth were all broken or missing. I asked him if he was hurt, and he replied he was alright. I told him I'd drive him downtown, but he kept saying that all he needed was to go a bit forward from here. I picked him up and started driving. I kept asking him what had happened, but he looked at my face without saying anything. But all of a sudden, he grabbed my head and slammed it on the steering wheel frantically. I hit the brakes while being slammed, and the car spun to a stop with a loud sound of a screeching tire. He crazily slammed my head, and as soon as the car stopped, he jumped out of the passenger seat and ran away at full speed. My head was all over the place for a moment because of the extreme pain, but soon after, I called the police. That's when I finally realized the place he started to attack me was the spot where every accident happened. He purposefully attacked me to crash the car into a guardrail. However, fortunately, I hit the brakes and turned the steering wheel to a right angle so the car did not crash. I told the police everything he did, and he was arrested. He kept denying his wrongdoings, saying that he had only asked for a ride, but eventually, he was imprisoned. Although a few years have passed, I still vividly remember that creepy look on his face as he pushed my head with full force, and every time I think about it, I start panting again. If my car crashed into the guardrail that day, I might have never woken up. Back when I was 9 years old, I used to have this itching fear of someone being in my room watching me. So, my parents got me a nightlight to help me get over it. At night, I would wake up and the fear of someone being in my room came to mind. So I would sit up and thanks to the nightlight, would see no one there. It honestly did the trick. I would have my room partially lit up and would feel safe. Even though my parents slept one door away, I honestly still felt scared before I got it. One day, while my dad was at work, me and my mom had the weekend to ourselves. We went to this large shopping mall to have some fun, buying toys and clothes for me and my mom. I remember seeing this really large play area in the center of the mall. I was so excited, my eyes lit up in excitement. Before I could even say a thing, my mom said I could go there. She knew me well, she would often know what I wanted before I even asked it. I ran over to the play area while my mom sat on a bench close by and watched me like a hawk. I climbed up the slide and there was a network of tubes and windows that you could see through and climb through. Kids were everywhere, going up and down, climbing through the network of tubes. I saw at the end of one of the tubes leading to a little room. It was designed like the front of an airplane. I loved airplanes when I was young, so I immediately crawled through the tubes as fast as I could to get there. When I reached the little front of the airplane room, there were fake buttons you could press that would make beeping noises. There was also a little steering wheel in the front. I pressed the buttons and played with the steering wheel like any little kid would. I just happened to look out of the window to my left and saw a man looking right at me. I remember him wearing a black hoodie and blue jeans. He looked to be in his early 30s. He stared at me with this really yellow, toothy smile. I remember his eyes also looked bloodshot. I realize now that he may have been on something. We stared at each other for at least six seconds, and that's when I heard my mom calling my name. I looked to my right window and saw her gesturing for me to come down. I did so and she grabbed my hand and we left the mall. My mom strapped me in my car seat and she got in the car as well. She made sure no one was around or followed us. Then she locked the doors and told me how she saw the man I was looking at and how he started to look at me the whole time I entered the playground. 
My mom went on to say that he followed my movements through the windows of the playground. I didn't think much of this, being just a little kid, so I brushed it off. That night, my dad called my mom, saying how he was stuck at work doing overtime due to the lack of employees who were available that night. My mom then said, okay, bye, I love you. She hung up the phone and prepared me for bed. She plugged in my nightlight, tucked me in bed, and kissed me goodnight. Hours passed, and I remember waking up early. I tried looking at my alarm clock. I purposely kept it at the end of my nightstand, so I could always read it right there instead of having to get up out of bed to look at it. But I couldn't even see my alarm clock. It was pitch black darkness. All I could see were my bed sheets. Literally nothing else was visible in my room. I then realized my nightlight wasn't plugged in. But my mom plugged it in, I thought. That's when the fear set in. The fear of someone being in my room with me. Right when the fear started to set in, I heard a loud creak right in front of my bed. A cold chill went through my body when this happened. I instantly scrambled to reach for my lamplight and turned it on. Right when I did this, I saw a man staring at me with bloodshot eyes at the foot of my bed. He then smiled in this toothy yellow smile. I screamed as loud as I could with fear. The man then bolted and jumped out of my window right before my mom came in, but she wasn't fast enough to see the man leaving. I told her there was a man in my room. At first, she didn't believe me, but then I told her that my nightlight wasn't plugged in, and how she plugged it in when she tucked me into bed. She paused and thought for a second. I slowly saw her face turn into a horrified look. She ran to our home phone and called the police, then my dad. Looking back at it now, I knew she realized someone had to have been in the room with me, because she knew how afraid I was of being alone in my room in pitch black darkness, and how I would never unplug the nightlight. The cops came and my mom explained to them what happened. Just then, my dad's car pulled up. He ran over to both me and my mom and gave us a big hug, asking if we were alright. The cops took the nightlight, as he had to touch it to unplug it. They said they would look for fingerprints on it, giving this is the only evidence they had. It was unclear how he entered, but we assume he entered through my open window. The policemen searched our property, but found no signs of the man. They also told us that the nightlight had no fingerprints on it, which means he wore gloves. The cops said they would stay outside of our house for the night and see if he would come back. My parents were okay about it and went to bed. I didn't get any more sleep that night, but now that I think about it, the man I saw in the mall smiling at me and the man in my room had to be the same person. They had the same exact smile and bloodshot eyes. Then a sick realization came to my mind. For that guy to know where I live and literally crawl through my window into my room, he would have had to have followed us home. How did he do that? I have no idea. The cops never found the guy. We moved to another town now, and I thankfully grew out of the fear of someone being in my room. I'm 15 now, and I exercise and work out every day. I worked on it, and I have an impressive build for my age. I now met the girl I love, and I recently graduated my freshman year of high school with all A's. I am now having a normal and happy life. I don't let this incident drag me down, because it was from my past, and I realize now, in order to be successful, you have to tend to the future. To everyone watching or listening to this, always be aware of where you are and your surroundings, and if you see someone suspicious or someone watching or following you, get to a crowded area or building where lots of people are immediately. If there is nothing like that and you're all alone, Pull out your phone and call the cops. Remember, it's better to be safe than sorry. Whenever I see rabbits on TV or in movies, I recall the memory of that day. The day that I don't want to think of ever again. When I was in high school, 
I used to go to the small forest behind my village and work out whenever I was stressed by hectic studies. Even on that day, I went to the forest as I normally would do on other days. However, as soon as I arrived in the forest, I saw something before my eyes. A white object was moving around rapidly, and above the object, I saw large rabbit ears. When I looked closely, I noticed that it was the back of a huge man wearing a rabbit mask. I was surprised and felt it was creepy for some reason, so I hid and watched him. He was chasing someone, and a man in front of him was running away desperately. I was confused about what was happening, yet soon after, the rabbit man caught the man who was running away, knocked him over, and strangled him. My heart started beating rapidly. The man passed out shortly after, and the rabbit man took out a spray from his pocket and sprayed it on the man's body. Soon, his body was completely covered in orange. Then, the rabbit man shouted, Bon Appetit! And he bent down, and shortly after, I heard a sound like flesh and cartilage being ripped off, and I heard a terrible scream. It seemed that the man beneath the rabbit was struggling, and the rabbit man was eating him. I felt my heart drop about a foot, and immediately called the cops. Holding the phone with trembling hands, I explained the situation to the police, but I heard this over the phone. What? So you're saying that a person with a rabbit mask is eating another person? <laughs> that's not cannibalism, that's just playing around, you know? But after a moment, the police realized how serious the case was through a frantic scream, and they came. After a while, the police arrived and arrested the rabbit man. The man who was lying down was panting with his flesh torn off to the point where the bones were showing. The rabbit man shouted at me as he was taken over by the police. Next time, I'll eat you up. The police searched his house. It turned out that he was obsessed with eating all of his food with edible orange paint. Then he attempted to eat not only food, but also things like toys or dolls with orange paint, and it seemed that he had finally done that to a person. The man who was being eaten by him moved to the hospital urgently, yet eventually died. They said that the rabbit man was imprisoned, and when he could no longer wear a rabbit mask, he pulled his ears like a maniac and ripped them off. They have no idea why he believed he was a rabbit. However, they assume that he has gone through tremendous trauma from being abused by his parents when he was young, and he might have started believing he was a rabbit after killing the pet rabbit his parents bought. Since that day, I have been dreaming of nightmares. In my dream, my skin is orange, and he approaches me and eats up my flesh and I wake up covered in sweat. Even now, my body trembles uncontrollably when I think about it. If I could please erase this memory. This story is unforgettable. I can remember it like it happened a week ago, although it happened almost a year ago. Me and my family went on a vacay in the city of Pampanga, which is all on Gapo. We stayed there for almost a week. It was a very long road. To be honest, it made me so tired I just wanted to sleep during the journey. As time went by, it got longer and longer to the point I was impatient. I almost got to sleep when I suddenly saw three unknown figures with no faces just standing in the corner of the road as if they were waiting for us. All I could see was their tattered clothes with some blood stains on them. I told my parents to stop for a moment to ask them if they had seen those figures. They said no. So I thought that this was just my head playing tricks on me. So I ignored them and got back to sleep to reserve it for later. As we arrived at our rest house in Alangapa City, I saw those three figures again. I managed to spot the patterns of the clothes of one that I saw earlier. But this time, 
I saw their faces. Their facial expressions could be seen because of the sunlight. As I made a keen observation of them, I would describe that they had a serious aura. I thought they were people who just guard the road in case a random guy tries to barge in without a ticket. But no, they were the three guys I saw from earlier on the road. So how did they manage to know where we were going to stop? But to this day, I find it stupid that I just ignored it. Anyway, we were enjoying the whole three days there. We were swimming at the beach, enjoying the sunset view, and playing with some random people there. There wasn't much to do that day, so I was busy doing some chores in our rest house. Our rest house is a beje cubo, made out of bamboo wood and nipa, which serves as the roof of the rest house, and the length of it is 4 meters. While cleaning it, I saw some claw marks on the roof ceiling outside. I questioned how this could be, because how could somebody reach that high up when they would need a ladder to climb up there? I still ignored that red flag. During the night, me and my family were about to sleep, when suddenly we heard a pack of guys screaming at the top of their lungs, so loud it almost made me go deaf. Then it stopped for a while, for maybe around 10 minutes. I heard it again, but this time it wasn't loud anymore. They were screaming as if they were whispering right next to my bed, which is on the second floor. Now, I stood up in shock hearing that sound. It wasn't only me who heard that. It was also my aunt, my mom, and my niece. We were all stupefied by it, so we ran outside to look for those guys. We searched all around the house and found nothing. We asked our neighbors if they had heard something or somebody screaming but they answered no. What we did is to call the police and tell them what happened. They asked us if we'd managed to see it, and we said no, we haven't. But we managed to tell them about the screaming, and all of the police there were shocked. One cop came near us and told us the scariest thing that one can ever hear. He said this, You see, those guys you heard screaming aren't people at all. They are tick tick. They search for prey and eat them. You can tell whether they're near or far away from your house when you can hear their yelling voice. If it's loud, they're far away from the house. But if they yell in a low voice, they are in your house. Sometimes before doing it, they will leave a claw mark in someone's house as they're marking for their targets. We were all completely shocked and at the same time became nervous. Now everything made sense, from the screams to the claw marks I saw earlier. The cops saw the nervousness and worries on our faces, so they escorted us to our rest house and told us to pack up our things and go back to Manila to avoid these encounters. We had already packed up our things in the morning, and as we were about to pop in for the ride, my heart suddenly started beating faster, and a chilling cold sweat ran down my spine. I saw those three guys again. Now they have happy faces. I never looked back at their faces once I hopped in to ride. To this day, I never knew how they managed to hunt us down where we were staying. The only thing I know is that we were still alive. We didn't tell our friends or acquaintances about it. I hope that I never see those three guys again. This is an incident that happened to me when I was in middle school. One day, I decided to play hide and seek in a slightly different way with my friend, Eric. It was a hide and seek while summoning souls. I know, we were just stupid teenagers. However, the more important fact is that this did not end with some simply goofy game, yet in horror. We found a way to play the game on the internet and cast the spell to summon souls as written. Then, I hid inside the closet while Eric hid under the bed. How much time has passed? Suddenly, I heard Eric screaming. Hiding inside the closet, I looked through the crack of the open doors. That terrifying sight. Eric bounced out of the bed as if he had been pulled out. He swung his arms as if he was fighting and shouted at me. Max, help me! But there was nothing on the side he was staring at. 
there was just a wall. I was dumbfounded, having no clue what just happened. Then, after a moment, Eric screamed hysterically and grabbed his neck. Soon after, his limbs spread uncontrollably as if someone was pulling them. Eric screamed frantically. I started trembling so bad at the shocking sight. A few moments later, he rolled over like crazy until he crashed into the wall and passed out. Then it became quiet. Thinking this had gone wrong big time, I urgently called the ambulance and carried Eric out of the house. As I was leaving the house, I heard a voice from behind. It was the voices of dozens of children laughing and saying, Now you're it. I got so many goosebumps and my legs got loosened, so I fell and dropped Eric to the floor. After barely dragging Eric outside, an ambulance arrived a while later. Eric was frothing at his mouth. Eric's parents rushed to the hospital and tried to blame me, but the doctor made it clear that I did not make him like that. He said, Eric's ligaments in his limbs were severely torn, which is definitely not something a middle schooler could do. A few moments later, Eric woke up and said some invisible kids grabbed his arms and legs and pulled at them hysterically. However, no one believed his words, and I haven't seen Eric since that day. He moved out soon afterwards, and I still don't know how he was doing. The guilt for not being able to protect Eric at that time still remains inside me. If I had gone out of the closet and saved him, would he still be injured? However, I was too terrified. Even though I didn't know what they were, I knew they weren't something I could confront. Since that day, I haven't played hide and seek. However, even today, it feels like I am with someone even though I am home alone. One time, early in the morning, I heard a voice underneath my bed. Look for me. I thought it was a hallucination and stayed up all night trembling so bad. Next time, I heard the voice coming from the closet. After that, I heard the voices of children under the sheets, the cupboard, the bathtub, and many more places. Look for me. So, I started carrying a crucifix at all times. Of course, I have never responded to the voices. I ignored them completely because I instinctively knew that something horrifying would happen if I opened up where the voices came from. Luckily, I am doing well now. However, I do not think this is over yet because even when I move to different places, they keep following me. So, I want to warn you, never, never cast a spell that summons souls, because although there is a spell to summon souls, there isn't one to send them back. My name is Leah, and this is a story of how my dad saw a psycho woman on the road at night. My dad was the type of dad who liked to go out a lot but that doesn't mean that he didn't spend time with us after his shifts. He would hang out with friends a lot, which we didn't really mind because he would spend the full day with us on his days off. Also, our family was pretty big with our grandparents living with us, so we didn't feel lonely. Anyways, back to the story. One time, his friend who lived pretty far away was gone for almost a year visiting his parents. So of course, when he was back, my dad wanted to visit him. My dad asked my mom if he could see him, but she was a bit hesitant. But this wasn't unusual for my dad, so she let him go. My dad soon went out, and it was getting pretty late, around 12pm, and my dad wanted to go. But his friend kept nagging him to stay a bit longer. So my dad agreed once it was 1am, my dad would finally go. At 1am, he left and while on the way, he had to cross a road that was almost empty with no sidewalks, stores, or houses. It was just a straight road with a bunch of land on the side. While him and some other cars were driving, he noticed a girl in a dress on the side of the road waving her hand like she wanted a taxi. My dad looked around, 
My dad's car looked nothing like a taxi, it was a grey jeep. He slowed down a bit to get a better look, then suddenly, the girl jumped in front of my dad's car. Her face became more clear. Her eyes were red, and her mouth was open wide to reveal her rotten teeth. She seemed like she hadn't showered in weeks, and her face was covered in blood, and in her hand was a sharp knife. While my dad was in shock, the girl jumped on my dad's car and started banging on the glass while screaming like a psycho. My dad quickly stepped on the pedal and drove off. Sometime later, I saw on the news that people were being harassed by a crazy psycho girl that ran away from a clinic. Apparently, she managed to kill two people. Sadly, they weren't fast enough to drive off. She broke their windshield and stabbed them multiple times. She was caught and sent back to the clinic. God knows what would have happened if my dad didn't drive off in time. My name is Yasmin, and I would like to share my story with you. This happened to me about last year around Halloween. I live in the Cotswolds, so there is a lot of dense woodland areas, and I'm just a teenager trying to look for adventure. It was a few days before Halloween, so me and my friends decided to decorate our old barn for a Halloween party. I brought my boyfriend Ryder and best friend Charlotte. It was a 30 minute walk to the barn. The time was around 10 or 11 when we got there, and while we were decorating the barn, we heard a big knock and scratching. At first, we thought it was just an animal, so we tried to ignore it, but the noises just got louder and louder. We all just froze for what felt like five minutes. The thing started laughing in a squeaky noise. We all planned to bolt out of the barn. We counted to three and screamed while we ran out of the barn. I felt like I was going to die that day. As we were running out, I took a glimpse behind and there was a clown. It looked just like Pennywise and it was carrying an axe and a bat. He saw me looking and chased us. Ryder had run far ahead of us, and still to this day, I don't know why Charlotte did this, but she pushed me to the ground and I collapsed. All I remember is the clown's face right against mine and being hit by something. I woke up in the hospital and I found out that Ryder ran back and called the police. What scares me the most is that on Halloween night, that same costume was worn by Charlotte's brother. I don't talk to her anymore, and I haven't since the incident. I just graduated, and I'm hoping to move to America with Ryder. I hope I never see Charlotte, or that clown, again. My name is Shelby, and this takes place when I was just 11 years old. It was an average day and I had just come back from school. I did my homework like any normal night. I tend to put off my homework until about eight or nine, since as an 11 year old, I wasn't really a fan of it. My mom always liked to hang out in our back room to smoke or watch TV. But that day, she was a little odd. Her eyes did not look normal. In fact, they looked like that of a dead person. But as an 11-year-old in fifth grade, I just moved on and went to bed. I used to have an older sister, but I never knew her. Sadly, she died at birth due to a sickness that her and my mom got. Whenever I heard that story, I used to feel upset, since I was an only child and always lonely. My dad worked late nights driving the train, and my mom was sometimes addicted to things that I can't really share here. But let's not get sidetracked. I went to bed that night around 10 p.m. like I always do, but I woke up in a strange place. It looked like a forest with a cleared out path, the kind you go hiking on, but it was really foggy and I couldn't see what was going on. So I started to move closer to the trail. But as I started to walk, I heard a voice say, Sissy, I spun around so fast and I saw a very tall girl, like around seven feet tall. She had pale skin and brown hair, but the hair was not normal. It looked 
greasy and stiff. But for some reason, I felt calm. I could see some things that my sister who passed away had, like the birthmark on her cheek. It suddenly dawned on me. I ran to her and hugged her, yelling, Big sissy, I miss you so much. She replied, I do too. I've been watching and waiting for you. Now that you're here, why don't we have a nice tea party? She said, while giving me an oddly creepy smile. But I agreed, since me and my mom didn't have much fun together. As my older sister took me to this tea party, I noticed that her face was a little different. Her eyes were bloodshot red, and her lips were pale blue and cracked, like when you have very dry lips. And she smelled like something decaying, like a dead corpse. But this was my sister, so I shoved all that away, and we kept walking for a while until we got to a poorly looking table with just two teacups with some tea in it. She told me to sit down, so I sat down. I was actually scared to drink the tea, but I did drink it. And when I did, I was shocked. It tasted just like the one my dad makes. After a while, I said, it's time for me to go now. I could tell this made her very mad. She stood up, slammed her hands on the table, and started growling like an animal. Her teeth were sharp and her eyes were like that of a cat, but black with red dots in them. And she started screaming at me. You took my spot. I should have been born, not you. You should have died at the hospital. You should, not me. At that point, I was scared to death. I was too scared to move, and I couldn't even see very well because my eyes were filled with tears. She grew. She started to grow taller and thinner. I could see her bones. And then she yelled, I need to take care of her. Mom doesn't love you. She loves me. I need to watch her, not you. I need to make her that soup so she can die. Just come, and I can be you finally. In my mind, I knew it was Thursday and I always cook soup for my mom on Friday. Then she tried to grab me, so I started to run as fast as I could. I was born with asthma and just running down my block is difficult, but I knew my life was on the line here. So I ran as fast as I could and I just kept running. I could hear what was my older sister that turned into a monster chant, I need her to die. I need to get my hands on her, over and over again. At this point, I felt like I was gonna pass out. I quickly turned to see if it was still following me. And what I saw was this creature crawling on the ground. Its skin was pale and it had black eyes with red dots in them. And it was just all bones and I could see its disgusting teeth and tongue. I don't know how but I just got so much energy that I ran and I ran and I ran. But then I tripped and fell on something. I saw that my legs were stuck on a rope. Then that thing came over and stood up and started to say, I now have you where I want you, it said in a demonic voice. Then it pounced at me, and that's when I woke up. I looked at the clock. It was 5.15 a.m., the time I always get up to get ready to go to school. So I did just that, hoping it was just a bad dream. After school, when I got home, I cooked the soup I always make for my mom, just like that thing said in the dream. Suddenly, the phone rang. It was my dad, but he didn't say the usual, hi, how are you? Instead, the only thing he kept saying was, where's your mother, Shelby? Where is your mother? I walked to the back room and said, she's passed out on the floor, Papa, like it was no big deal. I looked at my father on the phone and I could tell he was scared. He told me to try to wake her up, but she never woke up. That's when he said, pack your things, Shelby. Your aunt and uncle are coming. Now I was confused and scared, but I got my stuff together and waited. 
Suddenly, my aunt and uncle burst through the door and ran to my mom. They kept screaming, Rhoda, wake up! Rhoda, wake up! But she never woke up. They rushed me to the car and called the ambulance. I was confused, but when my mom was about to be taken away by the paramedics, she shot up and yelled, I'm not going! Everyone was so confused, but my mom put up a fight. They let her stay at home, but I was sent to go with my aunt and uncle. Later that night, my dad came to pick me up, and thankfully, my mom was asleep. We silently passed her and headed to bed. The next day, my mom was perfectly fine, like nothing happened. I was just happy to have my mom back, but as I was on the bus, I remembered that dream I had about my older sister. I think she was just trying to warn me about my mom. But as a kid, I wondered if I could ever see her again and just ask for peace. My name is Aditya. I am 40 years old and this happened when I was 28 years old. I live in Assam, a state in India. One day I was driving home in my Toyota Black Yaris when all of a sudden, two bikes go racing past me. It was a Duke 390 model bike and it appeared to be the bikers chasing each other or having a friendly race. I just shrugged it off and continued driving. After about five minutes, a cop car goes flying past me. They were going in the direction of the bikers and they pull over my car. One of the cops gets down and asks me to get down. I get down and he asked me if I saw two bikes going past me. I hesitated for a moment that I said yes and I gave the model and the plate number of the bike to which they said they would let me know. The next day I was at work on my computer at my office when all of a sudden I received an anonymous email on my computer. I opened it and something like this was written in bold letters. You have interfered in our business. Now pay for it and there was something posted below which I won't forget till I die. There were pictures of my house, and the worst part was there were pictures of my house inside. My bedroom, my kitchen, and my hall, everything. I quickly called the cops and they showed up 10 minutes later. They checked my computer, and after some time they said that whoever had sent this email had used random browsing centers, and there wasn't much they could do but one cop said they would put a cop to watch my house. A cop stood for five days at my house. The sixth day is the most horrible day of my life. I was sleeping in my bedroom, when all of a sudden I hear a bone chilling scream from the cop. I go out and what I saw turned my blood into ice. Two men who were wearing black pants and black jackets were stabbing the cop to death. One of the men turned to me and I could see his face clearly. <laughs> he had a creepy psycho smile and pulled out a knife and started to run at me while the other man said, don't ever involve yourself in our business, dude, or you will face the same as the cop. I looked around to see if there was something to protect me and there was an old cricket bat. I picked it up and hit the guy on the head to which he fell down and there was a pool of blood. The other guy then shot his gun and I ran at him and hit him in the head, to which he fell down and was unconscious. I quickly went in and called 100, which is the Indian police number. The cop showed up five minutes later and the two men were taken to the hospital and they survived. The cop who was stabbed unfortunately died. I testified in court as a key witness and they were both sentenced to death. Turns out that they were both prisoners and escaped from prison after killing the prison guard and dog and stole two bikes. The bikes were the same ones which went past me at great speed. The police chased them but lost control of them. To this day, I still keep flowers for the cop on his grave for dying to protect me. This is an absolutely true story that happened to me. I am 51 years old now and living in Texas. I grew up in Northern Virginia, and this is a story that happened to me when I was 16 years old. I was 16 years old and it was in the middle of summer. 
my friends and I would meet at one of our friends, Judy's apartment, each evening. One evening, Judy invited a new friend she knew from childhood. I don't remember her name, but she practiced black magic and believed she was a witch. She was only 16 as well, but she carried herself much older. This particular evening, she brought a Ouija board and lit candles. This was the first time I had seen a Ouija board, so I was intrigued and participated. As she asked questions, the slide moved to yes or no, and then later to spelling out answers. She had determined that a young female spirit lived in the board and that she was beautiful and had been a cheerleader for our high school many years ago. She was angry at her boyfriend because he had killed them both in a drunk driving accident. She wasn't angry that he got her killed. She was angry that her face had been mangled. Our new friend, the witch, kept trying to get her to trust us, that we wouldn't judge her appearance. And finally, the spirit agreed to show herself. She spelled out on the board to go to the bathroom mirror and bring candles, and she would appear. All five of us piled into the small apartment bathroom, turned off the light, closed the door, and lit candles. The witch chanted some words, and after a while, we all saw the girl in the mirror. It was horrific, and I did not expect it to work, let alone expect such horror. We all fought to get out of the bathroom at the same time, breaking the hinges. After a while, we settled down to talk about what we saw a short while ago. The witch was still communicating with the spirit in the board and told us that we needed to go to the old stone church on the outskirts of town. We were all leery, but agreed. We drove in my car out to the old stone church and arrived at the bottom of the hill leading up to it around midnight. The witch said that the girl was buried at the cemetery next to the church at the top. I drove us up the winding road to the top and parked. I left my car running and we all got out. We split up and walked around the church, peering in the old windows. We all heard a loud scream and ran back towards my car. I was running through the cemetery trying to be careful not to bang my knees on any tombstones. I ran into the back of one of my friends in the cemetery. We couldn't see anything, it was so dark. I jumped into the back seat of my car and one of my friends was already in the driver's seat. I said, go, go, go. I turned on the inside light because I felt gobs of spider webs between my fingers. When I turned on the light inside my car, I noticed it was not cobwebs. It was gobs of white hair. I screamed, which one of you did I run into the back of in the cemetery? All of my friends said it wasn't them. Who did… did I run into the girl in the Ouija board? Was the white hair from her? We made it down the windy road to the main road, and a man at the bottom was standing there with a shotgun. We stopped my car and he banged the shotgun barrel on the driver's side window, shouting to get out of here and don't come back. I noticed two small twin girls in white nightgowns standing on the L-shaped porch of the home, with yellow porch lights illuminating them. It freaked me out. I said, go, go, go. We spun out on the main country road and sped away. We got pulled over by a county sheriff deputy for speeding. He approached the car and asked us why we were speeding, and we all told him there was a man with a shotgun who threatened us back at the home at the bottom of the road to the old stone church. The county deputy shrugged his shoulders and told us there were not any homes within 20 miles of here, and to go home for the night. The next day, we all decided to go back out to the old stone church during the day to confirm that there was a home there. When we arrived, we saw the old stone church at the top of the hill, but there was no home at the bottom of the road. I am Addison Marie, and this is my parents' story from when they were in Germany. Let's start. 
It was 2006, and my parents were in a town right outside of Frankfurt, Germany, and they were at a pool hall. A couple walked up to them, and the guy named Richard, or Rich, says, You see, my lovely wife here can't speak English, and you guys look American. Would you care to join us at our house tonight and help my wife learn? My parents both wanted to help them. My dad said, Oh, of course we can help. The couple quickly smiled and glanced at each other. My parents were a little creeped out by them. Mom and Dad hopped in the back seat of their car, and the couple drove to their one-story house, and they all hopped out of the car and into the house. Inside, Rich turned on the radio, and an eerie song started playing over and over again. Rich brought out wine, cheese, and crackers. My mom went straight to the cheese and crackers with one sip of wine. My dad, on the other hand, said he wasn't hungry, <laughs> but Rich insisted my dad tried the cheese and crackers because Rich apparently made the cheese himself. So eventually, my dad ate one cracker with cheese on it. And then a few minutes later, my mom passed out on the couch. Rich went over to my mom and took her jacket off and offered to take my dad's jacket. And my dad said, yeah, sure. After Rich went into their bedroom to put the jackets in the closet, the girl, who was named Gretel, smiled and looked at my parents, <laughs> then got up to use the bathroom. When Gretel went to the bathroom, my dad carried my mom outside the house and behind a tree and waited for a taxi to take them to the hotel next to the airport. My dad placed my mom in bed, got in next to her, and he fell asleep with my mom still passed out. In the morning, my mom woke up and they still had one more day until they went home. So they made breakfast of bacon and eggs. Then they went in town to shop. Next they went to lunch at a restaurant, and so on. The next morning they woke up at 5 a.m., got ready and left to board their plane. My dad almost couldn't get on because he was puking so much. It was like in Harry Potter, when Ron accidentally made himself puke slugs. They almost didn't let my dad get on the plane, and my dad never throws up. When they got off, Four days later, they turned on the radio and heard that a couple in Germany had been asking people to teach the girl English lessons, then put sleep meds in the cheese and in the wine, and soon later, stabbing them. Then my dad remembered what happened a few days ago in Germany. Until this day, my parents still wonder what would have happened if he didn't leave the jackets, grabbed my mom, and ran. This story happened when I was just a child, and I will never forget it. At the time, I was only a young man, maybe 12 or so. I lived in a very small place. So small, it was considered a hamlet, not a town or village. Well, this town was always a very odd place, consisting of three churches and a cemetery on a hill. I lived just on the outskirts of the town with my grandpa, who was a world-renowned psychic and clairvoyant, a faith healer. So from a young age, I was exposed to many mystical events, along with the members of my family. So one day I invited my friend over to spend the weekend at my place. I had been exploring the woods and found where the creek in the village passed behind my house. It was a new spot for us to check out and spend time at. As children in the country, we enjoyed doing things outside and the woods were a great place to find new things. I was always weary of the woods because I had experienced weird things there, and I was trying to build my courage as a young man to overcome my fear of the woods. Well, my friend came over on a Friday, and I told him about the new spot I found that I wanted us to check out. So we decided to go the next day, as it was Saturday, and I had to do some chores after school on Friday. So that tied me up till the next day. So me and my friend woke up and got ready to go out to this new spot. We went through the woods and we had to cross a swamp by traversing a metal cow fence and walking by putting our feet in the holes of the fence and climbing sideways to the other side. When we got to the other side, we passed through a clearing, through a path and down a hill to the creek. We started looking around and checking the place out. It was a nice day. 
The sun was shining and it was blue skies. All of a sudden, I noticed an old plaid sleeping bag, which was not there when I had been there before. My friend asked me what it was, and I said I didn't know, and that it wasn't there the last time I was here. Then, all of a sudden, we both felt a weird sensation and looked at each other. I took a stick and slowly went over to the sleeping bag to open it up and looked inside. Well, nothing could have prepared me for what we found. As I slowly lifted the sleeping bag open, me and my friend both screamed out loud. What lay before us was a deep red pile of bloody guts. There was no mistaking it. What we saw was internal innards of something or someone. You could see the intestines and blobs of internal organs and thick blood. Me and my friend both started to feel sick and had a terrible feeling that something was there. We both started running as fast as we could, and I took a look back, and all I saw was a dark being, and the branches and limbs of the trees moving behind me as whatever it was that was chasing us caused the trees to flutter as it ran through. We ran so fast that we went right through the swamp, which was waist deep and muddy and gross and filled with God only knows what. We got home and were just silent and did not talk about it for a while. I never told my grandpa because I thought he wouldn't believe me. Me and my friend never went into those woods again together. I did later as I was older. I had a few more weird experiences, but that one was the most gruesome and unpleasant event I experienced in those woods. I look back to that day and I wonder just what was chasing us and what was that pile of bloody guts from. I still am unsure and I don't think I'll ever know. <gasps>
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You killed Dylan, didn't you? You sent those texts, wrote those notes, set up the scarecrows. <laughs> well, I didn't kill your friend. I just help uh, facilitate the deeds that must be done. We supply a food source to keep civilians safe. What are you talking about? Well, she has to eat something. You don't want her coming down from the mountain, do you? Can't get rid of her either. Sacrifices must be made to ensure that the majority survive. You might call me a murderer, but I don't see it that way. I froze as he continued. She's been eating more than usual. That's why we have a nice pile of meat down in that cellar. Homeless people mostly. I can't help it if she wants to pick off some lone campers. You're insane. What are you feeding people to? He laughed again. <laughs> I can't have you running around telling the media. Could you imagine the chaos this would bring? All the victims' families wanting justice? Exposure and rock climbing accidents make much more sense. We had been driving for a while. I could tell we were getting close to the trail. A camper, walking a brown dog alongside the road, waved to us as we passed. I wished there was some way I could tell him I was in danger. We continued the drive in silence. I was trying to comprehend the situation. When we got to the trailhead, the officer parked the car and got out. He drew his pistol, opened my door and motioned for me to start walking. The walk was slow as he limped behind me. I'll tell you where to go. If you try anything, I'll put a bullet in your skull and throw you in that cellar with the others. It was a long and silent walk up the trail. The cold air stung my face as we trekked along. Even in my panic state, I knew we were in the same area as the cellar. What are you taking me to? Her. What's her? Not sure. If you're going to kill me, at least tell me what we're going to. I can't tell you because I don't know what she is. Clawed her way here from hell is my guess. My heart was pounding and my legs grew weaker. I didn't ask any more questions. The sun was starting to set. The only sounds were the crunching of leaves and snaps of twigs beneath our feet. We took countless turns and the trail had turned to dense woods and uneven ground. I was exhausted. Getting close. I'm glad I didn't have to drag your corpse all the way up here. <laughs> I had already lost track of time. What seemed like hours of hiking finally ended. We finally stopped. In front of me was a small pond, perfectly round. Something was wrong though. The water was black and a thick layer of fog clouded the surface. It should have been frozen in this cold. Peaking just above the haze, I could see the heads of a hundred scarecrows lining the pond's perimeter. All were facing me, as though they had been waiting. The officer began to speak again as he started building a fire. The routine started to wear on us. It was always the same. Get the bodies, throw them in the cellar, write a bogus police report, contact the families. It got stale. And she got tired of the easy meals. So. We got a little more creative. Get the camper scared, get them moving in this direction. Let it hunt. It likes the trophies. When I saw your buddy's phone, I took it upon myself to get you down here. I thought it would be more of a challenge, but you basically turned yourself in. I felt myself becoming more nauseous as I recalled the events that led me here. Night fell, and the black pond began to stir. Won't she kill you, too? Like some one at a time. Whatever she can get to first. I didn't want to know just how many cops and rangers were a part of this. I considered making a break for it, but I knew I would be gunned down. The officer kept his distance with his gun pointed at me. He motioned me to move closer to the pond. I hesitantly obeyed. Stand here. That's where I put her food. The water began to churn as it surfaced. Black ripples formed small waves that splashed against the pond's edge. Its dark, matted hair was the first feature to break the surface. I immediately smelled the damp, rotting flesh. I was frozen with fear as it moved in my direction. 
and continued to ascend from the dark pool. I cannot fully describe what I saw. The hellish figure had risen from the inky depths and moved closer. It had a tall, thin form with long hair descending from its head to the middle of its body. It kept this shape momentarily. Whatever it is does not belong on this earth. As the creature moved closer, it would rapidly lose its form in a flash of gray and black static, only to return to the previous shape. I was able to make out a skeletal frame in between the rapid flashes. It moved closer. I heard something behind me, the shuffling of leaves and a man's voice yelling in the distance. I turned around in a panic, only to see a large brown dog dragging a broken leash behind it. The canine walked cautiously as it eyed the officer and I with curious skepticism. A beam of light flashed before us, and a man carrying the other end of the leash appeared. The same man I had seen earlier on the road. Sorry guys, I've been chasing my dog forever. He broke off and started following your scent. Is, uh... He saw it. What the? What? I took advantage of the moment. My survival instincts kicked in. The officer was distracted for only a few seconds, and I started running fast as I could, only to be outpaced by the frightened dog. I heard the first bullet fly by my ear. The second shot came soon after. I'll never forget the camper's scream as the bullet pierced his body. His agonizing voice echoed throughout the mountains. I never actually heard his screaming stop. They only grew quieter as I ran farther away from the pond. I ran for hours, fueled by adrenaline and survival. I knew the officer couldn't keep up with me, and he had to make sure his new witness could not escape. I will not disclose the details of where I went or where I currently reside. I'm not sure who's reading this. I am safe at the moment. I will attempt to work with the true authorities after I figure out how to tell them what I've seen without sounding insane. Right now, I'm trying to forget the sound of the man's screams and the snapping of his bones. This story happened eight years ago. I was 13 years old. At the time, me, my mom, and my dad lived in this small town with a low population. The town barely had any jobs, so my mom was a housewife while my dad worked as a cook at a diner. Growing up, I was a shy kid with no friends. I always got bullied in school for how much of a loser I was, and I loved to write and read. Mm. Uh, but that's enough about my personal life. So one weekend day, I was at home. <laughs> my dad went to work while my mom was, of course, at home cooking and cleaning. I was in my room watching TV. The day was going by kind of fast. A couple of hours later, my dad got home and my mom mm. called me down for dinner. When we finished with dinner, it was time for me to go to bed. So I did my daily routine, brush my teeth and throw on my pajamas. After that, I went to sleep. I say about four o'clock in the morning, I woke up out of nowhere, probably from a bad dream or something. For some reason, I decided to look out the window. When I looked out the window, I saw this man. He looked like he was in his 20s. He was wearing a long coat with black pants and long boots, and he had on gothic makeup. He looked like a goth. His clothes were all dirty, and he also had long black hair and was clean shaven. So when I saw this man, I was so confused as to why this man that I didn't know was standing in front of our house, staring at our house. I found that really weird. After he stared at our house for five seconds, he walked towards my mother's car and tugged on the front passenger door, but it was locked. Then he walked toward our front door and began knocking on the door. This, of course, woke my parents up. They walked downstairs and went to the door and opened it. Then I heard the man say, Hello, I'm sorry to disturb your sleep, but I need some help. I'm stranded and I've been walking for hours the whole night and I'm asking if I could come inside for a glass of water, please. Then my parents politely said, sure, come on in. Then I heard footsteps and the door closing. After this, 
I sneaked downstairs to see what they were doing. They were just sitting at the dinner table having a conversation. My parents were asking the man about himself and if he had any family he could live with. After their conversation, I heard the man asking my parents if he could have five minutes to himself. My parents said yes, and they walked out of the room. As soon as they walked away, the man gets up and sneaks over to where the car keys are hanging up and takes one of them and sneaks them in his pocket. As soon as I saw this, I yelled, Mom and Dad, he took one of the car keys. When I yelled, the man was startled and ran toward the front door, pushing my mom and dad out of the way. He opened the door and ran out. I ran upstairs to look out the window, and I saw the man running towards my mother's car, unlocking it and getting into the front passenger seat and locking the doors. My mother ran up to the door and I heard her yell, Get the f out of my car before I call the police on you, you little thief! Then the man slid over to the driver's seat, started up the car and drove off. My mother then ran inside the house and my dad called the police. Fifteen minutes later, the police arrived and my parents gave a description of the man. Still to this day, he's never been found. I will never forget that day for the rest of my life. This horrible incident happened to my son, Sam. Even today, I still do not understand why this happened to my son. It all happened three years ago. One day my son, who was a high schooler at the time, told me that he encounters a clown every day on his way to school. I did not think it was a big deal, so I replied, it's fun to have a clown in the neighborhood. But that was a mistake, for it wasn't just a clown. A few days later, Sam came home, soaked in water, I asked him what happened, to which he replied that the clown threw a water balloon at him and ran away. However, the balloon was filled with hot water and Sam almost got burnt. Sam was furious, and I was also full of shock and anger. The next day, I decided to take Sam to school. While driving, Sam started to pound on the window and shouted, Mom, that's the clown. I need to get him. I looked at where he was staring at, yet I couldn't see the clown. Sam cried out in anger as he was banging on the window. Even after that, Sam told me he keeps seeing this clown. His life was being consumed by the clown, slowly and slowly. He told me, crying, the clown is watching him on the streets, hiding between the crowd. He also stares at the clown from above when he was in the bathroom, and he even glares at it from afar when he is in school. Sam tried to ignore the clown. However, whenever he ignored it, the clown would throw a hot water balloon at him, and Sam couldn't help but chase after it with anger. Every time, the clown ran away quickly with a frantic laugh, mimicking Sam soaked in water because of the balloon. Sam said that he couldn't catch him. He tried to call the police once, but the clown was already nowhere to be found. Sam suffered from extreme stress. He started to lose his hair and couldn't eat properly. However, I had never seen the clown Sam was telling me about with my own eyes. A few months passed by, and Sam began to have insomnia. One day, I heard a scream in the middle of the night and ran to Sam's room. He was trying to jump out the window. I quickly stopped him and he yelled. The clown was looking at me through the window. I looked out the window but saw no clown. After that, Sam couldn't sleep because he developed a habit of waking up every 10 minutes to look through the window. I ended up taking him to the hospital. The doctor said it was cholerophobia, a phobia of clowns and prescribed him psychotherapy and medication. However, Sam screamed in frustration that he cannot shake it off from him. Our lives have entirely been destroyed. Sam shouted that he would get this clown and punch him to death every day. 
He started to work out a lot, and anywhere he goes, he would dash like a spring towards anyone with red hair. Watching him from the side baffled me. I started to think if we should move. One day, on my way to take Sam to school, he suddenly shouted to stop the car. As I pulled over immediately, Sam sprung out of the car. Surprised, I followed him. He ran at such a high speed and shouted, Mom, I think I could catch this guy today. <laughs> I could see the back of the clown running away in front of Sam. I ran after Sam as well. However, at the moment, Sam flew away in front of my eyes with the sound of a bang and a horn. He was run over by a car. I blacked out for a moment and I cannot remember what happened next. The next thing I can remember was when I was crying at the hospital while holding Sam very tight. His whole body was covered in antiseptic gauze and he was howling in pain. Sam cried out loud, raging. I could have caught it. I was so close. Other than looking at him, there was nothing I could do. After crying for a long time, I opened the door of the patient room to go out and get some fresh air. There was a clown in front of the door. A clown. I was surprised for the moment and tried to catch him. However, it threw a toy box at me and ran away like a maniac. His speed was surprisingly fast, so I couldn't dare to chase after him. I stood there blankly and opened the toy box it gave me. A clown doll popped out. There was a note on the head of the clown doll. It read, I did it. <laughs> My eyes burst into tears with despair and anger. A few weeks later, Sam got out of the hospital and our lives went back to normal. Fortunately, Sam said he doesn't see the clown anymore. However, after a while, we heard some news from our neighborhood. It was about a clown being found murdered in the town. I wasn't sure if that was the clown who was after Sam. Anyhow, we never saw the clown ever again. This story happened when I was 16 years old. I was living in Ohio at the time and went camping with my friend in the Zaleski State Forest. Let's call him Mark. It was the first time our parents had allowed us to go camping on our own, and the last. When they dropped us off, we started searching for a spot to set up camp as we were walking through the forest. We were walking for a while and finally found a spot. By this time, the sun was beginning to set. We quickly put up the tent and got a fire going. We cooked hot dogs until it became dark. After we finished eating, we started joking around and trying to scare each other with scary stories. As we started cooking marshmallows, I thought I heard heavy breathing coming from the woods. I thought for a moment I saw a dark figure peek out from behind a tree, but it was too dark to see clearly. I figured it was just my imagination, so Mark and I called it a night and went into our tents to sleep. The next day, we went on a hike over to a nearby lake. As we were hiking, I couldn't help but feel like we were being watched. I kept looking around, but I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. I told Mark this, but he didn't think anything of it. He didn't take me seriously and just laughed. When we reached the lake, we swam around in the water for a while. As we were swimming, I noticed someone standing behind a tree of a similar size to the figure I had seen the night before. I thought I saw him peek out at me for a moment. I was kind of freaked out by that, but Mark still did not take me seriously. I convinced Mark to investigate the tree with me, but when we looked behind it, there was nothing there. While we were walking back, I heard a rustle in the bushes. I asked Mark if he heard it, and he nodded. We turned around and again saw nothing. Mark thought it was just a wild animal, so we kept walking. Eventually, we heard a stick crack. The noise was coming from the left of us. We looked over in that direction 
and caught sight of the figure again. He was peeking at me behind a bush. He was looking at me directly with his wide, bloodshot eyes. I screamed and watched him disappear into the forest. Mark looked back at me, but since he didn't see anyone, he figured I was just trying to trick him. Mark was pissed. He yelled that I was ruining his trip. We didn't talk to each other for the rest of the day. When we reached our camp, we went our separate ways. I decided to take a walk into the woods that night. As I was walking, I heard a gruff voice from behind me. Thinking it was Mark, I shouted angrily, Hey Mark, what are you doing? I turned behind me, but the person I saw wore a grey jacket, stained work jeans, and a dirty baseball cap. He almost looked like a middle-aged man with grey, wispy hair. He hurried off into the thorn bushes the moment I saw him, but I was wearing shorts and didn't want to cut my legs, so I didn't follow him. I returned to the camp and saw Mark making a fire. He immediately apologized to me, and what I realized next really freaked me out. Mark wasn't wearing a grey jacket, work jeans, or a baseball cap. I didn't tell Mark about what I had seen because I didn't want to get into another fight. The rest of the night was normal, and when it became dark, we returned to our tents for the night. But in the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange noise coming from outside. It sounded like someone walking around. I checked my phone and saw it was 4 a.m. I also heard some gruff breathing like I had heard before. That's when I realized we hadn't put out our campfire. However, I was too nervous to go outside because of the strange noises. That's when I saw the shadow of a man walk by the side of our tent. It looked like he was wearing a baseball cap and a jacket. What happened next, I will never forget. The shadow pulled out what looked to be a knife. Slowly, I heard the zipper begin to open. My heart started beating faster and faster. That's when I saw it. A head poked into the tent with terrible, red, bloodshot eyes. He smiled a wide, creepy smile with yellow teeth that shined. His smile started getting wider and wider. Then he whispered to me in his raspy voice, I killed your friend, and you'll be next. Just as he raised his knife over me, Mark came and punched him in the side right where his kidney was. Mark was a pretty big guy, so he was able to knock the guy on his side. The next thing I knew, I heard him punching the old man from outside. I was too in shock to remember most of what happened next, but eventually, I heard police sirens. After a while, a police officer rushed over to me and told me, You'll be okay. We've got him. After that, we were too freaked out to stay there, so we called our parents and they drove us home. Even today, I still wonder what would have happened if Mark hadn't been there to save me. When I was in high school, there was an abandoned house behind my house. Whenever I passed by there, I would hear the sound of electricity crackling from the house. Although my parents said that nobody had lived there for decades, the sound of electricity kept coming regularly. I was worried that there might be a risk of a fire if the electricity was somehow connected. So, one day, I decided to go into the house with my friend Tim. After we finished school, we went to that house, but hesitated to go in for a while. I asked Tim if he was scared, but he replied, This is not fear, but rather a trembling of excitement. The old door creaked open with a spine-chilling sound, and we entered inside. Inside the house, there were scattered dog feeds everywhere, and a strong odor that pierced the nose. And oddly enough, the floor was covered with numerous tacks, so we tried our best not to step on them while we walked in. At that moment, we heard a strange, screaming-like noise coming from upstairs. We should have left the house at that moment. However, we couldn't resist our curiosity and slowly walked up the stairs. From one room on the second floor, 
we heard the sound of electricity crackling. Then we heard a man's voice from that room saying, Don't eat it. Eat it. We were shocked and cautiously approached the room. When we looked inside, Tim screamed in horror. As we entered, we saw three people sitting on the floor with dog collars around their necks, and one man was training them with a stun gun. All of them stared at us in silence for a moment, and then they started screaming for help like crazy. The man who was training them panicked and started hitting them, telling them to shut up, but they screamed so loud that it seemed like their throats would burst. Curses involuntarily slipped from my mouth as I looked into their tear-filled eyes. At that moment, the man hitting them grabbed the sun gun and charged at us, and Tim and I ran for our lives. However, Tim was caught, and his screams echoed through the hallway, along with the sound of the stun gun. I ran out of the house and called the police, then went back inside. I walked to the room without making any noise, and the man was putting the dog collar on Tim's neck. I ran towards him in anger and kicked him with all my might. He rolled over and fell. He dropped the electric shocker and I picked it up and threatened him while kicking him crazily. After a while, the police arrived and arrested him. When the police tried to untie the people tied up with dog collars, they were shocked. Their hands and feet were glued to the floor with instant adhesive. I realized that Tim's hands and feet were also stuck to the floor with adhesive. I locked eyes with sobbing Tim and my legs turned to jelly. Eventually, the rescue team arrived and managed to rescue the people who were tied up. However, they had been beaten and fed only dog food for weeks and their condition was serious. When the police asked the man why he did such a thing, he simply said he wanted to keep the humans as pets. He was eventually sent to prison. Fortunately, Tim was able to recover from his injuries with treatment, but the trauma stayed with him. We never brought up that story again after that day. This story has now come to an end, but I want to warn you all, if you ever feel like exploring an abandoned house, Never, ever go there. No one can guarantee your safety. It happened a few days ago. Me and my family went to a vacation house owned by my uncle. I had a great time there since I got to spend some time playing with my siblings in the clubhouse. One day we decided to visit the local mall, which was about 15 minutes away from where we live. My uncle's family went in another car, and we went in our own. We didn't exactly know where the mall was, so my sister sent us the location, and we followed that. Suddenly, our car stopped in the middle of the road. Fortunately, nothing bad happened, and we somehow managed to park our car beside the road. I called my sister, who was in my uncle's car. They said they had been pulled over by the cops because their car was a four-seater, and there were six people sitting in the car. After about 30 minutes, my dad found a mechanic and our car started working again. We were now going to the mall, but suddenly our GPS stopped working. Keep in mind that my sister's GPS stopped working too. We then figured out that by the time we would reach there, the mall would have already been closed. Anyway, we headed back to our home and played pool in the clubhouse. The next morning, we were all shocked to know that the mall was burnt to a crisp when we were supposed to be there. There were around 50 people dead. To this day, I think what would have happened if our car didn't stop where it did, or if the GPS hadn't stopped working. It still gives me chills. My name is Kevin and this happened to me last month. I was camping with two of my friends. We booked a spot at a large campsite in a forest that's right next to a lake and a beach. On the second night of our trip, I woke up from my sleep to use the bathroom. The bathrooms were located in their own individual building, 
and to get there, you have to walk down a dirt road through the forest. While I was walking to the washrooms, I felt like I was being watched. Luckily, I made it to the bathroom safely. But on my way back, I started to hear fast footsteps behind me. I turned around, and following right behind me was a scarily tall human-like figure. The only thing I could see other than its silhouette were its beaming orange eyes. I immediately started to run as fast as I could while the figure ran behind me. I cut through some trees and bushes and hid so that it lost my tracks. I eventually made it to my tent, but I decided to quickly peek out to see if the creature was gone. To my surprise, I saw the tall figure walk to the lake's beach and start digging a hole in the sand. It then sprinted off into the forest. My friends didn't believe me when I told them, but I know what I saw was true, and I will definitely never be heading back to that campsite ever again. I wanted to share my horror story experience with you. I cannot tell you my name because of privacy issues. You can just call me Maybeth. I'm 13 years old and this incident happened to me recently. I had gone to live with my grandmother for a summer vacation. My grandmother lives on the city side in a big house in which my nine-year-old cousin John also lives. My cousin has a habit of teasing me. It was nighttime and I was sleeping in my room. It was two in the morning. In my room, there's a big window that faces the outside of the house in which I could see the garden and a lot of trees. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of somebody tapping on my window. It was dark in the room. When I looked around the room from the window, I saw my cousin hanging from the tree outside the window. He was knocking on the window like a psychopath and he had that creepy smile on his face. I knew that he was not my cousin, but whoever it was, I wasn't going to find out. I quickly ran away from the window while screaming at the top of my lungs. My grandma came and asked me what had happened. I told her all about it, and she said, You should not worry too much. It is normal for me. I even saw you. I was so confused. I asked Grandma, What does it mean? Then what she said next will always remain in my memory. There's a ghost that lives in this town. It can shift into anybody's face. I was so scared after what she told me that the next day I went back to my house. For context, I'm a 21-year-old athletic woman, and I'm 5'7". This incident happened a couple weeks ago, and I still remember it like yesterday. I was a local jogger that would casually say good morning to neighbors and strangers. I also lived alone and single, as my ex-boyfriend left me for a taller girl, but I'm not here to talk about that. It was a Thursday evening. I put on my jogging clothes and timing bracelet as I left my house, and began jogging. A few of my neighbors had gone back inside while others still had some duties, like gardening. As I was looking at my bracelet, I looked back up and nearly bumped into an overweight, middle-aged, towering woman who was just standing in the middle of the sidewalk. I came to a halt and apologized to her, but I noticed that she was looking directly at the ground. She said nothing at all and didn't even care to look at me once. I walked around her and continued jogging, but there was something about her that wasn't okay at all. I quickly looked back, and now her head was pointing at my direction. I could see her bloodshot eyes through her long, messy hair. It gave me goosebumps, and I just looked away. When I got home, I forgot about her, and since the jog made me sweaty, I decided to take a nice hot shower. Afterwards, I put some clothes on and watched a movie on Netflix in the living room. I sat on my sofa that was behind a large window that didn't have curtains at the time. You'll see why I mentioned this. During the middle of the movie, I started to notice something on the TV. It looked like a reflection, almost. Curious, I paused the movie and got up from the sofa to look closely. That's when I realized it was indeed a reflection of someone's face. 
I look back and my eyes widen as I saw the same woman I almost bumped into. She had her tongue and chest pressed against the glass whilst giving me this perverted smile. Then she starts to bang the window with her right fist. I immediately grab my phone off the table as I ran upstairs to the bathroom, and locking the door, I laid down in my empty bathtub as I called the cops. Then I heard the window glass breaking, a sound that will be forever burned into my head. I could hear her footsteps climbing the stairs as I prayed to myself that the cops come here ASAP. As soon as the woman reaches the bathroom door, the sound of a man shouting police and woman getting tasered were sudden, but a relief at the same time. I waited until it was safe for me to go out. A police officer walked up to me and thanked me as he told me that they were looking for this woman for two weeks. He then explained that she was an escaped prisoner who was convicted for molesting her 15-year-old daughter. The scariest part about this was how ninja silent she was. I blamed the volume on the TV, but she managed to follow me back home without me noticing is strange. I didn't even have headphones on. A couple weeks later, I had to move out because I'd gotten a job somewhere else, and the police haven't given me an update yet. I also hope that vile woman rots in her cell for what she's done. It gives me the chills to think about an incident that happened when I was 13. I still remember it, even to this day. So here's the story. One day at school, my friends decided to play Ding Dong Ditch. Let's call them Anthony, Ed, David, and Josh. So once we planned everything, we went out around 6 p.m. and started deciding which house we should do. There was this one house that was creepy looking, and I heard rumors that a crazy man was living at that place. So being dumb kids, we decided to see if the rumors were true. Being the fastest one, I had to knock first. So I did around three times and ran. Then I hid behind a bush where Ed was hiding. I jumped when the door swung open and a crazed man looked out the door. I realized that this man wasn't normal. He was screaming and saying, I'm gonna kill you, then slammed the door. We were a little terrified, but we decided it was Anthony's turn to knock. I told him to walk slowly then run to us when he's done. So Anthony knocked, then ran to where we were hiding. A few seconds later, the guy opened the door with something that gave me the chills. A knife and a metal baseball bat. Ed said, run! The guy heard Ed and started chasing us at a terrifying speed. We hid behind a neighbor's house. We stayed there until we felt like he was gone. But this part is something that I can call paralyzation. The guy was right there, but instead of a knife, the man was holding Ed. We screamed, then ran to our houses. My mind was racing. Was Ed gonna be okay? I called David and Josh and I asked them if they were home yet, and they said yes. Then they asked me where was Ed I told them what happened to Ed, and they were in shock. I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. That day I was getting ready for bed, thinking about what had just happened. While I was laying in bed, there was a thunderstorm. Then, after a few flashes, there was a shadowy figure appearing after each flash of lightning. I turned to look. And there he was, looking at me. And he gave me a bone-chilling grin. To this day, I still haven't told anybody about this incident. Ed went missing. And he's still missing to this day. Next to my house, there lived a strange man named Tom. Tom never looked people in the eyes, he always stared at their stomachs. So, I have never once made eye contact with him. Whenever Tom saw me, he always repeated the same phrase. It was, I want a hug. He loved hugging anything. He would often be seen hugging trees or poles when passing by. Once, I saw him getting slapped when he asked the stranger for a hug. 
it seemed like he had an intense obsession with hugging. One day, while passing by his house, I happened to see through the open front door dozens of mannequins lined up. I was shocked, but I pretended not to notice and greeted Tom. Tom smiled brightly and still stared at my stomach, arms outstretched. After that day, Tom started to give me chills. One day, he met me in front of my house and said to me, I want to be hugged for 100 hours, but no one will hug me. Suddenly, he asked me to hug him and came towards me with his arms outstretched. I hugged him, feeling uncomfortable. He held on to me for a long time without letting go. I told him to stop hugging me, but he didn't release. Instead, he started squeezing me tightly. I pushed him away angrily, but he didn't even flinch. He shouted, I love hugging. Don't let go. Never. It was the first time I heard him speak so loudly, and his breathing became heavy, his heart beating rapidly. I used all of my strength to pull away from him and punched him in the face. Then he ran away to his house. I followed him to his house, still angry. Looking through his window, I saw something eerie. Tom was hugging each of the mannequins one by one. Then he kicked one of the mannequins and shouted, It's not warm enough. A few days later, in the middle of the night, I heard a knock on the door. It was Tom, holding handcuffs. My heart sank and I held my breath. He stood there for over an hour, repeating the same gesture of hugging the air. I called the police, and after a warning, they sent him home. After that day, Tom disappeared and never came out of his house for over a month. I went to his house, but there was no response. And despite several more weeks passing, Tom was nowhere to be seen. Eventually, I went to his house and an overwhelming stench emanated from it. I eventually called the police and they found Tom's body buried under dozens of mannequins. Among them, there was one mannequin that looked almost human with a wig and painted eyes and mouth. Tom was lying down with the mannequin in his arms and both of Tom's hands that were holding the mannequin were handcuffed. The cause of death was cardiac arrest. Hello, my name is Sam. The story I'm about to share with you is a true story that happened in my old neighborhood. I was in elementary school with my two sisters. Mary was 13 and the oldest. I was 11 and the middle child, and my little sister Emily was 8. One day at school I witnessed a little girl being forced into a blue vehicle. She was crying, but the man forced her in was trying to shut her up. That day we had an indoor recess, and it had something to do with a blue vehicle and a missing student. The teachers locked the school entrance and warned the class to look out for a blue car. Every morning we would catch the bus at 7.15 and I would always look out for an adventure. So I would always pay attention to everything that happened. One day we were waiting by the bus stop as usual when I spotted it. Across the street sat a man inside a blue car. He had black hair and sunglasses. His windows were always open and we could see inside the car easily. It looked like he had pink seats and cute puppies with toys. It was strange, especially because he was only staring at us. We were the only people who were at the bus stop, so it wasn't like he was watching his kid or anything. I didn't say anything at first, but then I started seeing him regularly. I pointed him out to my older sister, Mary, joking that he was stalking us and he probably wanted to kidnap someone. We all started laughing, but then realizing the situation, we got scared. Eventually, the bus came and we all sat in the back. As the bus was moving, I turned around to stare at the window, and to my horror, the blue car was following us. I screamed and informed everyone about the man that was following us. 
At that point, everyone was crowded at the back, trying to have a glimpse of the man. The bus driver told us to sit down and was probably nothing, but she looked scared. Realizing he was spotted, the blue car turned at a corner and disappeared. We all calmed down, but two minutes later he showed up again, and we all noticed. After that incident, we stopped seeing the man, but we still experienced weird things. Like one time, my cousin and I were playing in the backyard. We had a gate at the back that opened to the alley and led out to the bus stop. At one point, one of my cousins opened the gate. We began playing tag in the alley when a small white puppy began running towards us. It was very similar to the puppies in the blue car. We fed it some chicken, but as I was feeding it, it tried to bite me. We realized that this puppy was very aggressive and rough. We also noticed that the puppy had a blue mark painted on it. Before, we didn't pay it any mind. But the more I think about it, the more I realized it must have belonged to some sort of gang. My mom told us to stop playing in the alley and stay close. After that, the puppy disappeared. We forgot about the situation until now. Emily told me when the puppy disappeared, she heard a loud whistle and the dog began running to a man dressed in black and who stood on the corner. Was the puppy the same puppy from the blue car? Was he using the puppy as bait to kidnap us? And sometimes I wonder what would have happened if we ended up following the puppy towards the man. My name is Ivan, and this story happened about two years ago. A very close friend of mine went on a few dates with a girl, and I went to a party with them as well, and she was nice. Then things started getting weird after about two months. She started to morph him. He's a very quiet and not confrontational guy, so he let her. She made him dye his hair jet black and grow out a beard and dye that as well. Then I went almost a full year without seeing him. The next time I saw him, he was totally different. He talked like an old man and seemed like he had aged 40 years in a year. Keep in mind, we were 19 at the time. I became worried for him and thought he was being manipulated. I went to his apartment and rang the doorbell. I rang about five more times before someone answered. He invited me in for tea which I thought was weird since he always hated hot drinks. I hung out for a while before asking to use the bathroom. As I went down the hallway, I noticed a room that I hadn't seen before. Out of curiosity, I went in and saw something that shocked me. A big red pentagram was in the center of the room with candles in each corner of the shape. As I walked in, I didn't realize the door had shut behind me. I heard the door click and looked up to see my friend laughing. Not a happy, joy-filled laugh, but a low, hoarse, evil laugh. He ran towards me and wrapped his hands around my throat. He choked me to the ground. I was gasping. Shortly before suffocating, I picked up one of the burning candles and stuck the flame into his chest. He screamed and fell down, patting out the fire. I kicked him in the head several times and knocked him out. I heard a woman down the hallway scream and running towards the room. I kept the door closed using my whole body weight. She was banging on the door and screaming, If you let go, I won't hurt you. I'll just use your soul to make him live forever. Well, by now, my friend began to wake back up. But when he looked at me, he didn't try to kill me. He just looked dazed. He looked around and saw me barely holding the door closed and began to help me. She managed to break down the door and flung both of us onto the floor. I skidded across the floor and part of my shirt wiped away the red paint. She screamed and began to sort of melt. We stood up, stunned, wondering what the hell happened. He changed and we both left to go to my apartment. He told me the whole story. Their relationship had been going well for a few months, but she then began asking him to do weird things, like going to Wiccan stores and purchase black candles. He didn't mind, so he got them. Then one night, he woke up to being in the middle of a pentagram, tied to the floor. She was saying something in some language he didn't know. 
He felt an excruciating pain in his chest, then woke up to see me holding the door. I did some research and I even took him to see an exorcist. The exorcist believed the witch was using him as a vessel to potentially transfer Satan into his body. He has since moved out of that apartment. Hi, I'm Roseanne, and I have a cousin, Corey. He's 13 and used to sleepwalk a lot. And it's been quite a long time since he was sleepwalking, and this is what happened to him. One day, his parents decided to drop him off at me and my boyfriend Noah's apartment, since his parents have work somewhere far away, and his brothers have school. And that time, Corey was sick too, and we told him to rest. My boyfriend got a call from his grandma, and he told me we have to go. So I followed him since I had nothing to do. On my way home, I got a text from Corey that said, Anne, come home now, please. When we arrived, we ran upstairs and we opened the door. We didn't see any sign of my cousin. We both search everywhere and find him inside the closet. His eyes were black. So my boyfriend kept calling his name and his eyes went back to normal. Then this is where he told us what happened. Before he went to sleep, he put his earphones and phone on his table. And then he went to sleep. He woke up because the hallway lights were on and the first thing he felt was his earphone. And then he saw his phone on his stomach. The way he sleeps is he covers his face with the blanket, so that's why he can't see who's home or what happened. He was about to sit down, but he heard a woman's voice saying, I'm gonna take him. He's not gonna come back. He's not gonna come back. Corey knew it wasn't my voice or his mother's voice, so he just stayed quiet. He also got the feeling of someone walking in the room and checking if he was asleep or not again and again. Something inside him kept telling him to close his eyes. But he realized his phone and earphones were not where he had put them. And that's when he felt something sitting on his bed and crawling on him. Corey closed his eyes shut and prayed while the thing lifted his blanket where his face was and laughed. He described the laugh as deep and echoing and slow. Corey said that it didn't scare him since it happened to him so many times. But this sleep paralysis was different, which shocked him. After what felt like hours, he quickly sat up and the lights were never on and the phone and earphones were never in his hand. He heard knocking on the wall and ran to our room and hid in our closet with his phone and earphones. That's when he texted me and calmed himself. We called my boyfriend's aunt's friend who knows about this kind of stuff. She told us that the thing was mad that my cousin stopped walking with them, where he was sleepwalking in real life. And they want to be friends with him. And that's why they want to take him forever. We didn't tell Corey about this, but nowadays we ask his three brothers to sleep in the same room with him so that the ghost doesn't take him away from us. Thank you for listening to this story. This happened this week on Wednesday, and an update, my cousin is doing okay. He just doesn't want to sleep early except if it's a school day. But the knocking sounds have never left him alone, and his brothers have never heard it. I still remember the face of my friend dying in front of my eyes. Would that look be a resentment against me, an anger, or a sadness? I do not know the answer. I would never know forever. Sometimes the memory of that day portrays like a movie scene in my head, regardless of my will, and it feels like it is getting clearer as days go by. My psychiatrist told me that this was because of the shock, and he said he would conduct a hypnotherapy to erase my memory. In my unconscious, I imagine going back to that day to save my friend. However, despite repeating hundreds of times, I could not save him. It happened eight years ago. This is a story of Ewan, a friend of mine who fell into a cult. He had believed in religion for a long time, but there was something off about it. Rumors say that people worship a very large snake as a god. I told him to not lie, but Ewan's face looked serious. He said everything went well after believing in that religion. One day, I couldn't resist his incessant invitation, so I followed him once. He was my best friend for ten years, so I couldn't reject. What was the name of the religion? I couldn't remember. But one thing I do remember is that the name was not in modern language. 
I was shocked as soon as I entered the religion auditorium. Everyone was wearing a snake-faced mask with their tongues sticking out. Their tongues were all split in the middle like a snake. But that day happened to be the day of an important ritual, which was the day of worship to the snake god. The cult leader came into the auditorium and the believers frantically made the sound of snakes. I was shocked and got horrified to see Iwan was also hissing like crazy. A moment went by and the believers gave something to the leader. Someone gave a snake-shaped gold. Someone else gave huge bundles of money and someone even brought a deer that they had caught themselves. When it was Iwan's turn, I was confused because his hands were empty. However, when the leader stood in front of him, Iwan pushed me towards the leader. Full of shock and anger, I asked him what on earth he was doing. The leader, with an excited look, said to me, Oh, such a precious gift. Do you also agree with being offered as a sacrifice to the snake god? I cried out, Never. Iwan started to persuade me. You will get a huge reward if you give a part of your body to the snake god. Let's cut a little bit off of your thigh. I did it too. Iwan showed me his thigh, and his thighs were indeed cut. I shouted out, never. The leader suddenly became cold and stared at Iwan. He said quietly, Then, Mr. Iwan does not have a sacrifice to offer today. Iwan's face became cold, and he started to tremble. He knelt down and begged me for permission. I did not want to do it, so I flatly refused. Then the leader shouted, The snake god commands you to be punished. Then he dragged Iwan to take him somewhere. I followed him, yelling to let him go, but I couldn't help him because the believers stopped me. Iwan screamed and grappled, yet they did not let him go. They took him somewhere far away and reached a huge cage. And inside the cage, there was a large snake coiled up that seemed to be more than five meters long. Iwan screamed, but the believers threw Iwan into the cage. In shock, I asked what they were doing, to which the leader replied, the snake god will decide whether to punish him or to forgive him. We shall see his will. Soon after, the huge snake started to wind round Iwan's body. He screamed for help and his eyes met mine. He looked at me and opened his mouth as if he was trying to tell me, but he couldn't speak. The snake was around his body completely and I could hear a sound like crackling bones. I cried out and screamed, but I was kicked out by the believers. In such shock and horror, I called the police. The police arrived, but they were stopped by the leader and his believers. It took a while for the police to arrest them. When the police tried to find Iwan, he was nowhere to be found. However, the body of the snake was quite swollen. After the investigation, the police confirmed that Iwan was eaten by the snake. The leader and his believers were put in jail. It turned out that the leader actually fed not only Iwan, but also numerous people to the snake. I still cannot forget the eyes of dying Iwan, and I still have nightmares. In my nightmare, it is not Iwan, but me being winded up to death by the snake and the feeling is so vivid as if it were real. Even today, my bed was soaked with my sweat and the disgusting smell I felt in my dreams remained in my nose. When will this nightmare be over? It was a Thursday night when my boyfriend Gerard and I wanted to meet up at the park for a casual talk. We were neighbors, and our parents were really close friends. I was 15 at that time, and he was 19. 
Our parents didn't mind us dating, and they actually encouraged it, as we were meant for each other. My mom would go jogging with his mom, and my dad would go for drinks with his dad. On that Thursday night, I was walking up and down, waiting for him to come out of his house. We planned to meet up at 8, but at 8.10, he was nowhere to be seen. I began to call my neighbor, who lives opposite my house, to ask her what I should do. She couldn't pick up the phone as she was having tuition classes on. I was standing underneath the lamppost waiting for Gerard, and suddenly the lights went out. I got scared, so I sent lots of messages to him asking him to hurry. The lights went back on and I was scared like shit. I spammed Gerard again asking why he isn't out yet and telling him I was scared and I can't wait for him any longer. He replied back with a short text saying that we will be a bit late and he's putting on some cologne. I sighed in disbelief. The lights went off once again, but I was not scared of it anymore as I already felt so annoyed. Yes, it turned on again, but this time it was flickering. I looked closer to see a shabby old woman hanging on top of the lamppost. I freaked out, but I knew I had to get that lady down as I thought she was my neighbor. I was wrong. Excuse me, ma'am. I need to get you down right now, I said. She mumbled a few Chinese words, which I couldn't understand, and I replied with a, uh huh? She started screaming so loudly, and she was laughing like a maniac. She jumped down, and she was chasing me. I was crying and shouting for help as I saw her holding a sharp piece of glass. Luckily, my boyfriend came out and pulled me into his house, as he saw her too. She was banging her head on our window and mumbling the same Chinese words. I couldn't understand it, but I think my boyfriend did as he was Chinese. He pulled me upstairs, kissed me on the forehead, and told me to hide in the bathroom with him, as it was the only room with a lock. He called 911 and I was shaking violently, as I was so freaked out. The woman managed to break into our house, and she found us in the toilet. Wo Yao Ni, Si 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 Si, she said. I screamed, and my boyfriend covered my mouth. The door handle was shaking violently as she was trying to come in. The police arrived and they took her away. I found out she escaped from a mental asylum, and my boyfriend told me that she was saying something that she wants me to die. Two years have passed and I'm going through therapy. My boyfriend moved out of town after that incident, and we broke up as we couldn't handle long-distance relationships. I am grateful to be alive. My name is Louise M, and today is 11-9, the same day of this event. I'm an 18-year-old male teenager, and I live in a city called Belém, capital of a Brazilian state. English is not my first language, so pardon me if I make a mistake. At 4.53 a.m., I woke up. I was having a great dream and everything. As soon as I looked at my watch, I got sad and angry because I had to wake up at 5.50. I got to bed again and tried to force myself to sleep. But then, I heard something strange. I heard a noise coming from my window. It was a strange noise, like when you scratch an iron tool on a wall or like someone sharpening a knife. Still, I found it weird because I live on the second floor of a house and couldn't be an animal as the first thing I thought of was that. So I gathered the courage to find out what it was. In the corner of my window, there is a hole. So I decided to peek through it. I pulled my curtains only a bit, just enough to see through the hole. And then, my heart dropped as I saw a hand of a person holding onto the wall outside the house. When I pulled my curtains to peek, I made a little noise, and the scratching stopped. I got up and got out of my room. There's an old BB gun in the other bedroom of my house. So I got that, trying to make as little noise as possible. I made it to the bathroom and called my brother, who is a cop, as I live with my grandfathers and didn't want to wake them up. My brother said to check again and see if there was really someone there. From the other room of my house, you can see the window of my bedroom. So I opened up the other room's window, and I was relieved. I didn't see anyone. My heart started to slow down as I was filled with adrenaline before. 
I told my brother there was no one, and he went huh. back to sleep. I still think about that. My brother told me it could be a spirit, as our family has a history with this supernatural thing. It could be true. It was dark, and because I just woke up, I could have imagined things. Still, there are three things that make me uncomfortable. Number one, I'm not a person who wakes up lazy or sloth-like. I wake up ready because I used to train as soon as I awoke, as I am an athlete. Number two is that I never heard a noise like that before. I can't describe it. It was like someone was trying to open the lock of the window with a knife or something metal. Number three, it was very convenient that the noise stopped when I moved the curtain. Anyway, I think the scariest thing about this event today is that it wasn't clearly a ghost or anything unnatural. I was just afraid of why a person was breaking in my house. Because sometimes, it isn't just a robbery. There are bad and scary people in this world. I just thank God, because everything is fine now. But still, I wonder, what would have happened if I didn't wake up that night? I still can't forget the man I met when I was young. The man who scared me most in the world. However, I still don't know his face. If only I could know his face, I could report him to the police now. The terrible memory from back then is still vivid in my mind as if it were yesterday. It was 20 years ago, during a hot summer, when I was a middle school student. I lived in the countryside and played with my friends by the river and in the mountains every day. However, my grandmother always warned me not to go to the mountains at night, saying that faceless people roamed there but I just thought she was trying to scare me. However, later, I realized that my grandmother's words were not a joke to scare me. One day, my friend and I were playing in the mountains and didn't realize how late it was getting. As it got dark, we hurried back home, but got lost on the way. We panicked and wandered around for a while, but then I saw a man approaching us. At first, I felt relieved to see him, but the closer he got, the more uneasy I felt. He asked us what we were doing there, but I got chills because his lips didn't move when he spoke. After a moment, I realized he was wearing a mask, but it wasn't a mask. It was made of someone else's facial skin. At first, I thought it was fake, but when I looked closely, I saw that it was real and I saw several twisted marks between the skin. Suddenly, he picked up a rock and hit my friend's head. My friend fell, and the man pulled out a knife and started to cut off my friend's facial skin. I heard my friend screaming in pain. I ran away, screaming like crazy without looking back. I didn't know where I was going, and just jumped down, running towards the bottom. When I looked back, he wasn't chasing me. He was only focused on peeling my friend's facial skin. I ran further away and looked back, and he was holding my friend's skin in his hand. At that moment, I saw his real face. He grinned at me and shouted, Come here! Want to try wearing the mask? I saw his mouth moving but I couldn't see his features clearly from that distance. I wanted to get closer and see his face, but I was afraid I would die. I ran away again, as if going insane. After running for a while, I came back to my senses and realized that I was down the mountain. I ran back home, crying, and told my mother, who reported it to the police. The police soon arrived at the mountain and found my friend's body with his facial skin removed, but they never found the culprit. When the police asked me if I saw his face, I said yes, but it wasn't his real face. 
The police searched for him, but they never found him. Afterwards, the village was abuzz for a while, but as time passed, it gradually faded from my memory. After that day, no one went to the mountain again. Time passed, and I moved to the city and lived a normal life as an office worker, burying the terrible memory in my mind. But sometimes, I still think about that day and try to remember his face. I try my best to recall the man's face from my memories, but I just can't seem to see it. I've struggled to remember his face with all my might, sweating profusely, but it was always a failure. So, I am still in doubt tonight, as I drift off to sleep. Who was he really? If only I had gotten closer to him back then, could I have seen his face. This happened two years ago. I was fairly new to the world of work and I had just started working for a company. Back then at work I was working late nights and early mornings, in fact all of us really were. Our company had a kind of rotation for this and we had to do one late shift followed by one morning shift every week. I remember leaving the late shift after 11pm on the night in question. I walked through the dimly lit parking lot back to my car, I got in and started checking my messages on my smartphone. Then suddenly a thought came to me. I wasn't sure if I had locked up upon leaving work. As I was the last one out due to the night shift, this was my responsibility. It couldn't be helped. I summoned up the energy to head back there and check. I got out of my car and headed back to work, checked and then headed back to my car. Thankfully it was locked and I must have been gone for all of about 40 seconds max. I got in and started my engine and felt a clammy hand cover my mouth. Then I felt a man's hot breath against my ear say, if you keep your mouth shut, you don't die. I couldn't speak. I was terrified into silence. I just remember waves of panic crashing over me. My head was completely blank. I looked in the rearview mirror and nodded my head. I recognized the man behind me. He worked in the same company as me but in a completely different department. I was surprised and against his orders I asked aloud, Howard, what? Why? No, the words just came out of me. I had never really spoken with him before, he was just kind of a quiet guy, but I knew him. And he replied, I've been interested in you since you started working here. If you don't say you're going to be mine, I'll kill you right here. Fearful for my life, I could do little else than nod in agreeance. He then pulled down the lever of my seat so my seat went flat and began attempting to drag me into the back seats towards him. I screamed for him to stop. You said you don't like me, he mumbled. He was trying to pull my clothes off. I thrashed at him and I think somehow in the scuffle he hit something against the open passenger door and this gave me enough time to get free. I ran back to the company building since I had the key. I got in there and I locked myself in. I called a male colleague who left shortly after me and told him what had just happened. I know I should have called the police but I was in such a panic. Fortunately for me my colleague was still in the area and he turned around immediately and headed back to work. With him around I felt that I was safe to unlock the door. We went to the parking lot and searched for Howard but couldn't find him anywhere. It was at this point that I filed a police report. I was absent from work for a while and I decided to use my vacation time. I didn't want to go back there and have to talk to the gossipers. And while I was away, Howard was arrested. With this in mind, I was happy to go back to work as long as he wasn't there. I thought it was safe. When I came back to work, I was told that women were no longer going to be working the night shift alone and the company offered to help me relocate if I wasn't comfortable working there any longer. My parents wanted me to do this, but I didn't. I actually liked the job. I didn't want to let that creep make me quit my job. I wanted him to know that I wasn't scared. Plus, with him arrested, I didn't think that I had anything to worry about. My company informed me on my first day back that he had been dismissed, and that was really good to hear. 
The police were in touch and they advised me to keep my doors locked and the usual safety precautions. They said that a momentary lapse in concentration almost cost me my life, and they told me to ruminate on that for a while. This is a story about something I experienced not too long ago. I've always loved getting my fortune told since I was young, so even as an adult I would frequently visit fortune tellers. Eventually, I became a regular visitor at one particular fortune telling shop and would visit periodically. The fortune teller there was eerily accurate. He told me, soon your boss at work will have a major accident and you'll get a promotion. Surprisingly, not long after that, my boss really did get into a major car accident, and I was promoted. Intrigued, I asked the fortune teller how he could predict the future so accurately. He claimed that, unlike other fortune tellers, he communicated directly with demons to foresee the future. I felt scared but couldn't stop going there because his predictions were just too accurate. He told me that demons could do anything, and many of his clients had become wealthy with the help of demons. However, in order to fulfill a wish, one had to pay a large price to the demons. When I asked him what that price was, he fell silent and made a chilling expression before finally speaking. Every night I go to hell in my dreams and meet demons. I need to play with them there, since causing pain to others is their only happiness. So they whip and beat me with iron clubs, taking pleasure in it. I must endure this pain completely. Only then will they grant my wishes. But it's okay. I won't die because it's just a dream. <laughs> the intensity of the torture just increases depending on the size of the wish. I couldn't sleep that night and thought for a long time. If I could have everything I wanted. There was one thing that came to mind. My wish was to date the girl I'd been in love with for three years. The next day, I went to him and told him I wanted to date this girl. After thinking for a while, he said, Changing someone's heart is very difficult. It requires altering destiny. If I ask the demons for this, they will demand a high price. I'll have to endure terrible torture. After more contemplation, he said, So, I'll need $20,000. I was shocked by the huge amount, but I had no choice. I spent all my savings, took out loans, and went to him a few days later. He didn't seem happy, even after receiving the $20,000. He was trembling and sweating profusely. And then, a few days later, something incredible happened. The girl I had a crush on contacted me, and we really started dating. I was extremely happy every day. I thought meeting the fortune teller was truly a blessing. Grateful, I bought him a gift and went to see him again. But no one was living in that house anymore. Shocked, I asked the neighbor where the fortune teller had gone. She turned pale and told me, Didn't you hear? He he died. One night there was a terrible scream from his house, so the police were called. When they arrived, they found him dead. But the strange thing is, he seemed to have coughed up blood while sleeping, and the whole house was covered in blood. There were no signs of an intruder, and he was alone. It's a truly horrifying story. I was speechless, shocked by the news. I haven't been able to tell anyone this story since that day. The most terrifying thing is that, ever since then, I occasionally hear the fortune teller's voice whispering in my ear during my sleep. Mr. Miller, I'm in hell. All thanks to you. This is a story of a group of friends who accidentally turned one of their nights out into a hell adventure they will never forget. My cousin told me this story and she is Jenny. 
Don, Mike, Abbott, Jenny, and Olive are friends since their high school days. Now on their fourth year of college, they still see to it that they meet up at least once a week for nights out. One Friday evening, they agreed to go to a famous old house somewhere in Pasig. The old house used to belong to Don's family until his parents decided to sell it to an American couple who would spend a few months in the Philippines every year. So how in the world are we getting in if the owners are outside the country? Asked Mike, the short-tempered one. Easy, dude. I have a spare key, quipped John. What if they change the lock? Asked Jenny. They won't. They can't. The locks are antique. It was made by one Spanish artist, and the new owners knew that. They wouldn't dare take off a very important piece of the house, Don said. He was confident that he was right. After a few more arguments, the group made it inside the ancestral house. The entire house was dark. Not a thing can be seen. Abbott clicked his lighter, which barely illuminated the room. The living room set consisted of old Nara furniture and other antique pieces that were covered by white linen sheets. The whole place was clearly dusty. The owners obviously hadn't been home for months. Nah, you're scared of almost everything. Olive, you're even scared of your own reflection in the mirror, (laughs) Mike said. He was exerting an effort to ward off his own nervousness, but somehow his voice was a telltale sign of his own misgivings about exploring the house. A large squeak on the wooden floor surprised the group and they started running in different directions. Olive and Jenny ran towards the kitchen. Mike and Don ran to the second floor while Abbott was left behind searching for his lighter that was knocked out from his hand. Abbott was on the floor when he saw a man and a woman came from somewhere in the living room. The woman was carrying a gas lamp crying. The man was very mad, speaking in what sounded like Spanish. The woman ran towards the staircase, but the man pulled her by the hair and repeatedly hit her head on the floor a few inches away from Abbott. He was surprised that the man had not seen him at all. Abbott watched in horror as he took the gas lamp, poured the kerosene all over the woman's body, and lit her up. Help me, help me, cried the woman. Abbott's adrenaline rush made him forget his fears. He stood up and took one of the linen sheets covering the furniture. He used the sheet to put off the flame engulfing the woman's body. After a while, everything went dark once again. Abbott was catching his breath. The smell of burnt flesh gagged him. He used his lighter to light up the place. He saw that he was totally alone. Jenny and Olive were faring no better in the kitchen. Be careful, Jenny. We don't know what's in there. Olive whispered into her ear. Don't be scared. Look, we can see the kitchen from here, thanks to the luminous full moon outside. Jenny assured her friend. Hush, I think something's coming. Maybe it's one of the boys. Quick, let's scare them. Let's hide under the table. The two girls quickly took under the table. They waited for the boys to go near where they were hiding. But to their surprise, someone wearing camiso chino shirt and a pair of long pants came inside the kitchen. The mysterious man was holding a big bolo. All of a sudden, a woman appeared from nowhere. She was running around the kitchen, crying and begging for her life. Jenny and Olive embraced each other. They were really scared. They couldn't understand what the woman was saying. Then it happened. The woman screamed as the man stabbed her numerous times. Blood was everywhere on the walls, kitchen sink on the floor. Jenny and Olive closed their eyes and tried their hardest to muffle their screams. Then there was a sudden silence. Mike and Don were beginning to become agitated in the second floor. Dude, let's find the others now. It's too dark in here, said Mike to Don. Wait, dude, I'm trying to locate my old room. I want to see if something's changed. He pointed to a room located furthest from where they were. Mike followed Don to the room. When Don slowly opened the door, he and Mike saw some gruesome scene they might witness their entire life. The room was lit up by gas lamp. There was a man with blood all over his clothing. He was stabbing two small children, a girl and a boy. The girl was screaming, asking for help. Help, help us, daddy's killing us. Don and Mike to run and hide, but both of them were frozen, couldn't move. They were too shocked to react. After this, the door slammed shut. 
Don and Mike ran away as fast as they could. When they reached the first floor, they saw Abbott, Jenny, and Olive running away from the house. It took them hours to calm down each other. They never spoke about what they saw for many months. A year later, Don's parents came home from abroad. Don asked about the history of the house. His mother told him about a gruesome murder that happened in the early 30s. A wealthy Spanish man killed his entire family after finding out he was losing his business in the house and was virtually poor. The man killed his wife and the two kids, but the little girl survived. She was Don's late grandmother. Don threw away his key. He learned that sometimes things are better off being alone. I was around five or six years old at the time, and as you probably know, most girls at around that age would be into dolls, especially Barbies and princess dolls, and I was one of them, although I never really played with them. Most of the time, my dolls would be on a small shelf, not too far up the wall, but enough for me to reach, just standing or sitting there all day. One day, I woke up, and for some odd reason, I had a feeling about my dolls. I walked over to the small shelf where they were at, and I was just staring at them, and they stared back at me. I don't know why I was staring at them, but I guess I was just bored and wanted to stare at something, that being my dolls. A few minutes went by, and as I was starting to get bored, when I was about to get up, I suddenly got a cold feeling up my spine. For a quick second, I saw one of my dolls wink at me. I immediately stood up in shock, but didn't say anything. I thought it was in my imagination, knowing that I was five years old, but what I saw felt real. I never told anyone except my cousin about this. Till this day, I never got to know if what I saw was real or not. But luckily, as I got older, I lost interest in dolls and my parents put them into charity. But I still think about what happened that morning, and I wonder if that would happen again if I kept them. This happened in 1998. At that time, I wasn't born yet, but this story was told by my mother. At the time, there was a flood. The door of our house was damaged and had to be repaired. Two days later, my mother had a weird feeling because there were items missing from the house. Money, jewelry, food, and so on. One night, Dad planned to put a broom in the middle of the door of the house so if anyone opened it, then the broom would fall off. The next day, we were all shocked because the broom that was initially in the middle of the door was now next to the door meaning someone had changed the position of the broom. That night, Dad planned to try to catch the person who tried to break in. My dad sat in the living room, turning off all the lights and fans. All of a sudden, the door opened and Dad saw a man enter our house. Dad immediately took a baseball bat and hit the man as hard as he could. The beaten man fell and writhed in pain. Apparently, the man was the man repairing our house. The man tried to escape and said he was thirsty and wanted water in the kitchen. But my father was not negligent and did not release him. After that, the police arrived and arrested the man. And most surprisingly, we were not the first. Many had fallen victim to this man. The police then went to investigate the man's house and informed the man's wife. Upon investigation, the man apparently stole a lot of jewelry and gifted it to his wife. This happened when I was about 10 years old. My parents were going out to dinner and wanted me to watch my little brother while they were gone. A couple hours after they left, I decided to go to my room. Once I stepped foot inside, I saw the most unusual thing I had ever seen in my entire life. This little boy, who looked to be around my age, but from a different time period, was sitting in my chair at my desk, staring at a completely white screen on my Dell laptop. When he sensed I entered, he turned his head slowly, in perfect rhythm, to meet mine. It was so odd since he didn't jolt in surprise or turn his head around fast like a normal person would do. It was as if he was expecting me to come in. I immediately ran out and started crying. When I looked behind, he went back to staring at the screen. I didn't go back to my room until my parents arrived. When I walked inside again, the laptop was closed as if no one had touched it. I thought that was the end of that until a couple of years later, 
When it was five or six in the morning, I heard breathing that was done in perfect rhythm. I thought I was in sleep paralysis, but I could move and could change my breath pattern, so it wasn't that. When I realized that this thing was still breathing in that odd rhythm, I tried to act calm and not turn around. I closed my eyes and tried to focus on sleep. When I woke up, I didn't hear any more sounds, and I haven't heard that breathing again. I don't follow an organized religion, but there's something beyond this physical world that can't be explained. I hope I never see this thing again, but I do fear that it will pop up randomly. This happened two days ago. My colleagues and I had to fight off a robbery. I'm from South Africa in a black community, and I'm well built. I work at a local supermarket. We had about four workers who were ripped. I'll call them A, B, C, and me included. Me being a rugby player and them being gym freaks, we were not so close. Pretty much we only spoke when something important had to be said, and that was that. It was a Red Friday. That typically means lots of items were on sale. Just as I was packing the shelves, five men with masks came in with guns. They had a southern accent. Granted that I'm Zulu, those men sounded like they were from Lesotho. They alerted the guards, but to our surprise, the guards and managers bolted out the staff entrance, leaving only the employees to see the disaster through. I had hoped that maybe they were bringing help, but I quickly remembered their words from our conversation earlier. I may be a security guard, but I don't get paid enough to risk my life, especially when there are arsenals in the form of U4. I became really enraged. But just then, I saw A, B, and C gazing at three of the five men who had their backs turned towards us, on the lookout for danger through the door, completely unaware that the threat might be lurking from within. Two of them were in the cash office doing what I thought was collecting. Without wasting time, they ran and tackled the men, disarming them quickly and easily. Then reality hit me. These guys are trying to shit inside the cooking pot that I use to cook food for my family. In the corner of my eye, I saw the fourth man heading our direction, not realizing what was happening. I saw he put a gun in his pocket, probably because he was also collecting cash. I charged at him from a crouching position, head on to a full sprint, hitting him in the face with a powerful shoulder tackle. He passed out immediately. The fifth man came out, but he didn't have a gun because they only had four weapons on them. The fifth guy was just to grab the bag. We called the cops, and we were given gratitude. Quick message for anyone who's planning to cause any sort of disaster. Never let your guard down when pissing on people's yards. You never know who's looking. This story is from five years ago, but it still gives me chills when I think about it. At that time, there was a young man in our neighborhood who was rumored to be kind. His name was Ian. He always carried a flag with him, and whenever I ran into him, he would stop, hold my hand, and pray for me. One day he whispered to me, You have such a pure soul, so I'll tell a secret only to you. I was actually an angel living in heaven but the archangel told me to help the corrupted earth. So I came down. I thought he was joking, so I laughed and played along. Really? Then where are your wings? He touched his back and replied, When I was born in a human body, my wing bones became too small. Ah, I miss flying. I just laughed it off. However, the interesting thing was that he really had a kind heart like an angel. When he saw homeless people on the street, he would take them to his house, feed them plenty of food, and pray for them. He also cried all night when he saw people who had accidents or were in unfortunate situations on the news. I was touched by his actions, and we became close friends. But as time went on, darkness began to cover him. His house started to be filled with countless homeless people, and thieves broke in and stole things recklessly but he forgave them all. Every time this happened, I told him to take care of his belongings, but he just closed his eyes and recited a prayer. 
Tears streamed down from his eyes. As time went on, he became increasingly dispirited. Whenever we met, he would stare at the sky with a sad face for a long time. As time passed, he began to act strangely. He yelled at a random passerby on the street, saying, Your heart is filled with filthy greed. You should have a kind heart. I can see it all. The person flustered and ran away. Another time, we went to a restaurant together, and he suddenly slammed the table during the meal and shouted, How can this be considered as food? Compared to the food in heaven, this is garbage. Then he covered his ears and screamed, This is not music. Compared to the music in heaven, this is just noise. Then he sang hymns like a madman, and eventually we were kicked out. After that, he continued to cause trouble in the neighborhood, and I stopped contacting him. Several months passed. One day, I heard shocking news from a neighbor. Ian had gone missing. One day, a neighbor living next to Ian's house heard what sounded like hundreds of people singing hymns coming from Ian's house. So they knocked on Ian's door. But there was no one inside. Ian didn't show up for several months, and his parents and friends came to look for him but couldn't find him. So they eventually filed a missing persons report. One neighbor who saw Ian last claimed that he looked emaciated, as if he hadn't eaten for a long time, and his wing bones were abnormally and incredibly protruding. There was a note on Ian's desk which read, I came down to heal this world, but now I have lost my light. The children of Satan are whispering to me day and night to come down to hell. Dear God, please take me back to heaven. Ian is still missing. My name is Japheth, and this happened when I was 10 years old. We live close to the forest. In the forest, there's a well. Other people still use that well. I heard on the news that kids who fell in the well, some of them survived and others didn't. I would always go to the well with my sister if we ran out of water. One day, my mom received a water bill. We didn't have any money because my mom's salary is in August. So we decided to get some water from the well. The well was far away. People in my neighborhood said that the well was cursed. But I didn't believe that. I don't really believe in ghosts or monsters. One day when I woke up, it was 8 a.m., I noticed there were many people in the woods and police cars. Curious, I went there, and what I saw was shocking. A woman was found dead in the well. Her body was floating in the water. When the ambulance arrived, it was too late. The police said that someone pushed her in the well, so they started looking for the suspect. I was afraid to go to the well alone that day. A few months later, my mom was washing the dishes and there was no water, so she asked me to get water from the well. I nodded and started walking to the forest. I brought a flashlight because it was 6 p.m. When I arrived at the well, I noticed a man. He was wearing a black jacket and he was carrying a bucket, so I ignored him and started to get some water. Then the man said, Hurry up or you'll end up like that girl. I was freaked out, so I hurried up and went home. But then, my bucket was leaking. It had a big hole. Why didn't I notice this before? When I looked back at the man, he wasn't using the well. So, I went back home and got another bucket and went back. And he still hadn't gotten water. So, I hurried up. And then the man said, You again? This is my well. But sir, my uncle built this well for the neighborhood. I was shaking. Then he punched me in the face and grabbed my hair. I was just a boy, and I was weak compared to him. He started to laugh like crazy. <laughs> then he tried pushing me in the well. I was crying and screaming, and I thought maybe this was my last day alive. Then I saw a flashlight. When I looked, it was my mother and some neighbors. 
When the man saw that, he carried me and threw me in the well. It was a good thing I know how to swim. My flashlight was broken and wet. It was dark. I heard some punches and screaming. And then I heard sirens. It was the police. When the police arrived, along with some firemen and an ambulance, they immediately arrested the man. It turns out he was the one who killed the lady. And I was going to be next. Good thing I was safe. The man was sentenced to life for his crime. And I'm still wondering, what would have happened if my mom and some of the neighbors didn't hear my screams? I might be dead today. I'm 21 years old and live in the state of Parana, Brazil. I love to hike in small forests near the town, especially following train tracks. One day I was hiking on one of those train tracks that had trees on both sides. I was far away from the entrance, playing with my walking stick like it was a sword, when out of nowhere, a group of around five men appeared from behind the trees. They were like a hundred meters away from me, but I could see all of them were carrying white bags on their backs. And at first they were walking in the same direction I was, but one of them turned around and started yelling at me, asking, who are you? And the other started to yell too. Come here, you want to get hurt? I was in shock. I just shouted, what? And they responded, come here so we can beat you. And my heart stopped. I turned around and started to run as fast as I could, just thinking this cannot be true and avoiding stumbling on the track. I ran a mile before hiding in a tree and looking back to see if they followed me. I didn't see anyone, so I caught my breath and left this track as fast as I could. I still don't know what was in those bags, why they yelled at me, or what would have happened if I stayed. I don't go hike anymore. When I was 10, I was the recipient of a cruel betrayal. I was a girl who was shy and didn't trust many others. I remember a new boy showed up that year. For privacy, I'll call him Charlie. He was also 10 and so shy he barely ever spoke. The teacher was very hard on him constantly yelling at Charlie to speak up when called on in class, or to read book chapters out loud, I took pity on him and befriended him. For a year or two, things were good. Then I learned he became a member of a local gang. I didn't believe it until the betrayal happened. He hadn't gone to school that Friday, which concerned me. I was walking home from school with my mom and my younger brother. At a stop sign on 7th Street, it happened. I took off my glasses to wipe a smudge when something hit me. My left eye felt like I was hit by a baseball. I bent with a groan of pain, alerting my mother. She asked me to look at her. When I did, her face was in pure shock. As my dad was at work and unreachable, we had a neighbor drive us to the hospital. There, I learned I'd been hit with a BB, striking the side of my eye. The doctor told us had I been looking forward, it would have blinded me. For two months at least, I had to endure endless treatments and had to wear an eye patch. I also endured the cruel comments from students making pirate jokes. The day before my eye was healed and I no longer needed the patch, I learned who shot me. He confessed after seeing me with the patch. I was brought to the principal's office where I could see him before he was sent to juvenile hall. When I saw him, I felt like exploding. Sitting on a chair, handcuffed, was Charlie. He was staring at his feet, face ashamed. In a choked voice, I managed, Charlie! Why? I was your friend. You, you hurt me bad, you know? He could only shrug. I asked him to look at me. When he did, I lifted my eye patch. I knew it wasn't a pretty sight. I leaned in, nose to nose. Get a good look at me, Charlie. I want you to see what you did. And I want you to know I'll never forget this. You did this. I hope you will always you remember what you did. He was hauled off. Never apologized. I recovered completely with only a tiny defect in my left eye's vision. I didn't see Charlie again until almost 18 years later. 
My brother and I were visiting our old town of Downey after moving almost ten years earlier. We visited a nearby mall that was a favorite of ours as kids. In the food court, I waited while my brother used the bathroom. Glancing at a Hawaiian barbecue shop, I paused. A young man with his back to me looked strangely familiar. When he turned to hand a customer a food tray, there was no doubt. It was Charlie. He was shaggy looking. Looked like he had a rough life. When I saw his left eye, I gasped. He was wearing an eye patch. I approached him and called his name. Charlie? He practically jumped, saw me, and sadly smiled. Hiya, Jane. I asked him, pointing to my own eye. What happened, Charlie? He told me. After he'd left Juvenile Hall at 17, he'd gone back to his old house on 7th Street to rebuild his life. He was living with his mother, as his father had died while he was in Juvenile Hall. In his backyard, he was shooting cans with his old BB gun when it happened. A pellet had ricocheted off a tree, hitting his left eye dead center. In the hospital, he'd been told the damage was too great. He'd lost the eye. I didn't believe him, until for a second, he lifted the eye patch. I saw, to my horror, an empty socket. With a sigh, he whispered, I'm so very sorry, Jane. You weren't really my target. I got a lesson in karma. Please forgive me. I reached out and hugged him, whispering, I do forgive you, Charlie. I left with my brother shortly afterwards. I caught up with Charlie and he did better later. In time, he started working in an office and also married and had children. I was glad he turned his life around, but he had to learn a lesson or two to gain what he needed. I remember we were riding in a car one day and I asked my mom the scariest experience she ever had. She had been a camp counselor for a small outdoors camp in the summer, which lasted about a week. On a particular hot summer night, my mom was rolling around in her bed unable to sleep because of the humid heat. Her other friend, who I'll call Rachel, was also awake at the time. Around 1.30 a.m., my mom received a notification to not leave the area. Apparently, four convicts had escaped from a local prison and were on the run. Rachel was freaking out and hurriedly woke up everyone despite my mom telling her to calm down. After arguing with the campers and the other counselor, she had convinced the group to go to the boys' cabin to see if they were fine. They left out through the back cabin door and snuck behind bushes, making as little noise as possible. Unfortunately, they had to make it across a little clearing to reach the men's cabin. After checking multiple times, they ran to the boys' cabin and knocked till my mother's guy best friend opened up. He raised a questioning look before letting them in after seeing how scared everyone was. The guy laughed after Rachel said she was scared because of the escaped convicts and reassured her. Around two hours later, my mom and everyone headed back to their cabin and fell asleep. The next day, everyone was a bit freaked out, but was sure nothing had happened to them. Until my mom walked around to see the back of the cabin. It seemed someone had scraped the back doors and unsuccessfully tried getting in. She was freaked out by it and went home early. Later, she found out on the news only three convicts were captured and has always thought back to that night and wondered what would have happened if they stayed in their cabin. Hello, my name is Joe and I'm 10, from a small farm in Nebraska. I have two sisters, Annie and Scarlett, and they're 16. Our farm used to be quite large, but as time went on, people and animals have been taking our crops and littering, but that's besides the point. Our family was never wealthy and we didn't have much. It happened about a year ago before I found out about this channel. I live near Medicine Creek and our tractor broke down, so we had to pull it all the way to Cambridge. There had recently been people hunting animals nearby, and our parents didn't want our livestock getting killed. Our parents had me and my sister stay at the farm in case the hunters came to collect food. So my sister and I were watching the television when we heard rustling in the crops. Then our dog, Scout, started barking when the first gunshot went off. I yelled and screamed, but Scarlet put her hand over my mouth. We tried to call the police, but the phone line was out. Damn it. He cut the phone line. 
Next, the man shot at the window and jumped through. We ran straight upstairs to our bedroom. I saw a glimpse of his face. He was skinny with mildly red eyes and short, black, greasy hair. He pointed the rifle at me but missed. My sister shoved me into the room as she pulled out a knife and ran at the man. Then the most terrifying part. A bullet flew into my sister's arm. She screamed as the man pointed the gun at me. Thankfully, the man fell downstairs as Scout bit a chunk off of his leg. I grabbed the knife then ran straight at him. I stabbed him four times as blood splattered everywhere on the wall. The police showed up eventually because the neighbors saw the commotion. Thankfully, no one was majorly hurt. I just hope that nothing like this ever happens again. My name is Luke. This happened to me in August last year on a Friday. I was 20 at the time. My parents were going out of town for a week. They said I could invite some friends over, so I called my friend Mark. He asked if he could bring his little brother since he was babysitting him. So when they got here, we decided to get pizza. We were waiting for the pizza. So I said, hey, do you want to have a sleepover? He said, of course, but my brother's going to have to stay. I told him that was fine. So while we were waiting for the pizza, we were playing video games. And then the pizza arrived and we ate and played more video games. Then we went to bed. He and his brother were sleeping on the floor on a mattress. At 2.30 a.m. he woke me up and said, I don't feel good. I'm gonna go home. So when he left, I went to pick up the mattress and I saw a complete man under my bed. I screamed. Ah! I ran out of the room and called 911. He woke up from my scream and tried to leave. Then I tackled him before he could get to the front door. The police came five minutes later. Turns out he was homeless. They put him in handcuffs and he looked at me with an ugly grin. I noticed he had a knife in his back pocket. The police told me he might be going to prison for one year. Turns out He's been in my house for a week. The question we were all asking was, how did he get in the house? Nobody knows. What scares me the most is that it's been one year and I know he's out on the street now. When my friend got home, he called and told me there was a hobo under my bed and that's the reason why he left. If he hadn't realized there was a guy under my bed, he would have stayed and who knows what would have happened. My name is Andre, and this incident took place five weeks ago. I have a co-worker named Mike. He is a very jealous person that thinks he's better than the rest of us, even though he does no work whatsoever. He doesn't like it when we talk to him, but expects us to be interested in what he likes to say. Now to the story. I work for a company that requires me to get up at two in the morning and prepare to leave at five in the morning. So waking up is not something I'm a fan of, but I get a steady paycheck, so it's okay. Mike does not get a paycheck like everybody else's though. He gets 5% lower because he does not do any work. So he takes his rage upon us. Like one day I was at the movies and suddenly he came up to me and punched me despite the fact that I was in the front row, so everyone could see. Another time I was at the bar playing darts, and suddenly he came, grabbed a dart pin, and proceeded to try and stab me with it. I dodged it, and all the men in the bar assisted me with throwing him out. Just about 12 to 15 weeks ago, my girlfriend and I were about to kiss, when he came to my window and took a picture with an old Polaroid. And as he shook the photo, I punched him and drove his incapacitated body back to his little home. But by far, this incident was the worst of them all. It happened when I was at home sleeping, when I suddenly woke up to the sound of banging at my front door. Wake up, Andre, I heard outside. I knew that voice. It was Mike at my door. I heard what I thought sounded like a motorcycle at my front door, but instead, I saw it was a chainsaw. Now I see you die, Mike said from the other side. I bolted to get my airsoft rifle and just in time. When he burst in, I shot him.
first in the leg, then in the eye. Then I ran to call the cops, but Mike was still on his two legs. So then he cut a chunk of the flesh off my left arm. I screamed, but still managed to turn around and shoot him in his private area twice. He fell to the ground, and I was able to call the cops. Mike was arrested, and I immediately booked a flight to a different state. After the flight, I received a call from the police telling me that Mike killed another co-worker before he came to kill me, and that he planned to kill many more than just two. Every morning I look outside and thank God I survived that, because I don't know what would have happened if I had not woken up that night. There was a murder in my apartment building. The deceased was a middle-aged man who lived in the penthouse. The killer had cut his mouth from ear to ear with a knife and nailed the corners of his mouth up to his temples. The man was found dead with his eyes rolled back and a grotesque grin on his face. The residents of the apartment lived in fear and the investigation was slow as the murderer scene yielded no evidence of the killer. Three days after the incident, the same video was sent simultaneously to the cell phones of all the residents of the apartment building from a mysterious number. The video showed a clown looking at the screen and giggling in an unnerving manner, saying, Smile, smile, smile. He then picked up the camera and showed us his surroundings, the penthouse of the man who died a few days earlier. The man was tied to a chair, crying out for help, and the clown pulled out a sharp knife and began to slice the man's mouth open. After slicing the screaming, struggling man's mouth from ear to ear, the clown held the corner of the man's mouth up, smiled for the camera, and then took out a hammer and began hammering nails into the corner of the mouth. The clown giggled as he spun around in the swiveled chair to which the man was strapped with his mouth torn open and a wide grin on his face. Then the screen suddenly went black and the words, James, room 503 next, appeared in white letters on a dark background. My heart sank and I sat back in my seat. The fact that the clown knew my name and my home address gave me goosebumps. How did he know me and why was I his next target? I hadn't done anything to earn someone's grudge. While I sat there in a panic, other residents who had seen the video called the police and officers came to my house. They asked me if I knew who the clown was, and I suddenly realized that the man next door in room 504 might be the culprit. I had been losing sleep over the past few nights due to a thumping noise coming from my neighbor. One night I went to bed before an important meeting the next day, and again I heard a thumping noise from my neighbors. So I went over to their house after midnight and rang the doorbell. Who is it? The suspicious looking man next door opened the front door with a hanger and through the narrow doorway I could see he was holding a hammer. I don't know what he was doing in the middle of the night, but that hammer seemed to be the source of the noise. It's your neighbor. You're being too loud and I need to get some sleep. I said in an irritated tone to the man who glared at me for a moment before slamming the front door. I told the police that I heard the man next door hammering every night and had seen him with a hammer myself, so I suspected he was the culprit. The police listened to my story and they said they would take a closer look at the man next door. When the police returned, I couldn't bear to stay in the apartment, so I took an extended leave of absence from work, packed up my things and went down to the countryside to live with my parents. I stayed at my parents' house for about a month, and there were no more murders in the apartment because the police were keeping an eye on the man next door. With this lull, I returned to the apartment on my last day of vacation. I walked into the lobby of my apartment building and was greeted by the doorman with a big smile on his face. You're back home. I'm so glad you're safe. Yes, it's been a while. After a long drive, I was too tired to answer the man's friendly greeting. So I gave a rough answer and I waited for the elevator. He told me that he saw the man next door lurking in front of my door a few days ago and that he's going to take me there because he thinks it might be dangerous. When we got to the fifth floor and the elevator doors opened, I saw my neighbor standing in front of my front door, smoking a cigarette. 
The man's eyes looked murderous, and I was terrified. So I asked the doorman to go inside the house with me. He and I walked past the neighbor in a tense moment, and suddenly the neighbor lunged at me from behind, grabbed me from the back of the head, and started dragging me into his house. Help me! I shouted, frightened. The doorman quickly picked up my suitcase and slammed it down on the man's head as hard as he could, and the man collapsed, bleeding on the spot. What do we do now? I think he's dead. I asked him, breathing heavily. He looked surprised and broke out in a cold sweat. I didn't think he would die. Isn't this considered self-defense? Let's get him inside the house before anyone sees him and think about it. He and I picked up the fallen man and hurried him inside the house. I don't think anyone else has seen him yet, he said, looking out the front door. Just then, the man next door, whom I thought was dead, struggled to raise his head and shouted, Run! Suddenly, the doorman pulled out a knife from his pocket and slashed the man's mouth wide with a single blow, and the man screamed and died with one side of his mouth torn off. When I saw the scene, I was so stunned that my whole body went rigid. The doorman said, Whew! That could have been really bad. He breathed a sigh of relief and took off his jumper, revealing a colorful clown costume hidden inside. He smiled up at me, put on the clown mask, and said, Hello, James, from room 503. You didn't smile when I smiled and greeted you in the lobby every day. The people who live here are so unkind. Anyone who doesn't respond back to my smile will keep smiling even after they die. <laughs> My name is Kenny, but this isn't a personal story of mine, but I was able to witness my friend's reaction the moment after, so I guess I'll start now. I was in the seventh grade, and I was with some friends. Let's call them Abigail, Daniela, Angeline, Sherilyn, and Aline. To give a little background, our room was kind of worn out. Wooden windows that were missing parts, the paint on the walls was chipping, and the lizards roamed the ceiling illuminated by three light bulbs. Our room was always messy because my classmates at the time were disrespectful. I could say I hated that group of classmates. Basically, there weren't any teachers that would check on us. I don't know, but we expected our next subject teacher to come in. But unfortunately, no one came into our room. So people are going about their business, but the naughty classmates just started going crazy. Bullying and teasing innocent classmates of mine. Others are using their cell phones and turning on their flashlights because it was a rainy day, which was pretty frequent. I was just on my chair beside my friend Abigail when all of a sudden, the thunderstorm rumbled the ground and cut off the electricity. But we continued talking and laughing. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, so I was bored. But my classmates did, and I was super jealous of them. Not long after, Aline and Daniela began crying and sobbing and I didn't know why. My friends and other classmates came to our spot and asked them what was wrong. Daniela's face was trembling, and Aline was still sobbing. Daniela said that when her and Aline were minding their own business, you know, styling their hair like teen girls, to be specific, they were sitting on the floor behind my chair when the two of them looked down and saw a girl underneath me. She kept staring at them with her head tilted down. The scary part is, the girl's eyes were completely red, which is why they screamed. Me being confused, looked below my chair to see if there was ghosts or anything scary. I was so scared, but my gut told me I should try, so I did. I slowly looked down, and to my surprise, it was normal, like usual. Nothing was there. So I looked up at my friends, and they were still crying. The next morning, my friend Abigail told me a story of hers, too. Our teacher always assigns a classmate to hold the keys for the classroom to open early, and she was the one who was assigned the key that day. Abigail arrived early and was about to go through the door when she peeked in the window and saw a girl in our room. The girl was sitting in the cabinet near the blackboard. Abigail admitted it's a ghost. There's really a ghost in her school. After hearing that, I got goosebumps all over. I don't know what was going on then, but some say our school is a cemetery before a school was built on top. But yeah, this may not be a personal story of mine, but I experienced this story over and over again, as if I was the one who saw her. 
This is an eerie experience I had when I was in my early 20s, about 10 years ago. At that time, I was looking for a place to live independently, and I found a very cheap place and signed the contract right away. However, on the first day I entered the house, I saw a note on the front door that said, No one has stayed in this house for more than a month. Good luck. I thought it was just a funny prank by someone, so I started living in the house, and a few days later, I saw something through my bedroom window to the neighboring house's window. It was the silhouette of a person shaking back and forth. When I looked closer, a woman was hanging from several ropes attached to the ceiling, suspended in the air, staring at me in a relaxed posture. Although I felt a bit eerie, I just thought, there's a strange person living next door. I looked away and didn't pay much attention. However, after a while, I looked at the window again out of curiosity, and she was still there, smiling slightly and staring at me intently. I closed the curtains and felt strange afterwards. From then on, I didn't open the curtains for a few days because I felt like she would still be there, suspended in the air and staring at me. One day, I heard a knock on the front door. I opened it without much thought and she was standing there. I was surprised and she asked me, why don't you open the curtains? I was taken back, but pretended to be nonchalant and replied, I just don't usually look outside my window. Then she started singing, you have to open the curtains so you can see me, open the curtains. I felt chills down my spine and quickly closed the door. I hesitated, should I call the police, but I didn't want to complicate things. I just left the curtains open because I feared that she would return to my house. Then she appeared again, hanging on the ropes with a pleased expression. She swayed back and forth while staring at me intensely. I stared at her for a while, feeling dazed. And then I quickly closed the curtains and drank some cold water. Somehow, I started to feel strange then. She was definitely an odd person, but I felt a strange attraction towards her, although I didn't know why. The next day, I opened the curtains again, but she was no longer there. Only the ropes were hanging there. I waited for her all day, but she didn't appear and she didn't show up for a few days. I eventually went to her house and knocked on her door. She opened the door and invited me in. Her house was filled with countless ropes hanging from the ceiling, which was a bit eerie, but I didn't think much of it. She was very skilled at maneuvering the ropes, gliding around the house like she was flying. Then she said to me, you should try it too, it's really fun. The ropes were hanging very high, which made me a bit scared, but I decided to follow her and climbed onto the ropes. But at that moment, I lost my balance and fell backwards, screaming in pain as I hit the ground. Something was off though. She just looked down at me with a cheerful expression, not helping me or showing any concern. It was as if she was simply watching me. It sent shivers down my spine, and I quickly left her house, returning home. I closed the curtains and never opened them again. A few days later, she came to my house and knocked on the door. I didn't open it, but she continued to sing outside endlessly. I thought she was a psychopath and decided to move. After some time, I moved out and had normal days afterward. However, I heard on the news about a man who moved into that house. Shortly after he moved in, he fell from a rope at the house of the woman next door and died of a concussion. The police ruled it as an accidental death and the woman was cleared of all charges, but I couldn't help but wonder if he fell on his own, or was it something that she had planned? Only she knows the truth. After that day, I never heard any news about that house or the woman again. Time has passed, but I still wonder, is she still riding ropes there, and is someone still hanging on the ropes she made?
It was a cold night on December 17, 2021. My cousins and I were playing video games on my PlayStation 4 in the living room. We ate snacks like Pringles and nuts and drank pear soda. About an hour later, it was 3 a.m. and I fell asleep. I woke up to pitch black darkness and dead silence. The only thing I could hear were cicada bugs, loud as shit. I then got the urge for a cold drink, so I went over to the fridge and got my soda. I turned around and my blood ran cold. Right in front of me were two green glowing eyes. I threw my drink at the two eyes and they darted across the kitchen and through the open window. Then I could see it running down the street outside. It was wearing ripped and shredded newspaper. Also, this could not have been a human, because as most should know, human eyes don't glow in pitch darkness unless you're taking a picture, and my phone had been in the other room. I was in shock at what happened, and also surprisingly, my cousins did not wake up from it, nor did my mom. All of a sudden, I felt sick and fell down. I woke up to bright light that morning and was on my couch. This is where it gets very chilling and mysterious. My cousin came to tell me she had a dream of me getting a soda and locking eyes with a green-eyed humanoid, just like the one I described earlier. I told her that the same incident happened to me last night, but I fainted and then woke up. Did I enter my cousin's dream? Or worse yet, did my cousin dream about my terrifying reality? I'll leave you to decide. This story happened to me in 2019. I came home from school really tired, and I was feeling sick and dizzy. I told my mom about it and told her I would rest for a bit. I laid down and took a nap. A few hours passed. I woke up feeling thirsty. I also noticed that I was feeling better already. I got up and got my glass of water. I came back to my room, shook up and frightened. What I saw was myself sleeping on my bed. I thought I was dreaming, so I tried to pinch myself. I didn't feel anything. Was I dreaming? Was this real? One idea popped into my head. What if I lay down in the same exact position as my body? Will I come back? I did exactly what I thought was the best idea. I positioned myself and closed my eyes. Right then and there, I woke up. I saw my mother holding my hand, crying. She hugged me really tight and said, You were so pale and cold. I thought something had happened to you. I was just going to give you some food because you haven't eaten. I'm here to tell the story of the time I went to the park with my friends. On a Friday night during the summer, I asked my friends Alyssa and Maya to come over to play Just Dance and have a sleepover. Alyssa arrived first, then Maya. We go upstairs to put the sleepover stuff in my room and head back downstairs to my living room to play Just Dance like we normally do on Fridays. We played for hours, and of course, I got mega stars every time. My friend Maya suggested we go to the playground right next door to my house to stargaze. We tell my dad where we're going and head to the park in our little fuzzy PJ pants and sweatshirts. I often get paranoid, and my biggest fear is what's lurking in the dark. My friends know that so they comfort me in those situations. We start walking to the playground and I'm already pretty anxious. We make it to the swing set and we start acting like idiots, laughing like little kids telling their moms to push them. Then we stop laughing as much and start spilling secrets. I start having this feeling that we're being watched, but I looked around and there were no cars in the parking lot and no one at the field, at the playground or bathroom. I thought to myself, what if it's just an animal? But then I think, no, we are being watched. I know it. My instincts are right almost every time. My friend noticed me getting scared, so Alyssa says an inside joke of ours and starts reminiscing about old times. I start to feel better and decide to play some music and run up the slide to lighten the mood. My friends take some pictures of me holding up a peace sign on the swings for their snap stories. I run down to join them as Maya pushes Alyssa on the swings 
and I begin checking my phone to see the pictures of me. In the corner of my eye, I see something moving. That's when I stand up from my swing and see the shadow underneath the slide. I go over to my friends and say, Yo guys, do you guys see that thing too? They both say, No, it's probably a shadow from a car passing or something. Relax. I knew in my mind that I'm not going crazy. And then I say, No guys, really, there's someone under the slide. Look! Then Alyssa sees the thing move towards the slide. And she yells, Yeah, you're right. There's definitely someone under the slides. The thing starts inching towards us on all fours, moving like a lengthy animal. It was so creepy. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. It was so long and moving so silently. I grabbed our phones that were on the ground and sprinted for my house like I was in the Olympics. I yell, Start running now! My friends stayed at the swings. I looked back and yell, Why are you guys sitting there? Run! My friends then started running slowly and then looked at me and said, Haley, you're going way too fast. Slow down. I tell them, guys, he might be following us. You got to catch up. We make it to my house and slam the door shut. Then we run to my dad and tell him what we saw. Alyssa says while her and Maya were still at the swing, she saw it was a man with a tilted head and a sad emotion on his face. He looked young, like in his 30s, but obviously not some little kid who needed to find their parents or they would have come up to us and asked for help. My dad said it was probably some prankster and to not overthink it. We went up to my room and my friends kept telling me it was probably no big deal. I kept thinking of all the possibilities of creeps stalking us at night. It's been months since then, and my friends have recently told me how they still don't know the mystery behind the man at the park. To this day, I don't go to the park at night. For your own safety, I suggest you don't either, no matter how fun it may sound. Or you might end up in my situation, but not as lucky. I actually had a personal experience happen to me when I was nine. I thought you would be interested in it, so here it is. This happened to me when I went to my home country with my mom for vacation to meet my relatives and my dad was still working at the time. We were in the city where my oldest cousin's brother, who was 11 at the time, and his parents lived. We all were coming back from another relative's house at around 2.30 or 3 a.m. While we were going back to our house in my cousin's car, that's when a guy, probably in his 30s, came running to our car and my uncle, cousin's dad, stopped the car and the guy started knocking on the window. So my uncle rolled down the window and asked, what's wrong? To which the guy replied, panting, saying he needed a ride. And my uncle was about to say yes, when my mom said in our language so that he wouldn't understand that, there are kids in the car, don't take the risk. Then my uncle apologized and said it was too late and we were in a hurry as well, but he kept begging. So my uncle had to drive past him. And while we were leaving, that's when my cousin and I saw from the back windows five men with weapons in their hands and the guy talking to them, looking at us and pointing towards us and started following us. But after a while, they stopped. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. Thank God we reached home safely, but I couldn't stop thinking that what if my uncle had agreed and my mom hadn't stopped him? And what if we get stopped even for a single moment when they followed us? Would I have lived to tell this story? I'm currently 36, but this happened when I was 18. I was a high school graduate. I was working at a job. Not a big job, but a minor job. I obviously didn't want to work at McDonald's. The only job that was less crappy was at Costco. So I decided to go work there. I was interviewed by the manager, and before I knew it, I got the job. My position was a cashier. My first two weeks were great, but that was when I met James. James was 63 years old. He said he'd served his time in the military and was in the Korean War. He seemed like a nice guy at first, until he started to smell like garbage most days. When the store reached its 10-year anniversary, we all went to James's house. The moment we entered James's house, it smelled like shit. When it was time to eat, James came out with what looked like tomato soup, judging by the color. But when we ate it, it tasted funny. After the party, while I was driving home, I felt like I was going to sleep. I don't remember much, but the next morning I woke up in a hospital bed. My mom was crying and my dad shook his head and was nodding side to side. Then a doctor came into my room saying that I crashed into a pole. 
I suffered a broken arm. Then I remembered James's soup. I told the doctor to call the cops. When they arrived, I gave them my statement. To my knowledge, they went to James's house and found him eating the arm of a human. He was arrested on the spot. As it turns out, he was a serious murderer. He was sentenced to life in prison. To this day, I think back to when I considered him a co-worker. This happened to me a few years ago. It was late at night and I was on a road trip to Alabama for my great uncle's birthday. It was pretty far from where I lived, almost eight hours. I went to make a stop to refill my car. It was at a shady gas station. I had this feeling of discomfort as I got out of the car. I filled the car up, then went inside to pay. When I got inside, I saw they had snacks, so I took two bags of chips and an energy drink. I gave the snacks to the cashier and also paid for the gas. As I stepped out, I saw another car. It was black and the windows were tinted so I couldn't see who was inside. The car was positioned sideways in a parking spot. I ignored it and got in my car and drove. I was driving in the countryside so there were no street lights. After five minutes, I looked in my mirror and I noticed the black car following me. I ignored the car and kept on driving. Then the man came in front of me and started swerving. I quickly passed him and stepped on the gas. I wanted to get out of the area quickly, so I went faster and faster. I suddenly lost control of the car and went into a ditch. I tried calling the towing service, but there was no signal. I got out of the car to go find help and saw the black car. This time, the driver got out of the car and when I looked at him, I froze in fear. He had long brown hair down to his waist and had a deformed jaw as if someone punched him. He had scratches all over his face and arms and he had a psycho grin on his face. He lunged toward me and bit my arm. I tried pinching him with my fingernails, but he wouldn't let go. He pulled out a knife and tried to stab me. I thought, this is it. Then I heard sirens. The man put the knife back in his pocket and gave me his psycho grin as he ran into the forest. I waved down the police and told them everything. The officer who went into the woods caught him and put him inside the car. Apparently, the man escaped from a mental asylum a week and a half ago and stole a car from one of the nurses. The cops helped me call a towing service, and then when I was back in the city, I rented a car to go to my great uncle's birthday. All I was thinking about was the man. If the cops had gotten there a few minutes later, I would have been on the news. My name is Michael, and I'm a prison guard at this penitentiary. As I was doing my rounds today, inmate number 1857, hanging on his cell bars, shouted at me. Hey, your daughter's seven years old this year, right? She's the first one I'll visit when I get out. What? Enraged, I rushed to the bars and grabbed his collar, and he laughed as if it were amusing. Inmate 1857. His name is Rick, the most notorious criminal in this prison. Rick is a psychopath who killed a woman in her 60s, chopped her up with a knife, and even ate her flesh before claiming insanity. Rick was incredibly lucky. The victim's son actively sought leniency for him. The devout Christian son decided to forgive Rick in the name of God, even after his mother was brutally murdered. And it was something I couldn't understand at all. Thanks to this, Rick was acknowledged as mentally impaired and received a 15-year sentence only. After his sentence was confirmed, Rick began to show his true colors. He constantly hurled insults without reason and threatened to kill the families of those who irritated him once he was released. Knowing his madness, people grew anxious as his release date approached. The ironic thing was that this psychopath was a dutiful son. Having lived with a single mother his entire life, he cherished her dearly. His mother began preparing to open a beef jerky store with Rick about a month before his release, 
and started sending boxes of jerky and letters to the prison. However, bringing in outside food was strictly forbidden in the prison, so we tried to return the parcels she sent. But the warden stopped me and said he would allow the packages to be delivered to Rick. I couldn't understand his actions. The warden must have been bribed by Rick's mother. Dear son, your mother is preparing a jerky business these days. Please try it and give me your feedback. From your future business partner, Mom. When I opened the box of jerky, I saw a letter written in meticulous handwriting. She seemed quite serious about the business, sending a box of jerky made with various recipes to the prison every week. Smoked, chili, teriyaki flavors, and more. Thanks to this, Rick spent his days chewing on jerky. He even began using the jerky like currency, ordering his cellmates around. The prisoners, who relied solely on the prison-provided rations, cleaned for Rick, acted violently on his behalf, or dug up information on people Rick didn't like in exchange for jerky. Rick also collected feedback from the inmates about which jerky recipe tasted the best and sent letters to his mother. He was already fulfilling his role as a business partner before his release. He showed no remorse for the deceased victim and focused solely on making the business prosper. I was angry at the victim's son. If my mother had been so brutally murdered, I would have never forgiven the perpetrator. Due to his excessive tolerance, the evil demon would soon be released into the world and more victims would follow, which could include my own family. Rick's release date approached, now just a week away and his mother had already opened the store and was waiting for him. The store was named Mom's Beef Jerky as a tribute to her love for her son. As the release date neared and my anxiety peaked, I took a secret day off, which I didn't tell my wife and daughter about. I had to visit Rick's store, track his movements, and carefully devise ways to protect my family from him. When I went to the address written on the letter, mom's beef jerky. I noticed a sign with a familiar phrase. It was a store opened by Rick's mother. At that time, I saw the warden coming out of the store. It was clear that he was involved in some sort of backroom dealing with Rick's mother. I hid in my car until the warden disappeared, then entered the store. Now that I had witnessed it with my own eyes, I had to expose their inappropriate dealings. As I opened the store door, there stood a man there with fair skin and a gentle demeanor. Welcome. Huh? Isn't this Rick's mother's store? Oh, yes, it is. Who are you? You should be the employee. I'm a prison guard at the prison where your son is incarcerated. I saw the warden leaving just now. What's the relationship between him and Rick's mother? Oh, Rick's mother is inside. Would you like to meet her and hear it directly from her? Follow me. I followed the man to a storeroom deep inside the kitchen, and he pointed to the ceiling, saying, She's here. There, a middle-aged woman's head was hanging from the ceiling, shriveled and twisted after being soaked in sauce. Ah, what is this? I was so shocked that I screamed and collapsed on the spot. Then the man smiled brightly and said, I'm the son of the woman who was killed by Rick. I've been waiting for Rick to be released and come to this store as soon as possible. Whew, I've sent the rest of the body and now only the head remains. I'll prepare the head according to the final recipe Rick advised and plan to send it to the prison tomorrow. I ran out of there in utter disbelief and didn't tell anyone about what happened that day. A week later, I saw the corner of the prison warden's mouth go up strangely as he stared at Rick, who was happily tasting the last delivered jerky. And not long after his release, Rick went missing. My name is Jelly, and I have a stalking story. When I was in high school, there was a lot of boys in my school who courted me, but I rejected all of them because they didn't pass my vibe. Then there was this guy named John. He studied at the other school, not my school, and he courted me. At first I wondered how he knew me. 
Then I found out that his cousin Carlo was my classmate when I was in elementary school. So basically his cousin Carlo was the bridge between me and John. Everything seemed fine. John's nice, so I thought I should answer him. Then days passed and John stopped messaging me. I thought maybe he was busy. And then months passed. I still got no response from John. And his cousin Carlo was the one who kept messaging me all the time. At first, it was just a friendly conversation, but day by day, the conversation started to level up to the point where he asked me if he can court me. So I was shocked, because he's the one who forced his cousin John to me, and now he wants to court me? Then I saw on Facebook that John posted a picture of him and a girl. I was brokenhearted, because I already loved him. When I was brokenhearted, John's cousin Carlo comforted me. I am really open to my mom, so I told her that this guy named Carlo was courting me. My mom told me if he's nice and if he loves me, then why don't you give it a try? What I didn't know is that Carlo was texting my mom about me. Days passed. My mom kept forcing me to Carlo, but I didn't like him. My mom even got angry with me because I didn't want Carlo to be my boyfriend. I was so angry and sad at the same time because my mom was taking his side instead of me, her daughter. I asked my mom why she liked Carlo so much. It's her first time forcing someone for me. My mom said because Carlo was my classmate in elementary school and he's smart. It's true, Carlo is a genius. That's why he always wears glasses, but he is really weird. Every night I end up crying because my mom always asks me when I will answer Carlo. To avoid the situation, I started to date someone without telling my mom. Wherever I went, I felt like someone was stalking me. When I got home from school, I saw my mom sitting on the couch with an angry expression on her face. She asked me, you're dating someone? I was shocked. How did she know that? I denied it and she said if she caught me dating someone who's not Carlo, she'll move me to another school. I cried and ran to my room. I didn't understand why my mom wanted Carlo to be my boyfriend. She knew I didn't like him. We decided to move to another boarding house near my school because my younger brother is now in high school, which means he was now in my school. I woke up early because we had an exam. When I got out from the boarding house, I saw someone standing across the road staring at me. Then I realized it was Carlo. I hurriedly walked to school because I didn't want to interact with him. One day, my friends and I planned to hang out at night with our boyfriends. I knew my mom wouldn't let me, so I lied. I told her that only me and my friends Vicky and Carrie would be there. And she believed it, so she let me. I got home that night at 10 p.m. I saw my mom sitting on the couch with an angry expression on her face. I was curious because I asked for her permission first before I went to hang out. And she stood up and yelled, You went on a date, huh? I was shocked because how did she know? I denied it, but she said that someone saw me and my friends with our boyfriends on the Esplanade. Esplanade is a jogging area. She grounded me for a week. She stormed out of the living room and headed to her room. I saw her phone on the coffee table and I saw someone texted her. So I grabbed her phone and opened it since there's no lock. When I saw the person who texted her, I got so angry. It was Carlo. So that means he was stalking me and reported everything I was doing to my mom. Every morning I always saw him standing across the road from my boarding house, covering his mouth with a handkerchief. Every time I saw him, I felt like I wanted to cry. I was so scared and I didn't know what to do. Only my friends understood me. They told me to stay away from him. We had an upcoming program at school that was being held at the public soccer field. We were practicing our dance and I was really focused because I loved dancing. Then I saw Carlo in the waiting shed staring at me while covering his mouth with a handkerchief. I don't know why he covered his mouth with a handkerchief. I felt really uncomfortable. During our school program, I saw him in the waiting shed staring at me, but I just ignored him. After graduating high school, my mom suggested to move me to another school for a better education. It was my first day in university and I was feeling excited and nervous at the same time. On the first day of school, I already made friends because you know, I'm kind of friendly. It was fun introducing ourselves and meeting new people. After our teacher dismissed the class, I was about to go out of the classroom when my heart sank. I saw Carlo walking in the hallway. He saw me, but I turned my back to him and waited for my friend to finish packing her modules in her bag. Before I walked out of the classroom, I checked my right side and my left side to see if he was there. There was no sign of him, so I grabbed my friend's arm and hurriedly walked to the school's gate. We said goodbye to each other and I hurriedly ran to ride the jeepney. 
While I was inside of the jeepney, I felt like I wanted to scream. How did he know that I moved schools? Did my mom tell him? I felt like I was going crazy. Now he was in the same school with me, and he was going to stalk me every chance he gets. When I got home, I told my mom that I saw Carlo in school. I blamed everything on my mom. My mom said she lost contact with Carlo. She said she would never tell Carlo about my new school, but I didn't listen to her. I kept yelling at her. We argued for a while and I'd had enough, so I ran to my room and cried. I saw Carlo every day in school and kept ignoring him. It became too much and I was so done with him and I couldn't live like that. So what I did is I made more friends because I'm friendly and they can accompany me wherever I went. Like I asked them to go with me to the restroom. I surrounded myself with friends to forget him. And you know what? It actually worked. He's now scared to come near me because I have a lot of friends that surround me. And my friends are all well-known students in school because of their talents. They've asked me to join this and that activity and of course I've agreed. And now that I know a lot of people in my school and a lot of people know me, I am not afraid to be alone anymore. And Carlo, he distances himself from me now. Hello, I'm Rachel, but please call me Rach. I just found out today that my uncle is in fact a well-known murderer. I'm also the youngest niece. I give you full permission to take a video about this. I knew my uncle was a bit off when I was little, and if I asked my mother or another family member on my father's side, then they'd just say, Ted did some really bad things before you were born, so you're not allowed to be alone with him. That all changed when I turned 13 on April 7th. A while after I turned 13, I suddenly brought up the topic of Ted and my mother was a bit more comfortable to tell me that he indeed killed two people. He killed a man and a nurse. I was surprised my mother went into more detail, but I could tell she still wasn't comfortable going into full detail of what Ted did. And honestly, I couldn't blame her for it. She even told me that after her and my father got divorced due to him cheating on her and not being a good father, that my father, his name is James, told Ted to stalk me and my older sister, and my mother, and he did. The neighbors caught Ted watching us in their backyard and police were called. One time, he even left a death threat on my mother's vehicle after not getting him some Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or something like that. After Ted moved out, my mother changed all the locks on the old house and refused to let him in. She even said me and my sis were not allowed to be alone with Ted in my mother and father's divorce papers. Then today, on September 19th of 2021, my mother was finally comfortable enough to tell me everything. Ted Mayer, my uncle, has killed a very rich and well-known nurse in a fire along with another nurse. He was trying to be the hero, but he ended up killing them instead. My mother told me that he planned all this out for a few years, and then in 1999, he carried out the plan. It even says this in an article about Ted Mayer. It goes like this. Theodore Ted Mayer is an ex-Green Beret turned registered nurse who was convicted of arson in a 1999 fire that killed Edmund Safra and another nurse, Vivian Tarrant, at Safra's Monaco penthouse apartment. In October 2007, Mayer was released after serving eight years in jail. There was also an article about one of his victims that said this. Edmund J. Safra was a Lebanese-Brazilian banker who continued the family tradition of banking in Brazil and Switzerland. He was married to Lily Watkins from 1976 until his death. He died in a fire that attracted wide media interest and was judicially determined to be due to arson. After I looked up who is Ted Mayer, then I learned about what he really did. It explains a lot of why he gave off an extremely odd feeling, why he wasn't allowed to be unsupervised or left alone around children, and why he's no longer allowed to come to family gatherings. The reason why I want to share this post is to warn people about my uncle, who is known as Ted, or as Ted Mayer, to many. Please stay away from this man. Don't make eye contact with him and don't ever welcome this man into your life. He's very dangerous and is willing to commit another crime like the one he committed in France. I can only just imagine what he would do to me if I was alone with him and no one was around. And I'm just thankful my mother had me and my older sister's back. <laughs> This is an experience I had when I was 16 years old during the winter. Since the incident, I still can't go outside on snowy days. Back then, whenever it snowed, there was something I always did. It was called snowman smashing. Paul, George, and I would gather in the village on snowy days, look for snowmen that other people had made, and have fun destroying them as we found them. But one day, we discovered a strange snowman. 
The snowman was as big as an adult, wearing a black cloak and had deeply carved eyes and mouth. Paul put his hand inside the snowman's mouth and screamed, pulling his hand out quickly. His hand was bleeding. It turned out that there were many blades inside the snowman's mouth. In rage, Paul shouted, Whoever dared make me bleed shall bleed too. He started to remove the snowman's cloak. Then Paul walked back and ran toward the snowman, smashing it with a flying kick. We cheered in delight. But something came out of the broken snowman's body. It looked like some sort of heart. We screamed and ran away. Later, the police investigated and found out that it was a goat's heart. However, they couldn't figure out who had put it there. That night before bed, I felt an inexplicable sense of fear. It was as if incredibly cold air was entering my room. Even tightly wrapped in a blanket, my body shivered and I couldn't sleep all night. Since that day, I have been tormented by the feeling that the cold air has followed me all day long. Winter break ended and I went to school and received some shocking news. Paul had died. It turned out that one day Paul had jumped and tried to deliver a flying kick to another snowman, but slipped and fell backward, breaking his neck and dying. George and I were at a loss for words. We didn't say it, but we both felt a sense of shared terror. Since then, a sinister atmosphere loomed over the village, and all parents sternly warned their children never to smash snowmen. However, after some time, another heavy snowfall occurred, and as usual, a snowman wearing a black cloak was built in the middle of the village the next day. Some foolish children smashed the snowman, and shortly after, a boy in the neighborhood choked to death on a candy. He was one of the children who had smashed the snowman. After that, the parents in the village never allowed their children to go outside on snowy days and locked their doors tightly. Thus, no one walked around the streets on snowy days. Nevertheless, the day after heavy snowfall, the snowman with the black cloak would always appear in the middle of the street but no one dared to touch it. As time went by, the snowman no longer appeared in the village, and fortunately, no more tragedies occurred. However, since then, mentioning the snowman in the village has been strictly forbidden. To this day, it remains unsolved who made that snowman and what it was. It's still an unresolved mystery. My name is Kylie and this happened when I was 16 years old. I had two bullies named Alger and AJ. I wanted to tell my mom about my two bullies, but she'd probably hit me with a slipper if I did. I hated walking to school, not because I'm tired of walking, but because AJ and Alger would bully me on the side of the bridge. They'd take my money and threaten me that if I told anyone, they'd hurt me. One day, as usual, they took my money and threatened me, but before they went, I yelled at their back. Screw this, I'm telling the teachers about this, I said. AJ then kicked me and I passed out. When I woke up, it was already nighttime. I was laying on the floor the whole day and AJ and Alger were nowhere to be seen. I just went home and didn't bother to tell my mom what happened. The next day I wake up and feel happy that it's the weekend and I don't have to deal with AJ and Alger. Someone then knocked on the door. When I opened it, it was AJ and Alger. They smelled so bad. AJ just told me to come with them and they'll treat me, but said it in a cold voice. I was so hungry, so I went with them. I thought we were going to a restaurant, but we just went to the bridge. Both of them were standing in front of me and staring at me wildly. Honestly, I was more scared of the smell of them because they smelled like corpses. I wanted to vomit so bad, so I went to the side of the bridge, and then I saw it. AJ and Alger's corpses were down the bridge with their necks snapped because of the fall. That's when all the memories from yesterday flashed back. The reason why AJ kicked me yesterday is because I pushed both of them. Her feet hit me. That's why I fell down and my head hit a rock and I passed out. All of that happened yesterday. I looked back at AJ and Alger 
and they're getting closer and closer. Both of them then snapped their neck, their own neck, and just ran right towards me. When they disappeared, the smell was gone, but their bodies down the bridge still have that smell and always will. This isn't a story about me, but rather my friend. His name is Jacob. This is a scary story about a spirit he saw twice in his life. The first time was when he was standing in his parents' room, talking to his very sick dad. At the time, he was dying of stage 4 esophageal cancer. He got the feeling something was behind him. He looked toward the doorway to the living room, and something that was about four foot six and fully black with horns and blood red eyes was peeking around the corner with its hands on the door frame. He ran towards it and it slipped back around the door. When he got outside the doorway, there was nothing. His dad was completely confused when he stepped back inside the room and told him about what he saw. People who stayed at his house in his dad's final days claimed to have seen it. His mom saw the figure on multiple occasions, in multiple places, until he passed away. Fast forward four months. His big brother Luke was in a coma. He and his mother were going to the hospital to see him. And when they entered the hospital room, their stomachs turned inside out. They saw the figure, but this time it was taller. It was standing right over Luke, looking at him. When the figure noticed them, it glared at them. Then he blinked, and it was gone. Jacob said he couldn't sleep at all that night. He said he felt like someone was watching him when he was trying to sleep. I have a feeling that thing is the person that died before, since it was taller when it looked at his brother. If it was four foot six then, does that mean that a child died? What did it look like when no one died yet? We are 19 now. His brother hasn't woken up, and he's never seen the spirit since that day. This happened to me December 10th, 1996. I was at my friend's house because we celebrated our birthday that night. Time passed by, and eventually we needed to leave and head home. We were on our way home, but before reaching my house, we passed by a cemetery. My male friend, let's call him gay, was driving the motorcycle and he escorted me to my house while I was in the back just enjoying the cold gushes of wind. Now, cemeteries here in the Philippines are quite different because the coffins are placed inside cement and are painted white. They are piled up so we can reach up to three to five coffins up in the air. Back to the story. The cemetery was to my left. The moon was shining brightly as if it were day. And as I looked up, the very first thing I saw made my entire body freeze. There stands a tall, big-figured man wearing a barong Tagalog, a traditional attire in the Philippines. The most bone-chilling part was that it had no face, just white. I asked my friend, hey, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Then he replied, yes, what the hell is that? After seeing the faceless man at the very entrance of the cemetery, there were three ladies walking, two white ladies at the side holding up candles, and one black lady in the middle. That made me wonder why they were at the gate when no one was walking towards it. I looked at my watch and my eyes widened as it was 12 a.m. sharp. Gay, you can drive faster, I told my friend as he hastily drives, and as we turn left, I look back to where the faceless man was standing, and to my surprise, it was now looking in my direction. I faced front and never looked back again. We arrived at my house. I told my mom what happened and called my other friend, who also passed by the cemetery, and they said they saw nothing. Goosebumps, just goosebumps. Gay didn't want to take that route home, so instead he took the long way and safely arrived at his house. To this day, I never look at that cemetery whenever we pass by at night. I didn't want to stay up late and see that again. What was that faceless man? Why were those three ladies holding up candles? I don't really know. When I was younger, around nine years old, I used to hold the corn with my cousins, our parents, and our grandparents. We would stay up hauling late at night in a barn with only one working light, so the ambient was perfect for telling stories. One night my father told us something that was a true story of a woman he knew. 
We live in a small village, so everyone knows pretty much everyone around here. There was once an average-looking, middle-aged woman who always carried a walking stick with her. She claimed that she was the bravest person in the whole village and would always make that loud and clear, but people would just ignore her. One time, though, when she was yet again proudly preaching about her courage, a man stepped forward and said, You are always talking about how brave you are, but we cannot be sure, can we? I'll dare you to do something, and if you're as brave as you claim to be, you will accept the challenge. The woman, feeling like the challenge couldn't be that bad, answered, I accept your challenge. I don't need to know what the dare is to accept it. I'm not afraid of anything. The man smiled and replied, All right, I dare you to go to the cemetery tomorrow evening and sit on one of the graves. You have to sit there until the church bell rings at midnight. Then you can come back. If you can't stay till midnight and you return early, the whole village will know that you are a liar. The woman had no other choice but to do as he said. She accepted the challenge. The next day, she was waiting for it to get dark. She didn't have to wait long, though. The winter was almost here, and it got dark sooner. She went to the cemetery and soon found a grave to sit on. It was freshly buried, so the ground was soft. She stuck her walking stick in the ground and sat down, nervously waiting for midnight. After a few hours, she heard the bell ring, so that meant she was free to leave the cemetery. She sighed with relief, glad that nothing happened. She only had to walk her way back home. She tried to get up, but felt that something was dragging her skirt into the ground. She didn't want to turn around to see what was behind her. Panicked as she was, she grabbed her stick and tried to pull herself up, but her skirt was pulled into the ground harder this time. Feeling her clothes being dragged deeper and deeper, she screamed, Help me! The dead is dragging me into the grave! Help! But no one could hear her. The woman didn't return home that night. The next morning, a group of people went looking for her. They found her laying on a grave, dead. Her walking stick was stuck into her skirt, making it impossible for her to get up. When she pulled herself up with it, it only went deeper into the fresh earth. She died of a heart attack that she had out of fear. This is a true story about what a Japanese monk experienced when he was a college student. He was a student in the Buddhist department of a university in Satima. His father was a monk, but he was the second son and didn't have a temple to inherit. So he enrolled in the Buddhist department and lived in a dorm for Buddhist students. It wasn't an easy lifestyle because he had to keep up with his studies and train to be a monk at the same time. He was very tired of the daily routine of waking up at 5 a.m., getting water sprayed, chanting Buddhist scriptures, going to school, etc. To relieve stress, he would take a walk around the university dorm, but there was no entertainment facilities around the dormitory and there was nowhere to chill. There was a pet shop about four kilometers away, so he would go there with a friend to relieve stress. One day, he was playing with a big dog and taking pictures. Then suddenly, the owner came out from inside the shop angrily saying, Who told you to take pictures? And scolded him. You didn't take pictures of people, did you? The monk was taking pictures with a disposable camera at the time, and he was so frightened that he told the owner that he didn't take pictures of people, but he would just give him the camera anyway. The owner replied that it was okay if he didn't need to take pictures of other people. The monk apologized one last time in Kansai dialect and then was scared and wanted to go home. But suddenly, the owner's attitude changed dramatically. He asked where he was from, and when the monk said he was from Kyoto, he said he was from there too and seemed to be delighted. He wanted to chat and led him to a small house next to the pet shop and told him stories about himself. He used to run a pachinko parlor and he was happy to meet someone from his hometown and asked the monk to be his friend. When he realized that the monk was a Buddhist student at the nearby university, he even made him a job offer. Can you help me with my pet shop and walk the dog for 15 minutes twice a week and talk to me in our dialect afterwards? 
He offered to pay him 150,000 yen, which is about $1,100 for the job, which sounded like an amazing offer. So the monk took the job. However, his friend stopped him because he thought it was weird. So he told the man that he would ask his dorm teacher first and then decide. The man said okay and brought out some canned coffee to let them choose one. The monk picked a can and his friend refused. When he got back to the dorm, he asked the teacher about the job. The teacher got really mad at him because even though he was studying Buddhism, he still had that greed inside him. The monk went back to the pet shop to decline the job offer. The man said he understood and brought out some canned coffee again, making him choose one. The monk chose one, drank it, and returned to the dorm. After that day, the monk was busy and didn't go to the pet shop. Eventually, he had to move to Tokyo, so he went to the pet shop one last time to say goodbye to the man. The man was very sorry to hear the news because it was the last time. He brought out several canned coffees and let him choose one. The monk chose one and drank it on the spot. Then the man suddenly asked, you said you were a monk. Is there a real God or Buddha? The monk replied that he was practicing because he believed so. When he heard the answer, he offered him another can of coffee. The monk refused and left. That was the last time they ever met. Three years later, the monk in Tokyo received a phone call from his dorm teacher telling him that the pet shop owner was a serial killer. The owner of the pet shop was responsible for a series of murders that caused an uproar in Japan at the time, and one of his murder philosophies was to kill those who are greedy. The teacher told him this and said that if he had accepted that part-time job back then, he would have died. The monk was creeped out by the call, and he later learned something else from an article. When the serial killer was interviewed in jail, he told the reporter that he thinks there is a god or Buddha. The reporter asked him why, and he said, I used to own a pet shop in Satima, and I killed a guy. Then a monk came to visit, and I served him coffee. With four out of five cans poisoned and one unpoisoned, the monk came back three times, and all three times he chose the non-poisoned one. I even offered him another can at the last time, but he refused. Maybe there really is a god. Maybe he was protected by a god. This is a true story that happened in Japan between Sakin, the perpetrator of the Satima pet shop serial murders, and Mika Duan, a monk. The killer, Sakin, was very famous in Japan, and even a movie called Cold Fish was made in Japan based on his story. Mika Duan still has photos of him playing with the dogs in the pet shop, and he appeared on Japanese television several times to tell the story in person. Sakin told the story when he was interviewed before his death, saying he believed there was a god. A few years ago, the following post was posted to an online community. Hi guys, I'm a 23-year-old girl, and this guy has been following me for a few days now. He's got this weird big wooden sword, so I thought he was a martial artist, and I walked past him, but he kept following me. The other day, he followed me on the bus, pointed the sword at me, and kept muttering something to himself. The other day, I was on the subway, and people were looking at me. When I turned around, there he was again, staring at me and muttering. I freaked out and ran away, even though it wasn't my stop. Since then, I've been walking around the neighborhood every day, and my head hurts so much, like it's being squeezed by someone. Yesterday, my best friend called me and she told me that a man approached her on the street and yelled at her in a very angry tone. Your friend is in great danger, please tell me where she is. So my friend walked by thinking it was some weird cult guy. But then she was spooked and called me. And she said the guy was carrying a wooden sword. It was the guy I saw. What was going on? What's even creepier is as I'm writing this, I can see that guy looking at me outside the window swinging his sword around. I'll post again later. She posted a photo of the silhouette of a man outside her window, which received hundreds of comments, and the next day she posted another. I ended up calling the cops, and when they asked the guy what he was doing, he just stared at me for a while without saying anything. What was weird about his gaze was that he wasn't looking at my face. He was staring at the space above my head for a long time. What the heck is this situation? That was the end of the post, and the comments came flooding in. The story didn't end there, and she posted again a few days later. Hey everyone, it's me. It wasn't over yet. 
He's standing in front of my front door right now, chanting some spell, and he's shouting like he's swearing. The weird thing is that every time he chants, my whole body hurts. I feel like I'm being torn apart. Why is this happening? I need to talk to him. She posted a photo of herself, and her whole body was red. People kept commenting and asking what happened. After a while, she responded to their comments. I answered the front door and yelled at him, what do you want? And he answered that I was possessed by an evil spirit and if I don't get it off of me soon, I'm in trouble. People went crazy in the comments telling her he was lying and she shouldn't be fooled. She commented again. Now this guy is telling me that the first time he saw me on the bus, the evil spirit was eating my hair. Then the next time he saw me on the subway, it swallowed my entire head. Now it's swallowing my whole upper body, and if I don't get rid of it fast, I'm going to die. He said he's been casting spells to get rid of it, but it's not going away, so he came to see me in person. Somehow these days I have nosebleeds, my lips turn blue for no reason, and I can't breathe well. What should I do, guys? The post got tons of comments from people concerned about her, but then she stopped posting. Then a week later, a post popped up saying, Hi there. I'm the sister of the girl who wrote that a man came to visit her a while ago. She died a short time ago. The man came to my sister and said she was possessed by an evil spirit, so we had exorcism rituals for a while. However, it turned out that he tortured my sister in madness. He beat her with a wooden sword for five hours. He said that he had to beat her until she bleeds black blood, and only then would the evil spirit be dead. Eventually he went to jail but he is still arguing that he is innocent and that the evil spirit consumed her. After this post, nothing was posted on the online community about her. Many people were left shocked and horrified for a while as they recalled her incident. Hi, Wansi. I want to share my experience that happened way back in 2012. This is my true horror experience. And ever since that day, I believe in guardian angels. 3 AM. It was my first time working in Manila, Philippines. I worked at Jollibee Fast Food and my schedule was 2 PM to 12 midnight. At that time, we had an overtime charity, so we needed to extend cleaning for two hours. When I got out of the store, it was almost 2.25 AM. My aunt's house where I'm staying is nearby, so I didn't need a ride. My usual route is on the highway, which is on the left road. While I was walking, someone whispered in my ear. The voice said, don't go there. I looked back and there was no one walking behind me, but there were a few people on the sidewalks. I walked back and ended up using the right road. When I got home, I looked at the clock on the wall and it was exactly 3 a.m. I heard a gunshot, but I was so sleepy at the time, I didn't pay much attention to it. I brushed my teeth and then went to sleep. My cousin woke me up. I asked him what time it was and he said, it's 4 a.m. He said someone died on the left highway. It was a security guard at a motorcycle store. He was shot in the head and according to my aunt, they robbed the truck with motorcycle supplies and killed the security guard. And all this happened at 3 a.m. That's when I remembered the whisper I heard. If I had taken that left route, maybe I would also be dead now, if I happened to witness the crime. I'm thankful for my guardian angel, but I'm also sad as well because of what happened to the security guard. Hi, I've been watching all of your scary videos every time you guys upload them. I find all the stories interesting and very terrifying, but I never expected I would experience something horrifying, just like the videos you guys upload. Here's my story. I'm a girl who lives in a province here in the Philippines, and people here are very superstitious, especially the old folks. I never believed in those superstitious beliefs, but I never imagined that those beliefs would one day save my life. It happened two months ago when I got accepted as a tutor for a kid in the barangay near us. 
The salary was nice, and so was the family. It had been three weeks since I started being a math tutor for their child, and I was on my way to their house when I noticed people staring at me weirdly, as if they saw a ghost or something. I just shrugged it off and made my way to the student's house. I knocked on the door and smiled at the mother, who smiled back at me. But her smile suddenly faded away, and she looked at me like how the people on the street did. I thought I messed up my makeup or something, so I asked her, but she stood there quietly. The awkward silence was interrupted when I heard my student's cheerful voice shouting my name and running towards my direction. I was excited to hug her too since she was always hyped up to see me, but she stopped midway and started crying. Her mother snapped back to reality and said, Maybe she's just tired. You can have a seat in the living room while I prepare lunch. Even though I was confused, I just sat on their nearby sofa and I heard my student screaming. Why is my teacher's head missing? I was shocked by what the kid said and it became even creepier when her dad approached me, also looking scared and said, I think you should go home for now. But remember, if you arrive home, burn all the clothes that you're wearing today. It didn't make sense, but I just nodded and went home. At home, I recalled all those bizarre things that happened and told my parents about it. My parents, who were never superstitious at all, suddenly got up and started praying. They told me to burn the clothes that I wore that day immediately. Since their reaction creeped me out, I did what they all told me to, so I burned my clothes that night. While burning my clothes, I could smell some weird odor that made me want to puke. I told my brother to watch my burning clothes because I was going to get a glass of water. But on my way, I fainted. When I woke up, it was already 7.30 p.m. I asked my mom what happened, and they told me I fainted. So they took me to the hospital, and they said I was fine. Since I couldn't wake up in the morning, my parents informed my students' parents that I wouldn't be there since I was sick. But the next thing shocked me because, while listening to the radio, we heard that there was a shootout that happened in the street during 8.30 in the morning. And luckily, no one got injured since no one was walking on those streets at that time. But that's the same street that I always walk on at exactly 8.30 in the morning to get to my student's house. I then realized that the reason my student saw me headless is that I was about to get into an accident. And if I hadn't burned my clothes, I would have been a victim of the shootout. You see, in the Philippines, if people see you headless, it was advice that you should burn your clothes that you're wearing that day in order to be safe. The story begins in the summer of 2020, when my girlfriend, some friends and I were on a trip to a town near my city for a few days. The city has a beautiful port area with some cliffs behind it. These cliffs are very high and jumping from them, it is impossible. Instead of sand, there were hard rocks and stones. The small town is famous for two things, its tourists and its fishermen. On the first day of our trip, we decided to go for a walk to the cliffs to watch the sunset and bring some beer and snacks. The town's coast is situated in a big gulf that includes our hometown as well, so they're pretty close to one another. There was a large oil tanker that was anchored in the gulf for an extended period of time because of false documentation. Nobody claimed the illegal ship and the crew were off of the ship, so it was just stranded there for over a year. As we watched the sunset, only the large oil tanker and a few fishing boats were in the calm sea. It was a wonderful summer evening. The sun eventually set and we had a few laughs talking about stuff we wanted to do that summer. However, my friend Alexander noticed something odd. Hey, shouldn't that ship be empty, guys? He said. At first I ignored it, thinking it was an automatic light that just happened to be flashing that night. But eventually, the flashing lights became two, and then three, and suddenly a large portion of the ship was clearly illuminated. It seemed strange, but we knew nothing about ships, so we assumed there must have been a mechanic left behind to watch and maintain the ship while someone came to take it home. We went to bed, and all of my friends had already forgotten about it, except for me. I had a nagging feeling that something was wrong. The very next day, we went to a local fast food chain to get some breakfast, and the TV inside was on the local <gasps> town channel which gave information about nearly everything. And then we saw it. Three sailors dead after attempting to board an abandoned ship in the Gulf last night. Reports say that two of them had their throats cut 
and the third one died from electric shock. Did what we saw have anything to do with the sailors' deaths? Or was it just a sad coincidence? Why were the lights shining? Who cut the sailors' throats? And what were they searching for on this ship? I still don't know to this day. The police dismissed the case as an accident a month later. This happened when I was about 22 years old. I had been going to horror experiences as a group for a while at the time. It was a lot of fun until this happened. There were five of us in the group, and we traveled to scary places all over the country, exploring places like abandoned houses or haunted places. Along the way, we occasionally saw ghosts, experienced mysterious things, but for the most part, there was nothing to be worried about. Then one day, the leader of the group called to say that he had found something a little more out of the ordinary this time. A man had reached out to him, saying that something horrifying was living in his house and that we should come and see it. He wouldn't tell us what it was, but we were curious and eager to see it. So we decided to visit. That day, we packed our bags and set off for the house. After a five-hour drive, we arrived at the house. It was an ordinary house, and when we entered, we were greeted by a middle-aged man. He was living alone. He began to tell us about the creature that lived in his house. With sparkling eyes, he explained excitedly what a strange creature it was. We were full of curiosity. He told us that one day, while hunting in the forest, he came across the creature that he had never seen before in his life, and the moment he saw it, he knew it wasn't an animal nor human. The creature was wounded and bleeding, and its blood was brown. He captured it and brought it home and tied it up. The creature didn't drink water, it didn't eat bread, vegetables, fruit, or anything else. It would only eat live animals. It would eat and digest the whole thing, including every drop of blood and bone. So the man went out hunting every day and brought back animals to feed the creature. It had an amazing appetite, devouring animals every day and the man said he was exhausted from hunting every day. But his expression seemed excited while saying this. He didn't tell anyone about it because he was afraid that if he called the police, they would take the creature away. And if he spoke to the media, someone would definitely come and steal it. Then he said he was only showing it to us because he thought it would be okay for people like us. His story was hard to believe until we saw it with our own two eyes. After a while, he led us to the basement. When we entered the basement, there was a chained creature we had never seen before. It looked like a man, but it had large, sharp bones sticking from every bone in its body, and its skin was made of a hard, plastic-like material. It had large, wide teeth. As soon as it saw us, it started hopping mad, drooling sticky yellow saliva. We were terrified that it would break the chain, the man laughed and said, It's amazing, isn't it? I've never fed it human meat before. It probably won't even be a bite for him. We were all terrified and tried to take pictures, but the man wouldn't let us. So we stood there, completely blown away by the sight, when suddenly he shoved our backs toward the creature. One of my friends, Lila, actually got close enough to be grabbed by it, but managed to get away. The man let out a short sigh of regret, and we yelled at him, What are you doing? Another friend, Brady, became enraged and punched the man in the face. But the man was an incredibly strong man, and Brady couldn't take him down. He grabbed Brady and threw him at the monster, which bit down on Brady's leg. There was a tremendous crunch and the sound of a bone breaking, with Brady's scream shaking the basement. My friends barely managed to pull Brady to safety, and his leg was badly crushed and torn. I was outraged and managed to tackle the man. I knocked him down and began punching him ferociously in the face, and my friends joined in. The man's face was eventually covered in blood, and we quickly gave first aid to Brady. The creature was screaming a bizarre noise and seemed to be amused. We quickly got out of there and went to the hospital. The doctor looked at Brady's leg and asked what happened, and when we told him about the monster, he didn't believe us. Luckily, Brady was treated and he was fine. 
but to this day, his leg is covered with some very serious scars. We called the police and the man was punished. But the police seemed to keep the monster's existence a secret. Since then, our meetings are over and we've continued to search for the creature, but have never found out its true identity. Recently, I've started having strange dreams. It was a dream about a woman gnawing off other people's faces with her teeth. By the time I got exasperated with the recurring dreams, I realized that it wasn't a dream. When I got my mind right, I realized I was in a dungeon and there were some people around me with their skin peeled off from their faces, looking terrible. All of them were missing eyeballs and were laying on the floor, constantly moaning. Someone had many areas of their body severely dented, such as the upper arms and thighs. I tried to scream at the horrible sight, but my voice did not come out. For some reason, I had no energy at all in my body. I could just roll my eyes. I barely touched my face with trembling hands and checked on my body. Fortunately, my skin was still okay. After a while, I could hear someone's voice in the hallway. How many faces are left? Only a few left for me to eat. Ugh. Hurry up and gather some new pretty girls. Along with the voice, I heard someone getting nearer and my heart started beating like crazy. Other than me, there were about three more people whose faces were undamaged and they were all holding their faces, crying. Then a woman and two giant bodyguards opened the door and came in. The woman came over and looked at each person one by one for a long time. She touched their skin with her hand and smelled them. She stared closely at my face and said with a wide open smile, I should save this one to eat later. But that kind of face expression puts me off my appetite. So, you'd rather cry like the others. <laughs> Her voice was creepy like a witch's. She agonized for hours over the four of us and eventually went close to a woman and bit off her face. She screamed furiously, but all that came out was a weak sound of an air leak. The woman exclaimed in wonder, I knew it would be like this. The skin is so chewy, as expected. I'm correct. Take her to the operating room and pluck out her eyes. I was in terrible shock. I couldn't remember why I was here or even when. I couldn't remember anything. And that night, I had a dream again. Some men gave me an injection and left. And after a while, I heard gunshots, people screaming, and loud footsteps echoing through the hallway. And after a while, the police opened the door and came in and shook me. Then I woke up from the dream. I was lying in the hospital. A man came up to me and introduced that he is a detective and explained, You were imprisoned in that cellar for two weeks. Do you remember? I said, I don't remember anything. The detective continued talking. <sighs> it's a really horrible case. The madwoman ate off a total of seven people's faces and body parts. You were abducted two weeks ago, and every night you were given anesthesia. Fortunately, a missing persons report was filed, and while tracking you down, we discovered the basement. You are safe now. I couldn't believe anything. Why the hell did that woman do this? Then one thing came to mind. All the people in that prison were pretty. Suddenly, my head hurt as if it would break, and the forgotten memories came to mind. The model recruitment ad I saw two weeks ago. When I saw the ad for a very high-paid job, I remembered going to an interview, and I don't remember anything since then. After a while, the last memory came to mind. When I arrived there, I met the woman, and what she said as she looked at me. Oh my, take good care of her. Everything is to my taste, from head to toe. I will eat everything, except the bones. I woke up in the middle of the night with my cousin sleeping next to me. This happened about two or three years ago, when we were at our grandparents' house, but they weren't home since they had been invited to a party. It was just the two of us, and we were old enough to stay alone. I got up to get a cup of water, and as I walked back to my bed, I heard scratching at the window next to where my cousin and I were sleeping. 
I was too afraid to remove the curtain, so I just laid back down. But then, I heard the scratching again, and I was on the verge of tears. Being a teenager, my mind was running wild, and I couldn't help but imagine seeing two glowing eyes in the dark. I have had night terrors before, which made my fear of the dark even worse. I woke up my cousin, who was initially frustrated with me, but then he agreed to check the window. He put his hand on the curtain, pulled it back, and suddenly, there was a high-pitched scream. I started crying uncontrollably, but my cousin covered my mouth and jumped onto the bed, warning me that it was a skinwalker and that it might hurt us. The creature screamed again, and I was crying so hard, but silently. My cousin told me that when he pulled the curtain back, he saw it running on the walls like a deformed wolf, and that it jumped onto the balcony and hopped off, screaming all along. I was in such terror that I couldn't believe what I was experiencing. We lived in the city. This was unheard of. After the screams of the creature, I passed out. When I woke up, my cousin told me that nothing else had happened. We immediately ran outside in the fresh morning sunlight and checked the windows. There were long and jagged scratch marks on the windows and walls, and we could see paw and human prints on the walls. I went to check on the pet goldfish that my dad had left outside in a bowl of water, and to my surprise, they were all gone. Only a puddle of water remained on the ground. We didn't tell our grandparents because we were afraid of something bad happening to us. You might not want to believe me, but I know what happened that night. The claw marks, high-pitched screams, footprints, and everything my cousin saw will stick with us forever. My name is Zach, and I have a girlfriend named Mira. One day, Mira and I were walking towards school when we saw Jason Vasco. I asked them what they were doing, and they said Vasco was going to the school alone later because there is an old story from our school about a woman in the very back corner of an empty hallway who is constantly looking for her child at midnight. If she sees you, she's going to ask you if you've seen her child. Upon hearing the news, I wanted to get my girlfriend's attention. This was creepy. Jace also said that you have to write a signature. It's part of the ritual, and the plan is to get to the school around midnight. I said, what? Vasco can't do that. Look at him shaking over there. I chuckled, and then Jace replied, then you should go. I got goosebumps and replied, yeah, yeah, okay, I guess I can. A few hours passed and it was midnight. I brought a doll just in case the story turned out to be true and headed for the school. I could see Jace and Vasco from far away, keeping their distance. So we had a little chit chat and then I went inside the school. I walked and walked, and then someone or something appeared in front of me. There was a woman who had a hat, short hair, and was smiling creepily at me. She said, You are holding my baby. You are holding my baby. You are holding my baby. And I said, Yeah, yes, she's your baby. And then I took off down some hallway, but found myself trapped in a dead end. The rain was pouring down, and it echoed off the roof. Lightning reflected in the window, which got my attention, and I could see there is a picture of the same woman looking back at me. I wrote down my signature as fast as I could and got back outside. We decided to go home, and my girlfriend Mira, Jace, and Vasco were all shocked when I told them what happened. I wrote my signature on the window and not in the picture. Jace nervously asked me if I was joking, and I said I wasn't. Does that mean... This is a true story about my mother. Naturally, most people believe that their parents are unique or special, and I'm no different. However, when I was around 16, I discovered that my mom was special in a very different way. My mom has the ability to predict death. I know that to most people, Something like this sounds impossible or made up from a movie, but there's no logical explanation for what she's seen. When she was in her early 20s, she had a dream of a closed coffin and a voice telling her, You know who it is. A week later, my grandmother dropped dead from a heart attack. As creepy as this prediction is, there's one that still gives me shivers down my spine. One day, a friend introduced her to a cousin of theirs who had just given birth to a newborn baby. The night after they all had dinner together, my mother had a dream. In the dream, she saw a baby lying on its back, smiling and giggling. Suddenly, 
A large hand began to slowly wrap its fingers around the infant's neck. My mother awoke in a panic, unable to get her dream off her mind. To her horror, she received a terrible phone call. The newborn baby she had met only days before had died. The dream she had the night before wasn't just a random nightmare or her brain playing tricks on her. It was yet another premonition, the second one she had since my grandmother. Though this story happened years ago, my mother's spine-chilling ability still hasn't stopped. Just days ago, a member of our church passed away due to a brain aneurysm. When my mother heard the news, she told me that weeks before it happened, she kept hearing a voice in her head that wouldn't go away. It whispered, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm a truck driver. This is a story of what happened during the rainy season when it rained endlessly. It rained continuously for weeks and I went to work grumbling about it. When I was getting on the truck at dawn, I noticed my coworker walking with someone in the rain, putting arms around each other's shoulders. I shouted at him, Hey, are you two going on a date in the rain? But he ignored me and kept walking. I felt a bit offended, but I didn't think it was a big deal and ignored it. A few days later, while I was driving my truck again on a rainy day at dawn, the boss called me and told me that a colleague had suddenly disappeared. His truck was parked all by itself on the road with the door open. The boss got angry at me and shouted, What the hell is going on these days? A few days later, when the rain stopped, we heard news that two truck drivers from our company were missing. Their trucks were still parked where they have been, with the door open, without even a trace. I tried to contact their family, but they said they have been out of contact as well. I reported it to the police, but there was no progress. After a while, it rained again. Early that morning, I was getting on the truck when I saw a man standing in front of me. He seemed to be the one who put his arm around my coworker's shoulder. He was slowly walking towards me in the rain without an umbrella. I shouted at him, Michael is missing. Do you know where he is? Then all of a sudden, he walked towards me and shouted, Nice to meet you. He raised his hand as if to put his arm around my shoulder. I noticed that he had something in his hand, a very long needle. I was so surprised that I kicked him and jumped right back on the truck. As I frantically sped up, I felt a sting on my neck. When I looked at it, blood was flowing as if it had been pricked by a needle. I called the police and soon they found him hiding under a truck parked in front of our company and arrested him. During the interrogation, he confessed that he was the culprit of the missing truck drivers. When the police asked where they are, he said they are in his basement. The police asked him why he abducted them and he replied, Well, when it rains, I get a little weird. I usually could endure it, but when it rains this long, I can't stand it. It was when I was 10. It was also a rainy day like this. I was on the car with my dad. There was a big truck in front of us, full of steel rebar. Then suddenly, one of the rebars fell off, and it went through our car and through my dad's body. I saw it with my own eyes. After that, on rainy days, that scene comes to mind. When I hear the rain, I look for a truck. And he hollered, slamming the desk. Let's go to the basement of my house. I'll show you where it is at. And he screamed like crazy. When the police arrived at the basement of his house, there was a very large steel rebar on the wall, which was embedded in many dead bodies. I work at a small grocery store. The owner of the store was a man named Randy, and one day, he told me a strange story. 20 years ago, Randy worked at a grocery store in the same neighborhood. Back then, there was a co-worker named Curtis, and the two became friends as they worked together. One day, Curtis confessed that he had murdered someone before, and when Randy scoffed at him, thinking it was a joke, Curtis said it is true, and he doesn't get arrested by the police, even if he kills people. So when Randy told him to stop joking, Curtis said he would prove it. One day, while the two were looking for a target, they found a man walking alone in the alley, and Curtis abducted and murdered him. Randy said this is all he knows. He said he has no idea what Curtis did to the man. After a while, 
a man in the neighborhood was reported missing. The police broke in and interrogated Curtis, but there was no evidence against him. So Randy kept asking Curtis how he did that, but he didn't tell him anything. After all, time passed by and Randy felt a sense of guilt. However, he didn't have the courage to report the incident because if he does, he would make himself an accomplice. Randy told me it has already been 20 years, warning me to always watch out for people. It is hard for me to believe what he said. I just thought he made up the story. Then one day, a man named Curtis dropped by our store. Randy greeted Curtis and introduced him to me. I felt a sense of uneasiness. He is that murderer? He was an average looking man. He was rather kind looking. Curtis greeted me with a relaxed face. After a while, while Randy was away, I asked Curtis, Hey, there is something that Randy told me. Is it true? Curtis suddenly stiffened and asked what I'm talking about. I hesitantly said, 20 years ago. Then Curtis cut me off saying, Oh, of course that's a made up story. Does that make sense? Then he got up from his seat with a grave face. After a while, on his way out of the store, he said, Would you like some candy? Then he handed me a piece of candy wrapped in a transparent paper. I took it, but I didn't eat it. He kept looking at me, as if demanding me to hurry up and eat it. As I refused to eat, he asked for it and took it back. From that day on, Curtis kept coming to the store, approaching me every time. He kept asking me to go for a walk or go out to eat, but I constantly refused him. Then Randy came to me one day and said, Looks like you've become a target of Curtis. Run away. Don't ever come back here again. Go far away to another neighborhood. Don't let him find you. I actually quit working after a few days. Fortunately, I no longer had to run into Curtis, but endless fear and doubt lingered in my mind. But after a while, I heard news that Randy was missing. The police found that Randy had last left the store with Curtis and started investigating Curtis. And finally, they found Randy's hair in Curtis's house. However, no matter how hard they searched Randy's body, they just couldn't find it. After persistent investigation, the police finally found something in Curtis's house. There had been a hidden space in the ceiling of his house. In the ceiling, there laid Randy's body. Also, there was a concrete wall. When the wall was drilled, white bones and corpses were found. The DNA test of the bone revealed that it was the man who was missing 20 years ago. Curtis was sentenced to life imprisonment. One day, while looking for a part-time job, I saw a recruitment ad that was looking for an assistant for a YouTube channel. The salary was $200 a day. I was excited and applied right away, and asked my friend Matthew to come with me. A few days later, we decided to meet the YouTuber nearby. We got into his car and drove almost two hours to an abandoned factory in some remote area. When we arrived, there were other people there as well. They also came for the recruitment, and there were about four of them, and we exchanged greetings with one another. A moment later, the YouTuber walked over wearing a mask and holding axes in each hand. We watched him nervously, and he introduced himself as a YouTuber who shoots horror videos. He showed us his channel, but the number of subscribers was very low, less than 100. I wanted to know what this was all about, but I thought he was a person with a lot of money and just ignored it. But I should have noticed. He set up the camera and started explaining to us. I'm an axe murderer, and you guys will be murdered by me today. Don't touch your phone once the shooting starts. Don't go outside. Suddenly, the tone of his voice turned cold, and I got goosebumps. He said, Now the night of the death begins. Immediately he came running at breakneck speed and began slashing down a man frantically with an axe. The man shouted, Ah! I was really hit. This is a real axe. Blood splattered with a thud, and an ear-splitting scream shook the building. At that moment, my legs felt weak and almost fell down, and the screaming sound of others was ear-shattering. While I was shaking, Matthew, who was next to me, said, Hey, we're done. People ran to the entrance of the abandoned factory and tried to open the door, but it was locked. People knocked on the door frantically asking for help, but no one was around. People took out their cell phones and tried to call the police, but every time they did, the man knocked them down with his ass. 
I started racking my brain like crazy. I had never been so focused in my life. If this continues, everyone in here will die within 10 minutes. In the end, there was only one way. It was to steal the man's axe. I said quietly to Matthew, If we take the axe, then we win. Matthew cried, Our heads will be split in two first. Looking at Matthew, I said, Even if we stay still, we will die anyway. The two of us, let's seize his hands at the same time. In the meantime, the psycho was knocking down people with his axe in a flash. Several people were bleeding and moaning on the floor. At that time, a man attacked the psycho and the two started fighting. At that moment, I told Matthew, Hold his left hand. Matthew and I ran frantically and grabbed the psycho's hands. Then he struggled like mad and I managed to snatch away one axe from his hand. But Matthew missed his hand and the psycho raised his axe and hit Matthew. Ah! Matthew's scream infuriated me, and I slammed the psycho's back with all my might with the axe. He groaned and fell to the floor. I continued to hit him with the axe with all my might, and he fell, bleeding, and never got up again. I gasped for breath and called the police, and when the police arrived shortly after, the scene was horrendous. Two people died, and two were seriously injured. Matthew was seriously injured, and they were all taken away by an ambulance. The psycho was dead. The police checked on the camera he was filming, which vividly recorded scenes of people being murdered by an axe. The police were in great shock. I searched for his YouTube channel that the psycho had told me about. There were about three videos uploaded, but all of them were videos of him attacking many people with an axe. In the video, he was running with an axe, chasing people. Then the screen went black, only the dull sound of the axe hitting and people screaming. Then, at the end, the man appeared on the screen again, holding an axe stained with blood. If you're curious about the actual video, click on the link in the description. You can see the actual murder scene for a hundred dollars. And I could see people lying down far away. When I entered the link, a strange website appeared with a number of actual videos uploaded. I informed the police about this and they began to search for additional victims. I don't know what happened after that. Much time has passed and Matthew and I are still friends, but he still shudders when he thinks of that day, and he still has a big scar on his shoulder. This is the story of my six-year-old daughter, Riley. She was a good girl, but one day she started acting strangely. One day at dawn, she suddenly looked out the window and started howling like a wolf. When I asked why, she said that there was a wolf spirit outside and she was talking with the wolf. Mom, the wolf says that our house is where dead souls gather. I got goosebumps, but I just passed it over thinking it wouldn't be a big deal. But even after that, this same thing happened again and again. Suddenly, she looked into the air and talked to someone drew a strange looking monster on her notebook and said it was her friend. The monster was a very terrifying creature with six eyes and six limbs that looked as if three humans were combined together. And it possibly could not have been drawn by a six-year-old. I tried to scold her and I tried to talk her out of it, but she never got better. One day on my way to work, I told her that I would be coming in late because I need to work overtime. Then she said, Mom, I have so many friends at home, so I'm not lonely. I ended up taking her to a psychiatrist, but even the doctor couldn't figure out exactly why she was behaving like this. Then one day, she suddenly handed me some bread and asked me to eat it. The moment I picked up the bread and put it in my mouth, I recognized that something red was all over the bread. I asked in surprise, Sweetie, what is this? She said, It's hamster blood. Kevin told me to give it to you. My heart sank and I looked at the hamster cage in her room and found that the hamster was dead. I was so shocked and angry so I grabbed her and yelled, Who is Kevin? Why are you doing this? I yelled at the top of my lungs and she pointed to the wall next to me and said, That's Kevin. His jaw is down to the ground and his mouth is five feet wide. He's looking at you and drooling and his saliva is like jelly. And Kevin's mouth is full of dead animals and dead people because he can't digest anything since he has no organs. He says he wants to eat you too. I got goosebumps, grabbed her hand, and ran out of the house right away. Then I got in the car and sped like crazy until I got to a Catholic church in the neighborhood. I frantically searched for the priest and explained everything without hesitation. Then the priest thought for a moment and said, Your daughter has made friends with sinister spirits. 
Your daughter won't get hurt, but the people around her will be in danger. I will say my prayers for Riley. The priest held her and prayed the rosary for a long time, and she mocked the prayer or shouted it at the priest in an unknown language. I was really embarrassed and couldn't believe all this, but there was no other way, so I continued to visit the priest after that. After visiting the church dozens of times, surprisingly, Riley gradually came back to normal. She no longer stared into space, talked to herself, or did anything strange. I was so happy, and now my family could live a normal life. I didn't go to the church anymore, and after a few months like that, one day, Riley looked into the air again and shouted, Mom, the priest is here! I was surprised and asked her, The priest? Why is he here? Then Riley pointed into the air, and there was nothing she was pointing at, and she said with a bright smile, here he is in Kevin's mouth. <laughs> Every summer, my best friend, whom we'll call Maria, and I hung out at this resort. We each had our own hotel room that we shared together. One night, when we were 11 years old, Maria suggested that we go ghost hunting. I didn't have a great feeling about it, so I said, I don't really think we should go. Let's just stay inside and play games. But Maria insisted, saying, Oh, come on, it'll be fun. I'll play with you every day this summer if you go with me. Stupidly, I agreed. And we put our clothes, grabbed flashlights, and all that stuff. We went to the convenience shop in the resort to get a few sodas, and then that's when I saw her. Behind the register stood the most terrifying woman I had ever seen. My face went pale, and then she disappeared. As we were walking out, Maria noticed my pale face and asked, why? I told her everything, expecting her to be concerned, but to my surprise, she seemed happy. At that moment, I thought, what's wrong with this idiot? Nevertheless, she dragged me to the lobby to investigate. While I sat in the seat, already traumatized by the incident in the convenience store. As I was getting my phone from my purse, I noticed a red stain on my sundress. I thought it was ketchup from the buffet we had, so I shook it off. A few minutes later, I heard the most blood-curling scream coming from the elevator. I don't think anyone else heard it since there was no one else around and the night shift employee was fast asleep. It sounded like it was coming from the elevator hall. Curiosity got the better of me and I decided to check it out. The screaming grew louder and louder, causing my eardrums to feel like they were bleeding. I opened one of the doors and found a musty looking man in his 40s holding a knife to Maria's throat. In a panic, he grabbed me and whispered, I have a thing for Japanese girls. I'm actually Korean, but that didn't matter. I bit him and kicked his crotch, freeing Maria from his grip. We quickly ran back to our room and called the resort security. Thankfully, the man was arrested, but we were left absolutely traumatized. I'm now 13, and I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't heard Maria or found the right elevator. It was a stormy night and it was heavily raining. I was returning home on my scooter when I heard people behind me shouting and it seemed like they were stalking me. I could distinctly hear a female and she sounded close. I tried not to let it bother me at first, but it was impossible. I shot a quick glance behind me and I was being chased. There was a woman, and she was holding a knife just a few meters behind me. She menacingly smiled at me, which gave me a jerk, and because of the rainfall, my scooter skidded and I fell down on the wet asphalt. I turned on my flashlight quickly, and my stalker was still pursuing me. She saw my face from the flashlight and seemed alarmed, and then she ran off into the darkness. I scrambled to take a photo, but my shaky hands filled with panic mixed with the darkness, only got me a blurry shot of a blue sweater and the knife she was holding. The next day, I told my cousin about what happened. A look of horror came across his face. He told me that a girl had recently asked him out, but he declined. 
and she didn't take it well. The woman couldn't see my face clearly originally, and maybe that's why she ran after seeing my face finally lit up from the flashlight. What my friend said next shocked me. Apparently this was the fourth incident of her mistakenly chasing someone else. I'm glad I survived that night and got away with only a few scratches. However, I can't stop thinking about the fate of whom she might try to attack next. I am a Chinese international student living in Sydney, Australia. I am studying animation and property investment and I work hard every day. I remember one summer evening in 2021 when I had finished my report and decided to go for a drive to relax. I drove outside the city and found myself on a road surrounded by a national park up north. It was quite dark and without the car lights, visibility was poor, creating a somewhat eerie atmosphere. After a few minutes, I began to slow down as the road became more winding due to the mountainous terrain. It was during this time that I noticed a white figure in the middle of the road. Feeling startled, I stopped the car, and feeling a mix of fear and frustration, I exclaimed, What the hell are you doing here, asshole? However, upon closer inspection, I realized it was a crying girl in need of help. Not knowing how to handle the situation, especially involving a young girl, I allowed her to enter the car and sit in the passenger seat. She appeared frightened and requested that I drive her somewhere. As I continued driving, I didn't notice anyone behind the car. During the journey, I attempted to communicate with her and asked her where she wanted to go, but she seemed unable to understand or respond in English. She was a Caucasian girl, around 17 years old, dressed in a high school uniform. Despite my attempts to engage in conversation, she remained visibly anxious for about 30 minutes. At some point, she expressed her desire to call her mother, and I handed her my smartphone. However, she spoke in a language unfamiliar to me, which I assumed was her native tongue. For the remainder of the car ride, we did not exchange any more words. I contemplated contacting the police as the circumstances seemed suspicious. It was unusual for a young girl to be out alone at such a late hour. Additionally, I noticed that she was not wearing shoes and did not have a school bag, leading me to believe she may have been kidnapped. I decided to stop at a 24-hour gas station to buy some food for her. Before leaving the car, I quickly glanced inside to ensure she was alright. To my surprise, she was no longer there, leaving only some water or liquid on the left seat of my car. Despite the absence of any other vehicle at the gas station, it was baffling to wonder where she could have gone. I immediately contacted the police, and they thoroughly inspected my car. However, they were unable to provide any answers. Something strange caught my attention while checking my phone. I discovered a phone number. I called the number, hoping to reach the police. To my dismay, a woman on the other end cried and accused me of being a liar insisting that I shouldn't call back. A week later, I received a phone call from the police with a chilling revelation. They informed me that a Greek immigrant family had lost their daughter, who had been kidnapped and murdered by her boyfriend 30 years ago. Astonishingly, the police mentioned that she was only 17 years old at the time of her death. This left me wondering about the girl I had encountered that night, someone who seemed so real, but was apparently connected to a tragic incident from the past. I never saw her again. I had a girlfriend I dated three years ago. Her name was Sydney. But one day, she started to be so clingy towards me. She asked me hundreds of times every day if I love her, and I was so tired that I eventually dumped her. She then sent me one text message and moved to a city far away. Take care, honey. Let's meet in three years. Then she changed her phone number, and like that, I thought I'd never see her again. Three years have already passed since then, and I was in love with a new woman. I became a recognized employee in my company, and everything was going well. I had completely forgotten about my ex-girlfriend, until the day came. One day, I heard a knock on the door, and when I opened the door, she was standing there. My ex, Sydney. I got goosebumps. How did she find my house? But what terrified me even more was her face. Her jawline was severely reshaped, making it look as if she had no jaw. Her nose was absolutely pointy, as if the implant was going to pierce out of her skin at any moment. Her eyes, forehead, cheeks, and all parts of her face reshaped abnormally. It was just like a scene from a horror movie. The only way I could recognize her was by the tattoo on her neck. 
It was a tattoo she got in the past that read, You have to love me. Then she suddenly jumped at me, grabbed me by my neck, and shouted, How do you like my face? Now do you love me? Her jaw was crooked, and she seemed to be unable to pronounce words well. She stammered. I was so surprised that I asked her why the hell she is doing this, but she just kept repeating the same thing over and over again. Now do you love me, or don't you love me? Finally, I shoved her away and went into the house, and she kept knocking on the door for a long time. I ended up calling the police. It turned out that she had received over 100 illegal plastic surgeries since we broke up. She endlessly asked doctors for ridiculous, strange surgeries, and her face turned grotesque by getting surgery in an illegal way, after all. That's how she continued to come to my house and hover around in front of it. She shouted at me. Why? Is it still not enough? Should I lift my nose more? Shall I enlarge my eyes more? She screamed madly. After a while, she left a small note in front of my house, and the note said, Please come to my place one last time. Then I will leave you forever. I went to the address she wrote, and there was a small, shabby house. The front door was slightly open, and I peered through the door. Then I saw a silhouette of a woman standing in the living room. I opened the door, thinking it was her, and she shouted, How do you like me now? Don't you think I'm beautiful? Love me now! But the woman was not Sydney. It was a Barbie doll the size of a real woman. Sydney held the doll from behind and pretended to be the doll. I was startled, and then I saw that she was holding the doll's hand and holding a knife as well. She shouted as she ran over to me with the doll. It's not the looks, it's the heart that matters! She swung the knife at my chest, and I barely managed to escape and ran outside. I ran away like crazy and called the police. Later on, she was arrested by the police, and it turned out that she had been suffering from a very serious mental illness. What was even more shocking was that she had asked the plastic surgeon to transplant her heart into the body of a Barbie doll. When the doctor said no, she said to the doctor, Then I'll bring you a man. So take out his heart and attach it to mine. When I was in 12th grade, I joined an a cappella competition with six of my friends, three girls and five boys. It was 4.30 in the afternoon, and our mentor decided that we should go to the music room to practice our vocals since the competition will be the next day. We had been studying in that school for almost two years, but we had never entered that room before. As we entered the room, the first thing I noticed was the piano located near the door. It was quite old, as were the other guitars stored in the corner of the room. Andy, stop staring at the piano. It's an old piano. You won't be able to play it. He went to the piano and pressed the keys to prove that it wasn't making any sound. I just nodded at him and followed his orders during practice. We all blended so well, following his instructions. An hour later, there was a beep from his phone. Guys, there's an emergency. I'll just have to go downstairs for a bit. Wait for me. Don't touch anything. He instructed. We all nodded and he left the room. Sitting on the floor, we started chatting about the strategies we would use for the competition. A few minutes later, my friend Eric said something unrelated. Damn, I need to pee bad! And ran towards the door, shouting, Don't leave me! Before shutting it, we continued chatting and the conversation became more interesting. I didn't even notice when Eric returned to the room. In the middle of our conversation, we all heard the piano playing. I became annoyed, thinking that one of them was playing it. Hey, stop it! Sir might kill us! I scolded. Then we realized that the piano was broken and hadn't made any sound earlier. We looked at the piano, and 
it was playing on its own. We were all frozen in place, shaking to our core. I stood behind my other friend, trembling, and we all decided to exit through the door. My friend Eric was panicking so badly that he couldn't open the door at first. My other friend Trina took over and quickly opened the door. We ran downstairs to tell our mentor what had happened. Sir? The, the piano was playing on its own, I cried. He was in shock and decided to send us home to rest instead of continuing the practice. The next day, we found out that a nun had died in that room, and she was musically inclined. Our mentor joked that she was just trying to help us, but it wasn't a funny experience for us. We hadn't seen a nun playing. But witnessing a piano playing its keys was terrifying. My name is Kushi Singhal and I'm a 17 year old living in Delhi, India. So the story goes like this. This incident happened to me a few months back. One day, I was returning from coaching classes, and as usual, people were crowded on the streets, and the hour of the day was also a busy one, probably six in the evening. I was really tired that day, so I decided to book a cab home for myself instead of taking the bus. It was a distance of about 21 miles between my home and class, and it took about one and a half to two hours to reach home. While I was in the cab, suddenly I was shaken a bit, and the car stopped just about a mile away from my home, but because it was so dark, it seemed to be a pretty long journey. So I decided to walk home as it was too late to take another vehicle. After walking for a few minutes, I realized that a girl, probably the same age as me, was sitting behind the bushes just nearby where I was standing. Out of curiosity, I asked the girl if she needed any kind of help, and then she gently lifted her head up and said in a low voice, thank you for your concern. Actually, I have hurt my leg while I was walking by the side. Could you please give me your handkerchief so that I can clean the wound? I said, okay, but please tell me if you've told your family about this, to which she said, yes, I've contacted them and they'll be getting here any moment, but the wound is really hurting and I need to cover it as soon as possible. So I searched my bag and as soon as I was about to give her my handkerchief, an old man came towards me, grabbed my arm and immediately took me to the other side and said, hey kid, I was watching you for a few minutes. Who are you talking to over there? Then I replied, I was speaking to that girl over there to ask if she needed my help and was about to give her my hanky, but you grabbed my hand. And the next thing the man said to me left me in complete silence and with a deep horror inside of me. Listen, the girl which you are referring to was nowhere there. And I guess it was not a human, but the ghost of the girl who died 26 years ago in a road accident here. And it's good that you haven't given any of your belongings to her because if you had, it would be a really big problem for you, like you can't even imagine. Now don't stop anywhere until you reach home. I was left shaken and out of my senses. I ran straight home as fast as I could. When I reached home, my mother opened the door and said, Cushy, who's this girl with you? One of your friends? Without even listening to what she said next, I came in and closed the door and went straight to my room. That night I couldn't sleep, so I tried to calm myself down. I fell asleep and ultimately woke up the next morning. I then realized I was lucky enough that I didn't give this girl my handkerchief because if I had done so, she probably would have chased me. And the girl that accompanied me the previous night was the same girl I had encountered. I am really thankful to the old man for saving my life. My nickname is S. I wanted to share my experience that I had four months ago in hopes of it getting animated. Your animations are totally great, and I'm a daily viewer of your channel. About four months ago, I was home as usual with my parents and siblings, and I was studying. I decided to take a shower after I was done, and so I did. When I was in the shower, my parents and my two siblings went to take our cat to the vet and forgot to tell me. I continued showering and didn't hear them leaving or anything, so I didn't know that they left. While I was in the shower, our power went out. I thought nothing of it since a week ago my mom said that there was a problem with the electricity and that she would get it fixed soon. 
I got out of the shower and went to the living room where me and my parents usually hang out and watch TV. I couldn't see much, but I clearly saw four figures sitting on the couch. I was talking to them and complaining about the electricity, and no one responded. I was hearing breathing sounds, so I was certain that they were actually there. I told my sister to get off the couch so I could sit, and still no answer. I got annoyed at how they were acting and decided to move her myself. But as soon as I touched that figure, it was air. I stopped for a second. I was shocked. I ran and got my phone and turned the flashlight on and saw that no one was home. I called my parents and they said they would be coming back home soon. That night when I went to my room, I saw my blanket on my bed had the shape of a human, as if someone was hiding under the blanket. I told my sister to stop playing and get out, but no answer. I got mad and when I removed the blanket, no one was there. I kept trying to remake that shape, but the blanket was too soft to make that shape and stand like that. I'm still unsure who, or should I say what, those things were that night. And to this day, I can't find an explanation. A few days ago, somewhere in the house, I started to hear a faint scratching noise on the wall. As my house was in a remote forest, I searched the whole house to see if it was the sound of a wild animal, but I couldn't find a trace of an animal anywhere. And the sound was getting louder day by day. I was able to locate the source of the sound in four days, when, as usual, I was focusing on carpentry in the yard. Suddenly, the saw I was using broke apart and so I headed to the basement, where I hadn't been for a long time, to get a spare saw. In the basement, I was rummaging through my dusty toolbox, shining my flashlight, and I heard the sound that had been bothering me for days right behind me. I was so surprised that my whole body stiffened, and I quickly turned around to shine the flashlight towards where the sound was coming from. But nothing was there. I went up to the wall and listened with my ear against it, and to my surprise, the sound was coming from the wall at a very close distance. It was like the sound of something scratching the wall with a sharp tool, but it didn't sound like a wild animal, as it came in regular intervals. This situation, in which I had no idea what was behind the concrete wall, was so creepy and frightening that I couldn't stay home. So I quickly packed my stuff and got out and called the police. I hear a scratching noise in the walls of the basement storage room. Something is about to break out from the wall. And the police said that it's probably a wild animal, and they said they couldn't respond if it was just noise. I had no choice but to leave the forest and spend the night at the nearest motel. The next day, I returned home, grudgingly, with fear. When I returned to the house after just one day, it was a mess, as if someone had broken in. The kitchen and the living room were all covered with mud, and the refrigerator was wide open and all the food inside was gone. There were numerous footprints on the floor, which continued on to the basement. I took my gun out and carefully went down to the basement. To my surprise, there was a huge hole in the basement wall, and when I shined the flashlight at it, I couldn't see how deep it was. I called the police right away. After a while, they arrived and started searching the house. Many fingerprints were found in the house, but what was surprising was that all the fingerprints hadn't been registered, so even after checking, they couldn't be identified. One police officer said, It's estimated that there have been a total of eight intruders, but even if we tracked all the fingerprints, they haven't been registered. Besides, the shape of the fingerprints are quite unique. Then the officer looked through the hole in the basement with a flashlight and said, The depth of this hole cannot be measured at all, and it's too dangerous for a person to go inside for an investigation. We've never experienced this kind of situation before. It will take a bit to organize a search party. How about moving out first? Having worked as a carpenter, cutting the trees in the forest all my life, 
I had nowhere to go other than this place. I was afraid, but I had no choice but to plug the hole and decided to continue living there. After the cops had gone, I was left alone in the house. I covered the hole with a wooden board, nailed it firmly, and locked the basement door. Who the hell were the eight people who broke into my house that day? The house became silent as if nothing had happened, and no more sound was heard from the walls. For several days after that, I was startled even when I heard the slightest sound. But as time passed, the memories of the incident faded. A month later, when I returned home after going out to the woods to cut trees, I heard a strange noise from the basement. That sound was a sound I've never heard before, and it sounded like a snake. I pulled out my gun and carefully opened the basement door, when something suddenly came out and pounced on me, strangling me. It was a creepy creature with a bald head and skin, transparent enough to show all of its blood vessels. Its appearance was similar to that of a human. The creature was strangling and looking down at me, and it had a terrible appearance, with no black parts of the eyes. It wasn't long before several creatures began to surround me when I passed out. <sighs> How long has it been? When I woke up from the pain of my back being chafed, I saw the creatures grabbing my legs and dragging me into the subterranean ground. They were making an eerie hissing sound, and their transparent bodies were glowing green in the dark. The narrow passage in the underground gradually widened large enough for an adult to stand up and walk. There were many creatures gathered together. They crawled towards me and started fondling me. The creatures lifted me up and went deeper into the tunnel, where I saw a creature sitting with its head hanging low. I noticed it was the frailest creature, even at a glance, with a wrinkled body and bent back. The creature slowly lifted its head and looked at me, and its eyes resembled human eyes because it had blurry black irises. It was the only creature among the creatures to have black irises. Its eyes widened as it saw me, and it made strange noises. It began to speak in a strange language that I couldn't understand. Nana Luga Ani Yonamu Luga Uri Kimaki what did you say? When I asked it, the creature started muttering incomprehensible words again, and the other creatures were watching us, holding their breath. I wondered if the language really even existed, so I took my phone out of my trouser pocket and turned on the voice translation app, but the translator didn't recognize the creature's words at all. So I turned on the recorder instead and recorded the creature's words. The creature, which was muttering unknown words, eventually made a hiss sound to the rest of the creatures. Then the creatures rushed to me and began to kneel down and bow. What is this? I was puzzled at this strange situation, and they brought a bunch of various insects, dead moles and tree roots and handed them to me. It seemed like they were sharing their food. It was only then that I realized that the creatures had no intention to kill me and I gestured to them that I would not eat the food they brought me. Then, as if the creatures understood my words, they backed away for a while, and then brought a creature that looked like a female and thrust her on me. The female creature hissed and clung to my body. I shook it off in astonishment. I was so scared to be in this situation, and I wanted to get out quickly. So I cried and begged to them to let me go back home. Then they began to lead me back down the tunnel where we came in. Walking through the long tunnel, relying on the green light emitted by the creatures in the pitch darkness, was very arduous. After many twists and turns, I was able to get out again through the hole in the basement of my house. They sent the female creature out of the hole as well, and the female creature hissed and crawled around quickly inside the basement. I jumped out of the basement and quickly locked the door. Then the female creature started pounding hard on the door from inside. I called the police and explained the situation. And shortly after, the police and the search party arrived. The police carefully opened the basement door. And at that moment, the creature jumped out and clung to me. I was so startled that I screamed. And when the police tried to remove the creature, the creature clung to me harder and bit my neck. 
As I screamed, holding my neck, the cop smashed the creature's head hard with a club and got it off of me. As soon as they dragged the creature out of the house, white smoke suddenly billowed from its transparent skin when it received sunlight. Soon, it burned black and died painfully on the spot. From that day on, I was investigated for a long period of time about what I had seen underground, and my house was frequented by many people involved. My house was surrounded by a police line. The corpse of the dead creature was autopsied, and it had organs resembling those of a human inside its translucent skin, but no lungs, and gill-like holes were pierced diagonally along the ribs. Experts speculated that they may have survived by breathing through the gills underground. In addition, they said that their eyesight was deteriorating, so they did not have irises and could barely identify objects by light. I submitted the file containing the voice of the creature recorded on my cell phone to the police, and numerous historians gathered to analyze the language. Surprisingly, it was not the language of the modern society, but the language of ancient North American Native Americans and when translated, it meant, You are our first ancestor. We hid into the ground to outlive the war and survived, generation after generation, for a very long time. If I die, there will be no one who has learned the language. Teach your language to these people. The creatures were natives who hid underground to escape from an unknown war about 3,000 years ago. Over that long period of time, their bodies had developed to suit the underground environment, and they've become creatures. If people found out of their existence, it could cause social ramifications, so the government strictly controlled them from appearing in the media. I also had to write a memorandum to not disclose all the facts. My wounds from the creature's bites have almost healed, as they were stitched up at the hospital and treated regularly, and the nightmare-like memories of the day gradually faded off as well. Whew. I looked at my neck in the mirror and sighed in relief. I took off my clothes to take a shower, and there were strange holes in my ribs. What the… Astonished, I got closer to the mirror and, surprisingly, the skin of some parts of my body had turned transparent, revealing blue blood vessels. I went straight to the hospital, and all the doctors in the hospital rushed over to see my body, and they were shocked. They said that the disease is a rare one that they have never seen before. That was when I realized that my body was slowly changing into a creature after I was bitten. After returning home, I hid in agony due to my appearance that was changing terribly. After a long time, I mustered up the courage to stand in front of the mirror and found that the black irises in my eyes had faded. In addition, as my skin had turned transparent, it felt unbearably prickly and painful when exposed to ultraviolet rays. Now my body could no longer cut trees or go outside to the yard to do carpentry. By intuition, I realized I could only survive by going into the hole in the basement. I broke through the sealed basement door and began drilling the hole the police had filled with concrete. After drilling through the concrete continuously for a week, I heard sounds of people outside the basement when I was finally able to squeeze my body into the hole. Mr. Graham, it's the police. Please open the door. I came after receiving your medical records from the hospital. I heard your body is gradually changing. Are you all right? I crawled into the hole, ignoring the cops shouting. At the age of 13, I wanted to become a successful supermodel like Kendall or Bella. It was a career that stood out the most to me and I was extremely dedicated to achieving it. I talked to my parents about my future success plan. They supported me and had amazing feedback. I was eager to become a model, so I did something dumb and decided to apply myself to a modeling company. A week later, I received a call from a woman. I specifically remember what she said to me. Hey, are you Sarah? My name is Saira. I correct her by saying, it's Saira, who is this? She goes, I wanted to contact you about the email I sent you. We're here to schedule a photo shoot. In surprise, I responded, oh really, ma'am, thank you so much. The lady replied, yes, honey, believe it. I've helped girls become very successful. We are located in Manhattan. 
Where I live, New York is close but expensive. She claimed, I'm sure your mom would understand that this is a wonderful opportunity. I was worried about how my parents would react, but excited. The next day, I brought it up to my dad and he said, Saida, who was this person? Did you reveal your personal information to a stranger? You can't do that. You're going to get hurt, he screamed at the top of his lungs. Later, apologized for yelling and stating, I just don't want you getting hurt. I had made a dumb decision. I was naive, impulsive, and impatient. That same month, I watched a video on this lady's website. It was about a young woman named Kara Nichols. She was 18 and had a passion for modeling and later joined some random Craigslist modeling app. A supposed photographer sent her an email wanting to meet up. The photos taken of Kara are the only evidence she was seen alive. Her family is still grieving. This lady has been missing since 2012. Later, I found out the modeling company I applied to wasn't legit and was a scam. I also clearly remember the woman replying with, to this day, it still sends shivers down my spine. Well, we're not an agency. We just pick out girls we think are a fit for us. So we just want you. At first, I thought that was a little suspicious. Thank God my parents didn't let me go. One night while I was sleeping, I suddenly woke up with goosebumps. Looking around, there was something gigantic outside the window, blocking the moonlight. I was startled and looked at it closely. Outside the window, a very large face was staring at me. It was three times the size of a human's face, and its skin color was pitch black, and it was smiling, broadly. I jumped out of bed in surprise. What was even more shocking was that I was on the second floor. A human couldn't be that big. I shouted as I trembled, The p police I couldn't say a thing. After a while, it slowly moved away. It was smiling and staring at me as it walked away. Its eyes paralyzed my whole body, and I couldn't move. When it was far away, I finally could see its body. It was a huge giant that looked as if it was 12 feet tall. The length of its legs looked like a telephone pole. I froze on the spot, watching the scene. What? What the hell was that? Is this a dream? But despite how many times I pinched on my trembling thighs, I realized it wasn't a dream. Who the hell was he? I had big doubts. And I went around asking people in the neighborhood if anyone had seen him. Among them, there was an old lady who was over 80 years old. And she said to me with a very surprised expression, He's back? I'd seen him when I was about 30. After the giant came, people in the village started to die. When I was little, my parents told me that there is a giant that appears in town, but I didn't believe it. But he appeared again. Soon, there'll be successive deaths in this village. After that day, the people really started dying in the village, but the people who died were all troublemakers. Bullies who stole other people's money, people who committed adultery, and scammers, etc. Dozens of people have died mysterious deaths with unknown causes. All of them were found overnight with their bodies compressed into tiny balls, but the police and doctors couldn't find any exact evidence why they died like that. All the people in the village were seized with great fear. Then one day, while I was sleeping again, a loud voice resonated throughout my room as if a cave. I come to clean up this town every 50 years. Rogue humans cause damage to humanity, so they must be periodically disposed of. Fortunately, you are not a defective product. Keep on living a life of virtue. And at the window, the giant was smiling again. I shuddered in fear, but with the heavy thud of his footsteps, he slowly drifted away, and I haven't heard his voice since then. All the people in the village trembled in fear, but after a few days, there was no one who died. All the villagers gathered around and said he would come again later on and that they should prepare for that. Even at this moment, I'm really afraid. Will he really appear again after 50 years? If so, should I leave this town? If I leave this place, will I be free from his judgment? Hello. My name is Juliana. I am currently 13 years old with dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. I will admit this isn't the scariest of stories, but it still confuses me to this day. This happened to me in mid-2017. For some context, my mom works in a job where she has to travel a lot. So, a few days before this happened, 
She said she had a trip and she would be gone for a few days. I was pretty sad, but I knew it was just a business trip and she would be back soon. A few days passed and my sisters, dad and I were just having fun. Going out, watching movies, eating snacks, the usual. Finally, the day arrived that my mom would finally be back. I was having some trouble sleeping for a few weeks, so I was lying in my bed, unable to sleep. Then, I heard the door open and heard footsteps, but this is when it got weird. It sounded like men's footsteps, and then it just stopped. I was very confused, but played it off as our neighbors. I lived in a townhouse, so it made sense in my nine-year-old head. Finally, at around 2 a.m., I heard a woman's footsteps and saw a woman on the top of the stairs. She was wearing a pencil skirt, and it looked identical to my mom. My mom's favorite type of skirt is a pencil skirt, so naturally, I thought that woman was her. I wanted to go up to her and hug her, but I had a feeling that she was exhausted, so I let her walk into the bedroom. However, about an hour later, I heard the door downstairs open, and I went downstairs and turned on the light. There was my mom. She asked me what I was doing up, and I lied to her, saying that I was waiting for her. I still think about this from time to time. Inside, I was panicking. Who or what was that lady, and why did she look like my mom? Did I miss her so much that I started hallucinating? I'm so grateful that I decided to stay in my bed and not go up to her. I still wonder what I would have seen if I had gone up to that lady. There was a famous restaurant in our neighborhood. It was a restaurant that had amazingly delicious back ribs, and the taste was unrivaled. I was addicted to the taste and visited the restaurant every single day. Then one day, the owner of the restaurant said to me, Our precious regular customer has arrived, and we should offer some precious meat. A premium quality meat, which is really hard to obtain, came in today. It's so delicious that nothing compares to it. The owner patted my back while talking. I was a bit offended, but I just didn't make a great deal of it, because I thought I became close to him. I said I wanted to try it, so he led me inside, and there was another restaurant inside. There were several people who looked like VIPs sitting at the table. After a while, the food came out, and it was a small amount of about four pieces of back ribs. Then people immediately picked it up without saying anything, and ate like crazy. They even licked the bones like a dog that had been starved for several days. And they had a conversation I couldn't understand. There's a kid I want to eat these days, but how can I catch him? If I catch him, will you cook him at a low price? We could, but we'd have to hire a professional hunter to keep him out of trouble. Then one of them looked at me and said, Would you like to donate some bones? I was bewildered and said, What? They suddenly took off their shirts and showed their backs. They were dense in their flesh, as if several back ribs were missing. I screamed in surprise, and they chuckled as they said, Since you ate one today, you should donate one. Isn't this a world where we help one another? <laughs> they were staring at me with creepy eyes, which gave me a bizarre vibe. I was seized with fear and left in a hurry, just saying that I've enjoyed my meal. The owner of the restaurant continued to suggest that I sign up for the VIP membership, but I refused. I didn't go to that restaurant for several days, but one day, the taste of the back ribs occurred to me, and I couldn't stand it, so I had to go there. I was eating at the restaurant, but I felt something strange, so I turned around, and behind my back, the restaurant owner was holding a knife to my back. When I asked with fright what he was doing, he said with drowsy eyes, Give me just one. I left the restaurant with goosebumps, and I didn't go to the restaurant since then. Then one day, I saw that the restaurant was closed when I was passing by. So I asked the owner of the store next door if something had happened, and he said, Someone brought a knife to the store a while ago and created a disturbance, and three diners were rushed to the emergency room. But what was creepy was that everyone was stabbed like crazy, only in the back. The culprit was arrested, but reportedly shouted till the end that he had asked everyone for their consent to stab them. 
I'm 16 years old, and I grew up in an orphanage since I was young. I've lived alone in this world, without a family, when one day I met a guy named Brian at church. He was very kind. He was in his early 20s and lived in a small house, and I got to live with him in his house. However, one day, I started to experience terrible things in that house. One day, he came back home, covered with dirt and sweat, and said, Today I got one done in a while. Let's go eat something delicious. I thought he had come back after harsh labor, but when he opened his large bag, it was full of bloody knives, all kinds of tools, and wads of cash. When I saw his face looking at me proudly, I got goosebumps. When I asked where he got so much money, he replied, I risked my life to work. It's hard to make money. Then he took off his shirt and there were bruises all over his body. I couldn't understand what he was doing. He didn't tell me the details. However, he took me to the department store the next day and bought me all kinds of luxury goods and we ate at a top-notch restaurant. I was bewildered by everything, but secretly, I enjoyed it. Then one day, Brian called me and asked me to come and pick him up. So I drove to the address he gave me, and when I arrived, there was an abandoned building, and a man was tied up inside. Brian was cutting the man's finger there, and when I arrived, he said with an innocent expression, Isaac, in life, sometimes there are people you absolutely have to kill. In that case, you must cut their fingers and head off. That way, they won't be identified. Then he started slicing the man's neck with a saw. I heard the man scream and suddenly my ears got clogged. My whole body trembled as I watched the whole scene, but I held on tight trying not to be noticed by him. The guy who was so kind to me was a devil. I couldn't understand and I realized that the money he had been spending on me was the money earned by doing this. I was in great shock. I wondered whether I should report it to the police, but I was afraid that without him, I would be left alone in this world again. Then one day, I was asleep at dawn, but I heard something hit the floor with a thud. I woke up and went to Brian's room. There were three men wearing sunglasses. They looked at me, put their fingers to their mouths, and said, Shh. And then I saw it. What fell to the floor was Brian's head. I couldn't even scream. I felt paralyzed by fear from head to toe, and I couldn't breathe. There was vinyl spread on the floor, and as they put Brian's body in a bag, they said, Good boy, I won't kill you if you keep your mouth shut, but if you tell others what you saw today, your head will be blown off. We are experts in this kind of work, so it only takes three minutes to get done with one person. You know what I mean? When I asked them why they killed Brian, they replied, I received a request saying that if I got done with this guy, they would give me $100,000. This job cannot last long anyway. He's been used and abandoned. They also took away the cash Brian had saved, so I was left alone in the world again. Since then, I tried to live on my own, but it wasn't easy. And suddenly, I remembered what Brian had said to me. He always had said to me, this world is a jungle. If you're not careful, you'll become someone's prey. I'd rather be a hunter. But in this world, I was like a very weak deer. I couldn't just sit there. So after reporting the people who killed Brian to the police, I ran off to another city. Later on, the police contacted me, and I was informed that the killers had been arrested. But even after that, I had to live in fear that someone might come and kill me. Fortunately, I've been doing well so far, but there still would be someone in this world murdering for money. This true story takes place back in 2015. It was a cold, chilling winter night as usual. I'm a young mom with two girls under the age of 10. So naturally, I was busy making dinner for them at home. My kids were upstairs playing and my husband at the time had left for work early in the morning and wouldn't be back until midnight. So it was a regular day. It was around 7 p.m. and as I was preparing dinner, suddenly the doorbell rang. I was all alone on the first floor of our house. The kitchen is across the hallway from the door, and as I turned to look at it, I saw the figure of a skinny, frail man wearing baggy clothes standing outside our door. Although it could have been a neighbor or delivery man, I knew by the shape of that figure that it couldn't possibly be anyone I was familiar with. I wasn't expecting a package either. 
The chills ran up my body as I wondered who could possibly be at my house during this time. I slowly walked to the door and tried looking out the window to see who it was. However, the window on our door was very thick and had a pattern on it, so it was impossible to determine who it could be. I walked back to the light switch a few feet from the door and turned on my hallway light, then the porch light. Rapidly, he dropped to the floor and I stood there paralyzed by fear. Now that the lights were on, I could see more clearly. The man had dropped to the floor and started hiding underneath the bench that we had on our porch. What was he trying to do? What should I do? I thought. That's when I noticed that there was not only a man at our door hiding, but there was also a getaway car in our driveway. We have a close bond with all of our neighbors, and the people in the neighborhood know each other really well. So my first instinct was to call my neighbor who lives across the street. I called and asked him to see if there was anything suspicious going on outside my door. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to gather any information from it. So I took it into my own hands and called the local police station to see if they could drive by and check the area. For 20 minutes, I stood in the hallway, anxiously waiting. Then, I heard movement at the front door. The car that was in my driveway had pulled out and drove to another house on my street. The man had made a run for it and dashed to the other house as well. I wasn't sure what to think after that, and I don't really know what happened. I saw the police drive by and everything was normal. All I know is that the house that the man had run to was well known for selling drugs. I assume to this day that the man had just gotten the wrong house, but I still can't shake off that scary experience. Why was he hiding in the first place? To this day, I still wonder what could have happened if I opened that door. I was a little younger than what I am today. To be exact, I'm 37 years old now. So I was around 18 at the time. To this day, I'm freaked out by it and have recurring nightmares about it. And I still feel like my life is on the line even though nobody believes it. So this is why you should never trust what you see. I took a pet sitting job over the summer from an elderly couple. They looked around 80 years old, so I didn't think it would be sketchy or bad in any way. It was watching a cat while they left for a three-day vacation. All they said was to feed the cat every seven to nine hours. It was easy money. So fast forward to the day. I go to their house. I gather all my stuff out of my car, like flashlights so I can read. Their house is kind of dark and they don't want the lights on. And some extra clothes. Once I walked in there, there was this musty smell. This was the first weird thing that happened. It was strange because their house looked clean and tidy, but it was so faint I brushed it off. They soon showed me around the house. It was a decently sized house with four bedrooms and three bathrooms. It had carpet as floors and the decorations were quite modern despite the owner's age. The old woman took me aside and showed me where I'd be sleeping. It was a nice room, but the musty smell was slightly worse in this room, and the carpet looked lighter than the rest of the carpet around the house. But yet again, I brushed it off, like an idiot. And one of the more important parts of this story they told me was that they had a son, and he lived in this house too, and his room was in the basement. They told me that he never came out of his room, and they told me that his room was off limits because he was sensitive. Anyway, 30 minutes later they leave, and this kid and I are here alone. It goes smoothly for a long time, I'd say two hours until something happens. Now, I know the rule of three red flags and then you're out. But again, I was a stupid teenager desperate for money, so I overlooked things until it was too late. I was watching TV on the bottom floor when I heard a loud slam from the basement. Now, usually I'd be scared, but I know that her son was down there, so I looked past it even though it was extremely off-putting. Well, fast forward a couple minutes later, and I hear the basement door slam open. I'm confused by this, because if he supposedly lives here, why would he feel the need to slam the door? Again, I let it go because I don't know him, so I don't have the right to judge him. But because I was a very stupid teenager, I decided I would go check on him regardless of what the old lady said. So, I get up, trying not to make too much noise, and I walk to the basement door. And lo and behold, the door was wide open and the stairs leading down were completely blacked out from the absence of light. No windows, no light anywhere. 
So at that moment, I assumed that he had come up from the basement to get a snack, so I headed to the kitchen. But before I tell more, I didn't hear him going into the kitchen, I just assumed he did. I turned the corner and I saw him standing there. He had dark brown hair with brown eyes, he looked to be African American in his early 20s, and was quite handsome, so my judgment was down quite a bit. I took a light step into the kitchen and he flipped his head around and looked at me. Nothing was too weird about this because he looked normal other than the fact that he didn't talk or make any sound on the matter, but what did confuse me was that his hands had two things, a long rope and a kitchen knife, and right after he looked at me, he whispered, basement. I'll admit, it didn't strike me as suspicious because this was a smallish town and the year was 1990, so there weren't many defining factors to know about bad people, like stalkers or killers. And because the old people didn't strike me as the type to harbor a wanted criminal, all I did was walk away. So unlike that phrase, curiosity killed the cat, in this case, curiosity saved the cat. As I was walking past the basement, I remembered what he said, and something finally lit up inside me, telling me something was off. And it all had something to do with this basement. So I got my flashlight I thankfully brought with me and walked down the stairs. It wasn't a very big basement, it had one couch in the corner and a coffee table, and then the bedroom right next to it. But the defining factor was that the smell was overwhelmingly bad. It smelled like rotten eggs mixed with that musky scent throughout the house. But I bared through it because I was far too curious on what it could be. That I forgot what it couldn't be. Good. I opened the door to find a guy laying on the ground with a pool of blood surrounding him. He was wrapped head to toe in rope, and the kitchen knife was stabbed into the wall. I was horrified, and my eyes teared up from the strong fumes. There were bugs and maggots everywhere, but then I recognized something that will haunt me forever. The person I saw was the same person I had seen in the kitchen. Same shirt, same pants, same everything. I was so horrified that I stood there in a daze until a maggot jumped on me and broke me out of it. But let me tell you, I never ran out of a house faster in my life. I lived too far away to run to, so I knocked on the farthest house I could before passing out from exhaustion and told them what happened. Apparently, the elderly couple killed three people in the bedroom I was staying in. And that's why the carpet was lighter. They bleached the entire room. The musty smell wasn't as bad in there because they killed them hours before I got there and stuffed them in the closet. Their first victim was their son, who they tied up and killed five days before anything else happened. I can't explain what happened in that house, but I'm thankful that I went down there when I did. I also don't know what happened to the elderly couple, but I hope they got what they deserved. This incident happened about 10 years ago. Back then, I got robbed of money every day by bullies in my neighborhood. They always gathered around in the alley and took money from passerbys. But I had to run into them all the time because the alley was on the way to my house. Then one day, I couldn't take it anymore and said I couldn't give them money and they beat me up. I came home crying and I couldn't stand the outbursts of anger and pain. I finally made up my mind to take revenge. However, it wasn't like this from the beginning. All of this was just because of a flyer I ran into on the street. There was a sentence written on it. We take revenge for you with black magic. I called them out of curiosity and asked what this is. And they said that they offer services of punishing someone who you want to punish on behalf of you. Eventually, I went there out of curiosity and with a bit of doubt. When I arrived and opened the door, there were many large skeleton models standing there and suddenly, the skeletons turned their heads towards me and ran up to me, creaking. I fell on my back as I was startled, but when I regained consciousness, the skeletons were not moving, but remaining still. It was as if I saw an illusion for a moment, but it really felt like it was moving. The man sitting inside said, What you see and what you don't see, both are true. What you just saw is real. I realized that he had a spell. I ran up to him and said, there is someone I want to punish. How can I do that? Then he handed me a menu, 
saying that he wouldn't take the blame no matter what happens. I said it's okay. The paper he handed me had numerous monsters to choose from. Starting with low-class demons, there were dozens of different types of monsters of the underworld drawn on it, including a three-headed dog and a five-headed snake monster. Also, the cost of summoning each monster varied as well. Lastly, there even was a death god. The cost of summoning the death god was incredibly high. I asked in a trembling voice, Can you even summon the death god? He said, It is possible, but of course it is up to him whether or not the death god will take him to the afterlife. I pondered long and hard, and then he said, If you couldn't decide, experience it yourself. I'll call them here, so take a look and decide. I chose a demon that looks like a gargoyle. Then he uttered an incantation, and after a while, the room suddenly became completely dark. Then I heard a deafening voice of a monster, and in front of my eyes stood a gigantic gargoyle-like demon. It grabbed my neck and lifted me into the air, laughing. I said, groaning in pain, <sighs> How? Then the black magician said, smiling, I told you, it's all real. After a while, the gargoyle disappeared like smoke, and I fell to the floor. I signed a contract with him right away, and he said he would summon the demon when I want to. A few days later, I saw the gangsters gathered around in the alley again, and I secretly hid behind them and called the black magician. He chanted a spell, and after a while, the alley became very dark. Then the bullies started screaming. Looking closely, the gargoyle had grabbed them by the neck and was throwing them frantically to the ground. As they tried to escape, crawling away in panic, they were trampled by the gargoyle and their bodies were crushed. Screams and moans begging for help filled the alley. It was hard to believe what I was seeing. Moments later, people passing by called the police after hearing them scream. And when the police arrived, all of the bullies were sprawled out on the floor, gasping for breath. The police speculated that they had fought with each other. The bullies said that they were attacked by a monster, but the police didn't believe them. They were all taken by ambulance. And after that, I heard that all those bullies had broken bones and ruptured organs, so they underwent surgery. They were also receiving psychiatric treatment because they kept claiming that they saw monsters. They didn't show up in the alley anymore after that, and I didn't run into them anymore. I was really surprised that the black magic had been a success. And on the other hand, it was secretly delightful. But what's even more exciting is that no one knows I did that. One day my friend Justin showed me his cell phone and said, Aiden, look at this. This is a new mobile game application called Zombie Hunting, and it's something like Pokemon Go. When you turn on the camera, you can see zombies, and you can hunt them with weapons designated for each zombie. Wow, that's so cool. As Justin turned his cell phone camera toward the wall, two zombies that were wandering around appeared. One of the zombies then turned his head toward our direction and flung himself at us. When Justin quickly chose an axe as a weapon and struck the zombie's head, the zombie collapsed and a message popped up, notifying a successful hunt. A gun for the next one! As Justin touched the weapon storage, Various weapons, including pistols, machine guns, knives, hammers, and more appeared, and Justin changed his weapon to a pistol and shot it wildly at the zombie. The zombie died on the spot, splashing blood, and cheerful music played as a message popped up, notifying a successful hunt. Wow, is the game over since both of them are dead? No, this game doesn't end. If you look at the map here, it shows you the place where lots of zombies are gathered, and if you go there in person, you'll be able to find them. I want to try too. Search zombie hunting in the app store. It's free and it's really fun. I downloaded it right away and lost myself in the game from that day on. The zombie game with its high quality graphics and sound quickly became very popular. It seemed even funny how people were stampeding with their phones looking for spots where zombies were gathered. However, as the number of players increased, the number of zombies went down rapidly, and everyone became eager to find zombies that had now become so rare. One day, a pop-up appeared on the main screen of the zombie game. Recruiting participants for the zombie hunting festival. What is this? Reading into the content, I found that it was about inviting 50 participants to a spot where 2,000 zombies were released. 
It was said to take place in a mysterious place, and they even provided a bus to take people there. I was so curious and eager to go to the festival. Participants were selected through a lottery if they applied with their name, address, a photo of their face, and which weapon they would like to use if they were to participate in the festival. I took a picture of myself right away, wrote down the information, and sent it. At that moment, I got a call from Justin. Aiden, did you see that they were recruiting participants for the zombie hunting festival? Yeah, I just signed up. Me too. I hope we both get to go. One week later, Justin and I heard the miraculous news that we had both been invited. And in a few days, we would receive our invitations and a nice bulletproof vest with zombie hunting written on it. When I opened the invitation, it said, Welcome to the Zombie Hunting Festival. All participants must wear the bulletproof vest uniforms included in order to participate. And I was more than delighted feeling like a special agent hunting zombies. A few days later, the day had finally arrived, and Justin and I arrived at the designated place wearing our bulletproof vests and with our hearts racing with excitement. Soon after, a large black bus with Zombie Hunting Festival written in red letters on the windshield stopped in front of us. The bus door opened, and a short-haired woman came out and gestured for us to ride the bus. As we hurried onto the bus, we found it already full of people, all wearing vests. The bus departed and we traveled for a long time to finally reach a remote forest. It was a wide field surrounded by lush forests. When I looked around the surroundings with my camera, a huge number of zombies were roaming in the field, and participants murmured, unable to hide their excitement. Now, shall we get off the bus and start the game after hearing a brief explanation? The short-haired woman led people when we arrived at the destination. As people who had gotten off the bus gathered around her in a circle, she began explaining the game. Welcome to the Zombie Hunting Festival. Would you all open the application? When we all took our phones out and opened the application, a pop-up appeared with the phrase, VIP Human Zombie Hunting. You are now the zombie, written on it. What does this mean? The crowd buzzed. The woman then said, Do you remember that you wrote down a weapon of your choice when you signed up? The weapon that you choose will now be a designated weapon to kill you. Here, you are the zombies. What are you talking about, bitch? One of the participants cursed at her. But she continued her talk regardless. The bulletproof vests that you are wearing are designed to explode the moment you take it off. The vests are equipped with a GPS function, so the gamers are able to check your locations with their smartphones in real time. If you take off your vest to escape the chase, boom, you will be shattered in pieces. And unfortunately, this vest does not have a bulletproof function. Bullshit! You're not really gonna kill us, right? Despite his question, the woman continued talking. High tension currents are flowing through the seven meter high fences surrounding this place. So the moment you try and climb it, you will be killed by an electric shock. You may not take off your vests, climb up the fences, and the only way you can survive here is to dodge the attacks of gamers. I know it's a difficult situation, but I hope you can survive. Good luck! The woman stepped on the bus as she finished talking, and it quickly vanished from our sight. At that moment, a sudden loud noise of a gun was heard, and a man fell down. The people simultaneously looked at him, only to see that his face had disappeared, because his head had burst. Headshot, said a man with a shotgun, smiling, standing in the middle of armed people in white masks walking in this direction. People who had seen the grotesque scene all began to scatter and run away at full speed, and Justin and I ran into the bushes together. Some time had passed since we began running, when the sound of guns finally came to a halt, and we hid behind a large rock. Justin said in a tearful voice, What's going on? I don't know. Then Justin found a piece of paper on the ground. It was a catalog with game instructions written on it, and what was written on it was just horrifying. VIP Human Zombie Hunting Festival Total prize money of $6 million. Open the application and scan the zombie's face with the camera. 
You can only earn points by killing them with a designated weapon. We will be in charge of cleaning up the mess, so don't worry and kill as much as you want. Justin, after looking at the catalog, said, VIP human zombie hunting? I've seen this game. It was made by the same company, but this one was a paid game. I thought it was a scam because the subscription fee was $20,000. No way! Have we become zombies in this game? I felt chills running down my body as I listened to Justin. I think so. I guess they lured us all the way here by introducing it as a festival to use us as zombies. Justin replied in a trembling voice. Let's call the police! I urgently took out my phone only to find that everything else had gone dead except the zombie game app. My cell phone must be broken. Try yours. However, Justin's phone was also frozen in the same way. Both of our cell phones are dead? What's wrong with them? Maybe they planted viruses in the application. It doesn't make sense that they're both broken. Then Justin flopped and said, Aiden, which weapon did you choose? An axe. What about you? A machine gun. Then, all of a sudden, two white-masked men appeared as they scampered through the bush, and Justin and I lowered our bodies and hid behind the rock. Turn on the map. We have two here. They went up to the rock where we were hiding and shoved their phones in our faces as soon as they found us. As Justin's face was recognized, information about him floated over his head. Wow, a machine gun for him. They simultaneously took out the machine guns that they were carrying on their shoulders and began shooting at Justin. In an instant, Justin fell down, riddled with bullets. When Justin died, they shoved their phones at me. What? An axe for him? Uh, did you bring the axe? My name is Kale, and this is based on my real life experience. I work as a businessman in Morocco and got sent on a business trip to Nigeria on the 26th of January, 2022. I wasn't really interested in traveling again, but I had to, so I packed my bags and made my way to the airport. I landed safely in Nigeria and got escorted to a luxurious hotel room, where I was informed about how safe the hotel was and how I had nothing to worry about. Being uninterested in their banter, all that was on my mind was, get done with the business deal and leave. The next day, I woke up and made my way to the company to get done with the meeting and sign the contract. The whole day went slow as hell, but I was glad that it was finally over. Making my way to my room, which was on the ground floor, I swiped my card onto the lock and walked in, locking the door behind me. I decided to freshen up as I had already had my dinner before making my way back to the room. As soon as I was done, I packed my stuff for my departure the next day and headed straight to bed by 11 p.m. The clock struck 3 a.m. on the 28th of January. At that hour, I woke up and decided to use the restroom. When I was done, I made my way to the dispenser to get myself some water to drink. As I was about to take a sip, my eyes made contact with the window. The curtain slightly pushed aside. I could see a girl in a gown, around the age of six, standing next to the tree, not too far from my window. She just stood there, staring at me. I sighed and looked at the time, which read 3.10 a.m. I shouted out to her saying, Hey kid, it's dangerous to be out there alone. Return back to your room. I turned around unbothered, but the atmosphere didn't feel right. I turned to look out the window again, but this time, it was no longer the girl, but a little boy, who stood there, staring right back at me. What the? I cursed as I shouted again, while gripping the window pane. It's too late to be out on pranks, kids. Get back to your rooms. In anger, I turned around to leave, but then I remembered I left the window open, and when I turned to close it, my eyes widened as I released a gasp. The hairs on my skin rose at what I saw. This time, it was a dog. It didn't feel normal to me. All it did was stand in the same spot while staring right into my room. In fear, I slammed the window shut, locked it, and ran back to my bed, covering myself with my blanket, shaking with fear. I tried controlling my breath, but I passed out from fear. I woke up at 8 a.m. in the morning and got dressed as my flight is to take off by 10.30 a.m. As I walked towards the door, I noticed something, which made me remember everything. 
it all turned out to be a dream. But one thing I couldn't get over was that the door was unlocked and slightly ajar. My heart raced in fear. I checked all my belongings and noticed that nothing was missing. I remember locking my door before heading to bed. But what happened? The security checked all the CCTV cameras, but found nothing. At this point, I wasn't interested in staying at the hotel any longer. I thanked the receptionist, and I left for my flight. I arrived in Morocco safely, and not a day passes that I do not think about what happened in Nigeria. What exactly happened at the luxurious hotel in Abuja? Hi. To start off, I'm a pretty short girl with brown hair, and my roommate is pretty tall with blonde hair. This story happened a year ago. I had just moved to Canada for my film studies and had found a student residence where I had met my now best friend, that I'll call Christina for the story, and two other roommates. Christina and I really liked going out when we were bored or tired of staying in. So most of the time, we'd go out at night since that was when we were mostly bored. One night, around 3 a.m., we decided to go out for a walk downtown and decided to go to Chinatown. The streets were pretty empty, apart from a couple people that were mostly going home after a long shift. The streets were glowing with all the lanterns and a couple shops that were closing at the time. At the time, I had a pack of cigarettes in my bag since I had a movie where I needed cigarettes as props. As we were walking down the street, we noticed a weird man, bald in his late 30s, standing ahead of us, right at the end of a dark alley. He approached us and asked us if we by chance had a lighter. I told him we didn't, but it did bring back to mind that pack of cigarettes that I had. So I offered him the pack since I'm not a smoker and wasn't going to use them anyway. He smiled and thanked us as we started to make our way down the road. After a couple minutes, I felt uneasy and peeked behind me to see the man staring at us from afar, but brushed it off. After a while, Christina tapped me on the shoulder, telling me to look behind me in a subtle way. I turned around to see the same man, 20 feet away from us, walking slowly in the same direction. Christina and I noticed a bubble tea store ahead that was still open, but was about to close. The bubble tea store had a big glass window where you could see the streets. We went in to get a drink, and while waiting, the weird encounter wasn't on our mind anymore. Ten minutes later, I was looking out the window when the man suddenly walked in front of the window and stopped, staring right at us. He placed both hands against the window looking at us with wide eyes. He then decides to come in and looks at the cashier and asks her, So what is this? The cashier said, It's a bubble tea store, but we're closed now. He stood there staring at her without saying anything. The cashier said, We're not taking any orders, we're closed. Me, Christina, and the cashier all looked at each other, sensing something was off. He then turns to me and says, See you momentarily, with the creepiest smile I've ever seen before heading out. We all stood there, frozen, not knowing what to do, so we decided to wait it out a bit. Five minutes later, we saw him peeking through the window, waiting to see when we were going to go out and hit back to the side. Christina and I decided to go to the cashier and ask her if she had a back door we could leave from. She said yes and led us to the back door that led to a dark alley. Our only way home was through the front street where the man was. We started making our way through very slowly until we made it to the same road, but a little further than where the bubble tea store was. Once there, we ran as fast as we could to the nearest place we could hide. I peeked over my shoulder to see him sprinting towards us. After a while of running, we lost him at a karaoke bar that was still open, where we decided to stay a couple hours before heading home to make sure he wouldn't be there anymore. But it kept me thinking, what would have happened if we would have left through the front door? Hello, my name is Rose. I have an older brother named Adam who is also my best friend. We have both parents. Our father loves us a lot, but our mother hates Adam because of an unknown reason. Everything was great until a horrible situation happened. So I woke up one day and saw my father crying and my mother who tried to comfort him. I was little at that time, so I didn't really know what was going on. So I asked my parents if there was something wrong. My father started mumbling, your, your brother, he, oh God. 
he, he went missing. My father started to cry even more. I was in shock. I can't believe that my only brother, my only friend, disappeared. But how? Nobody knew. And the police, after investigating for a couple weeks, closed the case. We were all sad and couldn't even imagine something like this happening to our family. But one night, I was laying in my bed, half awake. Then I heard a weird noise in my room. It was dark, so I couldn't see anything. But it sounded like somebody was running. I was frozen. When the thing who was running stood in front of me, I was in pure shock. It was... Adam? How is it possible? Adam just started giggling and said, Pranked ya. I couldn't believe what just happened. I even said, It wasn't funny. We were all worried about you. Adam still laughed. After a couple minutes, Adam stopped laughing and he said, Let's go play in our parents' room. I didn't understand what was wrong with him. First he came out of nowhere and started laughing when I said we were worried about him and now he wants to play in our parents' room? But I did miss him a lot, so I agreed, and maybe I could have told my parents about the situation. When we ran into our parents' room and jumped on their bed and started yelling, Look, Daddy, Mommy, Adam is back. I even pointed at him. My father was confused. He said he saw nobody there. I started to cry and tried to tell him that Adam was there. But father just thought I missed him a lot, so I even started imagining him, so he hugged me and told me some sweet words. But my mother could see Adam. And she was very scared. Adam didn't look normal at all now. He had a huge black grin on his face and red eyes with big black pupils. And he was sitting at the exact spot and exact time my mother killed him. One day, my friend Ricky asked me to go to a zoo no one knows about. He said that it is a secret underground zoo where only a limited number of people could enter through personal connections. The entrance fee was exorbitantly expensive, almost a thousand dollars, but since Ricky came from a rich family, he offered to pay for my admission. I was very excited and went to the zoo with him. When I went to the entrance, many people were there, and the staff started guiding us. Welcome to the Human Zoo. Our zoo has combined human and animal genes to create the most beautiful creatures. Aren't you really excited? But you must write a confidential oath that you'll never reveal anything you saw here today. And whoever reveals the secret will become prey to the beasts here. <laughs> there were murmurs from the crowd, but everyone signed the oath and got on the elevator. The elevator went all the way down to the 10th basement floor, and when the door opened, a large glass wall stretched out ahead and there were living creatures inside. The first thing I saw was a human figure, seven feet tall, covered entirely in crocodile skin. Its torso was very long, and it stood on short limbs. The creature squealed as it stared at us with its yellow reptile eyes. Its opened mouth was full of crocodile teeth. Walking further inside, a huge eagle-like creature was crouching inside the glass, and when it spread its black wings that was covering its whole body, a human-like face emerged. Standing on human feet, its wingspan seemed to be nearly eight feet, and it flew into the air in a flash. The ceiling of the zoo, which was below ten floors underground, was very high, and the eagle flew here and there. Then the zookeeper threw food on the floor. It flew over and snatched it at once. Everyone cheered and clapped. It was an unbelievable sight. As I continued walking, I saw more and more shocking creatures. A creature with the head of a black panther and a lower body of a human. A creature with a snake head and a human body. A creature with a tiger face mixed with a human face, and so on. They pounced on the glass whenever we passed by. I was continuously shocked. In the meantime, someone took out a hidden camera and tried to take pictures of the creatures. Then, a security guard took the person's camera from behind, threw it away, and cursed at him. And after a while, a staff started guiding us. All right, finally, the main event of the day is coming soon. Don't miss the best spectacle on earth. After a while, the zookeepers appeared, dragging someone in the cage full of tiger men. That person was struggling for help, and the zookeepers just threw him into the cage. In an instant, the tiger men ran up to him and tore him into pieces with both hands. I screamed on the spot, and so did the other people. Then the staff said, 
Do not worry, that's not a real human, but a human clone created by genetic recombination. I couldn't breathe. To me, this wasn't a spectacle. It was just a crime committed by madmen. Then I saw a doctor surrounded by people in the distance. The doctor was making an impassioned speech about how he had succeeded in combining the genes. I got furious, but everyone was just watching with interest. Some of them asked, How much is that animal? I want to own it as a pet. Then the doctor presented an astronomical amount. There were about 50 species of creatures in the zoo, and there was also an aquarium. There were creatures like turtle men and stingray men in the aquarium. All of them were too bizarre for me. I came home and thought about it carefully. I eventually called the police. After a while, I heard a voice in front of my house. It's the police! Open the door! When I opened the front door, they were not the police, but employees of the zoo. They covered something on my head and put me in the car. When I regained consciousness, I was in a laboratory at the zoo, and the doctor was standing in front of me, scowling at me, and said, How dare you break your promise! I'll change your genetic structure and make you a beast. If I inject you DNA modification, your body will gradually grow hair. And you will grow fangs. And your nose will get longer. You'll gradually turn into a dog. <laughs> Another great piece will be created. I begged him for help, but he gave me anesthetic and I passed out. I was stuck in that lab for days. The doctor was still studying my DNA as well as that of dogs. But a few days later, government agents suddenly rushed in and arrested all the zoo staff and doctors. I was able to come home and explain to my family what had happened, but they didn't believe it. The zoo was closed, but surprisingly, the incident did not appear anywhere in the media or the news and was thoroughly hidden. And a few days later, men in black suits came to me and warned me not to disclose a thing about the zoo. Eventually, the zoo vanished in thin air, and no one knows where the creatures have gone or what happened to them. I live in an apartment, and one day I started to hear a man swearing every morning at 4 a.m. from upstairs. I endured it once or twice, but it was so annoying to hear it at the same time every day. I eventually went upstairs, and on the front door of the house there was a sign that read Exorcist. I knocked on the door. After a while, a man came out, but the instant he saw me, he frowned and said, What is a sane man not possessed by a ghost doing here? However, his pupils were very small, his eyes were mostly white, and cold air flowed from his house like a refrigerator. I was startled, but I tried to stay calm and said, I live downstairs. Why do you always lose your temper at four in the morning? It's so noisy that I can't sleep. He said, Four in the morning is when evil spirits run riot the most, so I exterminate them at that time. I have no choice. But the spirits I exercised are infesting this house. Get out quickly before they attach themselves to you. I glanced around his house, but it was dead quiet inside. However, before I opened the door, I had heard a lot of people talking inside. It was really strange. He pushed me and slammed the door. I felt unsettled and got goosebumps, but I just came back home. From that day on, I started to hear someone singing softly all day long. It was a faint sound at first, but the sound grew louder and closer to my ears, and I felt like I was going crazy. As a result, I went back to the exorcist and he looked at me, clicked his tongue, and said, As expected, you're possessed by a ghost. The ghost is singing a song of death in your ears. However, I couldn't believe him, so I just came back home. But after that, more creepy things started to happen. While I was sleeping, someone suddenly covered my nose with its hand. And I woke up from choking. But there was no one around, and my nose was stuffy for a while, and could not be cleared up. And one day I was driving, and suddenly a hand pressed my foot, and I couldn't take my foot off the accelerator. The car sped up like crazy, and I managed to get my foot off with all my strength and survive. And one time, when I woke up at dawn and went out to drink water, something flashed on the floor, and when I turned on the light, there was a kitchen knife under my feet. Since I live alone, nobody would have left a knife here. 
I thought something serious would happen if this keeps up, so I visited the exorcist again and knocked on the door. The exorcist looked at me and said, You're not dead yet. To survive, I finally asked him for an exorcism. I went to his house at 4 a.m. and the exorcist began to recite prayers. Then a voice whispered very quickly in my ear, Come with me to the afterlife. Let's live happily together forever in the world of the dead. Come with me. But what gave me more goosebumps was that when I heard that voice, I suddenly felt so good and found myself reply, Okay, let's go together. Then the exorcist swore at me with a very loud voice, and the voice in my ears slowly started to fade away. The exorcism continued all night, and the morning dawned before I knew it. The exorcist said that he had removed all the evil spirits and told me to go back and never come back again. I came back home and I still heard him swearing every morning upstairs, but I didn't dare to go there. Fortunately, nothing happened after that. However, sometimes I hear someone knocking on my front door, except that no one is standing outside. I had a friend named Craig, whom I was close to since childhood. After not seeing each other for a while, we coincidentally ran into each other on the street when we became adults. I greeted him warmly, but he seemed different. I noticed that he had shaved his curly hair and strangely kept hiding his right hand behind his back. I tried to shake hands with him, but he never revealed his right hand and instead extended his left hand. I asked him what was wrong with his hand and he said, I don't use my right hand normally. I didn't think much of it and let it pass. From that day on, we often met and spent time together, but he always kept his right hand in his pocket. I couldn't understand it, but I guessed that he had his reasons. Then, suddenly, I lost contact with Craig. I went to his house, but he had moved. It seemed like he had changed his phone number too. It was strange, but I thought he had just gone away. However, sometime later, the police came to visit me. They showed me a photo from a CCTV camera where I was seen talking to Craig. The police suspected Craig of kidnapping and killing a woman, and they were currently searching for him. Since only Craig's back was visible in the CCTV footage, they asked me for a photo of his face. I was shocked, but then I realized something. Craig always had a habit of looking around wherever he went and scanning the ceiling. Sometimes he would suddenly turn around showing me his back and not even looking at my face while talking. At that time, I couldn't understand all those actions, but now I realized that he was trying to avoid CCTV cameras. I also remembered that I had never taken a photo of Craig, and whenever I tried to take his picture, he would get angry and cover his face. In the end, I did my best to describe his facial features to the police. The police left and I was in shock. My friend was a criminal. But a few weeks later, I received another call from the police. They informed me that Craig had been arrested. And then, I heard the shocking truth. It turned out that Craig had cut off all the fingertips of his right hand to remove his fingerprints. He used only that hand to break into women's homes, commit crimes, and escape. That's why he always kept his hand hidden. It was then that I remembered, when I visited his house, I saw him training with a human-shaped punching bag using only one hand to strike and subdue it. I had just thought he enjoyed exercising. It was sort of a rehearsal for a crime. This happened only three weeks ago. I've thought about it often and I know without a doubt, me and my patient were almost prey to a predator. I work for my state. I work with people with substance abuse disorders, the mentally ill, and to a lesser degree, those with slight developmental delays. My role with the developmentally delayed is similar to a lower-ranked social worker. One thing I have to verify is that the participant is able to achieve their own personal goals set for that year, similar to an IEP in public schools. One of my patients has a goal to walk and or hike at least one mile three times a week. When I made my visit to her home, walking and hiking was what I needed to see her achieve. So she took us both on a walking and slight hiking trail nearby. 
Her and I are actually similar ages, ours being 40. As we were walking the trail, we get to a point that was much more isolated. We were no longer walking the trail that loops around a neighborhood pond with many people, but we were on a trail that took us through the woods in a cotton field. Her and I were walking and talking when she suddenly stopped walking. I looked at her and just as she went to say, I have a bad feeling. I had an overwhelming feeling myself that someone was watching us. Due to her development delays, I felt more concerned for her welfare than my own. It's hard to explain, but I didn't feel fear. I felt a feeling of protection for her. I looked behind us because I heard the sound of leaves crunching and sure enough, a guy who looked to be in his thirties is suddenly coming out of the woods and is slowly creeping up towards us. There was no one else around, so for this guy to magically come out of the woods and creeping up, I knew whatever he wanted was nefarious. I told her to continue walking and gave her a head start. I don't know why I even did this, but I just completely turned myself around, stopped and I looked straight at him. I just stared. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. But as soon as we locked eyes, it was as if he realized, now they know I'm back here. Because he froze and stopped walking towards us. I kept staring at him and then I started to walk back towards my patients so he understood my eyes were on him. Then as I walked backwards, I looked over to see my patient, looked back at him, and he disappeared as fast as he came back into the woods. If he had simply wanted to walk the nature trail, why did he stop as soon as I turned around and stared at him? Why didn't he just continue walking and pass us? It was evident to me that this guy was waiting and watching for a woman or women to come down the isolated trail. The fact that he emerged from the woods when he did made it clear that he had been hiding and stalking. I will forever be convinced that my patient's bad feeling and my own feeling of being watched saved one or both of us from whatever that man had planned. This is a creepy story of what I experienced while camping with a friend of mine five years ago. We went to a deep valley almost unknown, and we drove for more than ten hours and walked for another five hours to get there. Then a majestic scenery of nature unfolded in front of us, and clear water, mountains, and fresh air surrounded us. This must be the paradise of gods. Brad and I started fishing, but after a while I heard a strange sound. At first I thought it was a bug or a bird. The more I listened, the more it sounded like a person's voice. I told Brad, Do you think someone else came here? Brad replied, Bro, how many times have I told you? This is a place I only know. I looked around and, to my surprise, found a man in the grass staring at us. Wearing something very shabby, like leather, he was looking at us with a blank stare. It seemed that he was holding something like raw meat of some animal in his hand. I was startled and shouted asking who he is, but he didn't say anything, and continued making strange insect-like noises. We got goosebumps, turned on our cell phones, and got ready to call the police. Then he disappeared into the forest. Anxious, we wondered whether we should stop camping. But we couldn't go home since we barely got here. As time passed, we forgot about it, grilled meat, had fun, and fell asleep. But that night, when I woke up to the sound of high-pitched screaming, I realized that Brad was howling. I hurried to his tent. The man I saw during the day and several other people were grabbing Brad's arms and legs pulling him frantically. It was as if they were trying to tear Brad's limbs apart and they pulled with all their might in unison. I heard the sound of bones and cartilage being torn. My whole body was shaking and I picked up my cell phone and dialed 911, but my voice did not come out. I gasped and barely spoke and the police were dispatched but it seems like they would take a long time for them to arrive. I knew it was my turn after Brad, so I escaped into the woods like crazy. Then Brad's screaming came to a halt, and I could tell he was dead. I cried as I ran frantically, 
I was barefoot, so my feet were torn and blood was pouring out. After a while, sirens were heard and the police arrived. But terribly, Brad's upper body was only left in his tent. His arms and legs were all torn off. Everyone was shocked by the terrible scene and started investigating. A few days later, I heard from the police that the culprits had been caught. They were a family that lived in the mountains, and it turned out that they had been grazing grass and eating animals in the mountains, completely distant from civilization. They lived in valleys and cliffs, so their grip became unusually strong. It turned out that the four of them had ripped off Brad's limbs with their bare hands. Their linguistic ability was almost degraded, so they couldn't communicate well. But when the cops asked them where Brad's limbs are, using body language, they pointed to their own stomachs and made gestures as if they had eaten them. And they pointed at the officer's limbs and gestured like they want to eat them. They ended up in prison, but reportedly they were completely isolated because they could harm other prisoners there. One day, I started to have very vivid dreams and became able to do anything I want in them. At first, in my dreams, I flew around in the air or explored various places. But at some point, I embarked on more and more provocative things. I enjoyed beating passers-by and robbing shops, the things I couldn't do in real life. Then the police arrived and tried to suppress me, and since I was invincible in my dreams, I was able to defeat them all. Then one day, when I was on my way home from work, a person who looked somewhat familiar was staring at me from afar. I looked closely to see if he was someone I knew, and I was shocked. He was the police officer who tried to arrest me in my dreams. His looks were so peculiar that I could remember him. His eyes were abnormally big. His chin was very long and pointy, and his skin was awfully red. Why is he here? For a moment, I thought it was a dream, but it was clearly reality. He approached me with a blank expression, grabbed me by the collar, and lifted me up. I was so startled by his tremendous power, and I screamed at him. What are you doing? The people around us stopped me, and I hurriedly left. The man was staring at me expressionless until I was out of his sight. From that night... I no longer played around in my dreams because I was so horrified. I continued to live peacefully for a while, but as time passed, I started to make a fuss again to relieve stress. I broke into any random house in my dream and made a mess. But a few days later, when I was going to work, a man grabbed my shoulder, and when I looked around, I realized he was again the police officer in my dream. I was startled. Then he started choking me. I was perplexed and shouted, Why are you doing this? And he replied, looking at me, Don't disrupt our world's order. I was gasping as I couldn't breathe, and people around us pulled us apart, and I ran away like crazy. Since then, the man appeared in my dreams every night, so I no longer played around in my dreams. I mean... I couldn't. As I stopped committing bad things in my dreams, I no longer ran into that man in real life. I thought it was a good thing, but my doubt still remains unsettled. Who was he? Was he really the man I saw in my dreams? Then does he know everything about what I did in my dream? My name's Amanda and I live alone with my two-year-old daughter. I always felt uneasy at our old apartment. One day the drains were clogged so I called maintenance to come and fix it in the morning around 10 a.m. They had a key to access any apartment so I made sure to set an alarm for 9 a.m. just to make sure I was up before anyone showed up. That night was a regular night. I put my daughter to sleep and I locked all the doors and windows. Since it's just us, I was always paranoid despite living on the fifth floor. Morning eventually comes and I open my eyes and see my daughter still asleep in her bed, but I couldn't move. Just then I noticed everything got quiet and I saw some kind of figure peeking its head around the corner of my open door. I 
I couldn't make out any features on it. I think my brain tried to make it look like someone I knew. It didn't feel right to me, but oddly enough, I wasn't scared either. Then the words, someone's at the door, popped in my head. I was so confused. How would I know that and I couldn't even move? But over and over I kept hearing, someone's at the door, while the figure was just there. After maybe 30 seconds, I could hear my door being unlocked and someone saying, hello? My door had three locks, two deadbolt locks and a chain lock that prevented the door from opening even if you had a key. As soon as I realized what was going on, I woke up. I just laid in bed halfway afraid and trying to figure out what just happened. But surely enough, my daughter was still asleep. I looked at my phone and it was 7 a.m. I looked at the door, but no one was there. I inspected the house, but no one was there. When I went to check the door, I saw one of my deadbolt locks was open. But I know I locked it last night. I just stood there in disbelief. I was so grateful for the chain lock and then I thought, did that mysterious figure try to warn me? Was it trying to get my attention? Maintenance came later and I asked them, did someone come by earlier and they said yes. Apparently someone canceled a call and they moved my appointment up without telling me. When they realized they couldn't get in, they just left and came back at 10. Nothing like that ever happened to me again and a month later I moved out of that apartment complex. I still don't know what I experienced or why that figure came to warn me but I'm grateful that it did and me and my daughter are safe. I'm 18 years old and this happened to me when I was 10. I was at my grandmother's house and it was a normal summer night until we saw that thing in the sky. So me and my sister, along with two of our cousins who are siblings, were on a terrace. Like I said earlier, I was 10 at the time and my sister was four. One of my cousins was nine, let's call her B while her sister was around my sister's age, let's call her G. There were only four of us on the terrace and we were talking about random things. We had an old mattress there. I was lying on that mattress and looking at the sky. It was a full moon night. Suddenly I saw something in the sky and it was hovering right above us. It was a human kind of creature with bat-like wings. Since it was a full moon, I could clearly see him. His body was like a normal human body and his wings were also like human skin. Moreover, I could clearly see through his wings and I saw a bunch of veins and arteries. His wings were shiny in the moonlight. As soon as I saw it, I screamed and told everyone to run downstairs. And I was the only one who fully looked at it, while one of my cousins, B, only saw his wings. We ran downstairs. And I forgot to mention his size was around the same as a normal human being, but with both wings that were so huge, maybe 10 feet or even longer. As we went downstairs, we tried telling everyone what we actually saw just now, but no one believed us. My younger cousin, G, forgot her slippers there on the terrace. So we went upstairs to get those back and it was still there hovering over our house or more like hovering around the moon. Now, sometimes when me and my cousin talk about it, we get confused and wonder if we actually saw that thing that day or we were just hallucinating. But all of us saw that thing bad thing or I say good thing, but we may never get to know what it was or never encounter that thing again. One day, my friend Austin asked me, Brandon, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? I pondered for a moment and replied, Huh, well, flowers, nature, or women. Austin then said expressionlessly, The most beautiful thing in the world is the sight of someone dying, their desperate plea for help. No one else in this world possesses a more desperate heart than at that moment. Isn't it truly beautiful? And when they face their impending death, they fight for their lives with everything they have. It's the moment they act most passionately in their lives. If they don't face death, they will live their lives without experiencing such passion. It's truly tragic. That's why every human being must be murdered. I was taken aback from his passionate and chilling gaze. Yes, he was sincere. In an attempt to change the somber atmosphere, I forced a smile and said, 
that's an interesting thought. <laughs> so, does that mean you have to be murdered, too? He glared at me and replied. No, I have to stay alive until the end. I have to kill them all. And then he said something else. Brandon, let's save humanity together. Put an end to their lifeless existence and create a climax in their lives. Just like a flower that blooms and then withers. And the only way to do that is through murder. Fear gripped me. I wanted to refuse, but when I saw the madness in his eyes, I couldn't bring myself to do it. If I refused, he would surely kill me. A few days later, he showed me a video. Brandon, take a look. Another masterpiece has been born. In the video, a person was hanging upside down. Below them was a large drum filled with water, and it was labeled as hydrochloric acid. The person was screaming for help. Austin said, Look into this person's eyes. Have you ever seen such a desperate gaze? People in today's world have empty eyes, as if everything bores them. But in reality, they all had eyes as vivid as this person's. Isn't it truly beautiful? Isn't it? He shouted with exhilaration in his voice, as if roaring in triumph. I trembled in fear. He delightedly replayed the video over and over again. Eventually, the person was dissolved in the acid, and Austin cheered and applauded. Ah, oh, it's truly perfect! In the end, I went home and reported it to the police, and he was arrested, and he sent me a letter from prison. Brandon, because of you, my plan to save the world has been ruined. Just watch. This world will turn into hell. You will feel the weight of your mistake deeply. Or you can come to your senses now and execute my plan instead. Then this world can be saved. Kill all those with lifeless eyes and bring vitality back to this world. When I was young, I once explored an abandoned house with my friend Tyler. We were so excited by the fact that we could finally go inside the abandoned house that had existed for a long time that we burst the door open. But as soon as we entered the house, I smelled something strange that I've never encountered before. Where's this smell coming from? Tyler decided to look around the first floor and I went up to the second floor. The second floor smelled even worse. I looked around and heard a faint voice somewhere. Over here. I was startled and walked carefully towards the room where the sound was coming from. I'm here. It was clearly a sound made inside the room. I asked whether someone is inside, but there was no response. When I got closer and looked through the crack of the door, I noticed a rotten corpse lying inside the room. I screamed. However, when I went inside, there was nothing but the corpse. Then, whose voice was it? Suddenly, the corpse opened its eyes and said, I want to live! I felt as if my heart had stopped. It wasn't a corpse, but I couldn't believe it. His flesh was decomposing, but how can he be alive? Then he suddenly jumped on me and choked me. I freaked out and pushed him away and he fell headlong to the floor like a doll. I ran away and shouted at the top of my lungs, calling Tyler. He rushed over to me in surprise, and we went outside and called the police. Moments later, the police arrived. They entered the room and shouted, It's a corpse! I denied, saying that it is alive, and when I looked at him again, what was lying there was, without a doubt, a corpse. Police assumed he died a few days ago, but I couldn't believe it. What the hell is it? The police recovered the body, and I still don't have a clear answer to this mysterious case. People said that I must have been seeing an illusion, but I saw it with my own eyes, for sure. His eyes that looked straight at me, his mournful voice, and even the smell that pierced my nose when he came close to me are all vividly in my memory. Dust stirred up as he moved, 
and the texture of his hands when he touched my neck was rough. I remember them all, vividly. This could never be a hallucination, but no one believed me. Eventually, I came back home with disappointment and decided to just forget about what had happened that day. And that night, when I looked in the mirror while taking a shower, I was horrified. There were faint strangulation marks on my neck. My girlfriend told me about two weeks ago that she was waiting in line at the convenience store with her friend in Chinatown, New York City, when a large, dapper-looking man approached them. He complimented her coat and commented on how expensive it must be, and she said thank you and they chatted for a little longer. The man explained that his suit was just a shabby Brooks Brothers suit, but she noticed that he had all sorts of expensive jewelry on. When my girlfriend and her friend mentioned that they were students, he kept making assumptions about how they must be rich and that their parents were paying for everything. My girlfriend started feeling uncomfortable and tried to distance herself from him. He asked them if they had jobs and they told him no as they were students. After that he went on to tell them what he does for a living without being asked. He said, I do all sorts of odd jobs, this and that, but mainly I have these guys that work for me. I find them off the streets, I feed them, and I give them a place to stay. I'm waiting to meet up with them now. He referred to them as his minions which suddenly made something that seemed wholesome at first very unsettling. And then he told them that he would just had his wallet stolen and needed $400 for something, I don't remember the reason. He told them that he would pay them back later that week, but he needed the money right that night. My girlfriend politely declined and by this point she was really uncomfortable. She started walking towards the door to leave and said, Nice to meet you, and good luck. They both walked outside and sat on a bench outside the convenience store. As they were sitting and discussing the strange interaction, they saw the man exit and stand about ten feet away, waiting for a few minutes, looking at his phone. He then met up with his two other men and they chatted for a few minutes. The large man in the suit then walked in the opposite direction while the other two men walked into the store and started holding it up with knives. Absolutely shocked and frozen. My girlfriend and her friend watched as the cashier put her hands up and emptied out the cash register. The two men ran out of the store in the same direction the man in the suit had walked. They were both about to call the police but noticed that the cashier had already done so. They waited at the bench until two police cars showed up and then they walked in to tell the officers what they had just witnessed and tried to help identify the robbers and the man they had just met. I wonder if this is a common occurrence in terms of organized crime paying homeless people to commit crimes and rob. I'm 20 years old, and this is a story about what I went through when I was 17. At that time, I had a close friend named Jason. He was from a rich family, and we often hung out at his house. I went to his house that day as usual, and I saw Jason chewing on something. At first, I thought it was candy. I asked what he was eating, and he replied, this? It's finger cartilage. It's delicious. Do you want to try it? I thought he was joking, but when I saw blood on his mouth, I realized it was real, and I screamed in shock, pointing at his mouth. What the hell is that? He said. It's human meat. These days, there are sellers who specialize in this kind of stuff. What a wonderful world, isn't it? I happened to find them, but now I'm addicted. I cursed at him. Then he looked at me as if I'm strange. And after a while, he showed me an online website, which had lists and prices for each body part. There were cuts of meat and even eyeballs, tongues, and livers. He said, You can deliver regularly here. How do you like it? It's very good for your health as well. He kept urging me to try it, but I was speechless in shock. Then all of a sudden, he called someone on the phone and said, Yes, you can come now. I'm ready. I asked him what the phone call was about, and he just laughed, saying it's no big deal. A moment later, I heard a knock, and when he opened the door, three men wearing masks were standing there, asking where the thing is. Then Jason pointed at me. I felt like my heart had dropped in an instant, and only then did I realize what was going on. I ran to the kitchen, grabbed a knife in each hand, and shouted, Don't come close! 
If you do, I'll slice you and eat you guys up. The three big men looked puzzled and said to Jason, Hey, why are you letting them move around like that? You should have drugged them or tied them up. How are we supposed to take them? Then Jason angrily said, They didn't say anything like that on the website. It said that the staff would just come and work on it. Hurry up, I want to eat. He pointed at me and shouted. The men seemed to be thinking about it, but eventually went back outside, saying they couldn't continue the transaction. After a while, I hurled abuse at Jason and ran home. I immediately reported him to the police, and the police went to his house and found human flesh in his refrigerator and arrested him. Soon after, the manager of the store where he purchased human flesh was also arrested, and their huge human factory was also uncovered. There, numerous corpses were delivered from all over the country, stored in large freezers, and staff members were working in strict order. Since then, every night I think of that day and tremble in fear. I was very lucky that Jason was clumsy, but if he had been adept, I would have already turned into meat and be in his stomach. If you see this woman in the forest, don't follow her. My name is Ryan. In the village where I live, there is a deep forest. It's known for incidents like people getting lost or going missing, so most people avoid going too deep into it. However, I loved taking walks in the forest and occasionally ventured deeper. Nothing major had ever happened until that day. Just like any other day, I was taking a walk alone in the forest. Amidst the greenery, I suddenly caught a sight of something pink. Startled, I looked closer and realized it was a woman wearing a pink dress. She stood still, gazing at me. At first, I thought I might be seeing things. How could there be a woman in a dress this deep in the forest? I approached cautiously and asked if she needed help, observing her face closely. I noticed that she was incredibly beautiful. Without saying a word, she gestured for me to come closer. It felt strange, but I cautiously moved closer, scanning my surroundings. As I got closer, her gestures became more frantic, as if she was fast-forwarding. Her hand movements grew faster and faster. When I finally got close enough to see her face clearly, she suddenly let out an ear-piercing scream, expanding in size dramatically. Catch him! At the same time, four men burst out of the bushes and sprinted towards me. They were carrying ropes and large sacks. I screamed and ran away. I sprinted at full speed, barely managing to escape them. After running for a while and realizing they weren't chasing me anymore, I reported the incident to the police. My heart was racing from the shock. The police and I searched the forest together, but they were long gone. When we reached the spot where the woman had been standing, we discovered a cabin nearby. Inside, six men were locked up. They were nothing but skin and bones, having lived as slaves there for seven years. According to their accounts, the cabin belonged to a doctor couple who would abduct men passing through the forest and imprison them there as slaves. The abducted men were forced to do all kinds of tasks and were instructed to pretend to be dead when told. If they didn't comply, they would be tied up and beaten all day long. The men expressed their anguish at how miserable their lives had been. The reason they couldn't rebel against the couple was that, after abducting them, the couple would tie them up for several days and inject something that would gradually deplete their muscle strength. Eventually, all their muscles would waste away, leaving them powerless to resist. According to the men, the couple's goal was to have a hundred slaves. After that horrific incident, I never set foot in the forest again. I don't know if the couple was ever caught or not. It's been ten years already. I hope they were apprehended, but who knows? There might be another forest where they're abducting and enslaving more people. Welcome to Aqua World Theme Park. The world's largest aquarium. Aqua World Theme Park. The world's largest aquarium that people all over the world want to visit at least once in their lifetime. This is where I work every day. My job is to take care of the killer whales of the Killer Whale Show, which is the most popular among the many aquariums that unfold past a huge underwater tunnel where sharks, stingrays, and tropical fish swim. 
The killer whale aquarium is where it is the most crowded, so it is a team with a lot to look after. But as a person who loves killer whales, I felt proud working for the killer whale team, even though it was physically tough. Then one day, after feeding the killer whales dinner late at night and finishing cleaning the aquarium, I finally could get off work, but many employees were gathered in front of a huge logistics truck, rumbling. What's going on? Why is everyone crowded? I asked my colleague Jacob. Daniel, something unbelievable has happened. Sailors found a mermaid off the coast of Argentina and caught it alive, and Aquaworld imported it in private. It seems that mermaids really exist. Now we're going to be the first to see it before telling the press. I can't believe I'm going to see a mermaid in my life. Eventually, a huge water tank covered with a black cloth was pulled out of the logistics truck and people were buzzing with excitement. Put away that damn cloth. Let me have a look. Why don't you show it? You're going to put it in the aquarium anyway. The officials who got off the truck did not listen at all, but only moved the water tank without saying anything. At that moment, the men who were shouting in the front row rushed at it and removed the black cloth covering the tank, revealing the inside of the tank. And there was a mermaid, crouching in the corner of the tank filled with green, muddy seawater. The water was so muddy that it was hard to see, but the upper body, which was thin like a mummy, revealed the shape of its spine, was clearly a woman's, and I couldn't see her face, as her head was bowed down, but her long hair swang underwater made her look very much like a human. Wow, it looks like the mermaid we know. People flocked to the tank and started hitting the glass with their hands. The mermaid that was crouching floated above as if surprised. The mermaid's tail itself seemed to be two meters long and the long black fins were hideous and grotesque rather than beautiful. Ah, <sighs> people screamed and the officials quickly covered the tank with a black cloth and dragged it into the aquarium. I was so shocked by the disgusting mermaid that I couldn't sleep even after I returned home that night. When I went to work after staying up all night, there was a huge cylindrical tank in the center of the aquarium where the mermaid was to be exhibited, but the tank was empty. I went to Jacob, who was cleaning the tank, and asked, Jacob, where's the mermaid? Jacob replied that the mermaid in poor health was hidden in a controlled area to prevent it from dying and that a special management team was created to concentrate on health management. All the staff working at the aquarium wanted to enter the controlled area, but even access was impossible due to tight security. Likewise, I couldn't see the mermaid for a while and looked at the empty tank, waiting for the day the mermaid would be displayed in the aquarium. In the meantime, the fact that Aquaworld has a mermaid was reported in the media around the world, and myriads of people began to flock in and even if it was before the mermaid was exhibited, tents waiting to enter the aquarium formed an endless line. This was harsh for the aquarium staff. This was because they gave up on their vacation and worked tirelessly due to the influx of tourists. According to rumors, Dominic, the CEO of Aquaworld, bought the mermaid by paying an astronomical amount of money. But even the mermaid has yet been exhibited. It seems that it is enough for him to get more bang for his buck. What was even more shocking was that Aquaworld even started a free admission event in the midst of such a hectic situation with so many people gathered around. A free opening event was launched from 9 p.m. to midnight for foreign workers who live alone without families, homeless people, and low-income people. Upon hearing this news, the aquarium staff staged a protest against overtime work, but fortunately, they were finally relieved when they heard that a night staff will be separately hired and managed during the free night opening hours. A few days later, while I was changing into my work clothes when I arrived at work, Jacob, who turned white with fear with a bewildered expression on his face, came up to me and whispered, Daniel, I stayed at the aquarium at midnight yesterday and I saw something crazy. What happened? You suddenly disappeared during work hours yesterday, so I thought you had to leave work for something urgent. But you were here? Yeah, I haven't been able to sleep since the day I saw the mermaid. I took sleeping pills but I couldn't stay awake until the next day. So I hid behind a warehouse box and closed my eyes for a moment. But when I woke up, it was well past midnight after everyone had left work. I've been sleeping without even realizing it." Jacob then started to continue his unbelievable story. He said he was getting ready to leave work belatedly and was surprised by the sound of people screaming outside. So he ran out of the warehouse to where the sound came from and found that the aquarium night team staff had caught visitors and locked them up in a cage, 
and were feeding them to the mermaid. I can't believe it's a man-eating mermaid. You've got to be kidding me. It's true. I saw it with my own eyes. The mermaid suddenly changed like a piranha and ate up people. Actually, I was hesitant to report it because I was afraid I would get fired. But I don't think that's right. I should report it to the police. Eventually, Jacob reported it to the police, and the police turned up at the aquarium to search the circumstances of the murder, but in the end, they couldn't find any evidence. So the cause was settled as Jacob was regarded to have filed a false report, and he was fired right on the spot. And after a while, I received a call from Jacob, late at dawn. Jacob? Daniel, they're right outside my window. If I die, I beg you to find out who the culprit is. What are you talking about? Jacob! Jacob! Jacob hung up even before I could answer, and when I called him again, he didn't answer. I thought Jacob had called from a nightmare due to the stress of being fired from work, so I made no big deal of it. However, the next day, I heard that Jacob had died at home for unknown reasons. It was clear that Jacob had been murdered by someone. I was shocked and suffered from guilt for days for not having reported it to the police even after getting Jacob's call yesterday. Who were the people Jacob was talking about? Was it true, as Jacob said, that the aquarium was holding a free night opening to feed humans to the man-eating mermaid every night? I began to think that what Jacob was saying might be true. The next day, when I went to work with a heavy heart, people were gathered in front of the mermaid's tank that used to be empty. Finally, the mermaid had been displayed in the aquarium. I squeezed through the crowd and stood in front of the tank and finally got a good look at the mermaid in clear water. Surprisingly, the mermaid in the tank looked completely different from the mermaid I first saw. The black tail and fins had turned turquoise, sparkling with rainbow colors, and the upper body, which had resembled a mummy with its backbone exposed, had turned into the body of a beautiful woman with white skin as it had gained flesh. The mermaid rised to the surface and was looking down at people and it had the face of a beauty with a pale white skin and blank look. It's beautiful. People exclaimed, looking up at the mermaid, and the mermaid stood motionless in the water, looking down at people, just wagging its tail. Watching the beautiful mermaid, I couldn't believe Jacob's words that the mermaid eats people, but I decided to follow Jacob's last request to uncover the culprit. As the closing hour approached, after finishing work, I hid in the warehouse where Jacob did lied down between the boxes, and waited for the night to come. At nine o'clock at night, I heard the bustle of people again, those who won the free night opening of Come In. Likewise, after being nosy for a long time, it became quieter and quieter at midnight, as if people were leaving, and after a while, I suddenly heard someone scream. Ah! Startled, I jumped up and went outside, crept towards the mermaid's tank, hid behind the wall, and peeped towards where the sound was coming from. Surprisingly, the night team staff had caught three tourists and were forcing them into a square cage. Why the heck are you doing this? Please let me out of here. Among them, a foreign man who appeared to be Hispanic shouted, and at that moment, Dominic, the CEO of Aquaworld, walked over and asked the staff, Are these people safe for sure? Yes, among the foreign workers, there are people with no family. We have carefully selected people who will not be found even if they disappear. All other visitors have left the aquarium, so don't worry. Dominic, who was listening to the staff, nodded with a satisfied expression and gestured, and a ladder truck came in and began to move the cage with people inside onto the tank, and the terrified people screamed and grasped and shook the cage. Eventually, the iron cage reached the top of the tank, and when the staff pushed the iron cage into the tank, the iron cage sank to the bottom of the tank in a flash. People struggled to open the cage, but when the staff pulled the rope tied to the entrance of the cage, the door opened and people got out of the cage and began to swim towards the surface. The mermaid that was looking down from the people coming up to the surface trembled its tail and zapped the man, violently bit his neck, and in an instant, the blue tank began to turn red with blood. The other two people were reaching out their hands on the surface, asking for help to get out of the tank, but the night shift workers came with long harpoons and stabbed them in the eyes, and while they were struggling, bleeding from their eyes, the mermaid devoured all three in a flash. As I was watching this scene, hiding, I was shocked, and quickly got out, shaking all over. 
Aqua World may have bribed the police, as Jacob was regarded to have filed a false report. And considering that he died without a trace, I would also die like Jacob if I reported to the police. When I went to work the next morning, the mermaid's tank, which had been stained with red blood last night, had returned to a blue one, embroidered with beautiful corals, and the mermaid, which had eaten people like piranhas, was standing in the water with a beautiful woman's face looking down at people. Watching it gave me goosebumps. While looking at the mermaid, I suddenly realized that the mermaid's tail, which was over two meters long, had become much shorter. It was as short as the length of a human leg. The mermaid's appearance and tail length were also gradually changing, like human. On the aquarium, there was a notice attached. Every night at nine, free night openings are held for foreign workers living alone with no family, homeless people, and low-income people. Aqua World of Dreams and Hopes will become your family. Tonight as well, after midnight, someone will be sacrificed by a man-eating mermaid. I went to work as usual, then went back to the warehouse and lied down behind a box waiting for midnight. I covered my ears in agony due to the sound of people screaming outside. Waiting until 3 a.m. when it became silent, I carefully approached the mermaid's tank, and as if nothing had happened, the mermaid was swimming serenely in the tank that had been cleaned. I started to climb up the ladder to the top of the tank, and the mermaid was smiling at me from the water, and its smile was so frightening. Soon after, I climbed to the top of the tank and took out a great amount of potassium cyanide from my bag and poured it into the tank. After a while, the mermaid grabbed its neck and began to have a seizure, slamming its body against the glass wall. The glass wall gradually cracked due to the mermaid's tremendous power, and the tank broke and water poured down, and I plummeted to the floor, falling down from the ladder. Ugh. I lay moaning on the broken glass of the tank when I saw something whirling past me, and I looked up, and I saw the mermaid crawling on the floor quickly, with human legs that had grown out of both sides of its tail. Like the process of a tadpole becoming a frog, the mermaid had been gradually evolving into a human, as it ate human. The mermaid seemed to be in pain, and got away, crawling in a grotesque manner. I barely got up and grabbed the harpoon beside me and followed the mermaid. The mermaid has to be killed so that there will be no more victims. Put down the harpoon. Don't kill it. At that moment, a man walked out from behind the wall, saying, The man snatched the harpoon from my hand and threw it away. Who are you? I asked, surprised, and the man answered, I was one of the sailors who caught the mermaid off the coast of Argentina. I heard that there was a free night opening at Aqua World, and I knew that it was a killing party to obtain food for the mermaid. When I came in at night, by receiving the foreign worker benefit, it was just as I expected. But why shouldn't the mermaid be killed? You have to take them alive to make money. I was against selling them from the first place, but one of the sailors secretly sold them to Aqua World. The sailor chased after the mermaid and threw a net. The mermaid that was caught in the net shook its tail violently and revealed its sharp teeth. The sailor said, looking at the legs that have grown on the mermaid's tail, How much human flesh have they fed to make it grow legs? The sailor took a sashimi knife out of his inner pocket and cut off both legs attached to the mermaid's tail, and the mermaid let out a horrible shriek like a whale. It doesn't have to eat human flesh but it's just that it couldn't stop eating it because it tastes good. Meat has been precious to mermaids living in the sea since ancient times, but as people come to the shore when lured by mermaids, human was the easiest to meet for them to obtain. Since mermaids eat only what they want, they were only fed with human flesh. Mermaids were spoiled. He dragged the net with the mermaid entangled and got out of the aquarium. And soon, the sailors got out of the shabby freezer truck standing outside the aquarium and put the mermaid in the car, saying, Thank you for your help. They disappeared, and the mermaid's whereabouts were unknown since then. The next day, upon hearing the news that the mermaid had disappeared, Aqua World was thrown into chaos. And a few months later, another aquarium advertised that it was starting a free night opening event. A man recently moved into our neighborhood. His name was Tony. One day, 
He invited the neighbors for dinner, and I ended up attending the gathering. So, a group of about three neighbors gathered at his house for a meal. We were having a pleasant dinner when suddenly he spoke up. Everyone, I have a dream. Will you help me achieve my dream? One of the neighbors, Jerry, responded. Of course, what is it? I'll help you no matter what. Then Tony abruptly stood up and went to the kitchen. After a while, he came back wearing white gloves and said, I need to fill a record of 30 people, and it seems like that record will be achieved today. We couldn't quite understand what he was talking about, so we chuckled and asked, What record? But then, one by one, the neighbors who were eating started to stagger and collapse. It was only then that I realized that he had drugged the food. He said, This will be my final murder in life, finally. I will achieve my dream, and from now on I will completely quit and live a quiet life. Then he began to choke Jerry's neck with his hands. Jerry struggled and fell, causing the table to overturn and the room to become a mess. We did our best to stop him. Fortunately, I hadn't eaten much, so my mind was still clear. I shouted at Tony to stop, but he just laughed and said, once you've set a goal, you must never change it. That's the only way to achieve it. He continued choking Jerry's neck. At that moment, Randy, who was next to him, tried to stop Tony, and I immediately called the police. However, Jerry already appeared to be dead. Tony then turned to strangle Randy. I punched Tony in the face with all my strength, but my body didn't have much power behind it. I watched Randy dying and felt my consciousness fading away. Just as I thought I was about to die, I heard the sound of police sirens, and Tony quickly started to flee. I held on to his ankle with all my strength and didn't let go. While he cursed and stomped on me, I screamed in pain, praying for this moment to end quickly. Soon the police arrived and arrested him. However, both Jerry and Randy were already lifeless. According to the police investigation, Tony was confirmed to have committed seven murders and was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, he told the police that he had killed 22 more people, but he refused to reveal where the bodies were. So, it was unclear whether his words were true or false. However, somehow I have a feeling that his words might be true, because he killed people so easily, without any remorse or hesitation. His expressions and gestures were so relaxed and comfortable, and above all else, I can't forget the words he uttered when the police arrived at the front door. Damn it, only 29 so far. There was a beautiful girl in our school. However, there was a rumor about her. It was that all men she dates would die. However, she was not arrested by the police as there was no evidence that she killed the men. There were all kinds of horrendous rumors about her. Therefore, in spite of her beautiful looks, all people avoided her. Then one day, she asked me out on a date. I asked her why she asked me out and she replied, There's a place I really want to go with you. Eventually, I ended up dating her and I fell for her. I noticed myself rationalizing. I was persuading myself that nothing would happen even if I date her and it's all just nonsense. That's how we developed our relationship and we always spent happy days together. Then one day she asked me, don't you want to go to heaven? I asked her what she is suddenly talking about. She replied, I wanna go to heaven with you. If I only get your permission, I can go there even now. Her eyes weren't joking. I was so flustered that I asked why, but she kept saying, I prayed to God every day and heard him say that he has prepared a home in heaven for me. Let's go to heaven together. The two of us can live happily there. She handed me a drink. I could guess what that was. I got up and ran away. Then she cried out, we are citizens of heaven. I blocked her number, and I never contacted her again. But a few weeks later, 
I got a call from the police. It was that she had been arrested for murdering a man. The man died after drinking a drink she gave him, and when he was dead, he was dressed in white. When the police arrived at the scene, she continued to pray next to the body, then said with the very happy expression, God told me my boyfriend just arrived in heaven. The police arrested her on the spot for murder, and she yelled at the police, Officer, he's not dead, he's in heaven. God told me that he has prepared a home for him in heaven. If you go there, you'll get to see him. It's true. I'm a very lightweighted person, but I didn't expect that it would lead me into such a big trap. One day, while looking for a part-time job, I saw a notice from a medical student who was looking for a skinny male model to study the skeletal structure of the human body. I thought it was perfect and immediately made a phone call. I went to his house, and a tall man, over 6'2 and weighing over 250 pounds, greeted me. He was very friendly. Soon, he began to closely observe the bones in my body. After a while, he took out a syringe. I was very surprised and asked him what he was doing, and he quietly said, I'll kill you without pain, so please stay still. I screamed and kicked him before running away. I ran frantically and entered a room, locking the door behind me. In that room, there were numerous mannequins shaped like skeletons. At first, I thought they were just models, but when I approached them, I could be certain. Those were not models, but actual human bones. Unknowingly, I let out a scream. Then, from outside the room, I heard laughter and a voice saying, It's impressive, huh? You'll become one of those skeleton models too. He started shaking the doorknob like crazy. I quickly put on the clothes in the room, trying to avoid getting pricked by the syringe. I had left my phone in the living room, so I couldn't call the police. Eventually, I had to leave that room and escape from the house. I opened the door, and he tried to inject me with the syringe, but I dodged him and punched him as hard as I could. However, he was a man more than twice my size, and I desperately punched him in the face with all my might. He screamed in pain. I used every ounce of strength I had and beat him relentlessly. He couldn't resist properly and took the hits. Then, I ran out of there and escaped. I immediately reported it to the police, and he was soon captured by the police. They investigated the DNA of the bones in his house and confirmed that they belonged to the missing people. He was sent to prison. While entering the prison, he begged not to take away the skeletons. It sent chills down my spine. But later, when I looked back on the incident, I realized one thing. He was twice my size, so he could have easily subdued me or beaten me down with his strength. However, he never had any intention of hitting me and didn't try to overpower me physically. He only wanted to inject me with a syringe and didn't attempt anything else. I pondered over why that was the case, and one thought came to my mind. If he had hit me, my bones could have been damaged. So he didn't hit me on purpose. He wanted to take my bones intact. I work as a detective in a special investigations unit. It's been over eight years since this incident happened, but it remains the most memorable story of a criminal I've ever encountered. His name was Chase, and he was apprehended for brutally assaulting people. Due to the numerous accounts of his physical violence, he had been in and out of prison multiple times. So when I asked him why he enjoyed hurting people, his response was truly disturbing. Officer, have you ever hit someone? Well, for me, hitting people is the most enjoyable thing. No matter who they are, they all start off with an arrogant attitude towards me. But as I keep hitting them, they eventually kneel before me. No one is an exception. It's just a matter of how long they can endure. Eventually, they all end up bowing down to me. Even an officer like you. If we were to meet on the street, you'd kneel before me. <laughs> but it's so amusing to me to make anyone kneel before me. It's more entertaining than any movie or game. He reminisced about those moments with a disturbingly joyful expression. As he stared at me, his gaze felt as if he was looking right through me, and it made me extremely uncomfortable. 
In a moment of courage, I grabbed him by the collar, and suddenly his eyes transformed, exuding a chilling intensity. He glared at me as if he wanted to kill me and whispered, You're going to die for this. I felt a wave of intense fear, and I instinctively adverted my gaze from his eyes. In any case, he was sentenced to four years in prison. But after those four years passed, he came looking for me. Somehow he knew my home address and stood at the entrance of my house. He approached me with a bright smile and exclaimed, Officer, kneel before me. I was shocked and anger surged within me, but at the same time, knowing what kind of psychopath he was, a sense of terror overwhelmed me. I had a gut feeling that emotional confrontation would only lead to more trouble, so I tried to remain as calm as possible. You want to go back to prison again? I asked. He laughed and replied, It's all right. That place was quite livable, you know. If I can just experience the thrill of making you kneel before me, I'd go back any time. He assumed a posture as if he was about to strike me with his fist. I felt my legs weaken instantly. Fortunately, at that moment, our neighbor James happened to pass by and greeted me. I asked him for help and Chase froze for a moment before shouting one last thing at me and leaving. I'll come back next time, and then I'll definitely make you kneel before me. I was engulfed in fear. From that point on, I carried a gun with me at all times, and a few days later, when Chase appeared near my house, I aimed the gun at him. Startled, he asked me why I was doing this and retreated once again. Since then, I constantly scanned my surroundings, fearing that he might appear. Occasionally, I could catch glimpses of him watching me from a distance, but he never approached me again. I haven't heard any news about him since then, but he might be out there assaulting others. However, Chase, I hope I never have to see you again. We have a person in our company whom I call the Laughing Man. His name is Cooper, and whenever he sees me, he bursts into laughter. However, it's not just a cheerful laugh. It's as if he's laughing to death, struggling to hold back his laughter. At first, I was taken aback, and as time went on, I started feeling uneasy. It was because he wasn't close to me, and we had never had a deep conversation. I discussed it with people around me, but strangely, they all said the same thing. Cooper? I've never seen him laugh even once. He's expressionless every day. Next time he laughs, take a picture. I want to see how he laughs. I was genuinely puzzled. Was he only laughing at me? Over time, I asked Cooper why he was only laughing when he saw me, but he closed his eyes and said, I see you. The way you react is so funny. He swung his arms as if swinging a baseball bat. I asked him what he saw, but he didn't say a word. It sent chills down my spine, but there was nothing I could do. After that, he was often caught secretly watching me from a distance, struggling to hold back his laughter, and I got angry with him, but he couldn't help but laugh more. But I discovered that he never laughed when he was with other people. Only when he looked at me did he laugh brightly. It really gave me the creeps. Then one day, I was working late and alone in the office. When I tried to leave, Cooper was standing in front of me, holding a baseball bat. I shouted at him, asking what he was doing, but he just laughed without saying a word. He slowly approached me, struggling to breathe because he was laughing so hard. Then he swung the baseball bat at me. I barely avoided it, but my arm was hit, and I groaned in pain. In response, he laughed even harder. Seizing the opportunity, I kicked him and ran away at full speed. He chased after me, but couldn't catch me. I immediately reported it to the police, and Cooper was arrested. But a while later, our company was turned upside down. It was revealed that Cooper had been arrested for murder. He had recently killed a neighbor and dumped the body. It was also revealed that he had attempted to murder and assault other people. One person, who barely survived from him, testified to the police, saying, He was always laughing, so I thought he was a good person. But in the end, when he hit me and burst into laughter, I realized that was the true meaning of his laughter. I was in complete shock. What was even more shocking was when a colleague who had been closest to Cooper in our company said this. Cooper once told me 
He has a habit of laughing when he sees the people he wants to kill. He said he can't help but laugh because imagining killing that person makes him feel so good. At that time, I thought it was just a joke. I never imagined it could be real. Thinking back now, it gives me chills to realize that I was close to him all this time. Fortunately, he never laughed at me. I'm really grateful, but I used to force jokes to make him laugh. It sends shivers down my spine to think about it now. After hearing his words, my heart sank. All those moments when he looked at me and laughed came flooding back. I met someone who looked just like me while traveling one day. He looked so much like me that I believed he was a twin. We both stopped and looked at each other in the face for a few seconds, and he asked me, Who are you? I couldn't say anything in shock and only looked at his face. He also looked at me in the face and continued to look incredulous. I ran away with an indescribable discomfort at that night. I had a dream that my body burned down and turned into ashes. And when I woke up in the morning, my whole body began to crack and discharge. As time went by, my body began to hurt more and more. Gradually, it became difficult to breathe, and it became difficult to move as the arms and legs hardened. I was lost in thought. I heard I'd die if I met a doppelganger. Am I dying? I ended up visiting a famous fortune teller, who was surprised to see me and said, You were born by God's mistake. God is trying to turn you back into nothingness. I said I wanted to live, and the fortune teller shook his head and said there was no way. I went back stunned, and after that day my body began to dry out like a dying tree. As the day went by, I became senile, my back was bent, my skin cracked, and blood began to leak out. Even after visiting a doctor, he said there was no cure, saying it was a strange disease with an unknown cause. I shouted at the sky, God! You created me and now you're trying to get rid of me?! I wanted to live somehow, so I exercised for six hours a day and took care of all kinds of vitamins and health foods. Fortunately, I started to feel better, and I was able to slow down the speed of my body's breakdown. Then one day, I had a dream again. I saw a person who looked like me lying down in the form of a lump of ash, because his whole body was burned. I woke up screaming and now I'm in a better shape than ever before. Surprisingly, after that, I gradually recovered my health and gradually returned to a healthy body. I don't know what happened. Did God change his mind, or was it all just a coincidence? But one question remains in my mind. Where is the person who looks like me now? Is he alive? This is what I experienced when I was 17. At that time, I was in good shape because I mastered many sports, such as boxing and wrestling. But one day, Alexander, a notorious delinquent at my school asked me for a fight. I was bewildered and said, If I hit you, you'll go straight to heaven. But I shouldn't have said this. He suddenly shouted in anger. I'll chew you to pieces, eat you up, and then take a shit. I was perplexed, but I realized there was nothing I could do. He ran up to me and punched me, and I punched him back as I was enraged. He was knocked down to the floor by my fist and blood started dripping from his nose. I tried to help him up, saying I'm sorry and let's stop this, but he grabbed me, knocked me over and started beating me. I was infuriated and punched him badly. He fell down again and couldn't get up as he was in pain. I kept yelling at him to stop, but he was already half mad. He got up again and shouted as he approached me. Let's fight! I shouted. Please stop! You're gonna die if you keep doing that! He said, smirking. Of course! One of us must die! He pounced on me, and I picked him up and pinned him to the ground. He broke his neck, got up with his neck broken, and ran back at me. I tripped him with my leg, and he broke his arm as he fell down. He pounced on me with his arms broken as well. 
I yelled at him to stop, but he ran at me screaming. I'll stop when you die! I kicked him really hard, and he flew ten feet away. He fell to the floor and tried to get up, but his whole body seemed to be broken, and it seemed that he couldn't move. I called the police right at that moment. The police arrived, and he was taken away in an ambulance. He was hospitalized and taken to the intensive care unit. I was injured, as I was beaten up by him as well, but there were no major injuries. And after a while, I received another text message from him. There were two words written on that message. Let's fight. I eventually called him, apologized, and told him I gave up. Then there was silence for a few seconds, and I heard him whispering, Let's fight. My whole body trembled. He didn't listen to anything I said. His only goal was to fight me. I blocked his number. After a while, I received a letter. In the letter, once again, two words were written. Let's fight. A few days later, I heard a knock and looked outside to find Alexander standing there. He was limping with a cast on his arm. I called the police, but he continued to hover around my neighborhood. I ended up moving, and I haven't heard from him since. Years passed, and I ran into my old high school friend Luke, and while talking with him, I happened to hear about Alexander. After he fought with me, he kept challenging other friends at school to fight, and most of the kids refused and avoided him, but one of them, a friend named Nicholas, accepted the fight, and in the end, the two of them fought until Alexander killed him with his bare hands. In the end, Alexander went to prison. I was horrified. He had meant everything he ever said. If I hadn't suppressed him then, I wouldn't be alive now. This is what happened to my little brother, Luke. He had a habit of consistently moving his eyes, just like someone who is so insecure. When I asked him why he does that, he replied, The demons keep putting their faces against me to make eye contact with me, so I need to keep avoiding their eyes. However, there was nothing in front of him. He continued to move his eyes while eating, when he was walking down the street, when he was talking with somebody. He kept looking away as if someone was in front of him. I thought to myself that he was clearly suffering from a mental illness and recommended that he go to a psychiatrist, but he stubbornly refused to, saying that there are ten demons hovering in front of him. Eventually, our family all agreed to send him to a psychiatric hospital. He ran riot and struggled to get out, but the doctor administered a tranquilizer to him and he fell fast asleep. However, this was when the incident happened. A few hours later, he opened his eyes and suddenly screamed as he grabbed his eyes. Ah, our eyes met! He rolled around in pain. Then he suddenly jumped up and groped his own body and face, shouting in a loud, monstrous voice. I finally got in! He was smiling, turning up only the whites of his eyes. I was so shocked and was perplexed at what had happened, and so were the doctors and nurses. He continued talking in a monstrous voice. This body is mine now. This body is now Satan's. This body is now the house of demons. I shouted in anger. Go to hell, you evil! He laughed, saying, Peter, what's the trouble? Hell is a nice place! <laughs> After all, we called the priest and he performed exorcisms. The priest said Luke was born with eyes that could see demons, and he said that he must have seen demons all his life. How hard it must have been, tears ran down my face. The priest performed an exorcism with his eyes covered up with a ribbon tied around his head. Luke yelled at the priest as he was tied to the bed. Look into my eyes. If I enter your holy body and commit a sin, how will God respond? When the priest sprinkled holy water on him, he let out a monstrous scream, and smoke came out with a burning sound. After a long exorcism, Luke finally fainted with his head dropped, and the priest said that no more demons would come near him. 
Luke woke up and surprisingly, he no longer looked away. He regained his composure. However, even after that, every once in a while, as he walked down the street, he would point somewhere and say there is an evil spirit. But he never looked at that direction. When I looked where he pointed, nothing was there. I asked him, Is there really such a thing as a demon in this world? And then he said, Yes, there are many. Every day they hover around in front of people's eyes and whisper in their ears. There's also one in front of you right now. It's struggling to get your attention. Peter, I'll tell you one thing. If you see something strange in front of you, never look at it. You just have to pretend you didn't see it. Promise me. Here is the story about the creepy cinema I went to. I was 15 when this story takes place. My mom and I planned on going to the mall and watching a movie. Since our favorite mall was far, we decided to watch a movie at a place nearby that we hadn't been to. We found a mall named Star Mall Alabang. This mall came from the Philippines, and there's been a crazy rumor about it having been built on top of a really old cemetery. We went inside, heading straight to the ticket booths. The ticket booth line was empty. I looked around and noticed we were the only ones there. At first, I didn't actually mind because that meant we would be first in line and would probably get the best seats. My mom and I hurried through the halls to get to our theater because our movie was about to start. Both of us expected there to be a few people in the movie theater, and yet there was no one in the theater. Every single seat was empty. What made the situation even more chilling was when the lights dimmed and it was only us in there. We couldn't handle how eerie it was, so we ran back out of the theater. Then, to our relief, we saw two girls walking through the doors of the theater we were just in. We headed back into the theater feeling more comfortable, knowing there were at least two other people there. We picked out our seats near the two girls and sat patiently waiting for the movie. While the trailers began playing, we didn't pay much attention, but I remember hearing a few people come in and sit behind us. I even heard a few whispers and chatter at that time. My mom remarked that it was silly that we had been so paranoid, and that maybe no one was in the theater yet because we were very early. This is when the story takes a creepy turn. The movie started, so as should be expected, my mother, the two girls, and I were giving the movie our full attention. After most of the movie had played, I needed to go pee. Despite having heard many people join the theater with us, I still felt scared. I asked my mom to go with me because I didn't want to go alone. She said, just go alone. The washroom is near. The movie was probably about to finish, so I figured I could just wait to go to the bathroom. I ain't gonna miss the best part, you know? I tried to hold it, but I couldn't. If I waited for the end of the movie, I'd definitely pee my pants. For sure. I moved through the row we were in so that I could get to the aisle and start making my way down the stairs to the exit. Maybe I was being nosy, or maybe it was just out of habit, but I decided to look around and see if anyone else in the crowd was enjoying the movie. What I saw, or rather what I didn't see, stopped me in my tracks. There was no one at the cinema besides us. I had a mini heart attack because we literally just heard a few people going in earlier and I could hear their talking too. As in, we are the only people that's been watching. I was too freaked out to go to the bathroom, so I hurried back to my seat. I would hold my pee until the movie was finished. When the movie finished and the lights were turned back on, the two girls and my mom were talking about the movie. You know, the usual, giving their opinions and stuff as I sat frozen in my seat. It wasn't until they turned around to check the seats around us that they also realized that we were completely alone. Where's the others? They asked. I stayed quiet because I do not want to talk about it. (laughs) 
There was a middle-aged man among my neighbors who had been practicing martial arts for a very long time. He practiced by striking trees in his front yard every day and would break bricks with his bare hands. But one day, he was found dead in the front yard of his house. What was even more shocking was that he had suffocated to death with his fist stuck in his throat. His jaw was completely dislocated, something that couldn't have happened without compulsion. But there were no traces of someone having done it. The whole neighborhood was in shock, and the police focused on the investigation, but there was no progress. One day, while I was taking a rest at home, I heard a voice outside. Please, open the door. When I heard that voice, I was walking over to the door and opening it before I knew it. It felt like an order I couldn't resist. In front of the door, there was a man dressed up with eyeball-shaped earrings, necklaces, and rings, and he was staring at me with his eyes wide open. I was startled, and at the same time, a tingling sensation ran through my brain and spine. Then suddenly, I became completely exhausted and started to be in a semi-conscious condition. He then said, Please don't stare back at my face for a long time. Roll your eyes back. Then my pupils started to go up. I was so startled that I tried to look down, but it didn't work. It seemed to be out of my will. I screamed. Then he said, Please don't make a sound, and my voice suddenly did not come out. I was standing there with an upward glance, feeling great pain. Even though I had my pupils upwards to the extent where I couldn't roll my eyes further, he kept saying, More. Roll your eyes more, please. Tears flowed like a waterfall as I felt tremendous pain as if my pupils were being ripped off. I barely begged him for help in a shrill voice. He said, Are you still able to talk? If so, bite your tongue, please. Then suddenly I was biting my tongue with my teeth. I tried to open my mouth with all my might, but it didn't work. I felt great pain. Only then did I realize how the martial artist had died. He said, Now bite your tongue until it cuts off. Suddenly, someone shouted from behind. Hands up! It turned out that the police had been patrolling the neighborhood and had followed after a suspicious-looking man. The moment I heard his voice, the numbness of my body wore off. The man turned around and looked at the police and said, Please drop the gun. Then the police dropped the gun he was holding onto the floor. He didn't pick up the gun and stood still with an idiotic expression on his face. At that very moment, I attacked the man from behind and put a headlock on him. But when he said, Your arm is getting weak, he smoothly slipped away as my arm weakened and I was perplexed. He pointed at me and said to the officer, Point your gun at this man. Then the police picked up the gun and pointed it at me. The man said to the police, If he moves, the trigger will be pulled, and quietly disappeared. I couldn't move, and the police stood still for a long time, his body stiff. After the man had completely disappeared, the police dropped his gun and collapsed onto the floor, devastated. We couldn't believe what we'd been through, and since then, the police devoted all of their energy to catch the enigmatic man. And after a while, I heard news that the man had been caught. It turned out that the man had the ability to hypnotize people in one second. He had used that technique to play with people like toys. It turned out that there were hundreds of other people who had been harassed by him, but no one could report it because he had hypnotized them so that they could not report it to the police. Instead of sending him to prison, the government reportedly took him to use him for special tasks. No one knows what particular mission he is used for. But, since he is such a dangerous person, whenever even high-ranking government officials meet him, they are reportedly accompanied by a dozen of special forces. Yesterday, a fifth missing person has been filed in Vilsame. 
The fifth missing person, Ella, was also a five foot two tall girl. This has proved that speculation that the kidnapper only targets females who are exactly five foot two tall is true. The families of the victims are enduring hellish days as no missing person has been found yet. The photos shown on the screen now are the missing persons. If you have witnessed them, please file a report by calling the number below. There has already been a fifth disappearance in our neighborhood. The kidnapper seems to be the same person. This is because all five victims were girls exactly five foot two tall. The police speculated that the kidnapper was a pervert obsessed with the figure five foot two. Investigations continued on the serial disappearance cases that lasted for several months, but the whereabouts of the missing persons were unknown, and there was no one who witnessed a kidnapping taking place. Rather, the village was quiet and peaceful. Kaylee, come home right after school. You must never walk around alone. If you need me, call me anytime and I'll pick you up. My mother, who was watching the news beside me, said with a worried face, Mom, don't worry too much. I'm five foot three tall. Don't say that. You should always be careful. All five missing people were exactly five foot two, as if they were measured with a ruler. So don't worry too much, and I'll be careful too. I said calmly to reassure my mother, but I was scared as well. Two days later, I was walking with my friends on my way home from school, and many police cars and ambulances were parked at the entrance to the village's forest, and people were carrying dead bodies covered with white cloth on stretchers. The bodies of the missing victims were found buried here and there in the forest. The bodies of four people were already decomposed and turned into white bones, and the search team was surprised when they found Ella's body, who disappeared three days ago and had not yet decomposed. This was because the body did not have a single piece of skin left. The police judged that the culprit was likely to be a butcher who professionally trimmed meat based on the elaborately peeled skin off the body. So the butchers living in the village were investigated, but the investigation was at a standstill because no evidence was found. As the investigation intensified, as if the culprit became more cautious, no more victims occurred and several months passed. The incident settled down, but five foot two tall females never went out alone. And there were even families moving to other neighborhoods to protect their daughters. A few days later, on my way home from school, after parting with my friends, a woman came out of her yard and greeted me. Hi, do you live here? I'm Luna and I live here. Hello, I'm Kaylee. I live in this town too. Nice to meet you. Kaylee, it's so dangerous these days because of the serial killings. Would it be okay if you wander around alone like this? I'm scared, but I'm five foot three tall, so I just roam around thinking it's going to be okay. But you have to be careful. I have a daughter named Mia, and I'm worried a lot these days. Luna said, pointing her finger at the window on the second floor of her house. She said, That's Mia's room. She's five feet, two inches tall, so I don't let her go out at all. In fact, she saw you pass by through her window and begged me to play with you, so I came out to ask you to play with her. I looked at the window on the second floor at which Luna was pointing, and there was a girl standing by the window, looking down at where I was. Does Mia know me? Yeah, it's been a long time since she hasn't gone out, so it's her daily routine to look out the window, but I guess she wanted to be friends with you who passes by every day. Would you like to play with Mia today? I've also baked a delicious apple pie. Yes, I'd like to. I followed Luna into the house. Her house had a charming interior with floral wallpaper and pretty props, and there was a wooden table in the middle of the living room. Luna seemed to be working on sewing until now, as on a mint-colored sewing machine, there was a dress that was half-laced. Luna smiled when she saw me looking at the sewing machine and said, I was just making Mia's dress. I make my daughter's dresses on my own. The dress is so pretty. If you become friends with Mia, I'll make yours too. Come on, follow me to the second floor. Luna went to the second floor and knocked on Mia's door. Mia, I've brought you a friend. When she opened the door, there was Mia sitting on her bed, shaking her hand without saying a word. Her head bowed as she was shy. I smiled brightly and introduced myself to Mia, who was wearing a bucket hat and a black dress. Hello, Mia. I'm Kaylee. 
I came by because you wanted to be friends with me. Then Mia answered in a small voice. Hello, Kaylee. Thanks for coming to my room. Then Luna happily looked at us and said, Oh, you two have fun. Mommy will bring you girls apple pie. As Luna went down the stairs, Mia asked me, Kaylee, aren't you afraid of the outer world? I'm scared, but I'm five foot three tall, so I just walk around bravely. Mia, I've heard you're five foot two tall. Since you can't go out alone, I think it would be frustrating. Then Mia put her arm across mine and took me to a large mirror in the room and said, I'm five foot three tall now too. That's why I haven't had clothes that fit me lately. Just as she said, Mia and I standing side by side in front of the mirror were the same height. However, when I looked closely at Mia's face and body, something was strange. She was so grotesque as she had skin sewn here and there like a stuffed toy. I couldn't ask her directly about it because I might hurt Mia's feelings, so I just glanced at her. Mia's face was twisted as well, with her skin sewn together as if it had been patched up. Only then did I realize that Mia was no ordinary person. Mia looked at our reflection in the mirror and said with a satisfied smile, Kaylee, I like you so much. It's apple pie time. I'll bring mom. Mia went downstairs to get the apple pie, and I had a foreboding feeling about Mia's eccentric appearance. So I sneaked around her room while she was away. I was surprised when I opened Mia's closet. Strange leathers were hanging on four hangers, and when I took one of them out and spread it on the floor, it looked as if a human skin had been peeled off. The arms, legs, and torso were cut so that it could be worn like a suit, and a mask with the face and hair of a person's scalp had been peeled off was also hung in her closet. Ah! What is this? I was startled, and I hurled the unknown leather, thinking I should get out of this creepy house quickly. As I hurried out of Mia's room and went down the stairs, I heard Mia and Luna's voice from downstairs. She's the same height as me. She has a pretty face, so I like her. Hurry up and make me new clothes made out of Kaylee. There weren't any clothes for you to wear because you grew up, but this is good news. Mommy will make you a pretty one this time as well. I saw the mother and daughter walking upstairs through the cracks of the stairs. Luna had a large plastic bag and a sharp kitchen knife in her hand, and Mia, who was behind her, had cutting scissors in her hand. I was startled and went back into the room and locked the door. After a while, the mother and daughter found that the door was locked and started knocking on the door. Kaylee? Kaylee? Open the door. I brought some apple pie. I kept my mouth shut in fear. Then I heard Mia's voice saying, Kaylee, what are you doing? Let's play. Open the door. When I didn't say anything, Luna said to Mia, Mommy will bring the keys. I hurriedly looked around the room and found that the only way to escape was to jump out the window. When I opened the window and looked down, it was too high for me to jump out. Suddenly, the door burst open, and Mia jumped in and pulled me by the waist. As I writhed myself, Luna swung a kitchen knife from behind, and I collapsed on the spot. Ah! Seeing me bleeding from a huge back wound and suffering in pain, Mia hollered with a mad expression. What are you doing? You cut my new clothes! Are you crazy? Ah! Mia screamed for a while and sat down sobbing. It's because of you, Mom! You ruined it all! Now I have no more clothes to wear! Look at this! My feet are sticking out because my clothes are too short! Mia's ankle protruded from under the leather on the sole of her foot. There was another foot, and the red skin with dead skin cells and cracks all over was so disgusting that it could not be considered human skin. Luna said, comforting Mia. Oh, it's all Mommy's fault. I was in a hurry, thinking she'd jump out the window. Sorry, Mia. Now what? There are so many cops that I can't even get new clothes anymore. Then Luna looked down at me, pondering, and then said to Mia, oh, Mia, I've got an idea. Why don't we wait until the wound is healed and then skin her? Mia's face immediately brightened and she grinned. The mother and daughter taped my wrists and ankles and each carried my legs and torso and went down to the basement. Lights in the basement, I saw a neatly organized cutting room with bright white lights. On the large work table, a belt was installed to bind limbs, and surgical tools and cutting supplies were placed on the table. 
They laid me down on the work table, brought antiseptic and bandages, and started treating my wound. That's how I was locked in the cutting room until the wound healed and their treatment to obtain my leather began. The mother and daughter brought soup, bread, and water and fed me, applied medicine to the wounds frequently, and tied my limbs to the work table during the rest of the time. Look at this, Kaylee. You've become so famous. The devil, like Mia, would often show me news by holding her tablet PC in front of my eyes. On the news with an exasperated voice, the anchorman was saying that a six missing person had occurred, along with my picture, which was followed by my mother crying out for help to find me. When I saw my mother on the news, I burst into tears and begged Mia to get me out of here, but there was no use. As time passed, scabs formed on the deep wounds and new flesh began to come out. The fact that the new flesh was coming out meant that my death was not far away. Mia looked at my wound on my back and smiled broadly. Mom, the scab is about to fall off. The new skin is coming out. I think I can make new clothes now. Yes, that's true. I guess I have to start cutting. Mia, could you take off your clothes and lie down? Mia took off her black dress and then started taking off her suit made of human leather as well. Then the cracked red skin she had hidden under the suit, the shape of her eyes, nose, and mouth, which were unrecognizable, were revealed. Then Mia lied on top of me, and Luna took her measuring tape and began taking her measurements. I shouted for my life while being crushed by Mia, but they seemed to think of me as nothing more than leather for tailor-made clothes. Then I heard the doorbell outside. Luna tilted her head in bewilderment and said to Mia, There's no one who'd come home. Just keep an eye on Kaylee so she doesn't scream. She hurried out to the front door and Mia whispered as she thrust a sharp cutting shear into my neck. Shh, Kaylee, be quiet or I'll stab you ruthlessly in the neck with this thing. I knew very well that Mia could never hurt my body. Help me! When I cried out, Mia startled, clamped my mouth shut, and I bit her fingers as hard as I could. I screamed once more when she collapsed, grasping her fingers. Help me! There's someone in the basement! Shortly after, the cutting room door burst open and the police rushed in. Kaylee? Yes, it's me! The police freed me and helped my way out, but Mia, who had fallen on the floor, rushed at the police with cutting scissors and swung at them. She shouted, Don't take my clothes! No, I don't have any clothes I can wear! Surprised, the police shot her and Mia collapsed and died on the spot. Then, Luna, who was being held by the police outside, screamed, Mia! My baby! What did you guys do to my daughter? Leaving behind Luna's outcry, I got out of the hellish house, got into the ambulance, and was able to meet my parents again at the hospital. A long series of murders came to an end when a sixth missing person was dramatically rescued from the perpetrator's house. The killer's name is Luna a middle-aged woman who has worked as a tailor all her life. It turned out that she lured girls of the same size into her house, murdered them, and skinned them into suits for her daughter who had a rare skin disease. This happened to me 25 years ago. I had just dropped out of college and was looking to stretch my legs and get a new job. Well... That turned out to be much harder than expected. As a college dropout, I knew I wasn't going to find much. However, I managed to get a job at the gas station on Route 52. It was very far away from really anything. The closest town was 20 miles away. The owner was quiet, kept to himself. The place was a dump and the pay was scarce. One night, August 15th, the owner had just left, leaving me in charge for the night shift. Even I had goosebumps that night. It was quiet. Peaceful, you may say. However, none the more dramatic. Fog covered the one road that led to nowhere, and there wasn't a car in sight. I was just about to close up for the night when a man entered the store. That wasn't very odd, seeing as I had gotten a few customers that night. However, the one thing that seemed out of the ordinary to me was that I never saw a car park in the parking lot. They would have had to walk 20 miles... But it occurred to me there was an abandoned house very close to the gas station. Maybe they found comfort there and needed a drink, so I carried on. I told them the station was closing soon, however they just stood there, looking at the cigarettes on the counter. Seemed odd to me, because he was a rather old gentleman. 
and I wouldn't expect someone like that to continue smoking, even if he did it in his prime. I asked him if he wanted some. He said yes. That was all he would say that night. I asked him if that would be all. He had the cigarettes in his hand. However, rather than going to the register, he nodded his head and slowly stepped closer to the door. I tried to gather his attention. However, he didn't respond to me. He opened the door to go outside. I followed him from behind. I felt a chill when I did, one that I had never felt before. He began to walk into the street. However, I didn't follow him. The reason I didn't follow him is because a car was coming his way. I yelled out one more time, Sir! Sir! But he continued walking, slower than before. In fact, then he stopped. He turned around, and he looked right at me. He slowly put out his hand, with the car coming closer and closer towards him, and pointed it right at me. I had no time to react to that, however, because a few seconds later, the car sped up and ran into him. As I opened my eyes, expecting the old man to be in front of me, no one was there. In fact, I didn't even see the car in the distance. All that remained was a pack of cigarettes that sat there in the street. To say the least, that spooked me right out, but I truly knew no one would believe my story. So, I got myself back in shape, closed up the station, and went home. I slept with a light on that night. In the middle of the night, 12 I believe, I got a call. The owner of the gas station had passed away. I thought that was very unfortunate. He was rather nice to me. However, I will never forget these words. They told me he died in a car accident. Some random pedestrian walked in front of his car on the highway, causing him to swerve into the ditch. The owner's son took possession of the store and decided to close it down. He came up to me one day and asked if I knew anything about what happened. I just shook my head and walked away. I knew he'd never believe me. I eventually moved to New York, where I went back to school and got a job as a psychiatrist. Maybe if I can't relieve myself, I can relieve others from their torment. I've never spoken of that day since it occurred. However, I have decided to post it as sort of a message to others. The dead are alive, just not in the human form. As for the old man, I say goodbye, and I hope you finally got your cigarettes. This is what happened when I was about 20 years old when I used to work at a factory to earn a living. Life working at a factory was so boring, but I've got used to it as I forced myself to work there. I got to be friends with a colleague there, whose name was Devin. He had a shaggy beard and always smelled like alcohol. He always had horror books with him and enjoyed grotesque jokes. One day, when we were chatting, he said, Hey, I just came up with an amazing idea. Then he showed me his notebook on which dozens of people's names were written. Among them were the names of the factory manager and some of his colleagues. I will kill them all within the next years. What do you think? Isn't it an awesome plan? I thought he was joking, and so I said, Are you having a hard time these days? You've lost your mind. I told you to take it easy. And then he said, No, I really found the perfect way to murder. I can make a person disappear without a single trace. <laughs> I told him, take a vacation and get some rest. I'll tell our boss for you. And I went to work, but he was looking at his notebook incessantly. A few days later, he looked much more joyful than usual. I asked him if there's any good news, and he invited me to his house saying he had something to show me. When I arrived at his house, he said there is something great in the basement and took me there. In the basement, he put on gloves and goggles and opened up a large bag. Smoke poured from the barrel and he used a big pair of tongs to pull something out of it. A bone, he said. It takes a very long time to dissolve bodies, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. This means that it's possible to murder and not get caught by the police. My body started to tremble. Apparently what he was holding was a bone of a human. He said, Would you like to go inside this barrel too? And tell me how you feel when you're inside. I'm really curious the pain of being dissolved. It is often said that being burnt is the most painful. How would that feel? I asked everyone to tell me, but they wouldn't say anything if they go inside. 
Then he suddenly grabbed me and struggled to get me into the barrel. At that moment, I fought with him with all my might. We fought, tossing and turning. But what he was overlooking was that I am very strong. After a long fight, I picked him up from the ground and put him in the barrel, and he fell inside head first. He screamed and writhed himself, which didn't last more than three seconds, and I didn't have to look inside to find out what happened to him. I ran away like crazy. I couldn't even call the police and stayed home for several days, trembling about three days past since then. And I couldn't do anything, trembling in fear, and decided to go back to his house after all. His door was still open as it was when I left his house, and the house was full of bizarre smoke and a strange smell. When I went down to the basement and approached the barrel, there were parts of his body that had melted and were hard to recognize. I freaked out and ran away. I considered concealing everything, but eventually decided to report it to the police. Investigations revealed that he had already killed about three people. Several barrels filled with the sulfuric acid were found in his house, with human hair and pieces of bones inside. And a notebook was found in his room on which he was writing a horror novel. The process of how he lured people and put them into the sulfuric acid barrel was written in detail. And the following content of the novel was about putting me in a barrel of sulfuric acid. It said that a few days after killing me, he missed me and tried to take my body back out, but my body had already melted and disappeared. I was shocked. The police asked me if I had an argument with him recently, but there was no such thing. I still can't understand why he did those things. Did he really do all that to write his horror novel? This is a story from when my grandmother was in her 20s. She is now in her 80s, but has surprisingly beautiful skin. Whenever I complimented her on her beautiful skin, she would tell me this chilling story. Now, let's narrate the story from my grandmother's perspective. In my early 20s, I worked as a maid in a grand mansion of a wealthy family. There were a total of five maids, and I was the youngest when I first started. However... All the maids working there had pale skin and looked sickly. At first, I didn't think much of it and brushed it off, but as time went on, things started getting stranger. The maids would collapse one by one every day, and I could clearly sense that something was happening to them, but they wouldn't say anything to me. Then, one day, the lady of the house called me into the shower room. When I went inside... I was so shocked, I almost fell backward. She was bathing in a bathtub filled with red liquid. The smell of blood from that moment is still vivid in my memory. She quietly said, Shall I reveal the secret to my beauty? By the way, she was in her 50s at the time, but had an unbelievably youthful face. She asked me to come closer. And from within the bathtub, she took out a syringe and pierced it into my arm, drawing blood. I tried to resist, but I was too scared to move. She took my blood and sprayed it all over her body, all the while exclaiming in admiration, Ah, it's refreshing. Then she looked into my eyes and said, I'll double your salary this month. Come to the bathroom again next week. I couldn't muster a response. As I hesitated, She held the syringe close to my neck and asked, Should I finish it all today? I had no choice but to agree. I wanted to run away, but I couldn't refuse the large sum of money she was offering. At that time, my family was very poor, and I couldn't earn that much money anywhere else. Eventually, I continued to give her my blood periodically. She said that many rich people were taking blood baths, so she wasn't the only one doing it. However, one day, she was found dead in the bathtub. The police arrived with the screams of the maids, and when they saw her body, her body was blue. And the police said that there was not a drop of blood left in her entire body. There were dozens of holes punctured all over her body, and it was speculated that someone had drained all her blood at once. Strangely, the police never found the culprit. No evidence was discovered whatsoever. Of course, all the maids had alibis. 
After that, the case of her death remained unsolved. To this day, nobody knows who killed her. But you know, I actually know the answer. I was the last person she called into the bathroom before she died. At 3 a.m., after tossing and turning in bed, I went out to the porch of the living room to light up a cigarette. It was late at night, so all the lights in the apartment across the street were off, but only one house, right across from my house, had lights on. Inside, a man and a woman were standing, facing each other, and I could faintly hear high-pitched voices as if they were arguing. Soon after, they started fighting, and after a while, the man lifted the woman up off the ground and threw her out the window. (coughs) Letting out a horrible shriek, the woman fell to the floor with her long hair fluttering, and then I heard a bang. I was so startled that I climbed up on the railing and looked down, and the woman was lying dead on the cement floor, looking horrible with her skull broken. The man on the opposite side who pushed the woman also was looking down from the railing, and when he raised his head, he met my eyes. Surprisingly, the man looked exactly the same as me. I was so shocked that I gasped, and the man looked at me in surprise and shouted something, but I couldn't hear his voice well. Is this the doppelganger that I've only heard about? I can't believe my doppelganger is a murderer. I was so shocked that I collapsed right on the spot, my legs giving out. Alex, what's wrong? At the moment, my wife, Charlotte, who was sleeping in the bedroom, came running to help me up. A man in the apartment across the street just threw a woman out of the window and killed her. Really? Charlotte was startled and went out to the porch to check. Don't go outside! The culprit is looking at our house now! I said urgently, pulling her by the wrist. I hid behind the curtains and called the police with my hand trembling. The man living in the apartment across the street killed a woman by throwing her out the window. Please, come quickly! After a while, the police arrived, and the woman's body, who had been dead with her skull broken, was nowhere to be found. And when they searched the house across the street, people other than the man I had just seen were living inside. Hey, what is all this? Even kids don't make prank calls these days. This is clearly obstruction of justice. That can't be true. Everyone withdraw. I stood there, confused by the situation when my wife, Charlotte, came up to me and said, You've been under a lot of stress lately because of the promotion exam. So you must have seen things for a second. No, I saw a woman falling from the terrace of that house and I saw her dead body on the floor with her skull broken clearly with my own eyes. And when she fell, I also heard a loud thud. If it was that loud, I would have woken up since I'm a light sleeper. I'm telling you, stress is this dangerous. Honey, calm down and have some green tea. Here. As usual, my wife handed me warm, brewed green tea. As she said, my health had been deteriorated due to stress lately, and I was diagnosed with liver and kidney problems during our checkup recently. The vision I had seen that night was so vividly embedded in my head that I had nightmares of it for a long time. The face of a man who looked just like me, the corpse of a woman with a broken skull, the movement of the man's lips shouting something at me. What was he shouting? Seven years later, the abdominal pain with no known cause that continued on for four days seemed to subside, but today I was suffering from a high fever. My liver and kidneys, which have always not been good, were now so damaged that they could hardly function properly, disrupting my daily life. I was sure that I was slowly dying from the moment my eyes met the killers who looked just like me seven years ago. I've heard that when you meet a doppelganger, one of them will die. I thought that maybe the murderer I saw that day might not be an illusion, but my real doppelganger. Watching me lose my vitality day by day, Charlotte cried often. She did not give up on me and often took me to the hospital where she worked as a nurse for a thorough examination but the cause of my illness was unknown. If I die, poor Charlotte will be alone. Charlotte's beautiful eyes, soft hair, calming voice, and even the warmth of green tea she gave me every day. 
My heart ached at the thought that there were not many days left to be with her. I recently quit my job. I got sick and couldn't work anymore. As a result, Charlotte became the breadwinner instead of me, and she had to increase her hospital hours in order to get paid overtime. I felt so sorry for Charlotte, but the pain made me helpless, and trying to fall asleep lying in bed during most of my time was all I could do. Then one day, I was looking for painkillers for the severe abdominal pain that started again, but I was running out of medicine at home, so I couldn't take them. I suddenly thought that if I drink green tea that Charlotte prepared for me every day, I would feel a little better, so I headed to the kitchen, grabbing onto my stomach. I hadn't done any kitchen work due to my busy work life, so I had to look for the green tea bag for quite a while because I didn't know where it was. And when I finally found a green tea bag in the corner of the cupboard and steeped it in warm water and drank it, I was startled. It tasted different from the green tea I had been drinking before. I thought there was a separate green tea I'd been having, so I searched the kitchen again when I ran into an automotive antifreeze hidden behind things piled up in the cupboard. Why is automotive antifreeze in the kitchen? It was something I had never seen before, which wasn't the one I had been using in my garage. Suddenly, Charlotte's strange behavior a few days ago when she entered the kitchen and hurriedly took me out of the kitchen flashed across my mind. No way. At that moment, I had a spine-chilling sensation and a feeling of foreboding overcame me. With trembling hands, I put a few drops of automotive antifreeze into the green tea that I had brewed and carefully tried a bit. Horrifyingly, it tasted the same as the green tea that Charlotte had been giving me. I went to another hospital, not the one where Charlotte worked, and received medical treatment. The doctor was surprised to see my condition and explained that my liver and kidneys were damaged due to taking in an ingredient called ethylene glycol, which is used as an automotive antifreeze. The doctor said that after taking it for such a long time, my organs were ruined and the central nervous system was seriously damaged. He said it was no longer possible to recover. This was a diagnosis I had never gotten when I went to the hospital where Charlotte worked as a nurse for the past seven years. I was told for seven years that the cause cannot be identified. Can it be possible to not know even after undergoing a checkup? If you've gotten through a thorough medical checkup, they would have been able to find out. But I don't understand. I was able to know by intuition that Charlotte and the doctor working at her workplace were on the same side. That night, Charlotte, as always, came into our bedroom after her night shift, offered me green tea, and I said I'll drink it later. When she left, I went into the bedroom bathroom and poured the green tea down the drain. After checking that Charlotte went into the dressing room and closed the door, I crept up and put my ear to the door, and I found that Charlotte was whispering in a low voice, talking to someone on the phone. He's going to die in two or three months at most, right? I've got a lot of death insurance for my husband, so the amount will be considerable. Thanks for waiting a long time, honey. See you at the hospital tomorrow. I was so surprised that I covered my mouth with my hand and hurried back to the bedroom. Meanwhile, I was dying slowly, not from the doppelganger's curse, but at the hand of Charlotte. I was lying in bed and pretending to be asleep. As soon as Charlotte, who had finished getting ready for bed, entered the bedroom, I heard the sound of her fiddling with the cup on the table, as if checking to see if I had drunk green tea. Then, after a while, as she laid her body next to the bed, I started to hear her roughly breathing, as if she had fallen asleep right away. With Charlotte lying next to me, I got goosebumps and came to my senses. Should I report it to the police right away, or should I start with collecting evidence? I eventually chose the most foolish way after much thought. I decided to directly ask Charlotte what made her decide to kill me. It seemed that I could understand this unbelievable situation only if I heard it directly from the woman I love. I woke Charlotte from her sleep at dawn and called her into the living room. Charlotte looked puzzled with a half-awake face. Charlotte, I've loved you with all my heart, all my life, but why are you trying to kill me? At my question, Charlotte replied with a panicked face. Honey, what are you talking about? I know you've been feeding me automotive antifreeze. At my words, 
Charlotte put on an innocent expression and insisted that she has no idea what I'm talking about. It's too late to make excuses. If I ask the police to get your call history with your co-conspirator, the doctor you've been having an affair with, your crime will be revealed soon. Then Charlotte, who suddenly took on a horrid look, said, You weren't a loving husband. You neglected me for a long time because you only worked like a dog. I didn't want to live with you anymore. Then we could get divorced. There's no need to murder me. I needed your insurance money. A job as a nurse cannot be a lifetime job. You bitch! Alex, you're going to die soon. You'll hate me, but think of it as your karma for neglecting me and forgive me. At least the remaining people should be well off. If you love me with all your heart, you could at least do that for me, right? What? Enraged, I rushed at Charlotte, grabbed her by the throat, and shook her violently. And in response, Charlotte slapped my face. At that moment, I lost control of myself, and I picked her up from the ground, ran out to the terrace where the door was open, and threw her out the window. Charlotte let out a shriek and fell from the 11th floor, followed by a great crash. Shocked, I climbed onto the railing and looked down at where Charlotte had fallen. She was dead, her skull shattered on the cement floor. Only then did I realize that the murderer I saw on the terrace seven years ago was not a doppelganger. I had seen the future of me today, ahead of time. I slowly raised my head with bloodshot eyes and looked straight forward and my eyes met those of a man standing on the terrace of the apartment across the street. And that was me, seven years ago. I shouted at him with all my might. Kill Charlotte! Then, in an instant, my voice dissipated feebly through the air and evaporated. The man was surprised when he saw my face and plopped down to the ground. And I could only watch helplessly from afar, Charlotte running out of the room to help him up. My name is Anika, and I am from Kolkata, India. This is the story of the man who might have been trying to steal my soul as I slept. So one day I had a dream about a guy who was in his mid-30s. I had never seen this person in real life before. In the dream, he lived in the countryside. I don't know why I was there, but he took me into his home, and his family was there. He lived with his sister, her little baby boy, and his mother. While we were in his home, he proposed to me while talking about our future together. He was especially enthusiastic about the details of us doing the usual marital activities together. I told him I wouldn't marry him and ran out of the house. I ran through the countryside to get away from this guy, but he kept chasing me. That's when I woke up. I had never had this dream before, but from that day forward, I would see this guy in my dreams every now and then. I started noticing that whenever I would feel depressed about my relationship status, this guy would appear again in my dreams. It was always the same guy. I started to think that this guy was my soulmate. I'm a very spiritual person. I thought that this person might also be spiritual and our dreams are where we can connect. I decided to tell my mother about the guy in my dreams, thinking she might provide me with some insight as to why it was always the same guy or what might be going on. She didn't care at all. I would soon find out the true nature of this guy and why he might have been in my dreams. A few days after telling my mother about this guy, I was talking to my friend, Sneha. We were talking about the random nonsense that girls talk about together. Suddenly, she brings up dreams. She tells me about a guy who she dreamt of that wanted to kiss her. I got goosebumps. I was shocked. I hadn't told her about the guy from my dreams yet. I needed to know more. I asked her for more details. Where does he live? What does he look like? Every detail that she gave matched exactly. He lived in the countryside. He was tall. His skin was a darker complexion. He had a thin mustache. This had to be the same guy from my dreams. That's when I told her everything. I told her all about my dreams and the guy within them, and that I think he shows up in my dreams when I'm depressed about being single. When I told her this, she looked shocked. That's when things started to get weird. She told me that the first time she saw this guy was the night her boyfriend broke up with her. I had chills. This guy cannot be a normal guy. He has to be someone with supernatural powers. Only, it's not the same as the heroes in the movies. 
This guy uses some kind of supernatural powers to seduce the souls of girls while they sleep in order to have fun with them, and he enjoys it. He targets depressed girls, and my friend and I were not the only ones he would target. I found news from 2006 where a psychiatrist had taken the time to sketch a man who had begun repeatedly showing up in her dreams. It was someone she did not know in real life. I found other reports online of other people that claimed to have seen the same person under the same circumstances. When I found this, I was shaking. I felt like I was part of something unbelievable, yet it was happening to so many others. Reports of this guy appearing in dreams continued to surface until 2008. Is it true? Does this guy really exist? Did he stop because he found someone to love or is he dead? I'll probably never know the truth, but I am glad I said no and ran away from him. If he truly was able to control dreams like that, who knows what sinister things he had planned if I had said yes. Recently, I went to a party with my friends and ran into someone familiar. Where have I seen him? I couldn't remember. But after a while, I remembered. He was Max, a friend who was bullied 10 years ago in middle school. Right at that moment, I got goosebumps. This was because his past, when he was always bullied by kids as he was clumsy, did not match his current appearance at all. His appearance now was that of a sturdy man. I carefully called out. Max? He replied, grinning broadly. Do you remember me now? I was about to strike you in the head because I thought you don't remember me. <laughs> Good to see you, Jack. His voice was powerful, and I could feel that he was strong as he put his arm around me. I got goosebumps. He said he had something he wanted to show me, and asked me to go somewhere with him. I was reluctant at first, but I was going somewhere with him before I knew it. I got into his car, and after a while, we arrived at a shabby house in a remote place. Max, is this your house? He suddenly got back to his appearance of how he used to be when in middle school, and shouted with a childlike face and voice. Jack, do you remember what I said to you before? What, that you said I'm handsome? No, not that. I said I wanted to cut off the kid's hands. It came to mind. When we were in middle school, he would always say that crying after being beaten by kids. I answered, uh, I do remember. Why? Then he shouted as he jumped up and down. I really cut them all. He guided me into the basement in his house. When he opened the door to the basement and went down, several men were sitting there, stunned, both with hands severed. Looking closely, they were all of the guys who bullied Max in middle school. As soon as they saw me, they shouted, Help! I screamed. Then Max said, I love my friends, but they beat me up a lot. But they don't anymore. I'm so happy. I felt that I was going to vomit. When I turned around, I realized that Max was already holding a hammer and an axe in each hand. And he told me, Jack, why didn't you save me back then? You just watched me from afar while I was being beaten by these guys. I wanted to pull your eyes out. I started shaking and told Max to calm down. Then he said, Let's play rock, paper, scissors, Jack. If I win, I'll pull out your eyes. And if you win, I'll grant you a wish. I played rock, paper, scissors, shaking, and fortunately I won. Then he let out a deep breath and asked me what my wish is. And I asked him to set them free. He shouted. I can't. I have to hang out with my friends. I kept begging him, and he replied after pondering. Okay, since they can't play rock, paper, scissors because they don't have hands, if you win instead, I'll let them go. But if I win, I'll do whatever I want. We played rock, paper, scissors again, and this time I lost. Then he hit one of the guys in the neck with an axe. With a loud scream, he fell to the floor and died. What are you doing? I shrieked and Max said, This was something I wanted to show you about myself. How I beat them up. You always had seen me suffering. At that moment, the other guy suddenly ran up and shouted, grasping Max's body. Jack, now, attack! When Max was bewildered, I ran over and struck him with all of my might, and he fell down to the ground in pain. 
Then I jumped on top of Max and punched him in the face recklessly. He cried out in pain. Ah! I'm going to have to cut off your hands too, Jack! As I continued to punch him, he almost lost consciousness and I called the police. The police arrived shortly and were shocked by the brutality of the scene and arrested Max. It turned out that Max had taken revenge on a total of four of his friends. Two of them had their hands cut off, one had his tongue cut out, and one had his feet cut off. And Max had imprisoned them there and played with them every day. This incident made me suffer extreme trauma. I've had nightmares about Max pulling my eyes out every night since then. Then, one day, I had a dream about the days of middle school. In my dream, Max was being beaten by kids. However, his appearance was that of the present as an adult. And the kids who beat him had no hands. I screamed. Then Max looked at me and said, Jack, when I get out of prison, I'm going to gouge out your eyes and then cut off your hands. Then let's all hang out together. I had a roommate named Michael, but one day a strange rotten smell started to come from his room. So I told him, Michael, your room smells of something rotten. If you have a nose, you can smell it too, right? Then he shouted, Your nose must have been rotten, and slammed the door. I was puzzled, not only because of the smell, but also because Michael's personality seems to have changed. One day at three in the morning, he shouted very loudly in his room. You are more beautiful than a goddess. I will do anything that you want me to. I didn't understand what he was doing, so I knocked on the door, then he yelled inside. Don't bother me now, Steve. I didn't bother you when you were with your girlfriend. I was so confused. So one day, when he wasn't home, I decided to secretly open his room. I found the key and opened his door. His room was neat and tidy and nothing seemed out of place. But the moment I looked in the mirror, there was a woman standing behind me, staring at me. I was so surprised and looked around, but no one was there. Then I heard the woman's voice in my ear. Do you want to play with me? Then, along with a rotten smell, I felt a hand running down my neck. Startled, I looked in the mirror again and saw a rotten skeleton beside me, touching me and whispering. I screamed and ran out of the room. I was so scared, but there was nothing I could do, and I couldn't hear anyone in the room. The next morning, when I opened the room again, there was no sign, and I didn't have the courage to look at the mirror. So I just shut the door. I was confused whether I was dreaming or seeing things. When Michael came back home later, I asked him what the hell was going on in the room. He pretended that he doesn't know anything at first, but eventually he began to tell the truth. What was shocking was that he had practiced necromancy one day out of curiosity, and a stunning female spirit appeared. So he didn't send her back and let her live in his room. I didn't believe him and told him not to lie, but when he took me to his room to show her to me, the room was obviously empty. But when he said, Cassandra, I suddenly heard someone walking in on the ceiling, and with the feeling of someone's hair touching my head, the room started to reek of something rotten. I couldn't even look up and ran out of the room screaming. Since then, her voice was heard from time to time in Michael's room. I kept thinking what I should do about this, but Michael seemed so happy, and I thought there would be no harm to me since it was what happened in their room. But one thing that gave me goosebumps was what Michael always said by habit. I will become one with you, Cassandra! He started to lock himself in his room, not coming out for days, and I started to become worried about him. Then one day, he hadn't been out of the room for so long that I knocked on the door, but there was no answer. I eventually opened his door and I was startled. He was lying on the bed and his body had swelled twice as large as if there was something inside him. I screamed and called the police. When the police arrived and checked, he was already dead and his body was filled with black liquid. As a result of the autopsy, the liquid inside his body was found to be rotten blood but no evidence was found of whose blood it was or where it came from. After Michael's death, I was lost in grief. Recently, I started dating someone new and stayed with her at my house. But the strange thing was that she kept saying this to me these days. I want to become one with you. 
Then she clung to me and hugged me tight. I suddenly got goosebumps and pushed her away, but she kept coming over to me, repeating the same words over and over again. I indulged in her moderation, but as time passed, it got worse. Now she holds me tight and keeps telling me that she wants to be with me for 24 hours so that we can become one. What should I do now? Late at night, I took the apartment elevator bound to the first floor to buy some cigarettes. The elevator stopped on the sixth floor and the door opened. A woman was standing there who was thin with sunken cheeks, tangled hair, and dark circles under her vacant eyes. When I saw the woman's feet, I was startled because she was barefooted. The woman stepped into the elevator as she grasped her stomach as if she was in pain with her head down. I glanced at her, holding my breath, staying as far away as possible from her because of her dirty appearance. She looked around the elevator floor for a long time with her head down, as if she had lost something. The strange thing was that she kept on looking around even though there was nothing on the floor. I got out of the elevator quickly, avoiding her. Feeling unsettled, when I pressed the elevator button to go up to my house after buying cigarettes, that woman was now lying on her stomach and looking around the floor. I hesitated for a moment as I was scared of the woman, but got into the elevator. When I pressed on the ninth floor button, the door closed and started to go up but the elevator stopped on the sixth floor, even though nobody had pressed on the sixth floor button. When the door opened, the woman who was lying on the floor, face down, crawled out of the elevator. Shocked by the bizarre scene I had never seen before, I spent a whole day speculating about the identity of the woman on the sixth floor. I could only come to a conclusion that she was a deranged homeless woman who broke into the apartment. A few days later, at dawn, even before sunrise, I took the elevator for a morning jog. Nine, eight, seven, six. The elevator stopped at the sixth floor and the door opened, and a man with messy hair and dirty clothes got onto the elevator with his head down. But what was surprising was that the man was barefoot, just like the woman I saw a few days ago. The man was grasping his belly, just like the woman, and looked around the floor as if he were looking for something. I was so curious about what they were looking for that I risked my fears to talk to the man. Excuse me, what are you looking for? At my question, the man who was looking around the floor looked at me, raising his eyes. His blank eyes and his creepy looking face sent chills down my spine. He glared at me and whispered, I lost something, my stomach hurts. The man blurted out incomprehensible words, lied face down on the ground, and began stumbling around, looking for something. I got out of the elevator terrified, thinking hard about what would be the relationship between the man and the woman I had seen the other day. The woman also took the elevator from the sixth floor, and the man also took the elevator from the same floor. Both were like homeless people, barefoot, grasping their own stomachs as if they were in pain, and lying on the ground searching for something. I guessed that they must be a strange couple living on the sixth floor. So I went straight to the apartment management office and asked, Hello, I'm Michael living in room 902. Is there a strange couple living on the sixth floor? There's a barefooted man and woman who take the elevator from the sixth floor. They were like homeless people. They looked so thin and dirty. A couple? Hold on a moment. The janitor looked over the list of tenants and said, There's no couple living on the sixth floor. If the couple doesn't live on the sixth floor, who the heck are they? Frustrated, I took out the bill for the sixth floor from the mailbox where the maintenance fee bills are delivered and discovered a very strange bill. There were two households on the sixth floor, 601 and 602. The water bill for room 601 was $35 a month and the water bill for room 602 was $620. What is this? How can the water bill be over $600 a month? I began to doubt room 602 at the number that couldn't be understood. All sorts of strange things must have been happening on the sixth floor of this apartment. A few days after that, I was heading to the elevator as usual, but the elevator that arrived on the first floor was about to close. 
I hurriedly ran over and pressed on the open button, and inside were two big, tough-looking men. I glanced at them and tried to press on the button, and I found that the sixth floor button was pressed. Room 602? They were carrying a large golf bag, and there was a strange, fishy smell coming from it. Eventually, when the elevator arrived on the sixth floor, the men got off the elevator, carrying the heavy-looking bag together, and I sneaked out in front of the elevator door to make sure they were entering room 602. Then, I went back to the elevator, and I found small drops of blood on the spot where they had put the golf club bag. Barefooted homeless people, water bills over $600, a golf club bag covered with blood. After returning home, I thought about it for a long time, and eventually called the police and told them everything I had seen on the sixth floor. Shortly after, the dispatch police searched room 602 thoroughly. What was horrifying was that the house had been converted into an operating room. In the freezer, they found two dismembered bodies with all the organs removed and found one body of a boy who died just a few hours ago in a golf bag. It turned out that the men in room 602 were members of an organization that specialized in organ trafficking. And after kidnapping and killing people, they invited a doctor to their house to remove their organs. The unbelievable amount billed was due to a great amount of water used to dispose the blood from the corpse. I asked the police if they had seen any homeless people during the search in room 602. Have you seen any homeless people walking around barefoot? A man and a woman. No, we haven't seen any homeless people. I'm sure I ran into them in the elevator. Then let's check the CCTV footage. Follow me. We watched the apartment elevator CCTV, and surprisingly, on both dates I saw the homeless, I was filmed alone in an empty elevator. I was so shocked to see the video of myself asking, What are you looking for? Staring emptily into space. No! I saw it with my own eyes. Am I seeing things? Three days later, an autopsy on the corpses in the freezer dismembered in pieces revealed that they were an unidentified adult female corpse and an adult male corpse. The police said the victims were probably homeless, seeing that their fingerprints were not registered. Then who were the homeless people I saw in the elevator? By any chance, were they the ghosts of people whose organs were removed in room 602? Were they wandering around? peering into the elevator floor in search of their missing organs? This story is on behalf of my friend. He was too scared to send it in because he's scared someone might find him. This story took place in 2020 in Seoul, South Korea. My name is Asahi for the time being, and I went to live in Korea with my wife or at least, that's what we were planning on. In the first few months of living there, I started working as a police officer. I got along with the other officers very well. I had a best friend named Yeon Ji, who was very superior to the rest of us. I was told that he resolved 21 crimes in just six months by himself. He was like an older brother to all of us. I realized he had missing pinky fingers but I brushed it off, thinking it was just a disability. A year later, during September 2021, Yeon Ji retired as a police officer. I thought to myself that he had just found a better job or just wanted to live a life normally, but that wasn't the case. A month later, December 2021, me and a few other police officers were having a party to celebrate one of our senior sergeant's birthday. After drinking a lot, I was watching TV upstairs, away from the others. There was a news broadcast, and the news reporter said in Korean, 24-year-old criminal Yeon Ji Sung is reported on the loose after conflict between two rival gangs. If you see this man, please report immediately. Of course, I didn't believe what was going on. Honestly, I thought I was just too drunk to think straight. But all that changed in just a few hours. As time went past, it was approximately 2.30 a.m. and everyone was gassed out. It was then until I heard knocking from the front door. I couldn't be bothered to answer it, so one of the other officers opened it. 
a gunshot went off. All of us instantly woke up to it. As I looked towards the door, I saw the officer who opened the door, dripping with blood. As my vision became clearer, I saw a man around six foot seven inches standing at the door. Of course, it may sound stupid, but all of us ran towards him. The man dropped his gun and judo threw one of the officers. He then began to beat the shit out of all of us. It was an unfair fight. I'd say it was about one versus 17. I could tell the man was trained in some sort of martial art. One of the other officers grabbed a bottle of beer and smashed it on his head. I was going to try and take him down, but then he put me in some sort of jiu-jitsu choke. I was out cold. I woke up on a hospital bed with my wife next to me. What happened? I said to myself. My wife then began to tell me everything. It was said that the man who attacked me yesterday was Yeon Ji, my own best friend. My wife also mentioned that Yeon Ji was a former Yakuza member who was caught for drug dealing in Japan. He then smuggled onto a boat to Korea. It was at that moment that I realized why he had missing pinky fingers. I was told that some Yakuza members that commit serious offenses must atone by cutting their pinkies off. This was known as Yubitsume, and apparently his name, Yeon Jing Sung, was just an alias so that he wouldn't be caught. Although none of us found out his real name, we found out about his life before being a Yakuza. We were told that he was a good martial artist who was a black belt in Jiu-Jitsu, Taekwondo, and Judo. 2022, after this encounter, my wife and I moved back to the US. I farewelled my fellow police officers and asked them to keep safe. Even to this day, I wonder how Yeonji is going. This story took place in Silhet, Bangladesh, and was experienced by my uncle, who was around 20 at the time. My uncle and four of my other cousins went on a fishing trip, and by the time they started making their way back to the village, it was getting dark. As there is very little street lighting in the rural areas of Bangladesh, and the journey back home was a few hours distance, they decided to set up camp and continue their journey the following day. They decided that two members of the group would stay awake for three hours each and then rotate to keep watch over the fish and equipment as well as their own safety. My uncle was in the first group to sleep, so after three hours, he and one of my other cousins woke up to keep watch while the others slept. The cousin who was meant to keep watch with my uncle at the time was feeling very drowsy. My uncle requested that he got some rest and he could keep watch by himself. While keeping watch, my uncle heard a sound coming from nearby bushes and trees. Assuming it was a stray animal attracted to the fish, he went with a stick and poked the bushes and the sound stopped. When he turned away, he heard the sound again and was curious as to what it was and where it was coming from. He went through the bushes and found a small clearing with a very tall tree. On further observation, my uncle noticed a figure of a woman sitting at the top of the tree. She had long, dark hair, which cascaded all the way down to the bottom of the trunk. She had pale skin and was of a thin build. My uncle, who is a quick thinker, grabbed the woman's hair as he knew she was not a human being, but a jinn. Jinn refers to a ghost or demon commonly seen in rural Bangladesh, and he knew if he did not act fast, he and the others were not going to make it to the morning. A jinn's hair is its weak point, and if a person can grab hold of it, the jinn is powerless and cannot harm the person. The woman instantly screamed when he grabbed her hair and started pulling away. But my uncle clenched his fist and did not let go. He knew if he did, he would regret it. The jinn begged and pleaded with him and said she would make him rich and powerful if he let her hair go. But my uncle clung on with all his strength. After a long time, the jinn gave up and my uncle, who was really exhausted, fell asleep with his hands still clenched on the jinn's hair. He woke up in the morning and found all my cousins surrounding him, staring at him, looking very confused. When he looked up at them and asked why they were surrounding him, they pointed at his hand. He looked down and saw a dead crow in his hand, jet black, like the Jin's hair he had been holding on to all night long.
This story took place a few years ago when I was working at my old job in London, England. I was a manager there, and the company I worked for helped people gain skills and find employment. A woman came into the office, and the receptionist had her fill out the application form to complete the course. Part of the registration was made up of an initial assessment on the computer, which would determine the level the person was working at, so we could see their strengths and weaknesses. The woman was sat at the computer, staring at a blank screen for a long time, and it was getting late. As the office was closing shortly, the receptionist asked the woman if she is happy to come back at a later date to finish the assessment. The woman did not respond and continued to stare at the blank computer screen. The receptionist then came to me and asked if I could speak to the woman and inform her that we are closing the office. I went over to her and asked if she's okay and let her know that we are closing shortly. She asked if she could speak to me privately. I accepted and took her into my office. The woman opened up and started talking to me about how her husband recently died and that he often visits her, especially at night. I thought these claims were extremely strange. I found myself just nodding and making minimal conversation as I wanted to get out of the office and enjoy the rest of my day. The woman then said something which made me freeze. She said her husband was now in the office, with us. I noticed her looking over my shoulder and I instantly felt the room get colder. I could feel sweat on my forehead and my hand was trembling. I had never been so scared in my life. I quickly texted the receptionist under the desk and told her to come to the room and say there had been an emergency and I needed to leave. She listened and the receptionist came to the room and told me I have an important phone call I couldn't miss, to which the woman replied, she is happy to wait for me. I told her the office is now closed and we need to leave the building as the cleaners need to come and do their job. She finally left the office, taking the coldness with her. I went to security and informed him to never let her back in if she was ever to come back, but she never did and I never saw her again. Hi, I'm Jin and I wanted to share this experience with you. Back when I was six or seven years old, I used to not believe in ghosts or anything considered paranormal because of my mom's influence that these are just hoaxes. But that changed when we went on vacation for the very first time to my mother's hometown. It's a province. There are a lot of trees, crops, and farms. On our way there, when we got on our second ride, which is an open window bus, there was this man who was sitting behind our seat. He looked around 50 to 60 years old, and he had a cane with him. Once he had sat down, I looked at him, and he smiled at me. My mother was asleep at that time. The man gave me a candy, and as a seven-year-old kid, I took the candy and ate it. When we arrived at our destination, I said goodbye to the man, and he smiled again. Fast forward to nighttime, when we were sleeping, at around 3 to 4 a.m., I felt sick in my tummy, so I got up, and because the bathroom was outside the house, I felt scared, but none of the people in the house were awake, and I didn't want to wake them up because they were tired from the trip. I gathered all my courage and went out to the bathroom, which is at least 10 steps from the house. Though it wasn't very far, it was just really scary. It was cold, and when I got in the bathroom, I threw up and it was green, the same color as the candy that the man gave me. Once I was done and flushed the toilet, I looked on my side and there was someone looking at me and the person was just smiling. Then it hit me that the person was the man who sat behind us on the bus. I got more scared when he started to call me by my name, so I ran back to the house. I woke up my mom and told her what happened. She first thought it's just because I was dreaming, because there was no way someone could have been there due to the way that the bathroom was built. The bathroom was at the edge of the land it was built on. There was only at least four or five inches on the side. So that means that the window was put there so no one could take a peek while someone's using it. My mother got out and went to the bathroom with me to reassure me that there was nothing wrong until she saw the fingerprints on the window. She immediately called my father to check around, 
but he saw no one. The dogs, too, didn't even make a sound. The next morning, my mom was cleaning up and was putting up her family's pictures. One particular photo caught my eye, and it was the man who sat on the bus with us, who gave me candy, and the one who I saw on the bathroom window. I asked my mother who it was, and she said that it was her grandfather who had died years earlier before I was born. I didn't tell her about what I thought because it gave me the creeps. I never truly understood what had happened that day, but I remember it like it was yesterday. This is what I've experienced when I was 25. I went to Gavin's house with Alexa, my best friend back then and her boyfriend. Gavin was a guy I just got acquainted with. After we drank and hung out together, Alexa and her boyfriend went into a separate room for their own romance. Then my partner Gavin stared at me and said, Shall we start our love too? However, I refused to because I wasn't ready to develop a deep relationship with him yet. Then he suddenly said, Then let's play hide and seek. I was a bit perplexed at the moment, but I decided to accept it in order to break the awkwardness. I went into my room, then I heard his voice from afar. The time limit is 20 minutes. If I find you within that time, you'll become mine. I crawled under the bed, giggling. After a while, I started to hear something breaking outside. I started having doubts that he was up to something, but decided to just wait. Then I heard his voice from the hallway. You have to hide well, otherwise it's not fun. Then I heard something being smashed, and the sound got closer and closer. It was just a game, but somehow I started to feel more and more anxious. The moment I was thinking about leaving, suddenly a hammer penetrated the door. I almost screamed in surprise, but I kept my mouth shut with my hands. Then he opened the door and entered the room. He was breathing heavily and was carrying a huge hammer. I started to shiver. Is he playing a joke? All kinds of thoughts disturbed my mind. Then, after a while, he slammed the closet with a hammer with all his might. There was a loud roar and the closet door slammed open. Then he said, Ah, she's not here? Too bad. If she was hit, I would have been a good shot. I realized what's happening when I saw him swinging the hammer. It wasn't a joke. He was insane. He picked up the hammer again and walked slowly around the room. I sat under the bed watching him move with bated breath. After a while, he stood in front of the bed. I almost stopped breathing. He suddenly took a deep breath and spoke softly. I can hear your heartbeat from here. Then he removed the mattress from the bed, threw it away, and slammed the frame of the bed with his hammer. The wood crumbled, and the hammer pierced right next to my head. He shouted, staring at me through the gap in the frame. I missed the mark! I crawled out, screamed, and ran frantically out of the room. He held back his hammer and followed me. I ran frantically down the hallway and slid down the stairs. He was following closely behind me. Then suddenly, the alarm rang. He stood still abruptly, looking at his watch and said, "Ah, Time is up. He stood there blankly and said, Let's play one more game, huh? There are so many places to hide in my house. My whole body was shaking and I said, I'm sorry and that I have to go home. And he kept holding on to me saying, It's a shame. I left his house, got into my car, started it, and I heard his voice behind me. Just one more game, please. I really want to have you. I immediately left the place and called the police. The police arrived at his house and discovered something shocking. At his house, Alexa and her boyfriend were found dead. Their bodies squashed flat together. It turned out that Gavin had hammered them down over and over again. But Gavin was not seen in the house. And when the police searched throughout the house... He was hiding inside a closet, then burst out and swung his hammer at the officer. One policeman was seriously injured, and Gavin was shot by the police and died on the spot. My name is Sam, and this is a true story. In fact, it's a cautionary tale, so please pay attention. This story takes place when I was in fifth or sixth grade. I'm 23 now. One night when we were heading home, my dad decided to stop at the pharmacy to buy some things. I decided to stay in the car that was parked right in front of the pharmacy, and even though my dad insisted that I go with him, I stubbornly refused. Of course, he didn't like the idea of leaving me alone in the car, but he decided to just head in without me. 
The pharmacy was located on a busy street and a lot of people and cars were passing. I remember there being a narrow, dark alley on the left side of the pharmacy that looked very creepy, that likely led to the back side of the street. But I didn't pay much attention to that alley at first. I was only in the car for a few minutes when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a guy coming out of the alley. He was a bit tanned. He was wearing a dirty white shirt and jeans and looked as if he was in his late 20s or early 30s. I remember being creeped out by him, especially since he came out of the alley looking around kind of frantically. He looked suspicious. That's when we made eye contact and he started slowly walking straight to me. The thing about his walk is that it wasn't normal. He had a bent back and his hands were in his pockets. As he walked, he would look at the pharmacy and back to the car over and over again. The whole time his eyes would come back to mine. He was staring at me. I quickly looked away, trying to keep his figure in my peripheral vision. Once he got to the car, he tried to open the door, but thankfully it was locked. I was so scared the whole time, but I didn't want to make things worse, so I just pretended like nothing was happening. He kept trying to open the door. I didn't actually have a phone at the time, So I reached into my pocket and then turned my body away from him, making a motion like I had just pulled a phone out of my pocket and put it to my ear. I was convinced he was trying to kidnap me. I glanced over my shoulder to see how he was acting as he continued to try to get in the car. He had a concerned look on his face, but kept looking back at the pharmacy. After what felt like forever, he gave up and walked back to the dark alley. His walk was so creepy as he went. After he was no longer in view, I quickly got out of the car and went into the pharmacy to look for my dad. Once I found him, I told him everything. He was so shocked and angry. He even insisted on searching for the guy, but I didn't tell him that the creepy guy came out of the dark alley. I didn't want something to happen to my dad. To this day, I haven't forgotten his creepy stare and walk. God knows what he wanted to do to me. What if my dad didn't lock the doors? And what if this guy hadn't given up? I'm still paranoid to this day and would never stay in the car waiting for someone. I'm so thankful to God for protecting me and for my dad's concern that led him to lock the door. Please, never ever stay alone in a car, especially at night. And if you must, lock the door. I'm a man who works in the sewers. That day was also in the middle of repairs in the sewer. Then suddenly... I heard something coming out of the water quickly, so I turned my head and found something crawling towards me in the dark. At first, I thought a colleague was messing with me, but its movement was so bizarre. Its shape, slowly revealed in the dark, was a figure with numerous legs attached to the human body and was crawling creepily on the water. I ran away screaming up the ladder and he was staring at me from below. I called the police as soon as I went up and they went down there and searched, but they didn't find the mysterious creature. Rumor has it that there used to be a mad doctor in my town. He was a man who was crazy about bug research, and at some point he started crawling on the floor like a bug, and he's just missing. I would thought maybe he was the one I saw in the sewers, but I also knew that no one would believe me if I told this story. I just couldn't resist the curiosity. Eventually, I went back down the sewers. Walking for a long time in the flash, I heard a faint sound somewhere. I had a hunch. I immediately pulled out the electric shocker I had brought, and at last in the dark he showed himself. He crawled towards me with his centipede-like legs. He crawled over, grabbed my leg, and dragged me away at a tremendous speed. I was dragged frantically by him and used an electric shocker on him and he collapsed screaming. His face was even more hideous when seen up close. It was definitely a human face, but it was full of green skin and black veins. I had asked him who he was, but he kept struggling to drag me away without an answer. I knocked him completely out with the electric shocker and called the police. Police arrested him and confirmed that he was surprisingly the missing doctor. And shockingly, it was confirmed that several legs that were attached to his body were attached by removing other people's legs. However, he continued to feel uneasy and did not eat anything. 
and he did not say anything, no matter how much the police asked. So eventually, the police put him back in the sewer and he crawled to his hiding place. When police followed him to the shelter, many skeletons were found, all of which were legless. It is also said that all kinds of surgical tools were placed. Eventually, police arrested him again, but he continued to refuse food and died shortly afterwards. It turns out he died from contracting germs from the legs of a rotten corpse. And what happened to him? It is still remembered as a creepy incident, leaving many questions. Do you remember visiting Santa around the holidays? Do you remember sitting on his lap and telling him what you wanted for Christmas? Growing up in the 90s, I remember always getting to see Santa at the mall or at the Santa's Village in San Bernardino. I had made the trip to see Santa every year until I turned 12. At that age, I was feeling like I was getting too old to see Santa, and I didn't want to do it anymore. Out of all the Santas I visited throughout the years, there was one Santa that I could never forget, and thinking about it today still disturbs me. I was four, and I didn't know how much danger I may have been in. This happened in the early 90s. I was traveling in the family station wagon with my mom and my three older siblings. We arrived at this big area that had a few big buildings and there were a lot of people outside. I believe we were going to a homeschooling event for my older siblings. I remember being placed in a group with other kids around my age. My mom and older siblings went off to do other things and left us in the care of some lady. We formed a single line behind this lady and I remember being near the end of the line. The lady then led us into the one of the buildings. Inside, it looked like a school with a hallway and rooms with many doors. As we walked down the hallway, I noticed a room that was pitch black. I don't remember there being a door either. That should have been my first clue, that something was wrong. I heard a noise coming from the room. It sounded like a voice that said, Psst, hey. At that age, I was curious, and as we established, I didn't know better. I stopped at the doorway and looked back down the hall. I watched the kids disappear into another room. At that point, I should have run to catch up with my group, but I didn't. I continued to enter the dark room until I heard the voice again. I can't remember what the voice said when I entered, but I started getting scared, thinking it was a monster. The voice then said, It's okay. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid of me. The lights then came on, and sitting right there in the middle of the room on a chair was Santa Claus. Santa! I squealed with delight. My sense of danger was completely gone. I went over to him and was happy to see him. I got on his lap and started talking to him. He asked me the usual questions, like with all the other Santas I met. What did I want for Christmas? Was I a good girl that year? What was my name? And how old was I? Of course, I told him. Then I just started talking to him about my life, my parents, my siblings, my house, that sort of thing. It was just me and Santa talking to each other. I'm not sure how long I was with Santa, but it was probably about 10 minutes or so. To me, it felt like hours. Eventually, I felt like I had been there long enough and I tried to leave. What happened next was more than unexpected, even to a four-year-old talking to Santa. I gotta go, I said to Santa. I remember trying to get off his lap, but for some reason, he wouldn't let me go. I can't remember the exact words he said to me, but it was something like, no, I don't want you to go. You can't leave. I tried to get off his lap again, but I felt him holding on to me a little tighter so I couldn't get off. He was restraining me. I was getting uncomfortable and I thought Santa was acting weird. That was when I started to panic. I really wanted to get back to my group, to my family, and away from this situation. I struggled like that for what felt like forever, but was probably more like 30 seconds, before Santa finally let me go. I'm not sure what went through his mind, but he probably got scared that I would start to cry or scream which would draw attention to the room, and he released me. I slid off his lap and darted towards the entryway. I stopped and looked back at Santa, and he was begging me to come back to him in a childlike voice. He was also pretending to cry. My final words to him were, I gotta go. Bye, Santa. He continued pretending to cry as I left the room. I went back into the hallway and searched for the room my group was in. I didn't waste any time getting back to my group. When I found the room my group was in and entered, I saw the other kids just sitting at the tables, coloring and chatting away. I found an empty spot, grabbed the paper and crayons that were on the table, and then colored like the rest of the kids. 
The lady that was in charge of my group never confronted me about where I'd been or what I was doing. I guess there were so many kids in that room that she didn't notice I was missing for that short period of time. When the time came for us to go back outside and meet up with our parents, we passed by that room again. Only this time, the lights were on and the room was completely empty. No chair, no Santa. And I was definitely not going to stop to explore the room this time. I'm not sure what my mom or my older siblings did that day, but I didn't bring up my encounter with Santa Claus. For some reason, I just dismissed it and carried on with what I was doing with my group. It was stupid of me not to say anything that day or when I was traveling home in the car, but I do remember bringing it up at home a few days later. My parents didn't know what the heck I was talking about. They dismissed my story as a dream or a wild imagination. I know I did not make this up, imagine it or dream it. I didn't bring it up again until a few years later. Again, my parents still didn't know what I was talking about. Then my mom said something that still disturbs me. She said, if Santa was there that day, I would have been notified about it. The way she said that made so many terrifying things click. Santa was never supposed to be there that day. Even though this happened 25 years ago, these are the details that send chills down my spine to this day. It wasn't December. There were no Christmas decorations. He was in the dark on a day when there were hundreds of kids around and there was no line to see him. Thinking back on it now, I'll never know who that man was. It's probably for the best that it remains a mystery. When that memory of my encounter with that Santa crosses my mind, I try not to think about what could have happened to me if I had stayed with him another minute longer. I should consider myself lucky that I wasn't abducted that day. That could have been the last day I ever saw my mom and my older siblings. For all you kids out there listening to this story, do not ever encounter anybody that's alone in a room or a public area. It doesn't matter if it's Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or Chipper the Chipmunk. They are still strangers. If they're alone and call for you to come over, run away. Don't take the chance. It's not worth it. I am a police officer. There was an abandoned building in the mountains of our village, and four young men who were on an expedition to the building were recently reported missing. Moreover, I heard from my senior colleague that there had been several more people missing in the building before. But even then, he said no evidence was found. After all, I visited the building to investigate the case. It was an abandoned building that was gloomy, even at a glance. There was a small temple next to it, and I met a monk there. Then I asked the monk about the abandoned building. The monk said that the building was occupied by the devil and told me not to even go near it. I snorted at him because I didn't believe such things, but the monk had a very solemn face, and he said, Never go inside the building, but if you must go there, remember one thing. If you hear something, you must leave immediately. When the devil opens its mouth, the gates of hell will open as well. I half-heartedly replied okay and went into the building with enthusiasm. I slowly looked around the inside of the dark building with a flashlight when I suddenly saw two eyes shining brightly in the dark. When I shined the flashlight, I spotted a man crawling like a snake on the floor. Then he looked at me curiously and whispered something. However, I couldn't hear what he was saying. I pointed my gun at him and shouted, asking who he is. But he kept muttering and ran away and I followed him. Then, suddenly, my vision was surrounded with total darkness, and I heard his voice, which sounded loud. My master says he is happy that new food has arrived. As soon as I heard that, I got goosebumps all over my body, and at that moment, I heard the monk's voice in my head. Get out of that building right now! You are now walking through the entrance to hell, following that snake! However, it was so dark that I couldn't see ahead. At that time, I heard the monk's sutra in my head, and it became bright again. I felt that I was not inside the building, but in a space surrounded by red veins, and heat radiated from all over the place, making me feel like I was in a pit of fire. And there was a big hole in the floor, and the inside of the hole was like the intestine of a big monster. The intestine kept on wiggling, and a number of hands came out of it that started to grab me and pull me. I fought to death, but the strength of the hands pulling me was so strong that I gradually slipped toward the hole. My body continued to be sucked into the hole as if I was riding a slide. 
and I called the monk at the top of my lungs as I tried my best not to be sucked in. At that moment, I heard the front door slam open, and I heard the monk's voice. The sound of the monk reciting Buddha sutras resonated very loudly in the building. Then I heard a scream, and all the hands that had been holding me disappeared. Soon after, the scent of lotus petals began to fill the building, and as the heat dissipated, the large hole in the floor began to shrink. I got out of the hole, and the veins in the hole that had surrounded me finally faded away. At the same time, my whole body felt weak, and I eventually passed out on the spot. When I opened my eyes, I found myself lying in a temple, and the monk was reciting Buddhist scriptures next to me. He told me that it was a close call, and told me not to ever do that again. I thanked him for saving my life, and said goodbye. Since then, I never went near the building again, and only then did I realize where the missing people had gone. This is a story about my unforgettable night with a girl I met at a club three years ago. Of course, it's not a favorably unforgettable night in a good sense. It was a horrible night. When I first saw her, she looked through the men in the club one by one as if she was shopping for a guy. I avoided contact with her eyes since I didn't have confidence in my face, but she came to talk to me. I'm curious about your voice. I was surprised, and I started a messy conversation with her, but she didn't look at my face. She kept looking at my mouth. I talked intently to flirt with her, and she smiled as she listened to what I told her. And we ended up going to her house together. I couldn't believe it all, and I was puzzled. Once she arrived at her house, she suddenly pulled out the rope and picked it up. I popped up much imagination about the item but didn't want to break the mood by asking her some questions. I tried to settle the mood and carefully approached her for kissing, but she opened my mouth with her hands and told me, You should talk. I was much puzzled, but I told her smiling, Ah, the mouth is asking you to talk, right? She then suddenly pulled a small, sharp knife out of the drawer and said, Yes, I'm also asking you to say something very sweet. Go ahead and try. I'll score the points. She picked up the knife and looked like she was trying to sting my mouth. My back was sweaty and it was hard to determine whether this situation was serious or just a joke. I said with a smile, Ah, is that right? Let's warm up my mouth for a moment, shall I? I tried to change the mood by playfully moving my mouth. She firmly told me again, I'm really curious if I caught a delicious fish today. Until now, there have only been the praise with no taste. I faced her glittering blade in wide open eyes, and I was finally able to understand what the situation was now. If I make any mistake here, I'll be covered in blood. I was sweating and thinking of this and that like crazy, and then I started talking to her. I never knew such an exhilarating night was waiting for me. It's my first time with a girl like you, the woman who made my heart beat hard like this. Tonight, I'll fear your ears with honey. She closed her eyes and smiled, listening to my voice. And I felt like this was my time, so I slapped her hands and her knife flew all over the room. And I slapped her face with all my strength again. She screamed and fell, and I punched her several times until she was half stunned. Then I quickly ran away from her house. Then I called the police and they investigated her once they arrived. Also, horribly, they heard a swallow faint groan inside her house. After searching all over the house, three men were tied up and locked in a room. However, all of them couldn't speak properly and were crying. And it turned out that their tongues were all covered with numerous knife marks. The investigation revealed that she always seduced guys at the club, brought them to her house, and forced them to say something sweet. And she scored their points by drawing their tongues with her knife. When she captured three guys, one of the three had the disinfectant poured into his mouth and pulled out his tongue because he couldn't hold back his anger, and he cursed at her. The police were shocked by her bizarre behavior and immediately arrested her. However, it is said that she asked the police and even the judge to say something sweet about her. She ended up in jail, but I was so traumatized by the shock after I met that crazy woman. 
Since then, I could not open my mouth to any woman I met due to the suffering from that experience. Maybe she would search for new guys after getting out of jail. She is just searching for a living toy that can entertain her. If you meet this girl at a club, just run away. Definitely. My name is Sarah. I'm 21 and I live in a small village in Tamil Nadu, India. This is my story. I live with my mom and my elder brother, who is 24. We recently moved from the city to the village in order to be closer to our relatives. My brother and I were very excited about the move because we both love the village. One day, the three of us decided to visit my uncle and his family. His home is located in the middle of the forest area, 20 kilometers from our home. When we arrived, I was so happy to see them all. My uncle, my aunt, and my 10-year-old cousin. We had a wonderful dinner and then relaxed together by watching TV. After a while, I started getting sleepy. Just as I was thinking about whether or not I would head to bed, I got a call on my cell phone. The TV and my family were kind of loud, so I decided to go up to the second floor of the house and answer the phone where it was much quieter. I walked into one of the guest bedrooms as I answered the phone. As I greeted my friend who was calling me, I stepped over to the window and looked out at the view of the forest. That's when I saw an unbelievable scene. I let out an audible gasp as I saw four men digging a big hole shaped like a grave. I quickly hid behind the window curtain, phone still to my ear. I told the person on the phone to hold on a moment as I poked my head slowly out from behind the curtain and peered out at the men. They were about 50 meters away from my uncle's house. Next to the grave, I saw a man who was lying on the ground. He was tied up with ropes on his arms and legs, and his mouth was covered with duct tape. He was alive from what I could tell. The window was open, so I could barely hear his muffled screams in the distance. I hung up the call and crouched down so I could get a better view from the bottom of the window. There wasn't just one victim, but two. There was a woman lying on the ground as well. Just like the man, she was tied up with ropes and duct tape on her mouth. They looked like a couple. Then another man showed up. He was on the bigger side, was probably five foot five tall, and had shiny black curly hair. He was wearing so much jewelry, bracelets, and chains that there was no doubt in my mind that he was their leader. He came and said something to those men, and they carried both of the people who were tied up and put them in the grave. Then they started filling the hole with dirt. I couldn't take it anymore. My eyes filled with tears and I immediately ran downstairs to tell my mom what was happening. She called the cops. The cops arrived in time to catch these guys in the act and stopped the couple from being completely buried. Luckily, both of them survived and all five men ended up serving time in prison. I found out later what was happening that day. The girl, that was the daughter of the leader. Apparently, she had fallen in love with someone who was considered lesser than her own family, someone she would never have been allowed to marry because it would have lowered her family's status. The bone-chilling thing that I witnessed was a father attempting to kill his own daughter, a terrifying thing called an honor killing. Here is some background information. I was in Mississippi visiting my grandma for spring break, just relaxing and having a good time with the family. One day, my dad and grandma heard about a restaurant named Claw Daddy's that served crawfish and shrimp. After we got the seafood, we went to a small convenience store. I went inside with my dad while my grandma stayed in the car. When my dad and I walked out, there were police cars and fire trucks everywhere. Me and my dad were confused because we didn't see them when we walked in the store. We got into the car, and my grandma said she saw a woman in a nearby vehicle lying her head on her arms. My grandma thought she had a heart attack. Just before we were about to pull out, a man in his 50s shouted something to my dad, but my dad ignored it. The man came to our window, and what he said still haunts me. He said, Lock your doors. A woman's boyfriend stabbed her, and she drove all the way here to the convenience store just to get help. Me and my family were shocked. It turns out that woman didn't have a heart attack. Her boyfriend tried to stab her to death. When we were driving back to my grandma's house, a police car rushed behind us. That meant the boyfriend lives in my grandma's neighborhood. My dad and grandma dropped me off and went back out to get food for my dogs while I stayed home alone. Me, just being terrified about the stabbing, 
I got my grandpa's golf club for security. While having the golf club in my hand, I called my friends to tell them what happened, and all of a sudden, my dog started barking at something outside. I ran to the door and shouted, I have a golf club, and I'm not afraid to use it. But there was no one. When my whole family came home, I felt relieved. We played phase 10, and I had to stay around them to feel safe. I barely got any sleep that night, because I didn't know if the police had caught the boyfriend yet. All I know is I saw police cars and an ambulance heading somewhere. I think the cops killed him, or he is still on the run. This is the story of a religious trip I took in the Philippines when I was 13 or 14 years old. My friends and I were staying in a two-story building with lots of rooms in Manila. The view was nice, peaceful, and quiet. On our second day there, my friend Apple and I decided to head to the showers together. The showers in this building weren't in the rooms. They were in a large space where each person had their own cubicle to bathe in. Apple went into the first cubicle, and I went into the second. As we showered, I heard my friend Violet calling for us, asking where we were. I excitedly responded, Apple's in the first cubicle, and I am in the second one. You can occupy the third one. I was excited that Violet was joining us because at that age, the thought of us taking a bath together was fun. I heard the door next to me open, the shower curtain open, and the shower began to run. As I bathed, I had a conversation with Violet. We talked about typical teenager stuff. As I spoke, Apple called out to me from her stall. Hey, who are you talking to? I didn't think much of it. Maybe Apple couldn't hear Violet as well as I could with all the running water. I responded to Apple. Violet is here. She's in the third cubicle. Oh, okay, she replied. Now it was Apple, Violet, and I having a conversation. Next, I heard our friend Lila enter the bathroom, calling out to us. I told her where the three of us were and encouraged her to use the only remaining shower on the end. Same as with Violet, I heard the door, shower curtain, and water running. We continued to talk with each other for what seemed like a long time. Now, Violet asked if she could borrow my soap since she forgot hers. I said, Of course! Then I tried to reach the wall above our cubicle since there was a space there. I was handing it to her, but she was not taking it. I said, Hey, Violet, here's your soap. No response. I waited for five seconds and no response. I shrugged and figured maybe she'd figured it out and didn't say anything. As I finished cleaning myself up, I called out, Hey, Violet, Lila, we will wait for you so that we can go back to our rooms together. Apple and I sat and waited for the other two. We could see the cubicle doors from where we were. The doors had this blurred glass, so you can't really see what's inside, but if someone moves around behind the glass, you can see their silhouette. As we sat there, not really talking, I got an odd feeling. That's when I realized that the bathroom we were in was completely silent. No running water sounds, no noise at all. I called out to the other two. No answer. I looked at Apple, who looked back bewildered. She shrugged. Worried that something might be wrong with my friends, I approached the door of the third cubicle. I lightly pushed on the door, expecting it to be locked, and it wasn't. A pit of fear grew in my stomach. The cubicle, which should be warm from the steam of the running shower, was cold. I closed my eyes and quickly pulled back the shower curtain. Sorry, Violet. I slowly opened my eyes as I spoke. I'm just worried about... I froze on the spot at what I saw, or rather, what I didn't see. The shower was empty and completely dry, like nobody had been there. I rushed out of there and went to the fourth cubicle. Same situation. It was dry, and Lila was nowhere to be found. I was trembling from fear at this point. Who had I been talking to? Did Violet and Lila already leave and I just didn't notice? I reached my shaky hand up to touch the shower head, expecting to feel water. Nothing. It was completely dry. There was no evidence at all that the shower had been used recently. I ran out of the cubicle and grabbed Apple. We ran to our room, and when we arrived, Violet was talking to another friend of ours. We asked her if she was just in the showers, and she insisted. She was not. In fact, the people in the room confirmed that she really didn't leave the room. Next, we searched for Lila and found her eating in the cafeteria. We asked her the same question. Just like Violet, she insisted she was there the whole time. Apple and I looked at each other with horrified looks. Who needed the bar of soap? What was I hearing if it wasn't the shower running? And the scariest thought of all, 
What if someone had been watching me from the next cubicle all that time? I was conducting a recovery dive in the local lake for the police, recovering the body of some idiotic kid who hadn't worn his life jacket while drinking on a party boat. The lake was deep enough to require mixed gas to avoid narcosis. I followed all the normal protocols, keeping in contact with my diving partner and monitoring my dive computer. It doesn't take long to reach the bottom, but getting back up always takes much longer. My partner and I split up to cover more ground due to the extremely low visibility. It must have been about five minutes before I saw it. A human silhouette, standing upright at the lake's bottom. I swam closer and found him perfectly preserved, without a sign of decay on his body. He was buried in silt up to his shins. It really looked like it could still be alive or had only been dropped into the water a few moments ago. I tied a line to him and started to head back up toward the surface so I could signal the boat to haul up the body. I swam up, letting the line play out behind me until I reached my first safety stop. While I was waiting for my body to decompress further, I noticed that the spool of the line was still being pulled out even though I had stopped. It was completely taut and unspooling at a blistering speed. It took me about half a second to realize that my reel was about to run out and I was about to be pulled down by the line. There was a good 900 plus feet on my line and the speed at which it was being reeled out was so tremendous that as soon as I grabbed it, my hand was split almost completely open to the bone. In retrospect, that was a foolish thing to do, but it was just basic instinct to grab the rope and try to cut it with my knife. I then had a sudden burst of clarity and cut the straps holding the reel to my suit after a few seconds before the line ran out, causing it to vanish into the murky water. Within about half a second, I felt as if though the force of the whiplash alone would have been strong enough to break my back and kill me if I hadn't cut the straps. I was pretty shaken at this point, more shaken than I had been since I'd found my first dead kid. Nevertheless, I managed to ascend slowly and take my safety stops despite the pain, fear, and, of course, all the blood leaking out of my hand. It's a good thing this was a freshwater dive, or I might have been in real trouble on my way up. Anyway, my knee-jerk reaction, and what everyone else told me, was that it was narcosis-fueled hallucinations. Divers see all sorts of crazy things when narcosis kicks in. I've heard stories of fish and squid with human faces. Some guy swears that he was face to face with Cthulhu. My point is, is that narcosis is, to an extent, like temporarily being on DMT, and it can make you see some absolutely insane things. The only thing I could make sense of was how I got the cut on my hand. It's clearly from a rope. It's not clean enough to be from my knife or any other sharp object. The doctor even noticed that I had friction burns all surrounding the cut. So what the heck caused the cut? if I was hallucinating. And if I wasn't hallucinating, what the heck dragged out the line that fast? What really keeps me up at night is that the guy was resting on the bottom of the lake and my line was going straight down. So either he was pulled through the bottom of the lake or something with incredible strength and speed grabbed my rope and was reeling me in like a fish. I'm not sure which scenario is worse. Drawing. It's my favorite hobby, and I love it. It always makes me feel better. Whenever I have a bad day, I just sit down and draw my frustrations out onto paper. I was riding my bike home from school when I suddenly fell off my bike and hit the ground hard. I looked up to see Finn Barker grinning at me. He walked over and picked me up by the front of my shirt with a smirk. Hey, Zach, he says. I could smell his breath. It smells like rotten fish. Hi there, I say, forcing a nervous smile on my face. He throws me down. You almost ran me over with your bike, he exclaims, crossing his arms while looking down at me with a frown. I mutter an apology, but that doesn't seem to satisfy him. He grabs my bike and throws it into the street. A few seconds later, a truck passes by and runs over it. I gasped and stood up, looking at my now-ruined bike. 
as Finn laughed. I ran off to my house, slamming the door shut before locking myself up in my room. I put my head down on my drawing desk. Just then, I looked up to see a pen lying on my desk. It didn't look familiar, but I took it anyway and grabbed a sheet of paper from my backpack. I began drawing a picture of a bike, already missing my old one. The pen was surprisingly smooth, and it didn't seem to smear at all, which was amazing. After a few hours, the door opens and my mom walks in. Honey, it's 10 at night. Go to sleep. You have school tomorrow, she tells me sternly. Okay. Um, Mom, did you buy me this pen? I ask, holding up the pen I had used earlier. She smiled and nodded before exiting my room. I thanked her as she walked out. Then I stood up and flopped onto my bed, quickly falling asleep. I woke up the next morning, already running late. Damn it! I mentally cursed as I jumped out of bed and quickly got ready for school. I ran out of the house once I was ready, but suddenly stopped as I gasped in shock. There was a yellow bike standing on my front porch, and it looked exactly like my old bike. Remembering I'm running late, I just push my shock aside and hop on it, quickly pedaling to school. After a few minutes, I arrived and quickly made my way to class. I entered and slumped on my desk happy I wasn't tardy. I decided to draw with my new pen to kill time. Suddenly, my friend Jimmy comes up to me. Dude, guess what I just found out this morning? He asks me, grinning mischievously. What? I ask him curiously. I found out that Finn is scared of clowns. Cool, right? We can prank him on Halloween night, he says with a smirk. I looked over at Finn, who was talking with a guy. So, he's afraid of clowns, huh? I have an idea, I say with a smirk as I grab my new pen. I rip a sheet of paper out of my notebook and begin drawing a picture of a clown. Here, give it to him, I told him. Jimmy nods, taking the drawing of the clown, and he ran off to Finn. He hands him the folded picture of the clown and runs back over to me. I see Finn just shove the paper in his pocket, not even bothering to check what was on it as he continued talking. There, Jimmy says, smiling innocently. I high-five him and we both laugh. After school, Finn gets to his house, slamming the door behind him. Hey, Dad, I'm home, old man, he yells as he closes the curtains of the living room window. It was dark outside. Finn curses and walks up to his room, throwing his backpack on the ground. He sits on his bed and turns on the TV, setting the volume very loud. He shoves his hands in his pockets and feels something. He suddenly remembers the sheet of paper Jimmy handed him in class today. He takes the folded paper out of his pocket. I swear, the kid's gonna die tomorrow if it's a stupid note, he thinks bitterly as he unfolds the paper. His eyes widen in fear as he quickly crumples the paper and throws it across the room. Suddenly, the closet door moves. He turns the volume down and looks at the door. He shakes his head. It's probably my stupid cat, he mumbles, trying to calm himself down. It happens again, and he stands up and walks over to the closet. Stupid cat! He grabs the doorknob and yanks the door open, getting ready to scold his cat. Instead, his eyes widened in fear. Standing there was a clown with tattered clothes and razor-sharp-looking teeth. Hey, buddy, what's shaking? The clown asks with a sick smile before cackling out loud like a maniac. Finn backs up and falls on his bed, frozen with fear. Get away from me, Finn yells, scared out of his wits. Oh, come on, kiddo, want a pie? The clown asks, holding up a pie that seemed to be the bad type of red. Finn screams, curling up in his bed as the clown closes in on him. Meanwhile, at Zack's house. And done. Voila! Zack exclaims to no one in particular as he holds up a sheet of paper, smiling triumphantly. The paper contains a drawing of a creepy clown with tattered clothing and sharp teeth hiding in Finn's closet. The drawing shows Finn curled up on his bed, an expression of pure terror frozen on his face. Man, I can't wait to see the look on Finn's face tomorrow when he sees this drawing on his desk, Zack says, 
putting the drawing away in his backpack. If he only knew Finn was no longer going to be a bother at school tomorrow, or for the rest of Zack's life. About 13 years ago, I went fishing with Patrick and Charles to the river. We were on a small boat, and Charles, driving the boat, said, Do you guys know what's down there? You'd better be careful if you don't want to smell alligator breath. But while fishing, as Charles suddenly drove the boat aggressively, Patrick fell into the water. Patrick was drowning and screaming as he couldn't swim, and Charles quickly drove the boat towards Patrick to save him. But the boat hit Patrick's head. Patrick, who was floundering in the water, stopped moving and disappeared into the water. I shouted at Charles to rescue him. Charles jumped into the water, dived below the surface, and came back out shouting, Damn, it's too deep! I was in shock, and Patrick was nowhere to be seen. I kept shouting, and Charles climbed back into the boat, saying, I think he's already sunk. Charles and I looked around the river, but the water was still. I was in great shock, and there was nothing I could do at that moment. I called the rescue team, and after a while they arrived, but they couldn't easily find Patrick's body because the river was fast and deep. As I returned home, I kept replaying those moments in my head. It was as if Charles had deliberately rammed Patrick. Then did Charles kill Patrick on purpose? Why? We were great buddies. My whole body trembled in shock. Charles told the police everything was an accident, but eventually he was sentenced to two years. Thereafter, I made up my mind to sever all ties with Charles. But two years later, I got a call from him. My friend, I'm here! Shall we go crocodile fishing? That's how we started to meet again from time to time. But whenever he hung out with me, he always went to only uninhabited, remote places and would always say things like this. Hey, if someone dies here, no one would know, right? I started to get creepy feelings about him. Once he told me he had something he wanted to do, which was to dig up a deep hole in the mountains, fill it up with water, put 100 piranhas in it, and drown a person in the water. As he talked about it, his eyes lit up like those of a child talking about a toy. Also, while talking about business, he said that if you want to make a lot of money, you have to film a human meat mukbang and post it on the deep web. And he seriously urged me to join him. He seemed to be a psychopath, and I thought that if I continued to hang out with him, I would be in big trouble, and decided not to have any further contact with him. That's how I haven't been in touch with him for about ten years after that. Then one day, I got a phone call from him saying he got cancer and wanted to see me before he dies. I felt sorry for him for some reason, so I went to the hospital where he was hospitalized. He was lying on the hospital bed, wasted away to a skeleton. And when he saw me, he said, My friend, we had so much fun in the past. I don't know if you know it or not, but I killed Patrick on purpose. I had missed a really big fish because of him. <laughs> and just to tell you, I've killed a total of five people so far. Do you think the stories I told you in the past were just my imagination? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna die soon but I have one last wish. Won't you grant my last wish before I die? I was so shocked that I couldn't say a word, and he continued to speak in a strained voice. Sneak a knife from the operation room for me. I want to slit the surgeon's stomach who operated on me, because he opened my stomach. I wonder how the surgeon would react if his stomach is cut open. <laughs> I left the room without saying anything and ran away. And after a while, I heard that he died in the hospital. I didn't go to his funeral. Would he be resting in peace after he had died? And has he been able to meet Patrick? I am from South Africa, and these are true stories of strange things that happened to my dad while traveling at night. 25 years ago, when my dad was 20, he and a good friend of his, Chris, were going to a funeral. They left the afternoon before the funeral and expected to arrive the next day early in the morning. It was 1 a.m. and it was Chris's turn to drive. For some reason, he decided to take a shortcut through the forest. It was so dark that they had to take their time as they drove to make sure they didn't miss a turn or hit anything that might be in the road. They came around the corner and then my dad noticed it. 
Ahead of them, just at the limit of the headlights, there was a white figure walking toward the road from the forest. Chris slowed the car down and they both looked cautiously, trying to make out what the figure was as they got closer. It was a South African woman. She was absolutely beautiful and was wearing clean, white, Zosa bridal attire. As she reached the edge of the road, she put her arm out and made the universal sign hikers use to say they need a ride. My dad and Chris were both confused, wondering why such a beautiful woman was standing on the side of the road in the middle of the forest at 1 a.m. As the car got closer, my dad told Chris not to stop the car and keep on driving. Chris reassured him that he wouldn't be stopping the car. When the woman realized that the car was not stopping, she got closer to the road and leapt at the side of the car. Chris tried to swerve and sped up a bit to prevent her from reaching the car. Just then, they heard a thud on the window of the rear passenger door. My dad quickly looked back to see if maybe she had gotten hurt, but to his surprise, she was nowhere to be seen she had completely disappeared. My dad and Chris looked at each other. Both were concerned, but weren't really sure what to think of the situation. They continued down the road in silence. That's when they smelled it, the overwhelming putrid smell of a rotting corpse. My dad, having been to a morgue before to identify a family member that had passed away, knew that smell right away. My dad considered rolling down the windows, but because of what they just saw, he decided against it. Instead, he looked over at Chris, who looked back at him with fear in his eyes. My dad signaled Chris to get them out of there, fast. It wasn't long until they were out of the forest, and as soon as they left the tree line, the smell completely disappeared. Originally, they weren't speaking while in the forest because they didn't want to breathe the smell in their mouth, but neither of them dared speak a word until sunrise. My dad knows that woman was a ghost, but never got to know what happened to her, though or why she was there, haunting that forest. I was four years old when this story takes place. My parents and I drove from our home in Johannesburg to the Eastern Cape to visit my grandmother on my mother's side. It usually takes us half a day to get there, so we would often drive through the night. The Eastern Cape is one of the poorest provinces in South Africa, and so most people live in the mountains in these homes called rondevals. It's mostly farms that you come across as you travel through the area. It's terribly boring as things go. Fortunately, my grandmother did not live on one of these boring farms. She lived near the capital city in a town in the mountains just outside of the capital. The city wasn't massive by any means and there were a few things to do, but not much. Often you hear about or see people practicing witchcraft as this was an acceptable religion in the area. My family and I are believers in Christ, so we were grateful to him for keeping us safe whenever we went there. My dad was driving through Queenstown, where witchcraft is very prevalent, and it just happened to be around 3 a.m. as we passed through. My mother and I were asleep. As he drove down the road that led out of town, he noticed a tall, skinny figure ahead of him on his side of the street. This figure was so tall and was far enough away that he couldn't see a face clearly. It was unclear even what gender the being was. The being had a huge afro and its skin was extremely pale. As the car, a brand new BMW X5, passed this thing, the thing started running alongside the car on his side. My dad was freaked out and decided to drive a bit faster. No matter how fast he drove, the thing kept running next to the car and there was no way a normal human being could keep up with him as he drove like that. It kept following, so he kept speeding up, going so fast you'd think he was a Formula One racer. Still, this thing kept up with the car. Suddenly, the thing slowed down and my dad, who was still trying to put distance between him and the thing, saw it watching the car from his rear view mirror. My dad fortunately remembered that he was quickly approaching a sharp turn and slowed down in time. This really freaked him out. If he had kept driving as fast as he was around that turn, then we surely would have crashed. That's when he realized that being was after us. It wanted us to have a car accident and die. To this day, my dad believes that thing was a zombie. I was around six years old when these two very strange events happened in one night. We were on our way through Eastern Cape. Around 11 p.m., I was asleep in the back seat and my dad noticed the car was running low on petrol. Luckily, my dad spotted a garage, which is also a gas station, before we ran out. We've done this trip a number of times, but my dad insisted that he'd never seen this garage before. What was even weirder is that it was in the middle of nowhere. 
Standing outside of this garage was a group of eight ladies in uniforms. We recognize the uniforms as church uniforms, which is a common attire in some churches in South Africa. Unlike most places, this garage didn't have employees to pump the petrol into the car for you. This struck my dad as odd. He went inside to pay and then came back out to fill the car. As he was filling the car, he glanced in the direction of the church ladies and realized that they had moved closer to our car compared to where they were when we first pulled in. What was weird about that is that he didn't hear any footsteps prior to that. He turned back to the car for a moment, and when he glanced to see if they were still getting closer, he was face to face with one of the church ladies. She stared deep into his eyes with her eyes wide as if she was possessed. She started loudly speaking a language he could not understand, which is very weird because my dad knows every language in South Africa. There are 11 of them. My mother saw what was happening, but she was trembling with fear in the car, uncertain of what to do, and frozen in her seat. The woman started speaking faster. While this was going on, the other ladies were getting closer and closer to the car and were starting to form a circle around the car, but they were completely silent. Suddenly, the woman who was chanting who knows what looked into the car and directly at me. I was still passed out in the back seat. My father describes the way she looked at me as evil. While the lady seemed distracted looking at me, my father quickly finished pouring the petrol and drove off. As we pulled out of the station, my mother looked out the back window and the ladies were gone. My dad is sure that those ladies were witches dressed as church ladies to make themselves look harmless. The second incident happened around 5 a.m. when we were just about an hour away from my grandmother's house. By this time, my dad had been driving all night and was very sleepy. He said that he closed his eyes for one second and the next thing he saw was a sign saying, welcome to Jamestown. My father was extremely shocked by this because we had passed Jamestown three hours ago. What's even weirder is that we arrived to my grandmother's place four hours later, as if our car had somehow teleported back to Jamestown. It was on that day my father decided to change what time we left our home to go to my grandmother's. He was determined to avoid driving through that area at night ever again. This also helped my grandmother, who would call and check on us through the night, more and more frequently the closer we got, and that meant she didn't sleep all night and instead prayed for us while we were on the road. Her phone calls really helped my dad stay awake. Sadly, my grandmother died when I was nine. She'll be terribly missed by the family. As for my dad, I can safely say I think he'd rather forget the strange and terrifying things that happened late at night in the eerie countryside of Eastern Cape. Hello, Wanzi. I am Freddy from Indonesia, a medical doctor working in a hospital here. I'd like to share some of my personal experiences that continue to perplex me. This incident occurred five years ago when I was a medical student during my internship at a hospital. It was a night shift in the pediatric ward department. Patient numbers were low, particularly in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. I recall there being no patients initially until a new baby arrived. The baby's mother had tragically passed away in the hospital due to postpartum bleeding. The baby was born underweight, only weighing 1,500 grams, and was frail. The father, understandably devastated, wanted to take the baby home against medical advice. However, the doctor prohibited this. This particular pediatrician was known for being stern and even intimidating when teaching interns, but he was always compassionate and friendly towards patients. Around 2 a.m. that night, when both the nurses and I had completed our tasks and were attempting to rest briefly, the pediatrician unexpectedly arrived to visit the baby. This was highly unusual, as he typically visited patients during the morning hours. I presumed he wanted to assess the condition of the newborn patient. When asked about his nocturnal visit, he remained silent. His countenance appeared pallid and unusual. He promptly entered the NICU without explanation. Despite having five patients to attend to, he solely focused on the newborn baby. He became visibly distressed upon observing that the nasal oxygen supply for the baby was not positioned correctly. He carefully lifted the baby, embraced it tenderly, and shed a few tears. Following this, he placed the baby back into the incubator and departed without any verbal communication 
or record entry. This left us baffled, but we resumed our duties and tried to rest once more. At approximately 7 a.m. the following morning, the doctor revisited the NICU and asked me, Was there a newborn baby patient here in the NICU yesterday? I need to examine a new patient. I responded that he had indeed visited the patient the previous night. To my bewilderment, he appeared confused and denied visiting during the night. He even suggested I might have been dreaming. The nurses and I were left astonished, and to this day, we continue to wonder. If it wasn't the doctor who visited, then who could it have been? I've always lived at the same village for my entire life. It was a nice place for everybody else, but when I was younger, I could always apparently see things that most others couldn't. I still believe in what I saw since there's no way I could have made those things up as I wasn't allowed to watch anything scary on the TV because of my parents. My village was actually built on top of a huge graveyard and a lot of people were killed on the streets and in the houses during the war that happened 30 years ago. I constantly had nightmares and heard voices but nobody believed me. The scariest experience I ever had has to be the time that I was walking my dog. He was a basset hound and a gentle giant that would never hurt a fly. My house is near a big forest and near a river. I was never scared to go exploring. To get to the forest, we had to go in between tall bushes and down a path that had a cliff next to it. It was the only way in or out. We went further down where the river was and while my dog walked around, I sat on an old boat that looked like it hadn't been used in decades but it seemed sturdy. It was a pretty quiet day without any wind when I heard something walking behind me. I turned around just to be greeted by nothing. I shrugged it off thinking it was probably a small animal or something in the tall grass. Sometime later, I heard somebody say my name. Marco. It came from a deep cracking voice. It didn't sound human. I jerked my head to where I thought I heard it, and I saw a tall, humanoid figure without a head and two glowing red eyes that seemed to be on its chest. I knew I wasn't imagining it because even my dog was barking at it. When I saw it, I turned my head pretending there was nothing. Usually that was the best working option for me in previous paranormal experiences, but it continued. Marco. Every few seconds, I decided to keep pretending I saw nothing and got my dog to go back up. I started walking with a normal pace so I don't look suspicious, but it didn't stop. Marco! Marco! Every few steps, I turned around to look at my dog secretly looking at where the creature was and he seemed to continue hugging behind trees, following me. A few minutes later, I could finally see the road, but I was still scared. I started smelling a rotting smell, like rotten eggs and sweat were combined. And all of a sudden, Marco! It screamed my name. Me and my dog started sprinting towards my house. When we finally got there, I shut and locked the door and peeked out of the windows. It stood behind a tree in front of my neighbor's house and just vanished. I was shaken and waited for my parents to tell them what had happened. Of course, they didn't believe me. They never did when I told them these crazy stories. The next day, I went to walk my dog on another path and staying closer to my house. I saw police in front of my neighbor's house. When I got back home, I asked my parents what happened and they seemed very shocked. Turns out the neighbor stabbed his wife and fell into the river and drowned. He died right before I went down there. I have a theory that the spirit was his, but I don't know what its intention was. Was it to harm me as well? To tell me to go to his house and see what he did? I've always been puzzled by it, and still am, but at least my parents believe me more when I tell them something paranormal happens. This is something that happened to me a few years ago when I was living with my family next to a neighbor who had a very old house. Every day, I would play with my cousins and little brother in my backyard. We could always see the neighbor watering her plants. 
She had a pond in her yard where the ducks she owned would joyfully swim. We'd occasionally see her feeding them when she was tending to her yard. One day, her ducks went missing. We tried to help her find them, but weren't able to. There weren't any wild animals in our neighborhood, if you don't count stray cats. But there's no way cats would have eaten these big ducks. Around that same time, my grandma would tell me that there was a girl in a red dress always walking on the roof of my neighbor's house at 3 a.m., but it's only there for an hour. I didn't believe it at first, but my neighbor kept experiencing strange mishaps. One time, while I was playing with my little brother, I heard a scream. I looked over the neighbor's fence to see if everything was okay. When I did, what I saw was horrifying. By the pond, there used to be a pile of regular sticks, but this time, there was a stack of bloody bones and skulls instead. I looked from the pile back to my neighbor, who was standing there frozen. When I looked back at the pile, I could see that there were bugs and insects crawling here and there on the bones, and the smell. There was a putrid smell carried on the soft breeze to my nose. It made me sick to my stomach. Fortunately, my brother was too short to see over the fence. Even though he wanted to see for himself, I did not let him. I didn't want him to be traumatized like me. That night, I couldn't sleep. I lay in my bed, the image and smell of the pile of bones still vivid in my mind. I glanced over at the clock after a while. It was 12.59 a.m. Just as the clock switched to 3 a.m., I heard two metal objects banging in my backyard. There was a window in my room, so I got out of bed and walked over to it, trying to see what the noise was. I was horrified to see a girl in a red dress walking on the fence. Her hair was dark and very crazy. Her skin was pale, and from where I was standing, I couldn't see her eyes. Just as I started to wonder how she could walk on the fence like that, I realized that she had two horns coming out of each of her feet. I was frozen in place, unsure what to do. Just then, she let out a horrifying scream and jumped into my backyard, landing on all fours. She twisted her neck and looked directly at the very window I was standing in front of. That's when I saw it. Her eyes weren't there. No eyelids. Nothing. Just dark and empty sockets. In an instant, she rushed to my window, and when she got to it, she started banging on the window like she was trying to break it. I fell back away from the window, captured by absolute fear. I screamed, but no one seemed to hear me. She kept scratching and banging at the window, screaming this awful, gut-wrenching scream. I couldn't move, but I could now see, as I stared directly where her eyes should be, that her eye sockets were full of this thick, black liquid, and there were insects crawling in and out of the gross liquid. The entire encounter felt like it took only a few minutes, but when she disappeared and I no longer felt frozen in place, I looked around and noticed that it was now 4 a.m. I was stuck there in terror for an entire hour. Just like my grandmother said, it disappeared at exactly 4 a.m. At this point, I was shaking so badly that it was almost painful. I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I will never forget that night, especially her face. I will remember that horrifying sight until the day I take my last breath. Human can either be an angel or a devil, and that choice is wholly up to each person. I've dated a devil. I've also realized that it takes only one second for a person I thought was an angel to turn into a devil. My ex-boyfriend, Nick, was very sweet. When he drove me home after dating one day, I realized I had left my wallet in his car, so I went back and heard him talking to himself in his car. Damn it, Nick, be patient. The more you wait, the more thrilling it will be. He was talking to himself with a knife and a duct tape in his hand. I was surprised to see a new side of him, but I pretended that I didn't hear him and called his name because I thought I would be in big trouble if he picks up on it. Then in an instant, he hid his knife and looked at me with a friendly facial expression. I was so appalled, and I wanted to break up with him, but first I thought I should gradually disentangle myself from him. A few days later, he called and asked me out on a date, but when I said no, he yelled at me. You don't want to date me? Then I'll force you to date me. <laughs> and from that day on, the nightmare began. One day, he was hiding in front of my house, and when I bumped into him, he came running with a knife, shouting, Do you want to become prettier? I'll perform plastic surgery on your face. He swung the knife at me in the face and I fell down as I tried to avoid it and crawled to the front door. Then he put the knife over my waist and shouted, Would you like to get liposuction too? 
I screamed and ran into the house. Then he pointed at me outside the window and shouted, Manager, how much is this pig? (laughs) He looked at me and kept laughing. When I shouted that I'm going to call the police, he quickly ran away. And after a while, I got a text message from him. The text read, doesn't it hurt? And a video was attached. When I played it, I found that it was a video of him stabbing a pillow with my picture on it with his knife recklessly. I shuddered in shock the next morning. When I looked at my phone, I saw that I've received 100 text messages from him. The text messages read, There's no way you can avoid me except dying. The moment you wake up would rather be in the beginning of a nightmare. If you want to live, come back to me, then I'll wake you up from your nightmare. I vomited and called the police. He seemed to have settled down after being warned by the police, but this wasn't the end. After a while, he sent me a text message saying he was sorry, and he came to my house again. As soon as he saw me, he knelt down, begged, and wept. I felt sorry for him, and when I told him that I'll accept his apology if he goes back home, he shouted, suddenly running towards me. If this doesn't work, we have no choice but to meet in our next life. Then he strangled me. I screamed in pain, and he continued. Please remember me, even when you're reborn, Amanda. I screamed for help, and he covered my mouth with his hand. Help me! Shh, my love. I bit his hand with all my might, and he screamed and removed his hand. Blood flowed from his hands. Ah! How dare you bite me! Oh, yes. If you want to become a dog, I'll treat you like a dog. He unfastened his belt and whipped me as if it were a whip. I ran out to the front door and dashed off. He followed me closely, but when he saw the neighbors who came outside after hearing me scream, he ran away. I blocked his number and texted him that I will call the police if he shows up one more time. I haven't heard from him since then, and I don't know what happened to him. I don't even want to think about it again. Perhaps, at this moment, another woman may become his victim. It was exactly 3 a.m. and my dog, who usually sleeps outside, started barking loudly. So loudly it woke me up. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't. I got up and looked out the window to see what the problem was. He was barking at the gate used to enter our courtyard. I couldn't see what he was barking at from the window, so I decided to go outside and see for myself what he was freaking out about. This gate is joined by a wooden fence. From the door of the house, you can see the road. The moment I opened the door and stood in the doorway, he stopped barking. I looked around and still couldn't see anything because of how dark it was. After a few seconds, and since the dog stopped barking, I headed back to my bed. I lay there for not even three minutes, and the dog started barking again. Again, I went outside, and just like the first time, the barking stopped. And just like before, I looked around from the doorway and saw nothing. I went to bed, and the dog would bark again. This whole process happened twice more. The last time, I decided to actually step out of my door and look around. Just like before, the dog started barking, but as I looked around, I saw something moving on the other side of the fence in the corner of my eye. I quickly turned to see a black figure running on all fours like a dog, only it was definitely not a dog. It was a strange dog-like thing with no hair, completely black from head to toe, and it was running away all creepy, as if it had no bones. I decided to just ignore it as some strange animal of the night, and it probably looked weird to me because I was so tired. I didn't pay too much attention. My dog was still barking at the gate, though. I walked into the yard a bit further to get a better view of the rest of the courtyard. I wanted to see if anyone else was there. There was no one. I started to head back to the house, and just as I did, a wooden stump flew into my yard and landed where I was just standing. I turned to see the stump firmly embedded in the ground. Without thinking twice, I grabbed my dog and I ran inside. I locked the door behind me, went straight to my bed, and hid under the covers. There's no way I was going to sleep. I just sat there, rocking back and forth under the covers until the sun started to shine through the window and I could hear the morning birds chirping. As soon as I heard my mom was up, I went to her and told her what happened. She tried to come up with a logical explanation to put me at ease but I could tell even she didn't know what could have happened or what that creature might have been. I still shudder at the thought of what would have happened to me if I hadn't turned to go back in the house right at that moment, and that stump had actually hit me in the head. What kind of creature was that? 
The more I think about it, the more I'm sure. That wasn't a dog. As I locked myself in the corner of my room every day and haven't smelled people's breath. But I didn't know that this game addiction would turn me into a hero. That day, I was defeating bosses in the dungeon yet again. Bow your head before my champions, or I'll crack your skull wide open. <laughs> I was playing the game happily for a while, but suddenly I heard my mom yelling from the first floor. Mom? I muttered to myself while playing the game. I clearly told you not to bug me when I'm slaying a dragon. Then I heard the sound of a window breaking and my mother screaming. I was shocked. It was clear that something had happened. I went to the stairs and looked down on the first floor to see a masked man holding a knife and tying my mom's hands. My blood boiled, but I quietly went back into my room. I never thought I would be using you for something like this. In my room was the Stag Knight's armor. I had spent all my money to custom make it to the highest standards. I put on that armor, grabbed the huge shield and axe, and went down the stairs. As I pounded down the stairs in my heavy armor, the robber looked at me, and I could see his pupil shaking under his mask. I ran over and hit the robber on top of his head with the axe and he fell down screaming. He trembled as if he was surprised I could do such a thing. Of course, it wasn't a real axe, but it was so heavy and hard that it was a legitimate weapon. He tried to stab me with his knife, but it was useless against my armor. I shouted the name of a skill and hit the top of his head with an axe again, causing him to pass out. I then called the police and they arrested him when they arrived. From then on, my mom loved that I played this game, and I became a hero. I used to enjoy mountain climbing as a hobby, but now, when I hear the word mountain, I shudder. About six years ago, I was hiking as usual, and came across a cave. There were bones in the cave. I didn't know whether they were from animals or people, and I was chilled to the bone when I saw them. I walked into the cave to get a closer look at the bones. To my surprise, a strange figure, like a small human, was crouching in the cave. I shouted in surprise. Gosh, what are you doing here in this dark cave without light? But it did not move an inch, like a statue. I moved closer. It looked like the back of a very small child sitting crouched. I approached and said to it, Hey kiddo, this is, this is pretty dangerous. However, when I looked at its body up close, I realized it was made of thin, wood-like bones. It then turned its head quickly, and I could see several large, insect-like eyes on its face, and dozens of saw-like teeth in its mouth. Then its mouth doubled and unfolded, suddenly spitting out strange liquid toward me. I felt an enormous pain as the liquid got on my face and body. I tried to wipe it off, but it was stuck hard, like glue and I couldn't make it come off, no matter how hard I tried. I attempted to run away, but it grabbed my thighs with its legs. Its feet felt like scissors, and the tips were sharp like knives. Its feet pressed against my skin with tremendous pressure, and it began to tear my skin. I screamed, ripped its legs off, and ran away desperately. It rushed to chase me, jumping to heights. I ran for quite a long time. And when I finally got out of the cave and turned around, it didn't go out of the cave, it went right back into it. I called the police and explained exactly what I saw, but they didn't believe me. They told me that I had just seen something wrong. I was so angry, but I couldn't help it. I looked at my face and body in the mirror when I got home. My skin was covered with red scars and a thick and clear liquid and the skin on my thighs was seriously torn with bloody gashes. I called my uncle Jake, a tough guy who had been hunting for a long time. I told him what I had seen and asked him to capture it. Then he said, I don't know what that is, but I don't forgive the bastard who dared to spit on my nephew's face. I'll catch it for you. Prepare some barbecue to grill him hot. I met my uncle Jake a few days later and we went into the mountains together. I tried to find the cave again, trying to remember the location of the cave where I had seen it. We searched for a long time and finally found the cave. We slowly crept up to the cave and noticed the same thing was just on the inside. It was just sitting there, in the cave, 
Crouching back, it was the same thing that I had seen before. I yelled at Jake, and he slowly approached, pointing a gun at it. Then it suddenly jumped and started spitting the strange liquid at us. Jake clutched his face, screaming in pain, and dropped the gun. It then jumped toward Jake, grabbing his arm, and started biting him. Jake's tremendous screams shook the cave, and I could hear the bones snap in his arms. When I saw it, my body stiffened with fear, and I couldn't move my legs. Jake's arm was torn wide open and bleeding, with his blood pouring out, and I thought he would die. I ran over, picked up the gun, aimed it precisely, and pulled the trigger. But it pounced on me even after being shot. I shot it again and again. Then it jumped up and down to run away and fell to the ground. I immediately called the police, and they arrived after a while. They were shocked when they saw its body and took it to the station. After that, all I heard from them was that doctors were investigating the mysterious creature's body, and I haven't heard anything since. Jake was transferred to the hospital and had to undergo surgery due to severe damage to the tendons and ligaments in one of his arms. The doctor said he would have died if he hadn't accidentally severed his artery. Jake said it felt like someone cut his flesh with steel scissors when it bit his arm. After that, Jake no longer goes hunting and always tries to avoid talking about the moment we had in the cave, and I could see his whole body shivering every time I brought up the story. This story happened in 2007, as far as I can remember. I was 11 back then and my family and I went to Sri Lanka for our summer holidays. It was a normal vacation by visiting family there and enjoying the food. We were on a road trip with my uncle, auntie, and my cousin. We planned on visiting the temple, which was located on the southeast coast of Sri Lanka. We prayed, fed the holy cows there, and ate some really good temple food. My dad even cut his hair, as is tradition ritual when you're wishing someone the best of luck. So it was a pretty fun family day, as you say, with no complaints. It was starting to get a little dark, and by dusk, my uncle and my dad decided to look for a motel to stay for the night, so we could get some rest, before we had to head home the next day. They found a motel nearby the temple, but still out of the city, which was very dry, as far as I can remember, and there was nothing but dry, dusty earth. Behind the building was a wheat field that led to nowhere, but the building was in good condition for its location and age. However, we got two rooms on the top floor on the fifth story, one for my family and the other one for my uncle and his family. Our room was pretty small, but enough for five people. There was one large bed and one single bed. Right in front of the large size bed was a dresser with a TV on it, and next to the large bed was the bathroom with a small window in it. After we got our rooms, I remember we went to the city for dinner and came back to the motel around 10 o'clock. My oldest sister, who was 19 back then, and my brother, who was 9, shared the large bed together while my parents slept in the bed next to us. We fell asleep and were hoping to sleep through the night because we were all very exhausted from the heat. We knew we had to get up early the next day, so our mom told us that we must get to bed immediately. By about midnight, I can't remember exactly what time it was, but it was very dark. I heard a noise coming from the end of my bed, right in front of the dresser. Because of the moonlight faintly shining in, I could barely make it out. I saw my dad was taking something out of his wallet. I wasn't thinking much of it, but still was wondering why he had to do it at midnight. I fell back asleep and didn't think much of it. A few hours later I was awoken again, this time by the terrifying noise and scream from my auntie's room next door. I looked to my left and saw that my parents weren't in their bed anymore. While my auntie was screaming and shouting next door, I suddenly saw my mom run back into our room, take off her wedding chain from her neck and throw it under the bed. Now at this point you should know, that a wedding chain is a wedding ring in our culture, which is a holy chain made from a lot of hard work and is extremely valuable. 
She went back to my auntie's room again, and I looked to my right and saw my brother and sister were also awake. I asked my sister what happened, but she didn't know what was going on and was trying to comfort us. I just know how scared and cold I was. All three of us started to tremble and shake with fear. After five minutes, my mom came in and gave us a hug. We weren't crying, but we were so incredibly scared, our hearts were beating out of our chests. I'm not sure how it is in the western parts, but we originally lived in Switzerland. However, I noticed that in places like Sri Lanka or anywhere in the southern parts of India, women tend to cry very loudly. As a child, this could be quite distressing. We weren't accustomed to such intense displays of emotion, especially when someone cried out in pain like my aunt did. Her crying made the situation even more unsettling, yet at that time, we didn't fully understand what was happening. After an hour, we fell back asleep because our mom told us to. In the early morning, my parents were awake and were talking about the incident last night. My mom started to tell the horror. By night, a burglar climbed up to my uncle's room on the top floor, right next to our room, and stole a $5,000 wedding chain from my auntie, and also the car key to our van. My uncle woke up because of a noise from the bathroom, investigated, and caught the burglar trying to flee out of the window. When he tried to grab him, the burglar fell out of the window to the ground and disappeared into the wheat field. They chased him through the wheat field, but couldn't find him. The guy escaped, and even the police couldn't find him. Thankfully, we got a second key for our van, packed up everything, and went directly home. Before that, my uncle wanted to make sure that the burglar hadn't left anything behind while running away, in hopes that we might find a clue. However, despite our efforts, we couldn't find anything. My auntie was sad and barely spoke while driving home because she was so traumatized by the incident. While we were driving home, my dad made sure he had everything and looked into his wallet and realized that a small picture of his father was missing and so was his cash. That's when I realized that the man in front of the dresser wasn't my dad at midnight. It was the burglar himself. I don't want to know what would have happened if that guy realized that I was awake and looking at him. I'm glad it was dark so he couldn't see me, but it also freaks me out when I think about that it actually was the guy who took my auntie's wedding chain and the key of our van. Ever since then, I always make sure that the restroom window and the door to my hotel room is completely locked and deadbolted. This is the story of what I experienced in a strange town that I stopped in during my road trip. The small town where I stopped for gas and food was surrounded by dense forest. Strangely, there was no staff at the gas station, and the restaurant was empty with no one. But the store doors were open, and it seemed people were there since there were some leftovers on the tables in the restaurant. I wandered around the town, but it was strangely dark and cold as if the sun was not shining at all. Then I found dozens of people gathered in one restaurant. I went into that restaurant. The door was jingling open as I came in. However, no one looked at me, and they were just eating and exclaiming. Then one guy looked at me, eating something with his mouth full of yellow liquid. I was stunned for a moment. Then he said, It looks like you are from other towns. How did you know we eat healthy food here? Healthy food? I approached them, and all the people in the restaurant were eating something. Upon closer look, it... It was the corpse of a gigantic, monstrous creature that I had never seen before. It had yellow skin, two large snake-like heads, and limbs with a massive body over seven feet tall. I screamed, but people paid no attention and focused on eating like crazy. I asked the man what the hell it was, and he rolled up his forearm and showed it to me. Look at this. As he exerted his strength, the muscles swelled enormously. I was startled, and he suddenly grabbed me by the collar and lifted me to the ceiling. I screamed in shock. He just lifted me like a toy and threw me onto the floor. I was panicked, and he laughed. I can feel my power that I can tear you to death with my bare hands. I have too much power. This meat gave me this much power. 
He held a piece of meat in his hand and showed it to me. There was a subtle light. Having this meat also makes me feel great. It's like taking medicine. Do you want to try this? How much money do you have? <laughs> I scanned the faces of the people one by one. Their eyes were all red and bloodshot, and the muscles all over their bodies were so swollen that their clothes were about to tear. I said I just wanted to use the gas station and the restaurant, but people told me, Food is just trash. If you want to be healthy, you should eat something like this. I felt too nervous and just went out of the restaurant. I decided to wait at the gas station. After a while, the gas station staff came back and said, Do not ever tell anyone what you saw here. I asked why and he replied, This is rare because there are only a few of them. Only we can eat it. As he spoke, the muscles throughout his body cramped and he breathed heavily. I left the town in great confusion, and it seemed I would never go there again. But a few years later, I stopped by the town while on another road trip. However, unlike the past visit, the village was completely empty. It looks no one was on the streets, and all the houses, shops, and restaurants looked long since ruined. I was shocked again, and I asked about the town when I arrived in another village dozens of miles from there. And I heard that the people in that town had all been attacked and killed by something unknown. Even more horrifying was that all their bodies were found only left with skin, empty of flesh, bones, and organs inside. However, the police said that they have never been able to identify what made them that way. The only evidence was the unknown yellow liquid buried all over the town in the footprints of an unknown giant beast. But it is also said that the origin of the footprints was unidentified, and it remains unsolved to this day. I was appalled. I wanted to talk about what I had seen, but my body shook severely, and I couldn't speak at all. What the hell happened in that town? I am a night person who likes to jog around my neighborhood at night. I did the same on this day around 13 years ago. I changed into my sweatshirt around 9 p.m. and went outside for a run. As I ran outside, I enjoyed taking the cool night air into my lungs. I suddenly heard footsteps from somewhere and turned toward where I thought the sound was coming from. I could see a man coming towards me, swinging his arms. He was Nicholas, one of my neighbors. He had one hand on his neck and his white t-shirt was stained with blood. I was surprised and asked him what was going on, and he shouted, MY BLOOD! He then collapsed on the ground, bleeding from his neck. I slowly approached him with hesitancy, and saw another man at the entrance of Nicholas's house. He was dancing behind the collapsed Nicholas. The man was wearing a weird costume, like a red cape. He looked at me, brightly smiled, and yelled, You won't die, because I haven't drunk too much. Then he laughed and rushed off into the darkness. I supported Nicholas and panicked because I had no idea what was happening. He was half fainted and said, That bastard sucked all my blood! He looked pale and weak. I called the police and the strange man in the red cape had already ran away by the time the police arrived. The officers left to track him down. Nicholas was later transferred to the hospital where they expected him to die from excessive bleeding. A few days later, his testimony to the police was released, and it was shocking. On the night of the incident, someone knocked on the door while he was alone at home. He opened the door, and a man said he was thirsty and asked for something to drink. When Nicholas tried to give him water, the man said, There are no nutrients in water. The ones I need are in your body. And forcibly climbed onto Nicholas's body pulling out an iron straw to suck blood from his neck. When the police heard Nicholas's testimony at first, they said it was an unbelievable claim. However, the police began tracking the culprits and several pieces of evidence were found in his home. Not long after the tracking, the police caught the culprit, a crazy man who claimed to be a vampire. His straw was made of iron and the tip was as sharp as a knife. He had assaulted people in the middle of the night, sneaking inside the alleyways, sucking their blood, and leaving. Then, he became bold enough to enter another person's house. He said that he thought Nicholas's blood would be very delicious, 
as soon as he saw Nicholas's face, and he was right. He also told the police that he should choose his object carefully since each human has a different taste in blood and selecting the wrong person with unfavorable blood does not quench his thirst at all. He then reportedly smiled at the police officer and said, Mr. Policeman, your blood must be salty and sour. Let me suck your blood a sip and I'll tell you my secret. The police got angry with him and the man proudly said that he had sucked the blood of more than 50 people. The man eventually ended up in prison and Nicholas suffered severe trauma for some time. He lived in his house plastered with crosses and moved to another city altogether at the end. However, 10 years later, a rumor began that a vampire had again assaulted the village. As I thought of it, I wondered if the crazy man had just been released from prison. One day, while jogging at night, I heard something fluttering behind me and I looked back. There was a man and he had a cape on, flapping in the wind and running like crazy toward me. I was so startled that I fell to the ground and he pulled out a very large, long iron straw and tried to climb on top of me. I felt the fear of death, kicked him hard, and he groaned and fell to the ground. And he said to me as he pointed the sharp straw right at me, I've always wondered what your blood tastes like. He stabbed a straw in my arm and my blood gushed out. He then put his mouth on my arm to suck the blood. I punched him in his face, but he kept sucking my blood even though he got hit. I instantly felt drained as the blood left from my body and I was terrified. I kept punching him in the face until he fell backward in pain. I ran away as fast as I could and he shouted at me from behind. Your blood tastes like peanut butter. I'll come back to suck your blood again next time. <laughs> I ran away from him and called the police. He was arrested and put in jail again. That seems to be the end of my horrific nightmare, but every night I am terrified that he will appear again one day and I still have the scar from his straw on my arm. This happened to me two years ago, in the summer. I was 14 back then. I lived in a small town in Estonia. I have a best friend, let's call him Stan. Stan lived right next door. Stan and I really loved exploring in the forest. We would often find some really cool places. One day, we decided to visit an old mansion that was located in the middle of the woods, and behind it was a big beautiful lake. The mansion was a few miles from our apartments. We started walking there, and while walking, we joked about the manor, how we would see ghosts and abnormal things. When we arrived at the manor, it gave really bad vibes. My friend noticed it and told me that it felt very creepy and that we should go. I told him not to be such a pussycat and we went inside. Biggest mistake of my life. The mansion did not have stairs, so we had to climb up through the window. When we were inside, I don't know what happened, but I got chills, like someone was watching us. We went to the second floor. It was all covered in rocks. My friend started to slowly lose it. He wanted to leave so badly. I told him, Wait, wait. We haven't finished going to the attic. That's where the problem started. When we arrived in the attic, we began to explore it. Then suddenly, my friend screamed. I flinched and asked him what was going on, but I could barely finish my sentence when I saw a woman hanging from her wrists. She had white foam around her mouth and bruises around her body. We ran downstairs like maniacs, climbed out and ran towards the town. When I was running, I saw what looked like a doll sitting on a tree branch. When I looked away, it was gone. We called the police and I told them about the woman and the doll. They went in the manor and they found the woman with the doll right next to it. Later, the police told us that the woman was poisoned with strychnine. Then I looked up in Google about its history. The manor belonged to a very rich family in the 1900s and the mansion was abandoned because the wife was a serial killer 
who poisoned at first her whole family and then all of her relatives. And guess what she always left behind? A doll. My mom once told me about her mother's childhood scary story. When my grandma was a child, her family moved to a new house. The house my grandma moved to was a long-legged home, and there was always water under the house. If you wanted to go to a neighbor's house, you had to go by boat. My grandma's family was all Buddhists, so they cooked dishes at night, and in the morning, they donated the dishes to monks, as is tradition. But strange things began to happen in that house. Dishes were disappearing every day, as if someone had stolen them. At first, it was thought that a family member had eaten them, but the dishes were prepared for three or four people and more than a single serving. One person couldn't eat all that food. After months of such strange things, the water under their long-legged house began to recede, and they came down to clean there. Then, my grandma saw a horrible thing. It exposed something creepy. It was a dead body wrapped around one of the house's long legs, and it was already decomposed. My grandma's family realized that the person who stole all the dishes was the dead body. My mom told me that the dead body must have been killed by something or someone and then left in the river. We then watched as the water flowed back in and the body was taken out with the current and floated down the river. Hi, I wanted to share this story with you that happened to me about 10 years ago. I grew up on a big farm in Sweden. We had a ton of different animals, ranging from dogs, cats, horses, and sheep. I was around 16 or 17, and it was in the middle of winter. I was in charge of feeding the animals before bedtime, since my foster parents had to get up early for work. I wasn't afraid of the dark, but I didn't enjoy it either. I always took the dogs with me and asked the oldest to be close to me for safety. She was a very protective dog. I was walking down from the house and right in front of me was two big pastures. At the time, they were empty, or at least they should have been, since they are only used in the summer. But in the second pasture, in the middle, I saw a shadow just standing. It looked like a human, but way too tall. It was as tall as the windshed, so around 10 feet tall. I just stood there and stared, not really knowing what I should do. Then Doris, the dog, started to bark and ran down to the pasture. You have to go around a stable and a barn to get to that pasture, and since it was dark outside, she quickly disappeared in the darkness. I started to run after her and shouted her name to come back. I remember glancing at the thing right before the stable blocked my view. When I rounded the barn, I saw Dora staring at the spot where it should be standing, but it was nowhere to be found. Not even tracks in the snow. I have no idea what I saw that night, but even now, as an adult, I refuse to go out alone when it's dark. And I'm sure that I didn't imagine it because of Doris. She never barked and ran towards anything unless she had a reason. Hi, my name is Charlotte and I'm 20 years old. I had a weird experience a week ago. The day started like a normal day. I worked in the morning till 8 p.m. When I got home from work, I noticed that my roommate was acting strange. Let's call him Alex. I asked him if there was something wrong, but he didn't answer me and walked upstairs without saying a word. If you know Alex, he normally is a kind-hearted person and also a very talkative person. So it was weird that he was acting weird like this randomly. I thought maybe he just had a bad day. When I walked upstairs, I opened the door to my bedroom, but before I entered my room, I saw Alex standing at the end of the hallway. I said, hey Alex, I just got home, I hope you're doing okay. When I said that, he stared at me with a weird look on his face. It kind of freaked me out, so I just said, well, good night. I'm going to bed soon because I have to go to work early tomorrow. Sleep well. As I said that, he didn't say anything, like I was talking to a wall. I got a bit angry, because normally he never ignores me. Anyway, when I got into my room, I changed into my PJs and got into bed. I was really tired from that day, so I fell asleep fast. 
Then around four in the morning, I heard footsteps in the hallway. I thought that Alex probably needed to use the bathroom, but he wasn't walking to the bathroom. He was walking in the hallway from left to right. This was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Around five minutes later, I needed to use the toilet to do my business. When I got out of bed and opened my bedroom door, he was standing right in front of me. This scared me to death. I got angry at him for scaring me like that. Again, he didn't say anything. I was pissed and walked downstairs to the toilet. When I was done, I didn't hear any footsteps anymore. Finally, he went to bed, I thought. When I got upstairs, he wasn't walking in the hallway anymore. I got to bed and was relieved he finally went to bed. The next morning, I woke up at 6 to get ready for work. I changed into my work clothes and wanted to go downstairs and eat something. When I got downstairs, I saw Alex making eggs. Good morning, Charlotte, he said. He was the complete opposite of how he acted yesterday. Good morning, I said back. I asked him how he was doing. I'm doing very well, he answered. I asked him why he acted so weird and strange yesterday, and he looked at me as if he didn't know what I was talking about. Um, you do remember that I was out with my friends all day, right? He asked. My mouth fell open when he said that. that then who was in my house yesterday? He gave me a frightened look on his face and asked what happened, so I told him the whole story. He called the police right after I finished telling my story. When they arrived, they checked the whole house, but nothing and no one was found, sadly. To this day, I have no idea who that person was that I talked to, but it gives me shivers down my spine when I think about it. Hi, I'm Danny. I was sleeping in my spare bedroom because as a six-year-old girl, I hated sleeping in my room because it was on the other side of the house from my parents' room. So the bed I slept in was on the wall opposite of where the door was so I could see the door and if it was cracked open, the shadow would go on a wall so I could easily see what was going on outside of my room by the shadow. One day I slept in and I saw a shadow on the wall sorting mail because there was a dining table on the other side of the door. I yelled, Mom! I heard no answer, so I yelled again, Mom! Still no answer. It really scared me because I knew she would answer. Believe me, she would answer. So I just laid there watching the shadow on the wall sorting mail. Another thing is that we normally don't have a lot of mail, but the shadow just kept sorting mail. Next thing I knew, it was gone, so I slowly got up and looked on the other side of the door. Nothing was there, so I walked to my mom's room and she was passed out asleep. That scared the crap out of little six-year-old me, and later that day I asked her if she was sorting mail and she had no idea what I was talking about. Today, the only person I've told this to is my friend Kate. This happened a while ago when I was home alone. It wasn't my first time being home alone, but what happened will terrify me if I'm ever home alone again. My parents had to go see my sick grandma, and she lived on the other side of the country, so it took at least five hours to get there. I wanted to go too, but I had an important exam the next day, so I stayed back. I don't have any siblings, so I had the house all to myself. My parents left at 6 in the evening. After they'd left, I just went to my room and started playing some video games. An hour or so went by, and I had to study or I wasn't going to pass the exam the next day, so I took out my notes and started going through them. I was listening to some music, so I almost couldn't hear anything. After a while, I started to get a little hungry, so I went to grab some snacks from the kitchen upstairs since my room is in the basement. I was rummaging through the fridge when I heard a knock at the door. It was kind of odd since my parents had told me we weren't expecting anyone. Quietly, I went to take a peek through the peephole. It was a girl. She looked to be around 14 or 15, and she was holding someone's hand, who I assumed was her little sister. I was so busy taking in their appearance that I didn't notice she was still knocking. Now, even louder. I asked her who she was and what she wanted without opening the door. There was no answer. Instead, she started knocking even harder. Then I heard a bang. This time, it seemed to be coming from my parents' room. I was scared at this point. I threw the pack of chips I was holding and rushed downstairs to my room and locked it. I started hearing someone's footsteps coming towards the basement. I hid under my bed, waiting for what was about to happen next. I almost started crying when I remembered that I'd left my phone on the kitchen table. Suddenly, I could hear police sirens, but I was confused because I didn't get the chance to call the police. 
turned out that my parents' room faced our neighbor's house. When she heard the bangs, she knew something was wrong. So she peeped through her blinds, only to see a sketchy person was trying to break into her house through my parents' bedroom window. She immediately called 911. The knocking on our door was a trap to distract me, so the burglars could get into our house. The burglars tried to run, but were soon caught. My parents were later called. I'm forever thankful to my neighbor for saving my life. Hi, I'm a 16 year old girl from Finland. I have one creepy experience that I wanna share. I really don't believe in paranormal activity, but this made me think twice. When I was seven years old, we moved into a new house that was built in the 1950s. The house was pretty huge and had three floors. Back then, I had just one little sister. She was about two at the time. One day, my parents and my sister were just chilling at home. I wasn't in there because I was with my friends. That day, something strange happened with my sister. My mom asked her what's wrong, and my sister just pointed her finger at the stairwell and said, that girl isn't my big sister. My mother thought it was just a child's imagination and shrugged it off. But my sister kept saying other things like, there's a little girl, who's that girl? And she pointed her finger to the empty stairs. This made my parents a little uncomfortable. A few weeks later, our family friends came to visit us. They had a three-year-old kid. Let's call her Hannah. Hannah sat around our kitchen table. The table has a straight eye line to the stairwell. She stared at the stairs and said, why is there a flattened girl? My parents and Hannah's parents saw no one there. We always keep the lights on the stairs if someone needs to go to the bathroom or something at night. Sometimes we heard footsteps from the stairs, but weren't scared by that, we were just confused. When I was 13 years old, I was up late at night. Everyone was already asleep, but I wanted to watch YouTube and stay up. Suddenly, stair lights went on and off very fast for a whole minute. I was a little scared, but I still didn't pay much attention. My other baby sister, Susan, was born in 2018. The last part of this paranormal experience happened in 2019, when my younger sister, Susan, was a year old. My parents and Susan were in the living room. Susan said to my parents, why is there a girl on the ceiling? And sometimes she asked about a girl who was on the stairs and in the living room. So that was my paranormal experience. Me and my parents have no clue what my sisters and Hannah saw when they were little children. These days, they don't remember anything about the stairwell ghost girl. I wonder if a little girl died at our house in the past. Even today, I hear footsteps on the stairs, but I'm not scared. I hope someday the girl ghost gets where she belongs. My name is Nathan Mendez. I am from Houston, Texas, and this is a very sad story that I am about to share. As a little kid, when I first heard the song What I've Done by Linkin Park, it was in the end credits of Transformers 1 from 2007. Thanks to Transformers, I became a Linkin Park fan even though Chester Bennington died. Or so I thought. Fast forward to 2022. On April 10th, I went to the Houston Galleria Mall. The Houston Galleria Mall is one of the biggest shopping malls in Houston, Texas. My family and I were looking for formal clothes to wear for church on Easter Sunday. When my mother was in a store called Bed Bath & Beyond, I waited outside. A few minutes went by and a man approached me who looked and sounded exactly like Chester Bennington. He asked me if I knew where GameStop was because he had a son whose birthday had passed the month before. I pointed him in the right direction, but before I let him go about his business, I asked the man, what is your son's name? He answered Tyler. I asked him another question. Are you Chester Bennington of Lincoln Park? But he didn't answer that question. He just turned and ran away. I even thought to myself, that can't be Chester Bennington because he died on July 20th of 2017. I just need to know something. Was that actually Chester Bennington or was that his ghost? 
I'm a 17-year-old girl who is attending high school in Japan. Before I start, it's important to note that I'm a timid person, so I'm not good at anger and I'm not good at rejecting. Because of this, people often tell me that I'm nice. My friends know that I'm like this and often have to step in and help me. The story began earlier in the year, but we'll get to that. For now, let me tell you about a day that I will never forget. The day that showed me what happens when you're too nice. It was summer break. I will often go to a local pool with my friends during the summer, and this day was no different. It was supposed to rain all day, so I thought my friends wouldn't be interested in going and that our visit was canceled. However, I got a call from one of my friends. She asked me to go to the pool even though it was a rainy day. I said to her, Are you sure that's a good idea? She made the argument that the weather would make sure that the pool wasn't as crowded. Even better, if we went in the evening, there would probably be no one there, and we would have the entire pool to ourselves. I liked the idea and decided to go to the swimming pool with her in the evening. We walked together to the pool in the rain. When we got there, it was just as she thought. No one was there. She and I swam and splashed in the pool. We were having so much fun playing in the water. At one point, as we floated on the surface of the water, we got to talking about relationships. As soon as this topic came up, I tried to change the subject. You see, before summer break, a boy from school had confessed to me that he liked me and asked me to be his girlfriend. He was pretty average looking, but I just didn't know him that well and wasn't interested in a relationship. Not knowing how to properly explain this to him without hurting his feelings, I instead decided to lie to him. I foolishly told him that I already had a boyfriend and left him standing there. Of course, she knew this and decided to tease me about what my fake boyfriend was doing while we were at the pool. I laughed a little and then decided to get revenge for making things awkward. I snuck up on her and dumped her into the water for a second. She jokingly scolded me and we laughed together about how silly the whole situation was. We went back to treading water and talking about random teenager stuff. That was until I felt someone was staring at me from somewhere behind me. I looked back, but there was no one there. My friend noticed my look of worry and asked me what was wrong. I brushed it off since I didn't see anyone and I reassured her it was nothing. Maybe it was her reminding me of the guilt I felt lying to that guy from school. We went back to playing in the water after I reassured her things were fine. As we continued splashing around, I felt it again. Someone was watching me. I turned again to look. I saw nothing, but I had had it. I decided to make up an excuse as to why we should leave. She seemed a little unsure about what I said, but she didn't question it and we got out of the pool. My friend and I went to the showers together. I love the feeling of warm water and the relaxing process of getting cleaned up in the shower. So I usually take longer than my friends. Because of this, my friend finished first and headed out of the showers and into the locker rooms to start getting dressed. As I was rinsing my hair, I heard footsteps from somewhere. At first I thought it must be my friend, so I didn't care and continued to wash up. But the sound of footsteps got closer and closer until I heard them stop directly behind me. I was in the process of rinsing my face off under the water, so I turned quickly to see who was behind me. I can still, to this day, clearly picture what I saw when I turned around. There, standing just one step away from me, was the boy who confessed to me. I was so startled and scared that I froze on the spot and didn't even scream. I wondered if screaming would lead to him hurting me. Suddenly, he reached out and grabbed my arms. That was when I screamed and tried to pull away from him, tears running down my face. We struggled against each other for a bit. He was staring directly into my eyes with an eerie and wide-eyed expression. I was able to maneuver myself in a way that allowed me to kick him in the stomach, which caused him to fall to the floor with a thud. I hurriedly got out of the shower room, grabbed a towel, wrapped it around myself, and ran to my friend. She had already finished getting dressed and her phone was in her hand. As soon as she saw me, she asked me what happened to me, and I told her. She quickly grabbed me and pulled me into a nearby bathroom stall. We locked the door and she called the police. When the police arrived, they searched the shower room. They found him in the same place I knocked him down. Apparently, when I knocked him down, he hit his head and was unconscious. They arrested him that day. The events of that day have scarred me for life. It's made me wary of going to the pool, but most of all, it's made me realize that sometimes lying to be nice can be deadly. <laughs> my name is Rui, and I am from India. I live with my parents and older brother. One evening, my parents went outside to shop. Since I was grown up, 
and was not afraid of staying home alone, I convinced my brother to go for a walk. Finally, after he agreed, I locked the door from inside. After a while, while I was studying, I heard a bang. Now, the twist is that I live in an apartment, so either it was a break-in or something happening next door. I peeked outside my door, and my heart sank. A bearded man with an iron rod had broken my door and was trying to get inside through the gap. I thought quickly. I had been watching Wan C Entertainment, and I knew what to do. I could have chosen my brother's room as it had the best lock, but I chose to stay in my room as it had some weapons. Since the man had managed to get in, I immediately locked the door, dialed the police, and grabbed a hammer, pocket knife, and compass. The police told me to hide in the room until they arrived. I didn't hide in the wardrobe because it was full of clothes. And if the man found me, there I wouldn't be able to attack him. Then I called the security office man for the apartment, but he didn't answer the phone. My first thought was that he had been killed by this maniac. Now the maniac was laughing and banging on the door. I knew the door would break soon if he used the iron rod, and his laugh didn't sound like a person. <laughs> then the lock broke. Right as he was coming inside, I didn't even give him a moment and stabbed him with the compass and smashed the hammer over his head. He fell down, crying in pain. Then I used my karate training to knock him out so that I didn't accidentally kill him with the weapons. Then I heard the police sirens. They entered my house and handcuffed him. Surprisingly, after they removed his fake beard, I saw a boy my age, whom I had slapped a few days ago because he had teased me in public. He screamed, I'm going to get you. I later learned that the security guard was not dead. He was actually just scared because the intruder had an iron rod and let him in. That was also why he didn't pick up the phone. He was fired on the spot for not calling the police and the boy got eight years in prison. He had known that no one was at home except for me and had planned to kidnap me. I still think what would have happened if I hadn't kept some weapons ready? This story happened in 2010, when I was 11 years old. I was visiting my family from Poland, because at the time I lived in Norway. I was very excited to meet them again, since we hadn't been in Poland for a few years. When we got there, we were greeted at the door by our family. In case you're wondering, our family lives in a usual Polish apartment. When we got inside, we got to say hello to all the family that was there, including my favorite cousin. She was 13 at the time. We talked a lot in her room while my parents ate with the others. I told her I wanted to go to the playground near the apartment and stay there for a while, because I get bored just sitting and talking. We asked our parents for permission, and they said yes, but not to be there for too long probably because it was about 8 p.m. and would get dark soon. We agreed and went down to the playground. When we got there, it was very cold at the time because it was winter. We played there for about 20 minutes before we decided to go back to the house. Just as we were about to go back inside, I saw something hiding behind some trees. I told my cousin and she saw it too. We stood there and just watched this thing staring at us. After about 10 seconds, the thing noticed that we were staring at it and it came creeping closer to us. It moved very slowly towards us. Both of us were terrified and trembling and then we saw what was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was a man with bloodshot eyes and his right arm was gone. He looked at us without blinking and then he flashed us the creepiest smile we had ever seen. My cousin and I just stood there thinking that the man was probably going to hurt us. My cousin and I were frozen in fear. Suddenly the man started moving and just walked away. 
we immediately ran into our grandparents' apartment, and as we got there, we calmed down, knowing we were safe. We never told anybody about this afterwards. I'm 23 years old now, and this story is still stuck in my memory. My name is Vanessa and I live in the UK. I'm the oldest out of four children within my home and this story is mainly about my youngest brother who was a baby at the time. One day after school, me, my younger sister, and my baby brother were in my room waiting for our parents to come home from work. Me and my sister sat on my bed watching YouTube videos together and my baby brother was on the floor playing and crawling around. This was the usual as it would only be an hour or two before one of our parents came back. As I mentioned before, my baby brother was on the bedroom floor crawling and the walk-in closet door was open. Now looking back, this was very odd as the door would always be closed as there wasn't anything interesting in there, just boxes of old stuff that my mom didn't want to throw away. Because the door was open, my baby brother would go in it and play with the boxes and we could tell it was him as he would always giggle doing so. Me and my little sister must have gotten distracted watching the videos because when I went to check on my brother, the door was closed. I thought this was weird as you can't close the door as there is no handle from the inside, but I heard the boxes moving so I thought maybe my baby brother found a way inside. I opened the closet door to get him out of there so I could watch him. He came out and started playing again and I closed the closet door behind him. I got back to watching the videos with my sister, and after a while we heard the boxes moving again, except this time with no giggles. Me and my sister looked at each other confused as I just let my baby brother out. I stared at the door for a while and wondered how was this happening until the door suddenly started rattling, rattling like something was trying to get out. I paid no mind as I thought it was my brother again, although I had my doubts. When the door kept rattling, my other brother Jonathan, who was 12 at the time, came home and came to my room looking for something. I asked him with my back turned to him to open the closet to let my brother out. He said to me in a confused voice, what do you mean, and Aldo is right behind me. My sister and I looked at each other in shock, and we saw my baby brother crawling behind Jonathan. Me and my sister ran out of the room screaming and told our mother when she came home. She didn't believe us for some reason, but let's just say that I haven't opened that closet door since and it's now barricaded with a TV stand. Weird things kept happening in our home after that. Random knocking on doors and walls, dark shadows and weird appearances in mirrors. It's been three years since then and I still wonder what was in my closet. This happened to me three years ago, but to this day, I still get chills when I think about this experience. I was 14 years old at the time and my mom, my sister, and I had recently moved into an old house. It was very big, and the previous owner was an old woman who had died a while ago. A lot of time had passed, and we really enjoyed living in this old house since we'd renovated a lot of things, and it looked quite good now. But there was one night that I will always remember. It was my friend's birthday party, and while it wasn't really late, I was so tired that I came home and fell asleep right away. I woke up about 3 a.m. and realized that I hadn't even taken off my shoes. So I started getting ready for bed. I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, and removed my makeup. Then I got back to my room, and as I was putting on my pajamas, I spotted something out of the corner of my eye standing across the street. I looked out the window of my room on the second floor, and I saw an old lady standing there next to a tree. She was staring at me and wearing a dirty white dress. She had frizzy gray hair, light pale skin, red bloodshot eyes, and her mouth was open. She was missing some teeth, and I could smell her rotten breath even though I was far away. She also was very skinny. I stood there in shock and couldn't move. All I could do was look at her. She looked at me with her red eyes wide open, like a psycho. She didn't move either, only her mouth twitched, and she made a weird mumbling sound. I immediately got goosebumps all over my body. She was just staring. And after what felt like an eternity, I started panicking and crying in hope that my mom would wake up. She came downstairs and asked what was wrong. I told her that there was a lady staring at me from across the street and that I was very scared of her. So my mom came into the room and looked out the window. As she was looking, I could still see the woman standing there 
smiling <laughs> creepily at my mom and me. And what happened next shocked me to this day. My mom looked confusedly at me and said, Honey, what are you talking about? There's no one there. I looked at her in fear. What? Was I crazy? My mom had to sleep in my room that night because I was so traumatized and I didn't know what was wrong with me. But it didn't end there. The next day, we needed to get something to eat. And as we were sitting in the car near to where the woman had been standing, I started feeling weird. And I noticed the nasty smell of her breath in my nose. It made me feel sick to my stomach. And I started crying because I hadn't gotten over the previous night. After that, I started waking up in the middle of the night because I heard heavy breathing right next to me. That happened about five times. Then, it just stopped. Since then, I've always looked out of my window every night before I go to sleep. Thankfully, I never saw her again. But I wonder, why could I smell her breath and hear her mumbling when she was standing across the street and my window was closed? Later, I found out that the previous owner died in my room. I don't know if that woman wanted to scare me because she wanted me out of her house or if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But that night still haunts me to this day. It was a cold, rainy afternoon in Valencia City, Philippines, back in 2011 when I was sleeping in my bed with a high fever due to catching the flu. My mom was sleeping next to me in bed because she was taking care of me and made sure I took my meds on time. As I was snuggling in my sheets, I slowly hear someone whispering in my ear from a distance. I opened my eyes with my heart beating so fast and I was trying to move my body, but to no avail, I could not. The whispers continued to echo from a distance and I couldn't actually recognize the sound I was hearing, like it was all just a bunch of random words. Just then, the whispers came even closer to my ears and I was panicking so bad, thinking, what is going on? Why can't I move? Why do I feel like there's someone standing at my feet? I got a very weird tingly sensation run down my spine when I finally felt like something was actually whispering with its mouth an inch closer to my ear. I then remembered when I read about sleep paralysis on the internet and how to break free from it by trying to move your toes, and I did it. I was praying and trying to move my toes at the same time, hoping that I could break free from this nightmare. Luckily, I got out of it gasping some air and immediately woke up my mom and told her everything that happened. She got all worried and reassured me that everything's going to be fine because she won't leave me. I felt relieved and went back to sleep. One month had passed and I was watching some comedy movies in my room and it was around 11 p.m. when I suddenly felt the urge to drink some water. The outside of my room is a second living room and I need to head downstairs to grab a glass of cold water because that's where the fridge is located. As I got out of the room, I didn't bother to turn the lights on because the dim lights were turned on already and it was enough for me to see. As I was about to step out of the room, I noticed something in front of me sitting on the couch. It was all dark and only its eyes were gleaming despite the dim situation of the living room. The eyes were looking straight at me and I froze for what felt like an eternity. I finally managed to take a step back at my room and shut the door. I forgot to mention that both my mom and dad were with me in my room watching the movies as well. And they both stood up from their seats in shock because of the horror and emotion that I displayed on my face. I eventually moved on from that situation and forgot about it. Year 2016, when I graduated from college and went to Cebu City for my review and preparation for the upcoming board examination that year in November, I was living with a bunch of friends and classmates in a pretty decent house that we rented for the time being while we were having our review. It was all fun until one afternoon while I was sleeping, there was this familiar sensation that I felt that made my eyes to open widely. The same dark figure was standing right at the corner of the room. Only that time I could see it clearly and it was trying to reach me with its long, pointy hands. Again, I couldn't make myself move. I closed my eyes and kept them shut for five minutes and prayed to God for that hellish creature to be gone. Thankfully, I got out of it again. 
I still get some occasional sleep paralysis at times when I sleep in the afternoon. I am still scared even up to this day, but I somehow got used to it. All I can say is, even if you're scared to face your demons, you just have to stay tough and keep praying. God is always in control. My name is Brianna, and this happened to me a few years ago. I live in Silver City, New Mexico, and I was in a bad place at the time. I was living in a trailer park during that period, and I was about to walk to see my boyfriend. It was late. I'm not sure what time it was, but it was between 12 and 3 a.m. I got out of the house, turned on my phone flashlight, and began walking. Keep in mind that there is one large orange street light that illuminates the mailboxes near where you would turn to drive into the trailer park. However, as you walk down the road, there were no other lights, not even a single house light. I've always been a bit paranoid, but it was only a 10 to 20 minute walk, so what's the big deal? So I began walking down the street and my flashlight barely lit anything. I could see a few houses, but as I walked further down the road, I saw a massive ditch filled with trees, grass, weeds, shrubs, bushes, and a rail going down. On the right side of where I was walking, there was nothing but dirt and hills. I kept looking back as I walked to reassure myself that there was no need to be so worried and afraid, but I was just so nervous. I could see the end of the street from where I was standing. There was a dance studio on the left and a large fenced-in house on the right, almost like a checkpoint. It was a little far away, but I figured if I kept my flashlight straight and walked quickly, I'd be there in no time. Suddenly, I heard these movements, almost like steps. However, they weren't mine. I stopped and pointed my flashlight at the railed ditch, hoping to see someone walking or even an animal pass by. But there was no one there. Hello, I yelled, shining my flashlight towards this big, eerie tree that slumped over the rail. And nothing. I turned around to see if there was someone behind me, there wasn't anyone. I thought I was just freaking myself out, so I kept walking. Then I heard a hissing noise coming from the hills, almost like a cat or a large animal. I pointed my flashlight to my right, and there it was. I stopped in my tracks, my heart in my throat. It wasn't an animal. This thing had skin, clear skin, and I could see its spine. I didn't get a good look at its face, but it had an unusually long arms and legs. It was on its arms and legs and charged right at me. I had no choice but to book it down the street without looking back. I remember dropping a couple of items from one of my jacket pockets or pants pockets, but I didn't go back. I could hear its heavy and harsh breath getting closer and closer. I didn't have time to scream or cry or even get a better look at this thing. Finally, I made it to the light pole next to the fenced house. I looked back as soon as I got under the light pole and the creature was gone. I stood there for a moment, wondering if I was just paranoid and my imagination got the better of me, or if I had actually seen some demonic, ugly skinwalker thing. I had no idea, but all I knew was that I needed to get the hell out of there. I ran down the street until I reached my ex-boyfriend. I'd never felt more at ease with his arms wrapped around me, just cuddling me and holding me tight. I never ended up telling him what I saw until a couple of years later. To this day, I still don't know if it was my mind playing tricks on me or if what I saw was actually a bloodthirsty creature preying on its next victim. I never returned to that trailer park or the road leading to it, and I hope I never have to. It was December 31st, my birthday. Since my birthday and New Year's coincided, my family decided to make it into one big event. So my parents invited all our family members over. We celebrated at my aunt's house as she was abroad at the time. The house was actually unoccupied most of the year. She hired a person to live there and take care of it. It was big, almost like a mansion, except there wasn't a second floor. It was just very spacious. My family members say the house is haunted that spirits roam the halls when no one's around. Not to brag, but I was a smart kid. I genuinely didn't believe in ghosts. But that night changed everything. 
It was 10 seconds before midnight. My whole family shouted the countdown while I jumped up and ran around the room, waving my arms like an excited little kid. Five, four, three, two, one. New Year's noisemakers sounded, and some of my relatives bashed pans together in jubilation. I could hear cars and motorcycles honking outside as well. We ate after that, chatting amongst ourselves. I, however, was feeling sleepy, and I needed to pee. Putting my drink down on the table, I walked past my cousin, who was playing with my iPad and taking selfies. The hall leading to the bathroom was very short. You could easily get there in five seconds. The door to the bathroom was ornate and heavy. It always made a sound when I closed it, since I wasn't strong enough to close it softly. I felt around the wall to turn on the light switch, and I don't know if it was the lack of sleep or my imagination, but I saw a lady with her back toward me. She had long, black hair that went down to her lower back, and she wore a plain, white dress. She was so pale that she was glowing under the light. In disbelief and utter denial, I wiped my eyes with my free hand and blinked a few times, but she didn't disappear. She was still there, her back facing me. I gently pulled the door closer to me, so close that if I pulled it any closer, it would shut. Taking a deep breath, I opened it again. The lady was still there. She slowly turned her head, and I immediately closed the door and ran towards my family, who were chatting idly and drinking wine. I sat back down on the sofa, and despite the cold weather, I was sweating. I managed to calm myself down after a few minutes. Suddenly, my cousin screamed, and everyone turned their attention to him. He pointed at my iPad. He looked scared, shocked, and in disbelief. My heart stopped when I saw what he'd caught in his selfies. The same lady, black hair, white dress, pale skin, making her way to the bathroom. I knew he hadn't edited them, since there wasn't any editing software installed on it except for the included stuff which was mediocre at best. Not to mention he can't edit to save his life. In almost every picture he'd taken, she was there, walking. He deleted the pictures, and I remember that I still needed to pee. I didn't want to go back to the bathroom alone, so I asked my mom to come with me. She was annoyed that I made her open the bathroom door and made her stand next to me while I peed. It still doesn't make sense. If what I saw that day was just my sleep-deprived mind imagining things, then what did my iPad catch that day? Needless to say, I believe in ghosts now. I never believed in the supernatural. I wanted to, but never felt afraid of it. Years spent scaring friends and watching horror movies that even my parents refused to watch, and each time I felt nothing. Not scared, just excited. If you were to ask any of my friends, they would tell you that I was the most fearless person they knew. I would make jokes about how I could summon the devil himself and he would be afraid of me. However, that all changed pretty quickly. My teacher had just reminded our class that there was a school excursion coming up. This was a Friday afternoon. That particular week, I became very interested in communicating with the dead and demon summoning rituals. This reminder from my teacher made me think of a clever prank I could play on my friends in order to scare them. I decided to purchase a Ouija board. I made a plan to bring it to the hotel we were all staying at in order to scare them, or at the very least, annoy them. I ended up ordering one right there, in class, before we left for the day. I found one pretty quickly, actually. An old wooden Ouija board for no more than 15 pounds. I told my friends and laughed at their reactions. Most of them were creeped out and got annoyed but in a funny sort of way. They started joking around saying how they would throw me out of the hotel with the Ouija board if I actually did bring one. However, one of my friends looked horrified as they told me just how bad of an idea it was. I told him that I didn't actually believe in ghosts and that this wouldn't actually work. Even if it did, I couldn't care less. I'm fearless, right? Luckily, the Ouija board would arrive in the mail on Saturday. I wasn't concerned about my parents saying anything about the Ouija board, they also don't believe in this stuff and will just label it as a useless wooden board. 
I was so excited when I woke up on Saturday and the Ouija board had already come in the mail. I hugged it close, excited for all the fun I was going to have messing with my friends on our trip and ran to the kitchen. I sat at the table and I opened it carefully. Inside was the slightly old wooden board with its metal pointer and to my surprise, there was a strange instruction guide full of text. I have two younger sisters and just then they both walked through the kitchen. I had told them the night before about my plans for the Ouija board and that it would arrive that day. They both weren't too fond of the Ouija board being in the house and thought my idea was going too far, especially the youngest. She made sure to let me know that she wouldn't even touch the thing. They glanced over at me to see what I was doing and once they saw the board, their faces turned to fright and they ran out of the room. As I read through the instructions, I had a strange feeling. Something didn't feel quite right. It creeped me out just a bit. There were so many rules, so many warnings and dangers filled the pages. I shook off the feeling of unease. At the time, I didn't realize just how important those rules were. Immediately after reading through the guide, I decided to play with the board. When beginning the session, I did all that I was supposed to. I followed all the rules written in the guide and stayed polite and calm when asking the spirits questions. But no matter how much I tried, nothing happened. I would try, wait, and then get nothing. Again and again, and still no response. Eventually, I got bored and ended it by saying goodbye. I left the board on the counter and continued on with my day. That evening, my mom and my two siblings went to the cinema, leaving me home alone. I didn't care. Being alone wasn't a big deal because I wasn't scared of anything. In fact, staying at home alone was one of my favorite things at the time. I was sitting in the living room just scrolling on my phone. That was until I heard a loud crash and bang. It made me jump. Did that come from the kitchen? I went to check what had happened. I was cautious and all, but still not scared. I assumed something had fallen on the floor. I looked in the kitchen to see what had fallen over. That's when it happened. We had a plastic rubbish bin in the corner of our kitchen, and just as I came around the corner, a plastic orange juice container shot out of the rubbish bin and exploded. It left the remnants of what was still inside of it as it sat in the rubbish bin all over. Brown, dripping, rotted orange juice stains scattered everywhere. And I mean everywhere. The walls, floor, tiles, everything was covered in this gross brown liquid. I dismissed it as a coincidence. There was a reasonable explanation for this, right? Something or other about how the juice breaks down and creates gas within the container, causing it to explode. Hadn't I seen something like that on TV once? I convinced myself that had to be it. I managed to clean up most of it and decided that I would just wait for my mom to come back home to help me with the rest of it. At the time, my mom laughed about it and remarked about what powerful juice that was, but now I don't laugh about it. This was just the beginning and what came next will haunt me forever. That night I had such horrid nightmares, I can't begin to explain them. I remember lots of mumbled noises and blood, lots of blood, blurred visions of violence and then darkness. This wasn't normal. I barely experience nightmares and when I do, they are usually something dumb or stupid. That night, I didn't sleep well, at all. But again, I didn't think too much of it. Sunday was when I began packing for the trip. I placed the Ouija board in my suitcase and left the suitcase in front of my bed so that I wouldn't forget it the next day. As I was getting ready for bed, something seemed odd. You know, how you just get that gut feeling sometimes? That something is really wrong? Again, I blew it off thinking it was just anxiety about tomorrow's big trip. But boy, was I wrong. The night was cold. I could hear the wind blowing outside my window as I drifted to sleep and slipped into the abyss of my mind. My dreams were again loud and frustrating. Just like the night before, there was blood. This time there were screams. The whole dream was foggy and unidentifiable, but it felt like something was spawning, a corruption. I woke up breathing heavily as if I had been holding my breath. I was sweating, not just a little bit. No, I was drenched in sweat. I was barely awake and already my skin was crawling as I stared at the ceiling catching my breath. I closed my eyes and did my best to calm down, knowing that it was over. The nightmare was done. I lifted my head and looked around my room. It was dark and silent apart from the fan that was always running in my room. I reached for my phone and checked the time, 2.50 a.m. That made my skin crawl again. It was almost 3 a.m. and even though I never believed in the 3 a.m. haunting hour crap, something didn't feel right. The air felt thick and I felt like someone, something was watching me. 
I sat up, and to my horror, there was something there in the dark with me. For a second, I couldn't move. I was trying to understand what I was looking at. I blinked, and there, on top of my big suitcase, sat the figure of a girl. I could see her so perfectly. I could see her hair and her feet. She was staring at me. I barely had time to process this before I realized there was someone else in the room. Right beside her stood an outline of a tall man. He stood very still, but I knew he was there. I reacted by grabbing my blankets and throwing them over my head. I sat there under the bed covers and tried to remain completely still. My heart hurt from just how hard it was beating. Was I having a heart attack? What was this feeling? It was at that moment that I realized I was feeling pure fear. The kind of fear I have never felt before in my entire life. This can't be right. I must still be in my nightmare. I began counting my fingers. There were ten. I was awake. My mind raced. I knew whatever that was was not real. I have to be hallucinating or something. But how do I know for sure? I thought of grabbing my phone and using that as a light. But if those beings were real, it would be more terrifying to see their true forms under such dim light. I decided to count to three, and on three, I would run to the door and turn on the lights. One, two, I was stuck on two, my mind hurt, then finally, three. I threw the blankets off my head and jumped out of the bed. As soon as my feet hit the ground, I started to run toward my light switch. I winced at the pain from my feet as the pins and needles shot through my legs. I was fully awake, but my legs were not. As I ran, even though I felt like I was going fast, What I saw will forever be ingrained in my mind. It was the eerie figure of the girl sitting perfectly still on my suitcase, with her head slightly tilted in my direction, and the tall man beside her. He just stared blankly at my bed. I made it to the lights and turned them on. Sure enough, there was nothing there. I felt relieved, but not entirely. Whatever that was, it terrified the crap out of me. I did not sleep that night. I didn't want to wake up to those things that night or ever again. I had the lights on for the rest of the night. I tried to distract myself by doing random things around my room, but something in me told me, destroy that Ouija board. The thought echoed in my mind throughout the night. Eventually, I couldn't take it any longer. I was losing my battle to stay awake. Nothing had happened for a while. It had to be a fluke. I decided to lie down and try to relax. I shut down my phone and lay there in my bed perfectly still. Suddenly, I began to hear the loudest cracking noises. It made me jump. I thought it was my phone since something similar had happened in the past, where my phone's screen began to crack all of a sudden. I looked up and grabbed my phone. It was fine. The noise was gone. I looked around the room. I looked at my mirror. It wasn't my mirror. I checked my window. Still nothing. However, when I replayed that sound in my mind, I realized that it sounded more like the sound you often hear in a movie When someone breaks a bone, I wasn't watching in movies. No one was. Everyone in the house was asleep, except me. That freaked me out once again, so I did not move from my bed. My whole body was shaking. I tried to watch TikTok to distract myself. I stayed like that for another hour or so. Then after gaining some kind of bravery, I decided to get back up and try to work out. Maybe that would distract me. The time was 4.30 a.m. As I was getting into comfy clothes, I heard the loudest sound of a train. The sound was so loud, it made my head shake. I live in the countryside where there are no trains whatsoever. That pushed me over the edge. I grabbed everything and jumped back into my bed. Although I feel pretty dumb saying this, I began to pray. I prayed hard and wished that all of this would be over. It was nearly 5 a.m. I needed to get up. I wanted to surprise my mom with a gift before going to school. It was her birthday, but I was scared out of my mind and didn't want to be alone. I had to wake up my little sister and use a lie. I told her, I need your help to decorate the living room for mom's birthday. It worked. I felt much better being with someone, even if it was my little sister. It wasn't long before my mom woke up and came downstairs. I sang her the happy birthday song and I gave her her present. As we sat in the living room together, I couldn't hold in my fear. I told my mom what happened. I tried my best to make it sound as lighthearted as I could so that she wouldn't be scared. When I was done telling her what happened, my mom had a horrified look on her face. That further confirmed that I had a reason to be scared. I kind of laughed it off by saying something like, "Uh, I haven't slept since 2.50 a.m. Guess the spirits really did want to talk with me after all. But that didn't make me feel better. My mother suggested getting rid of the board. I was way ahead of her. 
I got a plastic bag, put the Ouija board and all of its parts inside of it, and told her to throw it away as far as possible from us. I couldn't even bring myself to watch her walk out the door with it. I must say, though, the moment it was out of my room, I felt relief. As if a thick air that once made it hard to breathe had been cleared out, I wanted to take a shower before I left. But I got so scared at the thought of being alone in the shower, I broke down. I began crying. My mom hugged me tight and calmed me down. I eventually calmed down, but I ended up not showering. I just sat there cuddling with my mom right up to the moment I needed to leave for my school trip. The trip was fairly uneventful in comparison to the weekend before. My friends were surprised that I didn't bring the Ouija board. I just told them that my parents didn't want me to bring the board and they believed me. The best part? I slept just fine on the trip. No nightmares, no weird happenings, no creepy girls in the middle of the night. I felt fine and no longer felt scared of being alone. It wasn't until I came back home that things changed. When I walked into my room, something felt off again. I couldn't put my finger on it. It was unnerving being in there. I expected to see the Ouija board like some scene from a horror movie where the haunted object just reappears as if by magic, but that never happened. I do have severe PTSD now. I can't sleep in complete darkness, so there's always a light on in my room. I'm so terrified of being in my room alone that my parents had to move my youngest sister into my bedroom to give me peace of mind. Just two days ago, I brought up the Ouija board to my sister, and she told me something that made me sick. She said that ever since that day, she would sometimes have strange dreams. They were always the same. She's sitting in an empty room with a giant clock in front of her, and at exactly 2.50 a.m., the tall, shadowy figure of a man and a girl sitting on the ground would suddenly appear and stare at her, as if they were looking directly into her soul. My name is Jose, and I would like to share a terrible memory I have about chocolate. About four years ago, when I was 18, I went to a chocolate shop and met a guy named Evan. I still vividly remember his bright smile. His teeth were brown because they were all smeared with chocolate. When he offered his hands for a handshake, his hands were stained with chocolate too. But he was very friendly, and we soon became friends. He was a chocolate maniac. He even always had chocolate inside his pocket, so his pocket was bulged. However, I did not realize how dangerous he was. As we got to know each other better, he often gave me chocolate. I just accepted it at first, but I started to feel more and more uncomfortable. But what was even more strange was that he watched me eating the chocolate, and every time I swallowed it, he let out an exclamation and hugged himself. One time, when I deliberately didn't swallow the chocolate out of curiosity, he stared at me for a long time and tried to open my mouth, yelling at me and wanting to know why I wasn't swallowing it. He only calmed down after I swallowed it. As time went by, he became more and more strange. One day, he brought me a box of chocolates and told me to eat them all. I said I didn't want to, but he shouted at me as if entreating. Please, I want to be happy! He suddenly became short of breath and started unwrapping chocolates and stuffing them into my mouth. I took a few, then he shouted in relief like I had just rescued him from drowning. Ah, oh, thank you so much, really? Then he started to cry. I was perplexed. After that, he started treating me like a VIP. He said he would do anything I asked him to. When I asked him why he was so nice to me, he said, Because I'll always need you. I couldn't understand what he meant. After that, his chocolate attacks continued. Even when we ate together, he kept putting chocolate in my food. And while we were talking to each other, he kept tossing chocolate into my mouth. I started to get more and more irritated, and I even started to gain weight and become unhealthy. I told him to stop giving me chocolate. Then he suddenly grinned and said quietly, You need chocolate in your body 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Without that, you're just a piece of meat. I thought maybe he had some strange mental illness and told him not to contact me anymore. Then, a few days later, he sent 30 boxes of chocolate to my house and told me he would no longer contact me if I sent him a video of myself eating them all. I blocked his number. I haven't seen him for a long time. I felt relieved, but the story did not end there. After a while, I heard that he had been arrested for murder. He met a girl through a dating app. 
brought her to his house, tied her to his bed, and poured hot, boiling chocolate all over her body. Her mouth had been wedged open and the autopsy showed that there were five pounds of chocolate in her stomach. And there was a video of her with Evan on her phone in which he was lying in a bathtub full of chocolate saying to her, If you can survive under this for one minute, I'll give you a hundred bucks. After the police investigated his house, they discovered something even more shocking. There was a huge block of chocolate in the basement, over seven feet long, and inside it was the dead body of a man. Everyone was shocked. I reopened the last text Evan had sent me. It read as below. I'm going to fill your body with chocolate. Your stomach and bladder will be filled with chocolate. Chocolate will flow in your veins, and if someone stabs you, chocolate will come out. You will become chocolate. You will become chocolate. At the time, I thought he was just joking, but now I realize he had meant everything he said. I started vomiting, and from then on I started to suffer from a phobia of chocolate. He went to prison, and I eventually met his mother. She told me something shocking. She said that he had harassed her for a long time too, and now just the sight of chocolates made her breathe heavily. Evan had loved chocolate since he was young, and his obsession only grew stronger as he got older. When he was about 16, he was taken to the hospital because he ate too much chocolate, and the doctor told him not to eat it at all anymore. So he said to the doctor, Then can I feed it to my mom instead? From then on, she realized that something was strange about him. He had started to force her to eat a box of chocolate every day, and she ended up secretly throwing them all away and lying to him that she had eaten them all. Then one day he came up to her with a knife and said, I have to check to see if there's chocolate in your belly. She ran away, leaving him alone and never came back. She cried, saying that she had expected an accident like this to happen someday. When I thought of him, I felt terrible about it. But for my own safety, I decided not to see him again. Time has passed, and he is still in prison. Sometimes I wonder how he's doing there. When I was ten, I was playing outside in the park with my little white bunny. I was letting her eat the grass, but suddenly she stood up. I usually don't see her do this because I never let her get near anything dangerous, but... She sensed something dangerous. I didn't know where that danger was, and I thought it was nothing. So I just continued to watch my bunny. However, she zoomed to the corner of the park fence. I was super confused. Plus, it was almost sunset, and I had to go home. So I picked her up gently, with my other hand supporting her bum. I was getting a chill, so I walked fast, in case the danger she sensed was following. I looked back and I saw a sketchy man with sunglasses. And I saw he had a bulldog with him. It was drooling, and it looked like it wanted to eat me and my bunny. So I booked it out of there. I ran as fast as I could, hoping he didn't let the dog free. I hugged my bunny near my chest so she wouldn't wobble around while I ran. And when I looked back again, his hand was on the dog's collar. He was about to remove the leash. I was tearing up, but then I saw my neighbor. He's a six foot one, 20 year old man. So I ran to him and hid behind him. He was confused about why I hid behind him. And I explained, that man is about to let his bulldog free and it might eat me and my bunny. And with that, he looked surprised and angered, probably because why would anyone do that? Don't they know if they let a big scary dog free, the dog will get shot? Even though the park was near my house, it was two minutes away, and I couldn't run any faster because I was only four foot six. He told me to get back safely with my bunny, so I did. As I was walking home, shaking, I heard my neighbor yell, If you let your bulldog free, I will call the barangay. But it seemed like the man didn't care. After a few minutes, I got home. I put down my bunny, and she hopped away slowly. I started crying, and I called for my mom. But she wasn't home, so I sat down on my bed, crying. Did I 
just get an emotional shock from a man and a bulldog? I don't know. But to this day, I avoid bringing any pets to the park that would be considered a type of prey. I'm 14 now. Although my bunny passed away due to sickness, I ask those who bring such small animals to the park to please try to avoid any big predators and strange looking men. When I was 16 years old, I had this experience with my then girlfriend, Samantha. Samantha lived in a neighboring county and didn't drive, so we rarely saw each other during the school week for any <laughs> extended period of time, especially alone. We agreed to skip school on Monday to spend time together. Being that it was Monday, I knew my father and stepmother would be at work, so we'd have the house to ourselves to play video games and just curl up on the couch to watch TV together with no distractions. The house I lived in was located in a suburban-style neighborhood, surrounded by rural countryside and woods. It was a two-story home, with three beds upstairs and one downstairs, and the entire kitchen area was covered in wood flooring. More on that later. The house also had a security system, with sensors on all entry doors, and a motion sensor pointed down toward the end of the main hallway, beyond the foyer, that led out into the kitchen. Samantha and I were upstairs looking through my brother's extensive baseball card collection and playing silly games like Never Have I Ever. When we both heard someone walking around downstairs, Samantha heard it first, then I paused and I heard it too. We both froze. Samantha asked, could one of your parents be home? We sat in complete silence in my room, listening through the open bedroom door. We could hear footsteps in the kitchen back and forth along the hardwood floor and the sound of a paper bag ruffling like the ones used at some grocery stores. The footsteps would progress slowly for several seconds, then stop. A paper bag would ruffle, then proceed for several more seconds, and the pantry door could be heard opening with its all-too-familiar squeak that was unmistakable to me. Having lived there, Samantha whispered, Are they putting groceries away? I said, It's got to be my stepmom. She's the only one who does the grocery shopping. My stepmom was far less forgiving than my dad, and being that I was skipping school with a girl in my room alone, I knew I'd be in deep shit if we got caught. Immediately, I told Samantha we needed to crawl out of my bedroom window, onto the roof, and hide until she left. We sat on the roof facing the street, waiting for nearly 45 minutes, just watching the driveway for my stepmom to leave, but she never did. And Samantha was getting impatient, as it was unbearably hot on the black shingled roof. Finally, I told her to stay put on the roof and keep a lookout a bit longer, while I went back inside to confront my stepmom. I told Samantha, I'll just tell her I was sick this morning and decided to stay home from school. I had no idea how I would get Samantha out of there, but keep in mind, I wasn't prepared for this, to say the least. As I walked into the kitchen, I called out to my stepmom, but no one replied. My parents' room was also downstairs, so I walked through the room, but no one was there. I proceeded to check every room in the house, but to my surprise, the house was completely empty. I even checked the garage, but it was empty. All of the entry doors were closed and locked, and that's when the realization hit me. All of the entry doors beep when they open, including the door leading out to the garage. And neither Samantha nor I heard any doors open, including the garage door, which could be easily heard from my bedroom, as it was directly below. Lastly, I opened the pantry hoping to cast doubt on this revelation, but I couldn't find a single new item that wasn't in there the night before. A cold chill ran down my spine. I ran upstairs and brought Samantha down from the roof, asking her if she saw anyone come or go. She saw no one, 
I never believed in ghosts before this day, and honestly, I wish I had a rational explanation for the whole experience. If my girlfriend hadn't been there to witness it with me, then I would probably chalk it all up to my mind playing tricks on me. I never actually saw a ghost, so I can't say for sure what it was, but I can tell you what we heard was real and convincing to the point that my girlfriend and I never doubted for a second at that moment that it was anything other than a person in my house putting groceries away. There was a certain alley that I passed by every day. It was so dark and narrow that very few people walked there, and it was owned by rats and cockroaches. But it was a shortcut, so I always took it. One day I was passing by and I saw a man crouching in the corner, eating something. I felt something strange, so I glanced at him as I quickly went by. He was holding a red bag. He put ketchup in it and then stuck his head in it and ate it. Then he sobbed and muttered, <laughs> It's so delicious. <laughs> mm. I thought I was strange, so I hurried out of the alley. But then I heard a loud scream from the street ahead. When I went towards the sound to investigate, I saw a person lying down and several people around him screaming. I was so confused. However, when I saw the person lying down, a scream escaped me without even realizing it. He was dead, holding his head with both eyes open, and there were large knife marks on the back of his head, and next to him was a card with the number 9 written on it. I heard someone calling the police in a trembling voice, and others sobbing and swearing. The police soon arrived and investigated the scene, but the police officer who was examining the body suddenly shouted in a loud voice, What the heck? This corpse has no brain! The scene became noisy, and police questioned people if there were any witnesses, but there were none. I remembered the man I saw in the alley and told the police. When they got to the alley, the man was already gone, and I haven't heard any news of him since. Then one night, I was walking down that alley alone. There was no one around, only the rats squeaking past, when suddenly I saw someone in front of me. It was a man. He looked at me and abruptly started rummaging through his bag. I felt something ominous and was about to turn around and leave the alley when suddenly I heard the sound of someone running behind me. I turned around. The man was running towards me with an axe held high in both hands. I started screaming and running away. He shouted and chased me. Ah, I want to eat. I ran out of the alley and screamed for help. People passing by looked at me in surprise, and when I looked back, the man was gone. From then on, I never went down the alley ever again. Several months passed without incident, and the fear was gradually forgotten. Then one day, as I was passing by the alley, a man spoke to me from inside. I heard there's a rumor that someone is eating brains in this alley these days. Would you like me to tell you the truth about it? He had gloves on both hands and was holding a red bag. At that moment, I realized who the man was. Tell me what's in that right now, I shouted, and then he laughed and said, <laughs> This is a fresh one picked right over there. It's hard to get one these days because there are so many CCTVs and police officers, but luckily, I found a drunk person sleeping, and I grabbed it right away. Once the alcohol smell goes away, it will be really delicious. Then he took something out of his bag. It was the hatchet. But you look tastier. Just stand still for five seconds. It takes a lot of concentration to hit the head in the right spot. Then he aimed the hatchet at my head as if you were throwing a dart. I was scared and ran away, and the axe flew past me close enough to move my hair and hit the wall, clanking loudly. I kept running without stopping. I looked back and saw he was eating something from the bag and waving his hand at me. I reported it to the police. 
The police arrived, but he was already gone. There was a card with the number 8 written on it in the alley. The next day, another brainless body was found near the alley, and the police began a large-scale investigation. A few months later, I heard that he had been caught. He told the police that, so far, he had eaten the brains of nine people, but only two bodies were found by the police. So when the police asked where the remaining seven bodies were, he reportedly said, Well, how do I know where the garbage goes? What are you going to do with the shells when you find them? The police kept asking him where he had dumped the bodies, but he kept saying he didn't know. Then, when the police asked what the numbers on the cards left in the alley meant, he reportedly said, Score. I've always been looking for a 10 out of 10 taste, but I haven't found it yet. Shit. <laughs> Let me go. I can never go to jail until I eat a 10. He was sentenced to life in prison, and I still can't go down that alley. When I was little, maybe eight years old, we had a neighbor who was really odd and didn't really communicate with other people that much. He would only speak a few words to one person, my dad. I still remember how he looked at the people who passed by his house with those bright blue eyes. He seemed normal for the most part. As I said, he had bright blue eyes and he was tall with tan skin and brown hair. I think he was in his early 40s. It was summertime, and my dad used to wash people's carpets as a side job. Then one day, my neighbor asked my dad if he could wash his carpet, and my dad agreed. Then the neighbor said, when you are done, just drop it in front of my house. Can you finish it in three days? My dad replied, yeah, sure, no problem. My dad finished cleaning his carpet a day early, so he decided to just bring it over to him right away. After getting there, he knocked on the door a few times but didn't get an answer. He was surprised because he knew that the man didn't have a job at the moment and that only his wife worked, but she was supposed to be home hours ago, which meant that both of them should have been there. Plus the car was parked in the garage behind the house, so he knocked again, no answer. He didn't want to disturb anyone else, so he just left. The next morning, when he came home from the market with our groceries, he looked agitated and spoke to my mom. She eventually told me that the guy had actually killed his wife while my dad was standing at the front door knocking. He had slit her throat with some kind of weapon, which was probably a huge knife or something bigger. I don't know because the guy actually had mental problems and didn't take his medicine as often as he was supposed to. He was okay when he was taking his medication, but unfortunately, his wife died that day. I really don't know what was happening in his head during these unfortunate moments. Today, I still wonder what might have happened if my dad had entered the house. I'm just glad he didn't. This story happened to my friend a few years ago. My friend's parents went out one evening to eat at a restaurant. They offered to have my friend come with them, but she had a test the day after, so she had to stay home to study. At 7 p.m., her parents left, and she was all alone. She was sitting in her room studying for a test, and after about an hour, it started to rain heavily. The noise made it difficult for her to study, so she decided to put on headphones and listened to music to help. Because she was wearing headphones, she could not hear anything. Which is why she did not hear it when, a half an hour later, her front door opened. After a while, she got thirsty. So she took off her headphones and went to the kitchen to get some water. As she was going downstairs, she heard footsteps. She knew her parents weren't supposed to be back until later, so she thought it was weird that they would be home already. She had a window by the stairs overlooking the parking lot, but when she looked out, 
she didn't see her parents' car. When she noticed that, she ran quickly back to her room and locked the door. She called her parents and told them what happened, and they immediately left the restaurant and drove home. Her dad told her to stay in her room and quietly make her way into her closet. While her parents called the police from the car, she went into the closet and stayed hidden. While she was in there, she heard the person in her house coming up the stairs and trying to open every door. When he got to her door and noticed that the door was locked, he started banging on it and trying to break it in while screaming, Let me in! Luckily, as soon as he broke down the door and entered the room, the sound of sirens blared in the distance. He ran away and my friend stayed in the closet until the police rescued her. Afterward, the police searched the whole area but did not find anyone. To this day, my friend refuses to be left home alone and has never listened to music in her headphones again. Only God knows what would have happened if she had not taken off her headphones. Hi, my name's Sarah and I'm 17, but this happened when I was 14. I live in Australia, and although I was born here, I come from a Middle Eastern background. One night I was home alone in my bedroom on my phone with the light switched on. The house was quiet, but I paid no mind as sometimes my family is quiet when they're all doing their separate things. It was nearing 9 p.m. when I heard a noise in my living room. I brushed it off by telling myself, it's just my siblings playing, and continued scrolling on my phone. But this noise continued for a few more minutes. Then I heard a loud stomping in the hallway near my door, as if someone in the house was searching for something. An uneasy feeling crept into my stomach when the noise suddenly stopped. I looked up from my phone to see a shadow outside my bedroom door. Keep in mind my bedroom door at this time didn't have a lock, as my parents believed I had no use for it. The hallway light was switched on, and I could see the shadow of someone's shoes directly outside my door, just standing there. My unease grew as normally I would just open the door to see what my family wanted, but something in my gut prevented that from happening. I decided to call my dad and see if he was home. When he answered, I heard talking in the background. My house was silent. This made me realize he wasn't home. Bob, are you home? No, I'm not. I'm at your auntie's house. Why? What's wrong? Not wanting to scare him with something that was mindless, I continued staring at the shoes as I responded, Nothing's wrong. I was just asking. The call ended shortly after, and I decided to call my mom. When she answered, she immediately asked what was wrong instead of calling out from the living room like she normally would if I called her. What's wrong? she asked. Are you home? I replied, taking my eyes off the shoes. No, your siblings wanted to go to your cousin's house, so I took them. Why? Now, being completely terrified but still uncertain, I just told her to come home quickly because I didn't want to be alone. When the call ended, I looked towards my room and the shadow of the shoes was gone. There was silence for a minute or so until my stomach turned, now angrier and harsher than before. I was shaking now and didn't know what to do, as I was in my room with no lock and nothing to defend myself with. Needing reassurance, I called my friend who understood my fear and told me to sit against the door. I listened to her and she stayed on the call with me until the house was silent and my mother got home. When I opened the door to her, I told her everything that had happened. She began searching the house for someone or any missing items. There was nothing. The only thing out of place was the laundry room window that was wide open, which wasn't the way it was left. My parents made sure to lock all the windows, and after a day or so, nothing else happened. So the incident was forgotten. It's been years now since it happened, but I will still never forget the fact that someone or something was in my house, right outside my room. Just wait. This story took place in California. My parents had left me home alone for the week. I loved being home alone because I could invite my friends or my girlfriend over. But this one night, I decided to invite my friends Timmy and Jack. Jack and I were pretty close because we'd been friends for three years, while Timmy and I had met at the gym about five months ago. But Timmy and I were 
still like brothers. Anyway, they get there, and we're having a good time, but we start getting hungry. I wanted some pizza, but Jack wanted sushi, so we played rock, paper, scissors. I won, so we went to go get some pizza from a local pizza shop. I had my own car, a little GMC truck that my dad had bought me on my 17th birthday that we took to the pizza shop. We ordered three pizzas and one two liter of coke. As we were leaving, I realized I had forgotten to lock the door to my house, so I got a little worried that someone might break in. When we got there, the front door was wide open. We left the pizzas in the car and decided to go in. Timmy told me he had some spray paint, so if there was anyone trying to hurt us, he could spray them in the eyes. I told him that was a good idea. Jack went in first, then Timmy. I was last because, well, I was scared. We searched everywhere, but we didn't find anyone. However, we didn't check in my parents' bathroom. We all went to check together. Jack went in first because he just wanted this to be over with and eat pizza. But when he stepped foot into that bathroom, some guy jumped out from behind the shower curtain and started choking Jack. So Timmy sprayed him with the spray paint and the guy started screaming in pain. Then I kicked him right in the side of the head, which ended up knocking him out. We called the police quickly after, and as it turns out, he was a wanted thief from Arizona. Jack and I are still friends, but Timmy moved to a different city. Every time we get together, we still laugh about that day. I'm a 25-year-old guy from Australia, and this happened to me when I was around 13 years old. I've lived in the same house for my entire life. My parents bought the house and moved in before my older sister and I were born. When they moved in, there was a huge tapestry of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper hanging on the wall in the hallway. My parents found that a bit strange, as the previous owners took all the other furniture and pictures with them when they moved out. As the tapestry covered a large, empty space of the wall, they decided to just leave it hanging there. For context, my bedroom door was directly across from the tapestry in the hallway, such that when my bedroom door was open, and I was lying on my bed, I could see it hanging on the wall directly through my open bedroom door. As a little kid, I always used to sleep with my bedroom door open, and for some reason, the tapestry always gave me the creeps. I hated looking at it through my open door, especially at night. Over the years, I eventually just got used to it. When I was 13, my parents decided to buy me a double bed. I was so excited. And as soon as I got to use my new bed, I always slept in the same position on the left side of the bed, facing my left bedroom wall. A year or so later, my dad decided to repaint the hallway a different color, and during that time he had to take the tapestry down. My parents then decided that the hallway looked better without the tapestry, so they didn't hang it back up. After a few nights of the tapestry being down, I had a horrible nightmare. In the nightmare, I was lying in my bed just like I was before I fell asleep. I then looked up and there was a black, demon-looking creature climbing up my right side bedroom wall, and I was absolutely terrified. It had black, scaly-looking skin, a long, pointed tail, and completely black eyes with red slit-like pupils, the kind that goats have. It opened its mouth and made an awful screaming sound and revealed its sharp, pointed teeth. I then woke up. My heart was racing and I was covered in sweat. I was on the right side of my double bed, facing the wall that the demon was climbing up in my nightmare. I was instantly freaked out because I always slept on the left side of my double bed, facing the opposite wall. I eventually calmed down enough to go back to sleep. Almost every night for around the next month, I kept having the same nightmare over and over again, and also kept waking up facing that same wall on the opposite side of my bed that I didn't sleep on. Each night, 
I found it harder and harder to wake myself up and pull myself out of that nightmare. It got to the point where I was scared to fall asleep as I worried that eventually, one night, I wouldn't be able to wake myself up. And I didn't want to find out what would happen to me in the nightmare if I couldn't. I went for several nights with only one or two hours of sleep and then without sleeping altogether. Eventually, time passed and the nightmare stopped. Looking back at it now, it makes me wonder, why did the previous owners of our house put up the tapestry in the first place and then decide to leave it there when they moved out? It makes me think that they might have hung it up for a reason, maybe as some kind of protection from the demon-like creature. I'm not a religious person, but maybe they believed that the depiction of Jesus in the tapestry would protect them and keep the demon away. All I know is that soon after we took it down, the nightmare started. Over a decade later, I still get chills when I think about those nightmares. I can still picture the demon-like creature so clearly in my mind. I hope I never have to see it ever again. I was staying with my grandparents for the summer. They lived in a small town on the countryside where everyone knew everyone else. The first time I went to their house, I met this strange lady. Her name was Susie, and she was their neighbor. She was in her mid-fifties, lived alone, and was always nice to everyone. She often came over to the house to talk to my grandma. One day, I was about 12 at the time, I was playing with my friend. We heard whispering coming from behind us. We looked around and saw her. She was talking to someone she called Tommy. Nothing seemed to be wrong, but remember, everyone knew everyone. And even my friend, who had lived there all his life, didn't know the boy. When we approached her, we asked, Who are you talking to, Miss Susie? She looked at us, smiled, and said, My little friend, Tommy. We looked to see where she was facing, but didn't see anybody there. She was still talking, and we ran away to my house. We told my grandma and she said her son Tommy had died years ago. A chill went down my spine. The next day, I saw her and asked about Tommy, and she said he was home. I asked if Tommy could come over to play tonight, and she said that he was okay. This is where my story gets even more creepy. My grandparents drove over to my parents' house in the city to pick up some more clothes for me, so I was home alone. They said I should ask my friend's parents if he could sleep over, so I did. Because we were old enough and they lived close by, they said yes. So that same night, we played video games and watched TV till 11 o'clock. We went to bed and then about 12.30 a.m., we heard it. Two knocks on the door. It couldn't have been my grandparents because they said they weren't coming back until the next morning. The knocking continued until we stupidly opened it. We were shocked. There was a boy standing outside. We couldn't see his face, but he looked about 10. We asked who he was and he said in a spine chilling voice, Tommy. He lifted his head and then we finally saw his face. It was pale and had black holes instead of eyes. He said, I came to play in a loud demonic voice. We shut the door and ran to my room, scared out of our minds. The next morning, we woke up drenched in sweat. My grandparents opened the door and woke us up. We haven't told anyone till today. I'm 15 now, and it still feels like it happened yesterday. I just want to share a story from when I was a kid. I was five years old at the time. It was around midnight and I was watching some late night shows while my mother was already sleeping. My mom let me watch movies on TV even if it was late since she would work late as well. So she didn't have time to be mad at me. She was a bar entertainer even though she graduated with a bachelor's degree. She chose to work at the bar since it was much more convenient for her schedule. We only had each other and we didn't have enough money to pay for someone to watch me. Going back to the story, as I watched the last show, around 12 a.m. as the music of the Philippine anthem was shown, I decided to turn off the TV and sleep beside my mother. 
As I turned around, I saw through our window a shadow lurking right above my mother's head. I adjusted my eyes, and when I could see it clearly, it was wearing a cloak. A black cloak. However, the scary part is that it had no face at all. I'm sure if it had a face, I would have definitely seen it since the moon was so bright that night. There was just like an empty space on its head, and it was like the cloak was floating in midair. I stared at it for more than 10 seconds because I was so scared to move at all. I didn't even have time to freak out. After a minute or two, it began to move away from the window, but instead of turning around, it slowly melted down. I'm not quite sure where it went. It was like it was being pulled down by hell. I began hugging my mother tightly and fell asleep. As I woke up, I still remember what happened and crossed my heart. I also remembered what the black cloak said. Three, five, eight. I thought it was just a random number that I misheard, but once I got older and recalled everything more clearly, I realized it was the date my mother died. My mother died on March 5th, 2008. I don't know if it was Death himself trying to warn me, but to this day, what ifs are still running through my mind? What if I had tried to look closer at it? What would have happened to me? Hi, my name is Mimi, and I've always been able to sense and see the paranormal. It first started when I was seven, and ever since then, I've never stopped encountering them. This is one of my bizarre experiences. I was 13 at that time, and I often had to stay home alone since both my parents were out working until late in the afternoon, and my older sister usually came home pretty late from high school. One day, I was watching TV and just chilling in the living room. It was around 3.30 p.m., and suddenly the doorbell rang. It was my mom. I was glad because I was getting pretty bored by myself. My mom freshened up and we had lunch together while talking about a lot of things. I felt relieved that I wasn't alone anymore. Even though I was pretty used to being home alone, I still felt kind of lonely at times. After finishing our meals, my mom and I went to our separate rooms and did our own things. Surprisingly, even though my mom was at home, I didn't hear anything from that room. Usually when my mom was at home, you could always feel her presence and she would be very active. In fact, she barely stays in her and my dad's room. Even though it was a little strange, I soon brushed it off as I thought she might be tired and just took a nap or something. An hour passed quickly and I was too busy chilling in my room, so I didn't think much about the strange silence in the house. It was around 5 p.m. when the doorbell rang again and I assumed my sister came back from school. However, as I looked through the door, chills went down my spine. It was my mom who was standing outside. But how was this possible? Mom was just in her room and she never went out, even if she did. I I would have heard something. She never goes out without informing us, and this part is as scary as it gets. She was wearing the same clothes when she went to work and was even carrying the same bag. I froze in fear. If this was mom, then who was the one who I talked to and had lunch with? My heart was beating loudly against my chest, and I mustered up all my courage and opened the door. My mom came in and behaved how she normally would, then went to her room to freshen up. Surely I couldn't have imagined this whole thing, right? I then ran to the kitchen, and to my horror, there were two plates in the kitchen sink, both recently eaten off of. I felt like I was going crazy. What the hell was happening to me? Even though I was flabbergasted and didn't know what to do or how to react, I knew that I wasn't dreaming or imagining things, and I very much knew the difference between imagination and reality. I was really spooked out by the experience, but I calmed down after a while. After all, this was not completely unfamiliar, as I've had many strange and paranormal experiences before. What makes me wonder to this day is who I really talked to and had lunch with, and what they wanted from me. I'm 18 now, and these bizarre and out of the ordinary incidents are still going on with me. But by now, I've grown accustomed to them, even though they still scare me sometimes. A lot.
I was being chased by creatures in an unfamiliar town with no one around. I screamed for help, but when they heard my voice, even more monsters came barreling out at me. Each of the monsters had a terrible appearance, but one in particular, a monster with a huge bat-like head and a snake's tongue rushed me to bend my leg with its huge icicle-like teeth. I screamed in terrible pain and hit its head like crazy. Then it screamed and pushed me. I fell backward and hit my head. It was at that moment that I woke up. It was 4 a.m. It's already been two weeks since the nightmares about those monsters started. My hand where I hit the monster in my dream was tingling. I stood up and fiddled with my hands, but my legs suddenly hurt and I fell to the floor. When I looked at my legs, they had turned black. That was where I had been bedding in my dream. Holy crap, did I really just get bedding? My leg hurt so much that I ended up going to the hospital, and the doctor looked at my leg, tilted his head quizzically, and said, Your leg is rotting. Have you ever been stabbed by a rusty nail? I said in surprise. I've been bitten, but I don't know if they were rusty. What? You got bitten? I immediately realized it was a dream and covered my mouth. It was so vivid. Uh, actually nothing happened. Then the doctor looked at me strangely and said, We need to get you into surgery right away. Make sure you don't get bitten again. Afterward, the doctor said the surgery went well and wished me good luck. As I left the hospital, I looked at the darkening sky. I hope those ugly guys don't show up again tonight. I took a hammer out of the storage room and slept with it next to my bed. Then I was dreaming again. I was standing in a deserted village and there was a hammer next to me. After a while, the monsters came running, really, and I picked up the hammer and hit them hard. It felt like I had been fighting with them for ten hours straight, and when I woke up from my dream, my blanket was all soaked with sweat. In the hand that had been holding the hammer was bruised and scuffed. This dream continued to haunt me day after day, and I became exhausted. I felt like I needed to do something, but I didn't know what. Then a few days later, I went to the doctor to check on the surgery site and heard some shocking news. He said that the number of patients visiting hospitals with rotting skin had spiked. He said it was really strange and kept shaking his head. I met some of the other patients, and at first, they just stared out the window blankly without saying anything. When I brought up the dream, everyone was shocked and said that they had been bitten by monsters in their dreams too. I was stunned, and one of them said that if you killed the monsters, their numbers would decrease. After hearing that, I decided to kill all the monsters. Every night, my battle continued. I smashed the heads of dozens of monsters and kept count. Every night, I danced to the sounds of the monsters' footsteps, sang to their groans, and cheered to their cries. I was becoming a monster. Eventually, the numbers of monsters began to decrease little by little, and the monsters, which used to fill the village, were down to about three or four. We patients gathered together regularly and shared our dreams every day. A few weeks later, I went to a meeting and heard some appalling news. One of the members, Jeremy, had died the previous night. He died suddenly in his sleep. But the strange part was that his head had been burned black and there were no signs of anyone else in the house. Everyone was taken aback. That night, I saw a huge monster in my dream. He was enormous, perhaps ten feet tall. Had only one arm and hot smoke poured from his hand. He reached out his massive hand and tried to grab my head and the intense heat made it impossible for me to breathe. I dodged out of the way and hit his arm with my hammer, but his arm was as strong as a telephone pole. He kept trying to grab my head, but I kept dodging and striking out at his arm with the hammer until his arm broke with a loud bang. Smoke filled my face. At that moment, I woke up coughing. Fortunately, I had broken the monster's arm, but he wasn't dead yet. I knew he would come for me again. A few days later, the same monster was running towards me with its mouth gaping and spouting hot smoke. And I hit the monster's head with my hammer as hard as I could. Its head finally cracked and hot liquid spewed out from inside. As the liquid splashed onto my forearm, I felt a searing pain. Then it fell to the ground and its eyeballs rolled out of its head. 
The eyeballs were like black beads, and I picked one up. At that moment, I woke up from my dream and felt something in my hand. In surprise, I looked in my hand and saw that it was holding a black bead. I stared at it blankly, and then, suddenly, smoke just started jetting out. I dropped it because it was hot, and it bubbled and burned and disappeared. From that day on, I never had those nightmares again. What exactly were those dreams? Was it all just a delusion, or did it really happen? This is a creepy incident that happened about three years ago when I moved to a new neighborhood. The housing there was really cheap, and it was a very quiet neighborhood, so I really liked it. I was resting at home just a few days after moving in, when a rotten smell suddenly hit me. I followed the smell to where it had come from, and it was the entrance. So I opened the front door, and there was a girl standing there. She was wearing torn clothes covered in dirt. Her hair had fallen out, with only a few strands remaining. Her skin was rotten in many places, and she was covered in bugs that were eating away at her. I screamed, ah, It's a zombie! She grabbed the door with her rotten hands and opened her mouth wide as she pushed her face through the crack of the door. Her jaw split open until her mouth touched her chest. I screamed at the top of my lungs, and then suddenly, she disappeared. Ah, Rose came to say hello to you. It was the voice of Tom next door. He was walking up to my house. When you meet her, you must give her some candy. Otherwise, she'll have a hard time. She's the reason we have so many candy stores in our neighborhood. As he said that, he gave me a piece of candy and walked back to his house. I was in a daze. I couldn't understand anything he was saying at all. Her face kept popping into my head for the rest of the day. The rotten skin, the smell, and even the creaking sounds of her bones when her mouth opened. I tried to forget about it, but I kept thinking about it until I fell asleep. What on earth was she? Is someone filming a horror movie nearby? After thinking about all sorts of possibilities, I opened my eyes to find it was morning. I was driving to work when the car suddenly thumped as if it had hit something. I was so surprised that I stopped the car and jumped out. That girl was in front of my car. The front bumper of my car was all dented, and she looked at me with her body all contorted. I got goosebumps all over my body. She stood up and adjusted every twisted bone. Then she came towards me and stretched out her hand. Her hands were full of candy remnants. When she, when she opened her mouth, ants crawled all over her rotten teeth. I screamed like crazy, and Tom came running out from next door. Here! He threw some candy at the girl and went back into his house. She took Tom's candy, ate it, ran to his house, and stood in front of the door for a while. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then I realized something. Her hair and clothes didn't move at all, and she moved as if gravity didn't exist. My vision suddenly turned dark. When I opened my eyes, I was lying in a bed at Tom's house. I was startled and jumped up, but my head hurt so much that I fell down again. Tom, what's going on? Tom sighed. If you stay in the same place as Rose for a long time, the cells in your body start to die. You may have noticed, but she's not a living being. Everything around her loses its vitality. Trees, flowers, animals, even oxygen. 20% of the deaths that occur in our neighborhood are unsolved. Why? Because the culprit is not from this world. I got goosebumps again, but I also thought that Tom was making fun of me. I couldn't believe it because I've never seen anything like a ghost in my life. But from then on, I always carried candy in my pocket. And every time I ran into her, I threw her a piece of candy and ran away. One time, I accidentally threw the candy too high, and another hand came out of her mouth and snatched it away. It was only then that I realized what Tom said was true. I went to Tom's house and asked him about the people who had died because of her. At first, he waved his hands saying he didn't want to even think about it. But when I persisted, he eventually started talking. The first was Chase, a strapping 18-year-old man who mistook Rose for a person. Up until then, her face had not rotted and she was quite pretty. So he kissed her. And a few hours later, he vomited out blood and died. When the autopsy was performed, hundreds of bugs were found in his body. 
They had eaten all of his organs. Of course, the police could not find the cause. It doesn't make any sense. I know. What about the next person? He was silent for a moment and poured himself a cup of coffee. I could see his hand shaking. It was a middle-aged woman named Nicole. But one day she was found dead with a snake stuck in her throat. The police were unable to find any evidence, and the case remained unsolved. We thought it was Rose who did it, because Nicole always said, Go away, Satan, whenever Rose appeared. I guess Rose didn't want to hear that. My body was shaking from the shock. You'd better stop. I don't want to puke in your house. Yeah, but if you just carry candy, our neighborhood is a really nice place to live. <laughs> he smiled awkwardly and handed me some candy. I always carried candy with me after that, and lived uneventfully for several months. Then one day, I ran into Rose as I was coming out of the house, and the moment I put my hand into my pocket, I realized I'd forgotten to grab candy, but I was too lazy to go get some, so I just tried to quickly run past her. That was a terrible mistake. Suddenly, her tongue stretched out and wrapped around my body. I barely managed to shake it off and run away. That night, the skin all over my body turned red, and I suffered from tremendous pain. I was so sick that I went to the hospital. The doctor said that there was a toxic substance all over my skin and asked what happened. I was so angry, so I decided to get revenge on Rose. I started carrying an iron ball with me, and when I ran into her again sometime later, I threw the ball at her and shouted, It's a new kind of candy! She took the iron ball, put it in her mouth, and swallowed it. Moments later, she fell to the floor in incredible pain, clutching her neck and crawled away writhing. She hadn't been seen in town since then, and it's rumored that she simply disappeared. People started walking around the quiet streets furtively. People held a candy smashing festival, saying that they can finally go around without candy. I was proud that I had defeated her. Then one day, I was walking around the neighborhood. I saw a huge man eating cotton candy. However, upon closer inspection, it was not a man, but Rose. She looked completely different from before. The skin all over her body seemed to be covered with gray stones. Her neck had become thick like a toad. I screamed at her grotesque appearance, and she opened her mouth very wide and ran towards me. I smelled a strong mixture of sweet and rotten, and I ran for my life. She retched and expelled a hot, sticky liquid all over me. The liquid covered me completely, and as the liquid gradually hardened, my body also began to harden along with it. I thought, this is how I die. Then I heard someone shout, Here's a big piece of candy! And she stopped and turned her head. Tom and a priest were standing there. The priest threw a large water balloon at her, which she caught and swallowed. Then suddenly, she became extremely distressed. Her body began to melt, and she dissolved into the ground and disappeared. What the priest had thrown was a water balloon filled with holy water. Tom broke me free from this weird shell she had encased me in. I packed my bags and moved away the next day. I don't know what happened to her after that. Tom said she was completely gone, but I think she will come back again someday. This happened eight years ago, when I was working as a taxi driver. I haven't been able to get behind the wheel of a car since this incident. On that night, which I still remember vividly, the moonlight was unusually blue and cold. Around 2 a.m., I was tired and wanted to go home. At that time, the backseat car door suddenly opened, and a man wearing a red fedora and red suit got into my car. There was no one around, so I was startled that this man just suddenly appeared. I clutched my chest. He was wearing red sunglasses. His face, just slightly visible in the darkness, was gaunt, and his cheekbones were severely exposed. I asked him, where he was going. Then he gave a strange answer. To a place you will hate so much. His voice sounded like it was leaking air. I thought he was a strange person, but I tried to speak calmly. Sir, please tell me your destination and I'll take you there quickly. I need to go home soon and see my wife for even just one more minute. Oh, that's romantic. 
I think it was a good decision to choose you. He was giggling obnoxiously, and I thought he was crazy. I was thinking about throwing him out, but then he said, There's a cemetery about ten miles from here. Let's just go there. I was a little annoyed, but all I could think about was quickly dropping him off and going home, so I started the car. I was nervous and wanted to lighten the mood, so I spoke to him. What do you do? I'm a delivery man. His voice still sounded like there was air escaping. Oh yeah? What are you delivering? I'm delivering something very interesting. I'm delivering it right now. Yeah? You're delivering now? But you're not holding anything. Then he started laughing out loud. And at that moment, dust flew out of his mouth. I was shocked. All of his teeth, visible from his open mouth, were rotten. His gums were missing. His tongue was rotten, disgusting, dry, like a mummy. For a moment, I was confused as to whether I had seen an illusion. Then I saw a cemetery ahead, and he said something I couldn't understand. Oh, it's about time. Goodbye. He hummed an unknown song and rolled up his sleeves, revealing his rotten, dry, bony arms. Then suddenly, he came closer to me, put his hand in my mouth. I was startled and tried to stop him. The car lurched forward and backward, and before I knew it, his hand was down my throat. Then I felt his hand grabbing my heart. I was in tremendous pain. I screamed, turning the steering wheel and slammed the brakes. At that time, the man whispered something in my ear. At the same time, I heard the sound of the car wheels screeching and everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I was lying in a hospital bed and my wife was next to me, crying. She said when she saw me waking up, Are you okay? The doctor said you almost died from a heart attack, but you survived. I was floored. I suddenly remembered the man and asked her, What happened to the man in my back seat? Then she looked at me with a questioning look and said, What man? You were riding alone. Could it be that your brain is also injured? Doctor! She began sobbing. The man in red! No matter how much I shouted, she just cried. I was so stunned and the rescue workers who came to the scene also said that there was no one in my car but me. I thought the conversation with the backseat passenger might be on the dash cam, so I asked my wife to get the dash cam. And when we played the video, we couldn't believe it. The man's voice couldn't be heard, only the sound of air leaking. My wife was confused and asked what the sound of air leaking was. Even when I showed it to the other people, none of them could understand what the sound was. Only I could recognize his voice. I panicked. What on earth was that man? I clearly remembered his red fedora shining in the moonlight, his creepy voice. They were so vivid. But I couldn't quite remember what he last whispered in my ear. Obviously, I fainted when I heard that. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't remember. Then, in the wee hours of the morning, I suddenly started getting goosebumps all over my body, like crazy. My body started shaking so much that the bed shook too. The reason was because I remember the words he whispered. What he said. I deliver people to the afterlife. Hello, my name is Joy. This happened in 2015 when I was in my 20s. I lived with my aunt and had been a working student for 10 years. There were six of us living in the house. My aunt, my uncle, their two daughters, my grandma, and me. It was around 10.30 a.m. one day and I was exhausted from not being able to sleep early the night before. So I slept for a while. I had a dream about two children, a boy and a girl, running around the house. As I remember, they're a bit chubby and wearing a white sleeveless and short pants. The boy's haircut was skinhead type and the girl's hairstyle was short hair that leveled on her cheek. 
They were around five years of age. They looked so happy playing around the house. Then they appeared in front of me, and I saw a blurry image of myself in them. They stood there for a while. I noticed that I had been on sleep paralysis. The boy grabbed my arm like he was pulling down. At the same time, the girl was just staring. The boy just keeps pulling on me. I keep fighting, even though I couldn't move my entire body, and I prayed. And I awoke in an instant. I never experienced or dreamed about them again after that. Two years had passed, and my grandma and I were folding our clothes in the same house. While we were talking, she was talking about her experience with sleep paralysis. As I was listening attentively, she mentioned she experienced sleep paralysis maybe 40 years ago in our old house. She told me she saw two children during her sleep paralysis. She said the children were playing at first, and then the boy appeared above her and the girl simply stared. I was shocked and asked her about what they looked like. As she was describing the children, I froze for a while and felt goosebumps on my whole body. Her experience 40 years ago was the same as mine eight years ago, and we still have no idea who those children were. I'm still not sure why my grandmother and I had the same sleep paralysis in different houses and years. Are we being followed by ghosts? I was awoken by the sound of static coming from my TV. Confused, I got up from the couch I was sleeping on and gave it a little kick, but it still wouldn't turn on. I didn't find this strange because we'd been having snowstorms for the past week and figured it'd be up and running the minute the weather cleared. I was just about to go back to sleep, but then I remembered I had bought something for my dog the day before. Dog Buttons was the name of the package and it was basically a box with multiple buttons inside. The buttons had recordings on them and were supposed to allow the dog to communicate with its owner. I set out the buttons on the ground and brought my dog to them, but he didn't seem to be interested. A few days passed and I was lying on my couch again and watching TV, like I always did when I had free time. I suddenly heard the word, stranger, from one of the buttons behind me. I looked over the couch to see that my dog still had his paw on the button, as if he wanted me to know it wasn't an accident. Stranger? Where? I asked, confused. Here, I heard come from another one of the buttons. My heart started to race and my hands and forehead felt sweaty. What the heck? I thought to myself. I tried to brush it off, but I couldn't, so I went upstairs to my room and went to sleep. An hour or so passed and I woke to the sound of the glass from my front door breaking. I immediately got up and looked out the window, thinking someone had broken in. But no. Someone was breaking out. There stood a creature, tall and pale. It only had eyes, no mouth, no nose, just eyes. It had two pairs of arms, two at its shoulders and two on its back. It then slowly began to stand on its legs and its head started to twitch maniacally. It barked, then let out the most blood-curdling screech imaginable. It then ran into the woods, where it was never to be seen again. My name is Lujane, and I'm 14 years old. I was born in Austria and have three siblings. They consist of two brothers and one sister. This incident occurred two days ago to my 19-year-old brother, Malik. My brother works as a receptionist in a hotel and is mostly required to work the night shift. Due to the illness of a colleague, his supervisor asked him to work the night shift two days ago. Frustrated, my brother left at midnight and drove to his workplace. Since it was night and he worked at a small hotel, only a few customers came out in the middle of the night. So he decided to watch Netflix on his phone. However, he wasn't the only person on duty. His friend was sitting in the upstairs reception, just as bored as him. At about 5 a.m., my brother had to use the restroom, so he left his desk. While he was in the restroom, his phone rang and he saw it was from his friend who worked on the floor above him. Confused, my brother picked up the call and answered. Hello? Okay, don't panic, but a sketchy guy just walked in. I'm watching the camera footage. He's got something in his pocket and he's going through your desk. My brother slowly pressed his ear against the door and heard someone going through his stuff. He slowly placed his hand on the door handle and swung it open in one swift motion. Sure enough, there stood an average man about my brother's height but a little more buff, wearing a fake Gucci hat, 
black shorts that reached his knees, and a waist bag. The man appeared to be in his late 20s with dark brown hair and a calm but sinister expression on his face. On seeing my brother, the man ran outside. My brother ran after him and tackled him to the ground. They fought for some time, throwing punches and kicks. At one point, the man tried to choke my brother. My brother's friend was still on the phone with him while all this was going on. He witnessed everything. And it was caught on camera. As the events progressed, he called the police. Meanwhile, five people were watching the fight from the balcony. My brother screamed for help, but no one came to his aid. They just stood there and did nothing. A random guy screamed, let him go, to my brother. They thought it was a childish brawl. Finally, the cops arrived and handcuffed the man. Surprisingly, he began screaming in a language that no one understood. When they tried to talk to him, they discovered he didn't speak English or German. He appeared to be Romanian or something. When the police looked through his records, they found nothing. He didn't have a passport and had entered the country illegally. The cops then praised my brother for his bravery. My brother went to the hospital at 6 a.m. to have his wounds examined. He appeared to have broken his arm and had a few bruises and scratches on his face. His shoulder hurt a lot and he couldn't move around much. When my parents found out, they told my brother how dangerous the situation was and to be careful next time. When my brother's friend showed me a video of the CCTV footage on his phone, it was clear that the guy had no idea what he was looking for. It's like it came unplanned and it just backfired for him. I saw how my brother and the guy fought outside the hotel's front door. There wasn't a camera view from the outside, but there was on the inside. What scared me the most was how calm his expression was when he was screaming as the cops were holding him down. That madman is in prison now, and that's what he deserves. Ultimately, I'm proud of my brother for his bravery that night. My little brother sees my big brother as his biggest hero and is more proud of him than I am. That night will haunt my brother for a long time. There is a sentence that I fear the most. The phrase is, what do you want? Now I'm going to tell you why I'm afraid of these words. Three years ago, I met this man, Steve, by chance. I met him through a friend. As soon as he saw me, he said he had found his dream girl and that he would do anything I wanted. When I asked him to prove it, he ran into the kitchen, grabbed the knife, and said he would show me his heart. I was surprised and held his hand, and from then on, our romance began. Then, one day, during a date, Steve asked, Is there anything you want to do these days? I said jokingly, I want to kick my boss's ass. That's a good idea, he said with a smile, and I just smiled. But the next day, he messaged me saying he broke my boss's hip bone. I thought he was joking, but the next day, my boss called me and said he was in the hospital. He said he got his ass beaten by some crazy guy. I was shocked and called Steve, and he told me, Your boss can't even walk. How are you feeling? Refreshed now? I had to pay a lot of money for the settlement, but that's okay. I was shocked and angry at him. I yelled at him and asked him why he did that. He said, as if he was embarrassed, Uh... Wasn't that what you wanted? From then on, I thought I shouldn't even joke with him. Then, sometime later, while shopping with him, I looked at a luxury bag and blurted out something without realizing it. Wow, if I had that bag, I would be happy even if I ate poop! But after saying that, I felt a strange gaze on me, so I looked to the side. Steve was looking at me with big eyes. With a trembling voice, I asked why. Then he looked at the bag and said, I'll be right back. And then he quickly ran outside. I called him, but he didn't stop, and I didn't know where he was going. A day or two passed, and no news was heard from him. I was overwhelmed with anxiety. A few more days passed, and Steve came to see me. He smiled brightly and walked toward me like a fashion show, holding the bag. Now who's the happiest in the world? How did you buy it? It's hard to buy that even if you save up your salary for, like, three months, I asked in surprise. My fists were having a hard time. I think I robbed, like, 12 people. Now, is there anything else you want? I was shocked and speechless. Oh, is it that touching? 
He was still grinning, unable to understand the situation. I felt like he wasn't normal and I couldn't handle him anymore, so I told him I was breaking up with him. Then his expression changed as if he had been hit in the back of his head, and he asked, That was a joke, right? I said with a serious expression that it wasn't a joke, (laughs) but he smiled and said, That's funny. (laughs) I said firmly that I wanted to end the relationship. Then, with his eyes twitching, he said, If that's what you want, we should break up. But we can still be friends even after we break up, right? No, let's never see each other again. That's impossible for me. If it's too hard, just think that I don't exist in this world anymore. Close your eyes and imagine that I have left this world. He sobbed and ran out, so I thought I was done with him. But after some time, someone knocked on my house during the night. When I looked out the window, it was Steve, and I screamed in anger. I definitely told you to forget about me. No matter how hard I try to erase you from my mind, I can't. So I guess I'll just have to get rid of you. He had a big pit bull with him, and I was shocked and called the police. He was arrested by the police who soon arrived. I told the police that he planned to make my face unrecognizable by having the pit bull bite my face. The idea was that if he did that, he would be able to forget my face. He ended up going to jail and I moved out. However, sometime later, after he was released from prison, he sent me a text message and the contents of the text message were as follows. I haven't forgotten you yet. Soon, I'll destroy you completely. I'm Maya, and this story takes place when me and my family went on a cruise ship for our holidays. I can say confidently that this event is one that I will never, ever forget. Just for context, my family consists plainly of just me, my mom, and my dad. I was around 10 years old, and being such a young girl, I got bored easily. My parents wanted to check out the bar, obviously they couldn't bring me, so they left me in the kids' area. It was a place where parents could leave their kids under the supervision of the crew's staff. I met many other kids there, and soon I became friends with two girls, let's call them Emily and Rosa, who were both roughly the same age as me. As we were all chatting, Rosa suggested that we play hide-and-seek. She told Emily to count and then grabbed me, saying she knew a perfect place to hide where Emily would definitely not find us. So, as Emily started counting, Rosa took my arm and showed me the hiding place. Opening a door, Rosa pointed down a flight of stairs. We go down there, Rosa said. At first, I was a little reluctant as the crew staff had told everyone before boarding that only staff were allowed to enter this area. But Rosa kept on begging and begging, so finally I agreed. As we made our way down the stairs, we started looking for rooms to hide in, and that's when I saw it. It was at the end of the corridor. A large, wooden door. As Rosa and I got closer, we could see the dust that covered the door. We could smell something rotten coming from the wisps of aged wood. Looking back at it now, these were obvious red flags. But Rosa and I were young and naive, so we entered anyway. It didn't take much strength to open the door, as it already looked fragile enough that a strong gust could break it down instantly. We entered, and it was pitch black. Rosa had a mini flashlight in her pocket, and that's what we used to illuminate the room. We could hear the faint sound of Emily's voice searching for us, and we couldn't help but giggle. We knew it would be ages till Emily found us, and that was somehow hilarious to us. But that's when things started going south. Rosa had gotten up and decided to explore this old room. She took the flashlight with her, so I was left in the dark. She told me to stay next to the door to see if Emily was coming. Rosa went off wandering into the pitch black silence, and that's how it was for a few seconds. Just pitch black silence. Until Rosa's screams and rapid footsteps filled up the room. I remember her running to me, grabbing my hand, and us bolting through the door and up the stairs back to the kids' area. Rosa's face was white, all the color drained, and I could see tears forming in her eyes. 
I asked her what happened, and that's when she told me. The real reason Rosa wanted to hide in this area was not because she actually wanted to play hide-and-seek, but because during the night in her bed, she would hear these awful clicking noises that kept her awake for most of the night. Seeing as her room was directly above this one, she suspected that the noise was coming from this room. While she was exploring the dark room, Rosa heard the clicking noise she had heard every single night and went towards it. That's when she saw the source of the noise. It was a woman, thin, with black hair tied in a disheveled bun. She had massive eyes and an awful, awful smile, which showed her mouth with no teeth. Wearing ripped clothes, and the areas that weren't ripped were covered in what looked like blood. The woman had seen Rosa and began chasing her, chasing Rosa but on her hands and knees like a dog. And that's when Rosa grabbed me and we escaped. From then on, the cruise for me was ruined. Rosa stopped coming to the kids' area, and I started having nightmares of the woman as I went to sleep. Luckily, the cruise was over soon. I was so glad to be away from that horror boat. My name is Gus, and this is my story. This took place when I was about 15 years old. It all started during the summer break. Spencer, one of my friends, said he and two others, Jose and Marco, were going up to his beach cottage for three days and asked if I wanted to join them. I asked my mother, and she gave me the green light. I packed my bag and said goodbye to my family. Once we arrived, Spencer's mom made us her famous homemade peanut butter cookies. After that, we all went swimming in the lake, played volleyball in the sand, and overall had a blast until that night. I got an idea. How about we all go explore the woods, said Spencer. It's dark out, man. Can't we explore it during the day, replied Jose. Now, where's the fun in that, I said. I'm down if you're all down, Marco said. We all nodded our heads and prepared to head out. Spencer got a lantern, Marco and I got flashlights, and Jose got a fire extinguisher and a lighter. Okay, I somewhat understand the lighter, but why the fire extinguisher? Marco said. You don't know what could be out there, man. Take it from me, Jose replied. With that, we walked out the back door and into the woods, following the train. We began to hear a strange noise coming from our left, toward the beach. About five minutes in, our suspicion grew as we heard it get closer. We all formed a circle in an instant to see what was going on in all directions. That's when we heard a man yelling at the top of his lungs and he was getting closer by the second. I pointed my flashlight in the direction I heard the noise and what I saw terrified me. An old man, possibly in his mid-70s, was staring at the moon with something in his hand. I pointed it out to my boys and they had the same reactions. But then Marco stepped on something, loud, drawing the man's attention. The man then looked at all of us, revealing what he was holding, and what I saw got my attention. The man was holding an axe. He then charged at us at full speed, and we were all terrified until Jose stepped in front of us and sprayed him in the face with the fire extinguisher, temporarily blinding him. We took this opportunity to run back to the cottage. We were all exhausted and terrified, afraid that the man would find us again. As a result, we decided not to call the cops. My friends and I begged Spencer's mom to take us home the next day, and she agreed. I never told my parents that this ever happened, knowing they wouldn't believe me. Sometimes I think back and remember this story, and ask myself, what would have happened if Jose never brought the fire extinguisher? Or worse, what if I never pointed my flashlight in the direction of the sound? Three years ago, my friend John asked me to go with him to an abandoned house. It was an abandoned house that was famous in our neighborhood. Famous because it was haunted. Everyone who went into it came out injured or crazy. I told John I would never go there, let alone inside, but he demanded for me to go, saying he would introduce me to a nice pretty girl I'd been wanting to get to know. Knowing that, I couldn't refuse. We went to the abandoned house, and as soon as we stepped inside, we saw a large portrait of a family. 
The people in the portrait were all baring their teeth like animals, and there was blood around their mouths. The painting gave me goosebumps. We kept walking around shining the flashlight here and there. Then suddenly I heard the sound of dishes clattering from the kitchen. I was startled and pointed the flashlight in that direction, but there was no one. Plates, forks, and knives were neatly arranged on the main table. As I approached, I had noticed that there were bones on the plates. It looked as if a human skull was split into several pieces. I screamed and ran to John and told him, let's get out of here. But John said, I came all this way. Allow me to give a high five to the ghost, and then we can leave. Now, let's go to the second floor. No matter how much I begged him to leave, he wouldn't listen. We went up to the second floor, and there too were many paintings hanging on the walls. They seemed to be old paintings of the family's ancestors, and their faces were distorted and creepy. They had red skin with pimply dots all over and long fingernails. I entered the first room. As soon as I opened the door, a dark figure shouted from inside the room, Looks delicious! And then, a skeleton figure of a woman crawled towards me. I was startled, and I took a step back. Cold air hit my face, and then the woman disappeared. I thought I was hallucinating due to my extreme fear, and my body started to shake. It was then that it happened. I heard John screaming from the other room, so I ran to see what was happening. However, when I tried to open the door, it was locked. John, open the door! I twisted the doorknob and yelled for him to open the door, but all I could hear from behind the door was John groaning and the sound of dishes clinking and some people laughing. I slammed into the door with my whole body, but it wouldn't budge. I tried to look around for the key, but I couldn't find it. Then I heard John say something. I put my ear to the door and listened closely. I'm ecstatic, he said. I kicked the door for a while, but no chance. So I called the police. Even if I had to face punishment, I thought I had to save John. After a while, the police arrived. They were angry at me, saying that in this house, dozens of people had died. They broke the doorknob and went inside. When the door finally opened, we were shocked by the sight of John. He was lying on a large table wearing nothing but his underwear, and there were several forks stuck into his stomach. There were plates surrounding him filled with black liquid. And John, he was muttering the same thing over and over again. Enjoy your meal. Enjoy your meal. We screamed, but John just continued to mutter to himself, please. Eat this as well. He grabbed the knife and tried to stab himself in the stomach. As the officers approached and tried to rescue him, he swung at them with the knife. I won't give you my flesh, he screamed. The police barely managed to gain control of him. He left the house on a stretcher, screaming in tremendous pain and then fainted. He was then taken away in an ambulance. He underwent surgery at the hospital. When I visited him a few days later, he didn't even look at me, but just looked at the ceiling and smiled. Oh, that night was the best night of my life. When I entered the room, the family was skinny from prolonged hunger, but they were so beautiful that I decided to satisfy their hunger. I lay down on the table and they started eating my flesh. Seeing them happy made me so happy that I couldn't stop laughing from joy. <laughs> I couldn't believe I could provide meals to such noble people. It was only then that I realized the reason I went into the house was for them. Bloody tears started to flow from his eyes and suddenly he glared at me and shouted, But why did you come in during mealtime? If you hadn't disturbed me, they would have eaten all of me. Take me back there. They are waiting for me. He grabbed me by the collar and demanded. The nurses and doctors came running and held him back. I was so shocked that I had no choice but to leave the hospital room. He was no longer the John I knew. I couldn't say anything. I just cried. I just kept hoping it was all just a bad dream. A few days passed after that, 
and I didn't have the courage to contact John again. After some time, I learned he had tried to rip out his stomach with his hands, saying he had to give the food to the family in the abandoned house. He was eventually admitted to a mental hospital. While he was in the mental hospital, he drew the faces of the family of the abandoned house. They were thin, with long teeth and fingernails. They looked more like monsters than people. Today, I often think about what it might have been that John saw. I mean, I can't even imagine it. I just hope that John gets back to his old self. This is a story from my foolish early 20s. At that time, I was really into ghost hunting. I had a best friend named Joshua, and we always went to supposedly haunted places. Then one day, we decided to visit a hotel that was famous for being haunted. There was nothing special about the hotel other than the fact that it was a slightly old-looking building that had eerie music playing in the lobby. We entered the haunted room while singing a song that was supposed to summon ghosts. I was reading an article about the place on my cell phone posted on a ghost hunting community. They say there are three rules that must be followed in room 704. First, never allow food smells to be present in the room. Second, always wear clothes in the room. Third, never leave the closet in the living room open for more than one minute. Then Joshua asked, what happens if you don't follow those rules? I answered. It says your intestines will be pulled out. <laughs> By who? Is there a horrible monster hiding in here? Then he swung open the closet door in the living room. It was empty but had a foul smell. Plugging his nose, he said. Someone must have pooped here before. Then as he closed the closet door, he continued. Oh, I'm hungry. Let's have some food and start hunting ghosts. He called room service on the phone. However, the staff said that room service was not available for this room. He got angry and complained to the staff, who eventually offered to bring him food. But the staff told him that he had to finish eating within 10 minutes and put the dishes out in the hallway. Soon, our steaks and hamburgers arrived and we started to chow down while looking for traces of the ghost. While we were using the electromagnetic wave meter, the closet door suddenly burst open. We looked at the closet in shock and at that moment we saw something that would haunt us forever. It was a strange creature that looked like the heads and arms of about seven people stuck together. It had no legs, and the many heads and arms all moved separately in a grotesque manner. The forearms and head were extremely large, and the faces were as pale and expressionless as corpses. It crawled to our food and started eating the leftover steak. I tried to film it with my camera, but the camera couldn't capture it. The being ate in an instant and went back into the closet and closed the door. When I saw it, I was filled with fear, and I said to Joshua, I have to get home before that monster gets hungry again. Then he said, What are you talking about? You can't just leave after seeing something sexy like that. Then he ran and pounded on the closet, shouting, Hey monster, try this too! He threw off his t-shirt and patted his bulging stomach. Do you want to try human meat too? Look at this plump skin! He opened the closet door, but it was empty. I chuckled at him, but the flame of fear was still burning in his chest. We watched TV, hunted around a bit, and soon fell asleep. But after a while, I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of a scream. And when I looked in the direction of the sound, I saw the huge being I had seen earlier, sitting on top of Joshua pinning his arms and legs down while sniffing his stomach. Then his numerous hands began tearing at Joshua's stomach. I wondered if I was dreaming, but Joshua's loud screams pierced my ears. Ah! I'll give you something else! Please stop! It wasn't a dream. I screamed. Joshua! I kicked at that huge thing as hard as I could, but it didn't budge and pulled on my leg. Then it squirmed its heads around in an attempt to bite my stomach. I barely escaped by kicking at the heads like crazy. My legs were shaking so hard that I fell to the floor. The being looked at me and started eating Joshua's intestines. Joshua mumbled breathlessly. Lewis, I should have just gone home. I called the hotel lobby and, out of breath, spoke to the staff. Now, in the room, in the room, 
my friend is being eaten. The employee asked me what I was talking about. I shouted. Quickly, grab a knife, a gun, or anything and get up here! I hung up and ran back to Joshua. The giant being laughed gleefully as it chewed his intestines. I took out the Bible from the drawer and recited some verses out loud, but the being did not respond and continued eating. There was nothing I could do. I cried out in despair and fear. Right then, a hotel employee knocked, and as soon as he came inside and saw the gruesome scene, he vomited. The gigantic being had already disappeared, blood stains stretched from the bed to the closet. The employee immediately reported it to the police. When the police arrived, they were distressed to find Joshua's intestines missing without a trace. The police officers just stood there dumbfounded and kept repeating that this couldn't be happening. A few days later, I went back to the hotel room to see the manager, who yelled at me. Your friend called it. It doesn't eat human meat! I shouted at him. You already knew what could happen? Then he sighed and said, As long as we fed them animal intestines once a day, there were no problems. That room is the most expensive room, so it would be a waste to leave it empty. But you provoked them. I told him, Okay, it must be hard for you to keep feeding that bastard, but I'll take this opportunity to get rid of it for you. So just wait a minute. I went back angry, and for the next six months I trained learning deadly martial arts. Then I went back to the hotel room to avenge Joshua, to tear that monster apart. I packed up a bunch of sharp weapons and went. I set out a bunch of pig intestines in front of the closet and shouted, holding a dagger in each hand. The highest quality pork has arrived! After a while, I heard the closet door open and saw it. That gigantic being. It began to eagerly tear into the pig intestines in front of it. But among the many faces that writhed around its body, I saw one familiar face. That, that was Joshua. My name is Vasunthara, and I'm from India. I have been following your YouTube channel for quite some time now and thought of sharing a story with you. In 2009, my father, who's now retired, was in the Air Force. The cantonment was an old palace donated to the state by the royal family of Baroda. It had a violent past, especially during the British Raj, involving murders of both Indian and British soldiers. The house that we were staying in was not in good shape, but we had to take it because there was no other ones available at the time, and staying outside the cantonment was not an option. My mother and I always had a feeling that something was off about the house, but my father never believed us. He was a stereotypical non-believer and always had an answer ready whenever something weird happened in the house. As time passed, we all began to believe that it was just our minds playing tricks on us. But everything changed one evening. My parents had a habit of going for walks before dinner, and on one of these occasions, they left me at home alone. I had been playing video games and watching TV before falling asleep. I had woken up drenched in sweat and with a feeling of dread, and then I saw it. An ugly man with a horizontal slash across his face stood in my room. The lights were on and I could clearly see his features, or lack of them. He had dirty blonde hair and completely whitened eyes. His jaw seemed to be broken and hung. He wore an old blue military uniform and there was a broken rifle under his arm. He didn't seem happy about me being there which was understandable since those old British soldiers were known to be terribly racist and would murder Indian men. I stared at the man, terrified, but he turned around and walked out of my room. I jumped out of my bedroom window and ran to my neighbor's house, since I didn't have a mobile and the landline was in the drawing room where the man had gone. I made a choice. My neighbors didn't believe me and thought it might have been an intruder and tried to enter the house but I stopped them by begging them not to do so. Once my parents came to know about it, we left the house and made arrangements elsewhere. We found accommodation in another house just outside of the cantonment. The worst part was no one believed me except my mother. My father thought I had some kind of breakdown and made me see a therapist. After a while, almost three years later, I started to doubt my own story and thought it was just a thing I did to gain attention. But I was never wrong as one night there was a massive commotion in the cantonment. 
The next day, my father asked in the office about it and what he was told is still burned in his brain to this day. A family that stayed just two houses away from us was watching television when an ugly blonde man with a gnash across his face entered and pointed his broken rifle at them. The woman had screamed and picked up her newborn and three-year-old and ran out onto the streets while the husband had frozen. Nothing had happened, but the man had collapsed onto the ground and had severe issues afterward trying to deal with what he saw. My father couldn't believe what he was hearing. He still wonders what would have happened if I hadn't woken up or had the foresight to run to my neighbors. I visit the cantonment from time to time to see my friends and I've heard that the man has become a common occurrence. They're planning to break down the houses there, but recently he was seen at the gates of the cantonment by the guards. I think he haunts the entire Air Force cantonment. When I was in high school, there was a girl named Natalie that I had a crush on. In fact, almost all the boys at school were fascinated by her beauty. But I couldn't speak a word to her throughout my high school years. Then, when I became an adult, I started working at a restaurant. One day, she came there to have her meal. To my surprise, she pretended to know me first, and I had a conversation with her for the first time. The moment she called my name, I felt like I was in heaven. But she was with another man. He was my high school classmate, Marcus. He seemed very close to Natalie, and I was so jealous of him. I had a short chat with her, and because of her beauty, I stuttered like an idiot. When I got home from work, I screamed at myself in the mirror because I was so disappointed that I couldn't have her. However, she came to the restaurant frequently after that, and we gradually became close. Then one day, she came to the restaurant by herself. So I asked her where Marcus was, and she flatly said that he had left. Then she said something unexpected to me. Do you want to come over to my house? When I heard her say that, I was so shocked that I almost spilled my food on her. But I couldn't hesitate, and made an appointment with her right away. Then I came home, buried my face in my pillow, and rejoiced. A few days later, I went to her house. I knocked, and when she opened the door, I was a little surprised to see that the floor of the house was covered in plastic. And when I went inside, there was a painting hanging on the wall. I remember that she was good at drawing when she was in high school. She said her dream was to open an exhibition. However, when I looked closer, I noticed something strange about the painting. It was a painting of Marcus rolling around on the floor in pain. It was so real that you could hear Marcus's moans in the painting, so it felt like watching a real scene. I got goosebumps all over my body. I drew it really well, right? Can you vividly feel Marcus's pain? This painting will surpass the Mona Lisa. Her voice got very loud and her eyes sparkled. It was a sight I'd never seen before. I followed her to the living room where several paintings were hanging on the wall. There were paintings of men I didn't know and what all the paintings had in common was that the men were in extreme pain. A man was crying and crawling with an ax stuck in his back. A man had bandages all over his bloody body. One man had his limbs tied and spiders crawling all over his body. Humans are most beautiful when they are in pain. So I always think about how I can make people suffer the most. Which of these men looks the most in pain? She said with a smile. For a moment, I started to think she was a psychopath. I felt cold sweat running down my spine. Marcus appears to be in a lot of pain in that painting. How did you draw it so realistically? I asked her. I hit Marcus with a hammer. After about three hits, that beautiful expression came out. He lived a really successful life because he left such a masterpiece. You hit him with a hammer? I was startled and shouted in a shaky voice. And when I looked closely, Marcus looked as if he was crying out for help in the painting. I felt cold sweat soaking my entire body. Have you ever heard this? Art is pain. She said with a smile and then walked into the kitchen and pulled something out of her freezer. 
It was a frozen mace. She ran at me with it and swung it at me. I instinctively avoided it and ran like crazy to the front door. And she followed and shouted, Now it's time to paint. I barely managed to open the front door and run out. And the mace she swung hit her door and I heard a loud bang. Come on, I'll draw you really well. She screamed and I ran away and called the police. Police soon began investigating her, and the results confirmed that she had killed four men, including Marcus, before dumping them in a river dozens of miles away. And the corpses all matched the men in the paintings. She was sentenced to life in prison. I couldn't get out of bed for several days because of the shock of that day. What would have happened if I had been a little late when running away, lost my footing, or failed to open the front door? There'd probably be a painting of me crying on the wall of her house. This is a story that happened to my dad back when he lived in India and was around 14 years old. My dad lived in a relatively rural area that wasn't far from patches of vegetation or forests. He and his neighbor's houses were roughly connected through a small walkway and a back door as if you were entering through someone's backyard. He and his neighbors had several servants in the houses who did chores and other work in the house. And there was one girl in particular who was typically cheerful and would come to his house to fetch the fresh milk from his cow. One day, she walked into the house in a very strange manner, as if she was completely tired dragging herself through the door with a blank expression on her face, practically limp as she walked around. My grandmother asked her, What are you doing? Stop behaving so strangely and grab the milk. After that, she walked back into his neighbor's house in the same manner, and my dad didn't give another thought about it. Then, a few moments later, my dad heard a scream and people yelling, Come quick! My dad and his parents rushed into the neighbor's house, and they saw the girl on the floor being restrained by three grown men who were also servants of the house. Her arms and legs were thrashing and flailing about, and she was shaking violently. Despite the men being really strong and holding her down, she was still flinging her arms and legs effortlessly as if she wasn't being restrained at all. My grandmother yelled to get a witch doctor, And at this point, my dad started to look pissed off. He yelled at them to get a real doctor to help her out, since it looked like she was suffering from a heart attack and needed real medical attention instead of spiritual help. Nobody listened to him, and after 15 minutes, the witch doctor arrived. Meanwhile, the girl was still being restrained and shaking violently. The witch doctor, assessing the situation, took off his slipper grabbed the girl's hair and smacked her on both sides of the cheek. My dad was almost about to restrain the witch doctor, getting even more enraged to thinking they were making the situation worse for the girl who's already suffering. But then, she stopped shaking. Still on the ground, her eyes wide open, she lied there, and the witch doctor, still gripping her hair, said, Which tree did you come from? The girl remained silent, and the witch doctor asked again, Which tree did you come from? If you don't tell me, I will trap you in this bottle. My dad was slightly perplexed at that statement, but went along with it. And by now, there was a crowd of 30 people all around the neighborhood gathered around the girl, checking out the commotion. The girl then released herself from the grip of the witch doctor and got up and began walking towards a forest separating the neighborhood. When she stopped in front of one of the trees, she collapsed and woke up confused, seemingly back to her normal self, now asking what happened and why everyone was surrounding her. The witch doctor explained what had happened, and the girl stated that her mother had visited her the night before. Her mother had died a long time ago, shortly after she was born, because of a train accident. It is said in those parts of India that spirits inhabit banyan trees, and not all of them are friendly. 
My dad still says that if those guys were somehow acting in an elaborate prank, that they did a really damn good job at fooling some 30 people in the village. If not, however, then I don't think it was her mother that visited her that night. I'm a man in my mid-twenties. Something unbelievable happened to me a while ago, and it hasn't stopped. Three months ago, I posted something very angry in this community. At that time, I was failing at everything I did. I was running out of money, and my girlfriend had just dumped me. So, I became angry at the world and cursed the sky itself. But why? Someone read my post and sent me a message. He said he would help me out and give me some money. At first, I thought he was a scammer, so I told him my bank account number and said I would kill him if he didn't pay me. But he actually deposited $1,800 into my account. I was so surprised that I eventually agreed to meet him. But I didn't realize at the time that it was a temptation from Satan. I showed up at the address he gave me. It was a building in the middle of a city, and I went into room 632 where I was supposed to meet him. There was a large open space inside, and in the center was an artificial fountain with some sort of red liquid flowing through it. I couldn't see clearly, but it felt as if it was filled with red smoke. After a while, a man walked into the room wearing an angry expression. It wasn't until I heard him laughing that I realized he was actually smiling. It seemed as if he was forcing the smile. He said his name was Malozul and offered his hand. His hand was reddish brown and looked like leather, not human skin. I was surprised when I saw his face up close. His eyes looked like red jewels, but they were so cracked that they looked like they might break at any moment. His nose was long and harpoon-like, and his philtrum and jaw had teeth sticking out like horns. You asked why life is so painful, and I called you here to give you the answer. It's because demons like me are manipulating your life behind the scenes to make you miserable. We get tremendous pleasure from tormenting people. So we work like hell to hear the screams of one more individual. <laughs> okay, did you really think wearing a mask with such an ugly nose and talking like that would fool me? I pulled his nose, which immediately cut my hand. Ah, what is this? Is this a real nose? He was holding a cup in one hand that looked like it was made of human skin and he scooped up some red liquid from the fountain and handed it to me. I've seen the evil talent within you. You hated the world. You hated God. That's the spirit we need. Satan wants to use people like you as a part of his army. If you become Satan's servant, you will realize how truly boring human life has been so far. The liquid in the cup he handed me gave off an astoundingly sweet scent. I took a sip, and it was as sweet as 1,000 cans of cola coursing through my entire body. I was so dazed by the overwhelming ecstasy that I dropped the cup on the floor. Everyone runs to the fountain and licks it like a dog after just one drink, but you're calm. He suddenly shouted in an unknown language and a beautiful woman walked in. Her skin was as moist as water, and her lips were red and shiny like rubies. She was so insanely beautiful that I cursed without even realizing it. She walked over and touched my cheek and my chin trembled. If this is part of the bargain, I'll become Satan's servant immediately. <laughs> Such a happy slave, aren't you? I slapped myself to try to come to my senses. But I'm a free spirit. I don't want to be a slave. Ha! You have never enjoyed true freedom in your life. Have you ever exploited someone to your heart's content? Or have you ever bullied someone till you've had your fill? I know full well that you've led a boring life your entire existence. As soon as he finished speaking, he suddenly started vomiting. Somehow, wads of cash poured out of his mouth. I was shocked, but the wads of cash kept spewing out and piling up. Satan said this, The greatest thing in the world is pleasure. What beautiful words they are! <laughs> he wiped his tears with a bill. Then he put the cash in a bag and gave it to me. Give your soul to Satan, and the world will be yours for the taking. Without saying a word, I took the money bag and left. 
The streets were still full of people scurrying around. They didn't know anything. I felt nauseous. I went to the bank to find out if the money was real or fake. I walked up to the counter and handed them a bundle of cash. The banker looked intently at the bills. This money is from Duke Astaroth. Would you like me to deposit it into your account or exchange it for new money? I realized that the banknote had a devil's face on it. Is that the face of Astaroth? After leaving the bank, I returned home. There was another message from the strange man. It was about creating a soul contract. After thinking about it for a few days, I couldn't forget that beautiful woman, so I went back to the building from before. He welcomed me with open arms. As he came closer to hug me, I took a step back in shock because his whole body was on fire. He laughed. Are you ready to set the world on fire? What happens if I make a contract with Satan? Then you become a low-level devil. Your first mission will be to make four people around you, including your friends and family, suffer. Make them shed tears of blood and gnash their teeth with hatred. Then gradually increase that number. This is how you rise through the ranks. So far, I've driven 137 people into a sea of despair, and 82 people into a whirlpool of anger. That's why I live in a top-class penthouse. I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in such horrible things. I'm naturally kind. I turned around and tried to leave. Then he suddenly shouted in that unknown language again in an angry voice. And numerous transparent snakes came out of his mouth and sped toward me. The snakes climbed up my body and started biting me everywhere, and I felt the pain of being bitten by dozens of teeth. Ah! As I felt the blood draining from my body, I saw the transparent snakes' bodies filling with red blood. I ran away, writhing in pain, running out of the building and falling to the ground. People passing by came up to me asking if I was okay, and before I knew it, all the snakes had disappeared. I was taken away in an ambulance, and the doctor asked why I had dozens of bite marks on my body, but I couldn't answer. From that day on, I had heard the voices of countless people shouting in my head, I will make you experience the greatest pain! And bizarre things started happening to me every day. I felt tremendous pain as if hot spears were piercing my body. But all the tests at the hospital showed no abnormalities. A pastor passing by on the street saw me and hit me with a cross as if he was trying to kill me. My friends were distressed, saying they kept hearing the words, I want to kill you in their heads every time they met me. It was clear something was going on, but no one believed me. Not the police, not my family, no one. If anyone knows how I can escape, please let me know. First and foremost, I'd like to state that I am a Romanian, and that the following story is as true as possible. Well, it happened a few years ago, when I was at university in a rather small town. I was renting a nice apartment with my cousin, who was two years younger than me. We were at the same college. One day, after we finished classes, he and I were walking quietly home, which was half a mile away. We'd had a long day and were exhausted. I'd like to point out that it was around 3 p.m. at the time. Everything was fine until we were about 100 yards away from our apartment. We were talking about tomorrow's tests and other issues when we noticed a guy looking at us suspiciously near the park. I told my cousin to ignore him, move on. I was trying to be calm so as to not show fear or panic. That man approached the street parallel to our apartment and stumbled there, looking at the gate. To be honest, I was a bit reticent about him and his intentions, but I walked up to the gate and gave him a nasty look. The guy didn't move from there and didn't seem bothered by me. The only gesture sketched by the madman was a sadistic smile. I ignored that and went inside with my cousin. On Friday, we didn't have any work, so we relaxed. We ordered some pizza and watched a soccer match. It was 5.30 p.m., and I decided to go out for a run. My cousin stayed in the apartment, talking on the phone with a friend. I stepped out of the yard, and a few steps from the gate, I heard sounds behind me. I thought it was a dog or something, 
but I decided to turn around and see what it was. Surprise! It was still the same strange man. Furious, I turned to him, asked him why was he following me. He said, nothing, turned his back, and walked away. Confused, I continued my run and made up all sorts of theories. What if he was a robber? What if he was a criminal? What if he needed help? I stopped and calmed down a bit, trying to ignore those intrusive thoughts. It was deathly quiet on the street until my phone rang. It was my cousin. I answered it and asked him why he was calling. His voice was shaking. He said he heard someone knocking on the door. And when he looked out the door, it was the same crazy guy. I told him that I'd come as soon as I could and that he should hide. Five minutes later, I got to the gate and saw the man. He had some kind of hammer in his hand. I grabbed a brick in my hand and ran towards him. I yelled at him and threw the brick over his feet. He made a sound of pain and started coming towards me. I was nervous, but I didn't let my emotions show and make me vulnerable. So I charged at him, kicked him hard in the shin. He dropped the hammer and fell to the ground. My cousin came outside and told me to come inside because he had something important to say. The keys to the door were missing. Just before the police came, I checked the stranger's pockets. They were not on him. The police told us that the guy was a burglar who had robbed four houses in the neighborhood. We searched with them for the keys we couldn't find them. I changed the locks, and frankly, I don't want to go through that again. This is an incident that happened five years ago when I was nine years old. In my home country, my family used to love snacking on chips all the time. Luckily, we had a small shop in front of our house. It had all the snacks that I loved, and they were cheap, so it was my favorite place. The shop used to be owned by an older lady in her 60s. Let's call her Mrs. Mayer. Mrs. Mayer had one daughter and a very small house. I loved her so much because she gave me a free lollipop after every purchase I made. The last time I saw her was when we visited our home country during our summer vacations before the pandemic hit. For two to three years, I haven't visited my home country because of the pandemic. But last year, my cousins came to visit us all the way from my home country. I'd asked my cousin multiple times about Mrs. Mayer, but she wouldn't tell me anything. I annoyed her so much that at last she said, Okay, if you're so curious about her, let me tell you what happened while you were away. My cousin then went on to tell me this story. In the last month that she was normal, Mrs. Mayer was dealing with a brain injury, and as a result, she became paralyzed and had to shut down the business. But after around a year, on a normal day, they heard a knock on the door, so of course my aunt went to open the door. When she opened the door, she was in shock, and her voice stuttered, Mrs. Mayer? It was Mrs. Mayer, wearing a traditional Indian dress and holding a very rusty old brown bag. My aunt's voice stuttered again. How can I help you? My aunt also offered to hold her bag for her multiple times, but she refused every time and got aggressive to the point that my aunt got scared. The last time my aunt offered to hold her bag for her, Mrs. Mayer looked up and stared at my aunt with glowing red eyes and aggressively stomped her foot and said, No. My aunt got really startled this time. Tell Mr. Philip I want to take him to the graveyard, said Mrs. Mayer in a husky, low-pitched voice. Now Mr. Philip was my grandfather, and at the time he was eating his food. I'm busy right now, Mrs. Mayer, said my grandfather. But she repeatedly said it sounding more and more frustrated. Tell Mr. Philip I want to take him to the graveyard. Tell Mr. Philip I want to take him to the graveyard. Tell Mr. Philip I want to take him to the graveyard. My aunt was so frightened that she shut the door hard, but Mrs. Mayer put her hand in the way to stop the door and didn't even get hurt. She slowly pushed the door back open, looked my aunt dead in the eye, and violently screamed. Tell Mr. Philip I want to take him to the graveyard. My aunt was terrified at this point, but her eyes suddenly looked down at the big, 
rusty old brown bag. There was blood dripping out of it. Now panicked, my aunt was trembling and rushed to shut the door and managed to lock it. Mrs. Mayer was banging on the window outside for a few minutes, but after she finally stopped, a disturbing wide grin grew across her face. Her eyes still glowing red, she started muttering something and finally left. After that day, Mrs. Mayer was never seen again. Even now, I still wonder what would have happened if my grandfather had gone with her to the graveyard. This story took place when I was roughly five or six years old. My baby sister had just been born a year prior to this story, and my parents had also just been divorced, so my mom and stepdad moved me and my sisters into this new house. This house had been built on a hillside in West Virginia in the mid-1800s. It was made out of dark wood that almost gave you an ominous feeling just looking at it. The house had three stories. The front door was at the middle story, where our bedrooms and living room were. Upstairs was the attic, but the entrance to it was a pulley door. Downstairs was the kitchen, laundry room, back door, and then a mysterious room. This mysterious room was the only room in the house with a metal door. Cold air would seep from below it, and it had a padlock that only my mom and the landlord had keys for. The landlord referred to it as the boiler room. My bedroom was located directly above the boiler room, and it also had the pulley door for the attic on my ceiling. It didn't take too long before strange things began happening to each member of my family individually, but it began with me. There would be times when I'd leave the room for a minute, and then return minutes later to find things moved out of place. Hordes of wasps and other things would come out of the attic and act in strange ways always remaining in my room. I wouldn't learn this detail until years later, but my mom and stepdad apparently heard footsteps in the living room, walking in circles almost every night, usually only when one of them was still awake. A skeptic would say that my things being moved was my older sister playing tricks, that the insects were normal, and that the footsteps were creaky wood. However, one night, I woke up and felt like someone was in the room with me. I turned over and saw a little boy standing there, shrouded in darkness. I could only see his silhouette, but he appeared to be the same size as me. So I said, hello. The boy answered back and told me that he was from the boiler room and asked if he could play with my toys. I told him no because it was too late and I didn't want to get in trouble. For a brief moment after that, I could make out the boy's expression. My rejection was met with a gaze of pure rage, and then, in an instant, the boy was gone. I told my mom and stepdad about it the next day. They seemed nervous about it, but then they just reassured me that it was a bad dream. Even as a little kid, I was good at reading people, so I could tell that they were holding something back but I let it be. That night, something else happened. I awoke again to the feeling that I wasn't alone. This time, whenever I turned around, I was met with something sinister. The silhouette of an elderly woman stood hunched over my bed, her face inches away from mine, breathing on me. Where her eyes should have been, there was only darkness. I got up and ran past her, opened my door, and hurried over to my sister's room. My older sister was away at a sleepover, so it was just my baby sister in her crib asleep. When I turned back to the doorway, I saw the woman walking towards me slowly. As she walked past the window, lightning crashed outside. And then, in that instant, the woman was gone. And where she was, It appeared that a wolf was approaching me instead. I looked away for a second, and as I looked back down, the lightning crashed again, and after that flash, I saw spiders on my pillow. I turned to look back to the spirit, and after the next flash, the little boy appeared again. As he got closer and closer to me, I passed out. 
I woke up in my bed again, drenched in sweat. Many questions raced through my mind at that moment. Soon after telling my mom and stepdad about that experience, we moved out. According to what the landlord told my mom whenever she confronted him about the paranormal experiences, a widowed mother and her three children had lived in the house when it was first built. The husband had died during the Civil War. At some point not too long after, the mother snapped and murdered all three of her children in the living room of the house and then stashed their bodies in the boiler room. Those deaths perfectly explained why fast footsteps had been heard in the living room, why my toys and stuff were moving on their own, and why I saw a little boy and an evil woman. It also perfectly explains why we moved out so fast after I told my mom and stepdad about seeing the woman. To this day, I sometimes ask myself, what drove that woman to do it? Grief? Loneliness? Insanity? I'll never know. But another question I have is, if she was willing to do that to her own children, what would she have done to a child that wasn't even hers? What would have happened if my sisters and I had stayed at that house? My name is Adam, and this is a scary story of mine. This incident happened almost a year ago. For personal reasons, I'll change my friend's name to Monica. It all started when my dad bought me a full basketball hoop. I absolutely loved basketball, so this was a dream of mine. I played with it every single day for about 30 minutes or more. And around that time, summer started and school was ending, so it was even better for me. I should also mention that, as I said, I have a friend named Monica and we've been friends since I was born, because she lives just a few meters away from my house. Whenever I played basketball, I could see her house's window where her kitchen or living room was. And I, for some reason, sometimes, when I shot a shot, I would look over to see if she or her family was watching me play. And I know, it's a bit weird. Now, the day of the incident. I messaged her on Messenger, what she was up to, and she said that she was getting ready to go to her grandma's house and stay there for a few days. I was kind of sad because I liked to play with her online or sometimes meet in person, but I couldn't do anything about it, so I just said, all right, have fun. About an hour later, I decided to go into the yard and play some basketball, and then it happened. I got the rebound, and I looked over to her window Rose. There was something that looked like a big black box in front of the window. And I knew that whatever was there shouldn't be there because I should be able to see a painting on the wall and I couldn't. As I was about to start dribbling, I noticed something. The big black box wasn't a box. It was a torso. And the torso started to move down. And then I saw a face which looked absolutely terrifying. Its grin stretched so wide, and its eyes were the biggest I have ever seen, and they were looking straight at me. Since at that time I was really into ghost stuff, I thought I was seeing the devil. I just dropped the ball and ran back inside. It was me and my 20-year-old sister at home. I tried to tell her what I saw, but... She just laughed and told me to stop watching the scary videos on YouTube. And because of that, I was pissed. I grabbed my phone and texted Monica asking if anyone was at her house. And she replied by saying, no. That's where I got super scared. Knowing what I just saw, I told her about it. And she somehow believed me and tried to tell her parents but she had strict parents, so they didn't believe what she was saying. I was scared, so I just didn't even want to think about it. So I just watched some movies on the TV, which made me a little bit calmer, as my sister also tried to tell me it's all good. A couple months passed, and I started to forget about it. But it wasn't until me and Monica were on Discord talking that I realized she was 
talking weirdly. I've known her since birth, right? So I know her usual speaking tone, but something was off. So I asked her, Is everything okay? You sound strange. She said, No, not really. I said, Why? Then, she told me what happened last night. She said that she woke up very thirsty around 4 a.m. and decided to go get some water downstairs. As she entered the living room, she looked to her left and saw a big black thing. I don't even know how to explain it. It doesn't look like a human or anything. And it was standing near the window. I saw it. And it was just looking out the window, even though the blinds were closed. As she was about to scream, the thing turned around and smiled so widely, then let out a non-human scream, which let out Monica's scream as she ran to her parents' room, crying and saying that something was downstairs. Her dad grabbed a baseball bat and started going downstairs while her mom calmed her down. After a few minutes, her dad came back saying, there's no one in the house which made Monica even more scared because she thought it was a demon. And of course, since her parents were strict, they didn't believe her, but she slept with them still. After Monica told me this story, I remembered the same thing that I saw. And me and Monica were both scared to sleep that night. But thankfully, nothing happened. It's been almost a year since that incident and nothing's happened. Me and Monica are still friends, and we still sometimes bring this incident up in a conversation. But we still can't figure out what that thing was that we both saw at that window. One day, my friend Lucas came running into class and breathlessly said, Hey, did you hear the news? A few days ago, a man in the neighborhood called the police, but he didn't say anything. So the police went to his house and found him lying in the bathroom with his head cut off and a cell phone in his hand. Really? If that's true, it's super scary, I said in shock. What's scarier was that they couldn't find the head. But that night, another person saw someone dressed like a scarecrow running around holding a trident with something round stuck on it. At first, she thought it was a pumpkin or something but now she thinks it was a human head. Wow, that's terrifying. It's not even Halloween. Who on earth would do that? Let's be careful now. If the killer shows up, show your ugly face. Then he'll go find another head. Dude, how can you make jokes in situations like these? It's no joke. As stupid teenagers, we tried to pretend that nothing was wrong, even though we were scared. That night, while I was sleeping, I heard a crow cawing from the window. I mumbled in my sleep, annoyed. Crow, you better shut up before I break your neck. But after a while, I heard someone whispering very softly. Maybe you should watch your own neck. I was startled, and I looked out the window to see a man standing there. He was wearing a big hat like a scarecrow, and his face was a bizarre mask made of gunny sacks. He was cawing like a crow. I was so shocked that I screamed until my uvula popped out of my mouth, and at that moment he opened the window and let himself in. It's so loud, I have to slit your throat to shut you up. I threw the blanket at him, jumped out of bed, and ran out of the room faster than Usain Bolt. He tore at the blanket with his trident and chased after me. I ran and screamed until the house rattled. This quite obviously startled my father, who came running out with his gun, and I started crying and screaming, Kill the scarecrow, Dad! My dad went into my room with the gun up and ready, and the man jumped out of the window and ran away. The next day, as soon as I left school, I went to see Lucas, grabbed him by the collar and said, You were kidding yesterday, right? You owe me a new blanket. What are you talking about? His face was a mask of total confusion. However, 
When I looked at Lucas's scrawny body and thin forearms, he was clearly not the man who had been swinging a huge trident single-handed last night. I was in a huge panic. Then Lucas actually had the stones to make fun of me. You're such a baby. If a guy like that breaks into your house, you just poke him in the eye with your finger, kick him in the balls, and hit him between the eyes three times in a row and it's over. Ah, if I were you, he would be lying in the operating room by now. Pity. Lucas was punching the air in his imagined fervor, but I couldn't say anything. A few days after that, Lucas didn't show up for school. Then I heard something shocking from my teacher. Lucas had been murdered during the night. He was found with his head cut off and his fists had holes from spear punctures. But his head was nowhere to be found. The neighborhood was turned upside down and the entire police force stood guard day and night, maintaining high alert. Then one day, a police officer was found handcuffed in a police car with his head cut off. But this time, there was a video from the car's dash cam. However, the culprit wasn't in the video. At first, all that could be heard was the sound of two people struggling. But then the police officer spoke up. If you're going to cut off my head, do it one go so it doesn't hurt. You should really let me go. I won't tell anyone I saw you. After that, a dull sound and a scream blasted out. And a moment later, the back of the perpetrator running away giddily with the police officer's head stuck on his trident. The police did their best to catch the criminal, but to no avail. There were, however, plenty of rumors circulating. Some people said they saw the criminal's face. Some said they knew who the criminal was. And some even said they were the criminal. But it was all lies. After the police officer's death, the killer was never heard from again. But since then, people in the neighborhood still sleep armed. I still have doubts. Who was the culprit? Why did he take those heads? And what did he do with them? This happened while babysitting. One day, I found a job with a very high hourly wage on a job search site on the internet and decided to work there for a few days. I felt very lucky, but it turned out to be too late when I realized it was bad luck. When I went to the house, I found a 13-year-old boy named Leo alone. He spoke excitedly as soon as he met me. Hi, Evelyn. There's so much to do with me today. He ran into the living room where there were a lot of tools lying around. I wondered what he was trying to do, but I was worried that something annoying would happen. After a while, I ate with him and sat on the sofa to rest. But he started watching a very dangerous-looking martial arts fight video on his phone next to him. Then he suddenly shouted, Wow, I want to be like those people, so you can kill people with your bare fists. He clenched his fists, looked at me, and said, Hold your head down for a moment, I'll hit your chin with my knee. I was shocked and told him not to do it. But at that moment, he tried to knee kick me. I was shocked and ran to another room and locked the door. I was really angry, but I thought it was because he was an immature boy. As I was using my phone alone, I felt relieved. But suddenly, the door opened. He opened it with a key, but he was holding a large monkey wrench. This looks really cool. I'm going to hit you with this, so tell me how much it hurts. I got angry at him, but he kept running at me, brandishing a monkey wrench. I freaked out and ran out of the house and called his mother, but she said it was just a prank and she told me not to worry. I was distraught, but decided to hold on just a little longer because of the money and moved on. The next day, I went to that house again. Leo was even weirder that day. He was watching a very brutal video on his computer in his room, and it didn't seem like a movie. It seemed like a real video. I told him not to look at that, but he didn't seem to hear me at all. He stuck his head in as if he were going into the monitor and watched the brutal scene over and over again. Meanwhile, he kept muttering things to himself such as, This is awesome! And, This must be really fun! 
I got goosebumps and was waiting for time to pass quickly so I could get home from work. After a while, Leo called me, and when I went to him, he was holding a large pair of scissors and shouting, Evelyn, are these scissors really big? I asked my mom to buy me the biggest one. Don't move, because I need to test how lethal this thing is on you. I yelled at him to stop, but then he frowned and started breathing heavily. <sighs> if you're going to keep rejecting me like that, why did you come to my house? You don't do anything for me! He was furious and swung the scissors in the air. Leo, put down those scissors, otherwise I'll call your mom. I picked up the phone and shouted at him, but he burst out laughing. It's okay, my mom is a nurse, so she can treat you. And then he came running towards me with his scissors wide open. He swung the scissors at me and I barely managed to dodge them, then ran out the front door. Then he opened the window inside the house and shouted at me, since you keep running away, I need to get a weapon that can be thrown. I called his mother, explained what had happened, and told her I wanted to quit. But she spoke over the phone as if she was very annoyed. I'll give you more money, so do whatever he asks. I said I couldn't lose my life for money and hung up, and I never contacted her again. But a few days later, something shocking happened. Leo sent me a photo in which he was making a V with a fork stuck to a woman's neck. Leo said the experiment was finally a success, and he asked me to call him the Fork Killer. I was so shocked. I called his mom, and she said Leo had killed his new babysitter by sticking a fork in her neck. And since Leo was begging her to get a new babysitter, she asked me what she could do. She cried, saying she couldn't believe her son was a psychopath. After some time, Leo ended up in juvenile detention. But I know what he will do when he gets out of prison. Anyone, please never go to his house. Never show your back to a stranger. This is what my grandmother used to say to me in sign language every day. When my grandmother was 43 years old, an assailant had both of her ears ripped off and eaten. She told me this story every day. Even though I'm now over 20 years old, she still caught up with me every day and talked to me. That guy chewed off my ear. The bite was so strong that at first I thought I had been bitten by a dog. I screamed and he stroked my neck and said, be quiet before I eat your vocal cords too. Then he made a clicking sound with his teeth. That sound was so scary. I still shiver when I hear the sound of someone chewing food. And from then on, I started having a speech impediment. It was 20 years ago, and security in our neighborhood was lax. So not only my grandmother, but many women's ears were eaten by him. But the police were unable to catch the culprit. But I reassured my grandmother, telling her not to worry. As times have improved now, that doesn't happen. But she always told me to cover my ears when I was outside. I told her that one day, I'd rip off the criminal's ear and bring it to her. Then, one day, I saw an old, homeless man on the street, and I felt sorry for him, so I, I gave him money. He thanked me and was eating something strange. I asked him what he was eating, and he answered with a smile, this is a pig's ear. I was surprised and asked him why he ate pig ear, and he smiled and said, actually, I really want to eat human ears, but since I don't have any, I'm just eating these. When I see your ears, my mouth starts watering, and I'm going crazy. I might turn into a dog and eat your ears, so go away. <laughs> he ate the pig's ear like a starving man. My heart started racing. I asked him if he'd ever tried a human ear, and he quietly whispered, No. I haven't tried it, but someone told me that human ears are really delicious. Then he suddenly shouted. He chewed my ear and said it was really delicious, and he continued to be amazed. Only then did I discover it. He has no ears. I was shocked. I was horrified and tried to leave quickly, but he kept holding me, wouldn't let me go. And he told me, I want to eat your ears too. I don't need any money, so can you just give me a bite? 
He smiled and showed his teeth. His teeth were very sharp. I pushed him away, ran away. I went to my house and asked my grandmother if she remembered the criminal's face, and she nodded her head. I started sketching the criminal's face while talking to her. But as soon as I saw the completed sketch, I was shocked because the sketch looked very similar to a homeless person I had seen. His half-closed eyes, very wide nose, serrated teeth, and above all, his laughter was very unique. His laugh was very low-pitched, and when I imitated it, my grandmother was surprised, said that she remembered that laughter. So does that mean that the homeless person is the culprit who made my grandmother like this? Although it was late at night, I went back to where that homeless man was. He was lying there. I ran up to him and asked him if he had chewed off my grandmother's ear. Then he said, Do you have a picture of your grandmother? I'd know when I see her face. I grabbed his collar. Do you remember the woman you threatened to eat off her vocal cords a long time ago? <sighs> I remember. But the number of women I've threatened like that must be over ten. <laughs> I was so angry. I wanted to rip his ears off, but his ears were no longer there. He seemed to understand what I was thinking and laughed wildly. I ate my own ear. It was so delicious. I didn't even feel the pain. Why did God only give humans two ears? I want more. Then suddenly he came towards me with his mouth open to bite my ear. I punched him square in the face with all my might. He screamed and fell backwards, but I just kept hitting him. And eventually he passed out. I took a picture of his face and returned home. I showed the picture to my grandmother, and she looked shocked. When I asked her if it was him, she covered her ears and nodded her head. The man hasn't been seen on that street since, and my grandmother never mentioned that man again. One night, while I was asleep, a sticky liquid suddenly dripped on my face. I woke up, sat up, but to my surprise, there was nothing. Confused, I felt a warm breeze on my face as if someone was breathing on me, right in front of me. There was a tremendous stench, but clearly, there was nothing or no one there. Then suddenly, something pounded my chest like a hammer. I fell back with intense pain. I clutched my chest. I couldn't breathe. All I could hear was the strange sound of laughter. I fell out of bed and rolled under the bed in great pain. A loud bang hit the floor next to me. A huge dent was left in the floor. I felt I was going to die if I stayed under there. So I rolled out, stood up, and started swinging my fists at whatever was in front of me. As I punched, my fist was clutched out of nowhere to a stop position, as if I hit an invisible wall. I heard screams, and then the sound of footsteps running out of the room. A loud banging of the front door of the house was happening, with the opening and closing bang of the door. I ran immediately to try to lock it, but the door handle was broken. Slowly, I realized that the foul-smelling liquid was leaking from the walls all over the house. I started screaming at the top of my lungs. I took my phone and called the police. The police arrived moments later and began investigating the liquid from the walls, but could not determine what it was. They also examined the dent in the floor of my room. It was strangely shaped like a large hand with seven fingers. The police left, all sorts of questions unanswered. I was alone again, clearly in agony. This was all right. The next day, I went to the hospital. The doctor looked me over and asked if I had been in a car accident. He said my body seemed like it had been through some kind of dramatic trauma that I was recovering from shock. He told me I needed to rest for a while, and I was to stay in the hospital for a day or so. The confusion made me doubt everything, as if I was in delirium. A couple of days later, I was released. When I got home, I was greeted by my next door neighbor, Jeremy. We spoke and he started to tell me that he had heard some kind of voice. 
as if it was a monster or something. He asked me if I also heard such a voice. I replied no. He told me he had an ominous feeling that something unexplainable was going to happen. I thought he would never believe me if I told him what happened just days before, so I just kept my mouth shut. When I returned home, I was more scared than ever before. A few days later, while I was asleep, I once again felt that warm breath on my face. I swung my fist. I heard a strange screaming sound. Blood splattered across the room. I was now clearly seeing blood appear out of thin air like a waterfall cascading to the floor. I quickly ran out of the room and called the police. When the police arrived, there were blood stains all over the room. The color of the blood was orange. There were footprints in the blood stains. Those footprints were odd. Giant feet with two long toes. The police were baffled. And although they collected blood from the scene and tested it, they could not determine what the hell this thing was. From that day on, I often heard the turning of doorknobs. I would often grab the kitchen knife in fear. When going to investigate outside looking through the windows, I could see breathy fog left on the panes of glass. Not to mention the never-ending strange sounds of laughter. I couldn't stand it anymore and moved. After I moved out, Jeremy caught up with me, and he updated me about my old house. A man in his 30s named Petros moved in. He would be seen running around the house at night, swinging a baseball bat at the air. At first, they thought he was crazy. One day, Petros was heard screaming so loud that Jeremy said he would hear the screams, and then in between the screams, loud bangs. One night, it was so bad they called an ambulance in fear. Petros was found clutching his chest. He was rushed to the hospital where he died, they say, of a heart attack. The doctor said Petros' chest was caved in and the ribcage was smashed full of broken bones. When the police searched, it was the same routine. The front doorknob was broken. Sticky liquid was found all over. In the end, the case was closed, marked as unsolved. Jeremy told me that there was no one living there now and the house remains empty. I couldn't sleep for days after hearing Jeremy's report. I think I know what happened to Petros. Only those who had experienced it could understand that fear. Scarier is not knowing what that thing in that house was. No one knows what it looks like, and no one could know what it wanted. I myself believe I know nothing. Maybe no one will ever know. This happened on Christmas Eve of 2016. I was only 12 at the time, and it was me, my mom, and my sister at home. The three of us were getting ready to go to the mall to buy groceries and other things for Christmas. But before leaving, my mom and I had a fight, and she threatened to leave me home alone. Our yaya, Mary Ann, was on her Christmas break and was in her hometown with her boyfriend. Yeah, yeah is usually what Filipino households call their housemaid, and if my mom actually left me, I'd be at home alone by myself because our yaya yeah isn't with us. My mom and I continued to fight. Then she took my iPad away from me. I asked her to give it back, but she refused to do so. I was really angry, so I went to the closest room to cool off. When I came back, I saw my mom and my sister driving away from the house leaving me behind, alone. I got mad, so I started releasing my anger by yelling across the room and throwing things everywhere, which helped me get my frustration out. A few minutes had passed by, and I heard weird noises outside. I took a peek at the window in the bedroom I was in that had a view of the front yard of the house. I checked to see if my mom and sister had come back. I saw the gate wide open and didn't think much of it, at the time, I was still mad at them, so I locked the door of the bedroom. Later on, I started hearing small, faint noises from the living room. I stayed in the bedroom, listening intently, and a few seconds later, I heard someone twisting the doorknob of the room I was in, as if someone was trying to get in. I thought of opening it at first, but then I felt something odd about the situation. I thought to myself, Wait! If this is my mom or my sister, 
Then why aren't they knocking? Why do they just keep trying to open the door? I then called my mom on the phone and asked her, Mom, where are you? She responded, At the mall with your sister. Did you forget? I answered with, So, you guys didn't come back home? She said, No, we're at the mall, and I'm feeling a little dizzy. We're just sitting on a bench for a while. That's when I froze. I realized that someone must have broken in. I mean, none of us were expecting anyone on that day. Plus, our guests will come on Christmas Day itself, not on Christmas Eve. Then I whispered to my mom on the phone, Okay, and hung up. The person who broke in was still trying to open the door of the bedroom. I started sobbing quietly as I was scared and was only a child and didn't know what to do. I immediately called our yaya, Mary Ann, on the phone as the intruder was still trying to get into the room. When Mary Ann picked up, I said to her, Yaya, come here. I'm alone at home and no one's here with me. As I was crying, Mary Ann said, I can't. I'm all the way back in Samar. That's far away from Manila and I'm still on my break. Why? What's happening? As I was crying and watching the door, I hung up. My idiotic 12-year-old self decided to try opening the door. As I went towards the door, I unlocked it, but I immediately grabbed onto the doorknob while putting some force onto it to prevent the intruder from getting in. I looked through the peephole just to make sure if it was someone I knew, like a relative or a neighbor, and what I saw gave me chills. I saw a man who looked really high and had stitches on his face. I immediately tried locking the door again, but it was hard to since this man had a grip on the doorknob already and was trying to push the door open. I cried even more while trying to twist back the lock on the doorknob. As I was trying to lock the door, I could hear this man breathing really loudly and he was really strong trying to push the door open. I tried to push the door back and added more force to it. And as a guy with a slim build, this was hard for me. When I finally put enough force to push back the door, I took a risk and let go of the doorknob and quickly twisted back the lock. With luck, I was able to lock the door again, but that didn't stop the man from trying to open the door. After what felt like hours, the man stopped trying to get in the room. I took a peek again from the window, and what I saw from the front lawn view of the window, the gate was closed, but I didn't know if the man just closed the gate and decided to stay in the house guarding me, or if he's really gone for good. A few hours passed by. It was nighttime and really dark. My mom and sister finally returned home, and my mom called me on the phone. My mom said that there's a small problem. It's that she couldn't open the gate. This usually happens if the gate of our house isn't closed properly. This must have been the man from earlier who didn't properly close the gate. And since I was still scared because of what happened earlier, I asked my mom to just keep trying, but she said she couldn't and the only way for the gate to open was if I opened it from the inside. I got scared even more, because what if the man was still in the house, just hiding and waiting for me to come outside to open the gate, but then capture me as I passed by? My mom and sister were getting annoyed, so I decided to risk it. As I got out of the room, I ran as fast as I could from the living room to the hallway and to the front lawn. I quickly opened the gates while hoping that the man was finally gone completely. It's a good thing my mom wasn't inside the car and was already outside helping me open the gates since that scared me less. When me, my mom, and my sister finally got back inside, I didn't see the man anywhere and I checked to make sure. To this day, I haven't told my mom or my sister about what happened with that strange man. And until now, I sometimes wondered what would have happened if I opened that door.